So far, all the models for both regression and classification were equally applicable to data that was first transformed via basis functions. Now in this short video, I'm going to briefly remind you of the usefulness of basis functions, uh, now in the classification setting, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about their limitations. And this will eventually motivate us to make learning of basis functions part of our modeling approach. And this will eventually lead to the formulation of multi-layer perceptrons or neural networks. But first things first, let's take a look at a toy example where basis functions are clearly beneficial. Now suppose we are given this two-dimensional data set. So we have uh, features, uh, like two features, can be anything, and I have two classes. And I want to separate these two classes, so one indicated in red and the other in blue, via a, a linear classification model, or maybe generalized linear classification model. Then there's no way I'm going to be able to separate uh, these two classes with just a linear um, a classifier, right? So I could draw a, a decision boundary somewhere over here um, that will classify this correctly, this correctly, but then this part won't uh, be classified correctly. And I can try out all sorts of uh, decision boundaries, but none of them uh, would work. Now, this is a, a nice example of where we can use basis functions to turn this into a linear classification problem. So we can design and uh, we can pick basis functions such that uh, the data transforms in the following way, that uh, the, the blue data points can be clearly separated with a linear decision boundary from the red uh, data points. Now in this particular example, we're going to do that via Gaussian basis, basis functions, uh, where we uh, center a Gaussian function around this point over here and this point over here. Um, so let's say this Gaussian has an average or a mean value mu1 and uh, this particular one has a mean value mu2. So what does that look like? So my first feature value is going to be obtained by mapping this point x to this first basis function. And this first basis function was a, a, a Gaussian basis function. So that means an exponential to the power of minus a half x minus mu1. So the distance to the first center x minus mu2. And then I have this uh, second basis function, phi2 of x, which essentially uh, computes the affinity or closeness of a data point x to the second mean. Okay, so that's the second basis function. It's also a Gaussian basis function. And that's how we could interpret this, right? So this uh, basis function essentially uh, What's happened inside this exponential is I'm going to compute the distance from a point x to this mu and I'm going to pull this through this exponential. So whenever this distance is small, this exponential will have a large value. Uh, and whenever this distance is large, for example, uh, points over here have a large distance to this uh, mean, uh, then e to the power of minus something large will lead to a, a small value. Okay, so this first basis function computes the first component of my new feature vector, right? And the second basis function computes uh, the second component of my new uh, feature vector. So each data uh, point um, now gets a new location in this new feature uh, space. Okay, so let's see how this works. So we have this cluster of points. All these points, they are close to this first Gaussian uh, mean. They are close to mu1. So that means that they will have a large value um, for obtained from uh, the first basis function. So they will have a large uh, phi1 component. Uh, so large means close to 1 because the distance is close to 0. This exponential is close to 1. So it will correspond to this, this particular set of points. Now if I focus on uh, the red cluster, so all these points, they are very close to mu2, so they will have a large uh, feature vector phi2, or far large feature value phi2, so this actually corresponds to this set of points, right? So because phi2 is very close to 1, it's because all these points are uh, close uh, to mu2. And then finally we have this set of points. These set of points, they are very far away from mu1, so they will have a value close to zero. And the distance is large, so e to the power or minus something large will bring it to zero. So we indeed see that the phi1 components of this cluster uh, takes on uh, small values. And if you compare it to the mu2 cluster, obviously these points are further away than the red points, so they will have a lower value in phi2. 
and they're about the same distance away. So this cluster is about the same distance away to this average as this cluster is. So they have about the same uh, value for the, the feature value uh, phi2. Okay, so each data point, each point x, gets mapped to a new uh, point phi of x. This is the vector obtained by stacking these basis uh, function values, and these were the points x. Okay, so now this is what we've been doing all along when we talked about uh, working with basis functions. We have an input vector x, and we can transform it to a new vector space via these basis functions. And now we are going to perform classification in this new, um, well, a new vector space. And because of our clever choice of basis functions, in this particular case, they were Gaussians, we were able to uh, nicely separate the groups. And now this actually enables us to work with a linear classifier, with a linear decision boundary, simply by focusing on, well, primarily, essentially, this is feature value phi2. So this essentially tells us that um, all points for which the phi2 feature value is large, those belong to the red class. So in a way, maybe I could also um, build a classifier just based on this feature vector. Uh, but in the general case, well, um, you want to use different uh, basis functions to come up with a nice decomposition of your input data. Okay, so this is a very clear advantage of basis functions, right? So with a proper choice of basis functions, we can turn this highly nonlinear classification problem in uh, essentially a linear classification problem via these uh, basis function transformations. But this already also exposes a limitation of basis functions because now I know what the data looks like. I work with 2D data, I can visualize this, I can get an impression of how my data is distributed and I can come up with clever choices for my basis functions. But what if you go to high dimensional uh, data sets then it becomes very messy to make these kind of visualiz visualizations and come up with, with proper, with decent choices uh, for the basis functions. Right, so um, let's just quickly go over some advantages and disadvantages of working with basis functions. Maybe first and foremost, uh, these uh, basis functions allow for, for building nonlinear mo models or nonlinear mappings from input variables to target variables through basis functions. And that's what we're doing here, right? My classify in itself is linear, but I first uh, pull my uh, input vectors x through some nonlinear function mapping. Um, and okay, so essentially the whole pipeline is nonlinear in that sense with respect to x. So that allows me to build very complex uh, functions in the end. And once we've defined our basis functions, then uh, the methods that we're used to work with in, uh, on the input space x. Uh, they equally apply well to these new feature values. And that leads actually to the fact that we can obtain closed form solutions for least squared problems, and that we still have that uh, can work with a tractable uh, Bayesian treatment. Where this tractable treatment basically means that we work with, with linear uh, function mappings and such. And uh, so once, we ha once we've been through this nonlinear mapping, then everything else uh, can be kept simple, essentially. Now, some possible limitation of this is that uh, these basis functions, they are fixed, right? They're not learned. So I have to decide, decide on them. I have to choose them. And once I make my decision, uh, I keep them as they is. But ideally, maybe you also want to incorporate this as part of your modeling framework to also optimally select or actually learn these basis functions. Now, that is an issue which we're going to solve in one of the upcoming videos when we talk about neural networks or multi-layer perceptrons. Then we consider um, the modeling of these functions uh, as part of the, the learning process itself. And another limitation is actually uh, this curse of dimensionality, right? So if my dimensionality grows, well, first of all, it makes it very complicated uh, for us to come up with choices for the basis functions. Uh, but also we want our basis functions to cover my entire space, right? Um, because we want every input point X to be mapped to some meaningful uh, new feature value. Uh, so that means, especially if you go to higher dimensionals, uh, higher dimensions, uh, we have a higher and larger and larger space to cover with basis functions. So that leads to a very rapid growth of uh, the number of basis functions. Okay, that basically covers uh, what we call the curse of dimensionality, which is also discussed in chapter one of the book of Bishop. Now, what we're going to do in the later videos, we're going to focus on this limitation that the basis functions are fixed. And we're going to actually learn this via multi-layer perceptrons. 
But before we get there, we will continue uh, going over uh, the three methods for uh, classification. So discriminative methods, uh, probabilistic generative modeling, and well, next up is uh, probabilistic discriminative modeling using uh, logistic regression. When we first moved to the topic of classification uh, a couple of videos back, I said we're going to roughly adopt three strategies for classification. Uh, one was based on probabilistic generative models. Um, we covered discriminant functions. And today we're going to talk about probabilistic discriminative models, um, specifically focusing on logistic regression. Now we started this video series on classification of with going over uh, the theory of decision making. And the theory essentially told us that if we know uh, the joint probabilities, uh, the pro joint probability distribution that generated my data, so these data point pairs, uh, input uh, class uh, pairs, if we know this distribution, then we know how to make our decisions. So what we then started off with, with first going over probabilistic generative models. And we call them generative because if we know this distribution, if we are able to model this distribution, then we can also draw new samples from this distribution or generate new data samples. And we performed our modeling uh, by uh, modeling the class conditional densities. So uh, the probabilities of each data point X given uh, my class uh, CK, my K class, in combination with uh, the prior class uh, probability distributions because the product of these two distributions gives us this joint but more importantly in the classification uh, setting we're interested in the posterior distribution for my class given my observation x and using the class conditional and the prior we can use Bayes rule to obtain these posterior class uh, probabilities. And from the point of view of decision making, these posterior class probabilities is the one that we're, uh, that's the thing we're interested in, right? That we want to assign a deemed data point to the class which really maximizes the posterior class probability. What we then did, we fully let go of this probabilistic setting and said, okay, let's just directly model uh, discriminant functions that are able to assign a new data point to a corresponding target via a function which is parameterized by a set W. And we came actually to this point of directly modeling these discriminant functions by making the observation that uh, if we model in the probabilistic generative setting, my class conditions with Gaussians, with the same covariance matrix, then I end up with linear decision boundaries and linear models that essentially describe my classification behavior. So why not directly model these uh, linear uh, functions? And we did so via generalized linear functions. Um, so uh, then we, in the setting of discriminant functions, we covered two methods. Uh, we covered linear classification models obtained uh, via least squares regression, although there is had some issues related to outliers. But we also considered the perceptron, which also led to uh, a direct modeling of my decisions via uh, discriminant functions. Okay, now the third class of classification strategies, which we haven't covered yet, are uh, the class of probabilistic discriminative models. So this falls somewhere in, in between, um, well, the direct modeling of discriminant functions where we do not uh, rely on any probability theory at all, uh, somewhere in between that and the probabilistic generative methods where we really adopt a full um, parametric probabilistic uh, viewpoint on things. Uh, but since in the end for classification, we are primarily interested in these posterior class probabilities, that is the thing that we are going to directly model. So the modeling becomes much more simpler if we do just this. Okay, so that will be covered today. Probabilistic generative modeling. Okay, so the setting is again, we are giving a, a data set of data points X with corresponding targets. And these targets correspond to now a binary uh, class. So I can pick one out of two classes uh, for each target. And what I'm now going to do, I'm going to formulate this classification problem directly using these basis functions. So we are given a set of useful basis functions that map these inputs X to some other feature vector of dimension M. Okay, so I'm going to create a new feature vector obtained from uh, my uh, uh, input vector X, of which 
the first component is always the constant value one. And that allowed me to um, describe any linear uh, model directly with this uh, scalar product, right? And what I'm also going to use, I'm going to use the following notation. Instead of writing phi of x every time, I'm just going to write phi. And then it should be understood that this phi still depends on my input x. Um, okay, but that simplifies notation uh, quite a bit. Okay, so what we'll now focus on is a class of probabilistic dis discriminative linear models. Uh, and with linear, I mean uh, the following, that my posterior uh, class probabilities are modeled uh, via a combination of this linear mapping followed by uh, some non-linear function, which we will call the activation function. Now, we, we have seen this, this form before, where, we, for example, we use the logistic sigmoid, and this is just a linear mapping. Um, actually, we're going to use the logistic sigmoid again, and that will lead to logistic regression. Okay, so we're going to use generalized linear models, meaning that we have this linear component over here. So, of course, my data x is already transformed in a nonlinear way, way via these basis functions, but once I've done that, I have a linear model as a function of w. And then I have this activation function, which turns this into non-linear mapping. And a second note is that I'm modeling a probability distributions here. So this mapping actually should ensure that the output value, so after pulling this through f, should take on values between 0 and 1. Okay. And then we saw in the probabilistic generative setting that uh, we could obtain these posterior distributions uh, via the class conditionals and the priors, and we took ratios between them, and that essentially allowed us to formulate the posteriors using logistic sigmoids or soft max functions in the multi-class case. But we're focusing now on, on two classes. And then we obtained models of the following form, where actually this component was replaced via uh, the log odds, right? So the, the, the log of the ratio uh, between my joint probabilities. And what we're going to now, we're going to simplify this. So instead of these log odds, we're going to define our own function. So that's sort of a loose uh, modeling aspect to it. We're just going to find some uh, model over here. And that then uh, generates a posterior uh, class probability. Okay, so as nonlinear function, we're going to use the logistic sigmoid all right, so we are going to say that models of this type are going to model my uh, class, my posterior uh, for class one. And we're talking probabilities here. So the probability for the other class is then given by one minus this probability, which is denoted with a y as a function of phi. So that equals one minus sigma w transpose phi. Okay, so we're going to use this notation y actually for our generalized linear model, like really as a function of my input phi, and it returns a value somewhere between zero and one that can be interpreted as probabilities. Okay, and since we are now considering the two class case, I can model my targets with zeros and ones, right? So I can uh, also model, in, instead of uh, defining two separate probabilities, one for class one and one for class two, I could also uh, build this uh, probability distribution of the, for the parameter t, which can take on the values zeros and one. So I'm not going to explicitly do something like say for class c is c1 or for class c is c2. I'm just going to insert this uh, variable t directly uh, because I can use it in a, with a sort of selection mechanism as we've seen before. So we have this model, which uh, models the probability for class one. So if t is one, uh, then this thing is active. And then we have one minus phi, uh, y of phi. And this thing should be active whenever t is zero. And when t is zero, this thing is inactive. Okay, so with this binary coding with ones and zeros and can directly define my posterior distribution for this random variable t, uh, instead of making two separate definitions for class one and class two. So I'm going to repeat this actually. So in the generative setting, in the generative setting, we actually said that we're going to model uh, the posterior class probabilities for class one given X via the logistic sigmoid, which takes as input the log of these ratios 
the class conditional for C1 times the prior for C1. So this is essentially the joint probability for X and C1, the ratio with uh, the joint for X and C2. Right, so this was the generative setting where we were first modeling these um, class conditional distributions and the priors, and then we could obtain a posteriors via this logistic sigmoid. And it turns out that if we work with Gaussians, then this becomes a linear function of this particular form, but where the Ws were essentially defined via my parameters of the Gaussian distributions, which I used over here. And as mentioned before, now our focus is to just directly model these uh, linear decision boundaries without first modeling these um, uh, class conditionals and priors. So that simplifies our modeling approach quite a bit. And as we will see, and that's, the ne and that's this slide, uh, this actually leads to the fact that I'm going to use less parameters also in my model. So also in that sense, it uh, makes it more simple, right? Because um, in this uh, probabilistic generative setting, I said I'm going to model my class conditional via Gaussians and a class prior. Uh, now focusing on these Gaussians, how many parameters would I uh, need? For example, if my data consists of uh, vectors, which are m-dimensional. Now, if my vectors are m-dimensional, then these class conditional densities are m-dimensional multivariate Gaussian distribution. So each uh, mu parameter for each class, so let's just consider the per class case. So for one class, um, I need, for each of these means, I need m parameters. But then I also have these covariance matrices, right? And how many elements do these covariance matrices have? These have uh, m squared elements. So in that sense, I would need m squared parameters. Though this is not fully the case because these matrices are uh, symmetric. So I do not need to define m squared unique uh, parameters, but at least it scales with m quadratically. So here we have the number of parameters that scales quadratically with m, right? So if m becomes large, then also my number of parameters becomes large quite quickly. Uh, whereas in my logistic regression case, I'm just modeling directly uh, these w's, so that only requires me to have m parameters. So for my weight vector, I need m parameters, so that means uh, the scales linearly with my number of basis functions, right? So this is a, a very strong case. If I'm just interesting for in classification, then it makes more sense to do uh, direct modeling of these uh, posterior uh, distributions because then, uh, well, I need way less parameters essentially. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to directly model these posterior uh, distributions via functions of this form. And this is called the logistic regression function because it takes as input this linear transformation of my feature factors, and then I'm going to pull it through this uh, logistic sigmoid. So that leads to what we call logistic regression. Okay, so I'm modeling my target via, the, via this uh, posterior class distributions. So this also means I can define a likelihood function um, given my data. So basically I can test how well um, my probability distribution describes these input output pairs. So let's do that. So we're again computing this likelihood function on all my data. And we again make the assumption that my data is IID, mean, meaning that this factorizes in the product of all these individual likelihoods. So uh, the likelihood essentially that my model, which is described by this set of weights W, um, describes this uh, input output uh, relation and the probability of uh, so the product and the probability this probability of a given target given my input xn was given by this selection mechanism so the probability for class 1 times 1 minus the probability of class 1 where this these yn's were really my uh, posterior uh, probabilities right which were in turn modeled via these sigmoids. So this generalized linear model based on the logistic sigmoid. 
Okay, and uh, from here on, I'm going to work with the short notation for the feature vector uh, for the corresponding data point xn. And I think maybe in one of the previous videos, I already made this uh, notation. It simplifies uh, things a lot. Okay, so because we were modeling my targets via uh, probability distributions, via posterior distributions, we could define a likelihood. And now we're going to optimize uh, the likelihood function. So the likelihood that my model parameters w describe this data set. And that would give me a, a, a maximum likelihood model for logistic regression. And yeah, we've done this plenty of times. Instead of maximizing the likelihood directly, we're going to maximize the log of uh, the likelihood or actually minimizing the negative log of the likelihood. So let's see what this thing looks like. So we have minus uh, this product becomes a sum. So minus the sum over all my data points. Then we have again this, uh, these products over here, which also become a sum. So you have the product of the log of y n to the power t n, but these powers move up front using these logarithmic uh, rules. Um, plus one minus t n. So that's again this power the logarithm of y minus y n. Okay, so when I'm minimizing the negative uh, log likelihood, I'm minimizing this particular error function. And this particular error function is known as the cross entropy loss. And this terminology, so cross entropy, that also that, that, that actually has a information theoretical background. What, it, what we're actually doing here is we're measuring uh, the distance between two distributions. We have a ground truth uh, target distributions, uh, distribution consisting of these uh, ones and zeros. And I model a particular uh, distribution uh, via these uh, y n. So essentially it's a cross entropy between my ground truth and my predictive uh, distribution. But maybe for this course, it isn't too important where this terminology comes from. We're just going to call this particular loss the cross entropy loss. And it consists of this a product of my, well, ground truth probability, like really probability one for uh, class one times whatever my uh, prediction set. So ideally we also want this to be one. And also on the other hand side, we have the probability or the ground truth uh, label for my negative class times whatever my model uh, came up with. So the log of my model's uh, prediction. Okay, so whenever we have minimized this thing with respect to W, we've obtained our maximum likelihood solution for my logistic regression uh, function. Um, a quick remark here. So this is of course a function of W because these Y ends these y ends, they are still a function of w. I just use this short notation over here. But my sigmoid, uh, which takes as input, my linear model described by w uh, is labeled yn. So this is a function of w, which we are uh, minimizing. And in contrast to what we've been able to do so far, uh, so far we've been able to rewrite such error functions in a quadratic form, which we can exactly minimize, for which you can find a closed form uh, solution for the minimizer. For this problem, we cannot do this because my functions y n are a non-linear function of w. That's because the sigma is over here. Okay, so that's unfortunate, but uh, it turns out that this error, this cross entropy error is a convex function with respect to w. So that means there's only one optimal value. And if we're able to find this optimal value, then we found really the global optimum uh, for w. So really the optimal solution. And the fact that this cross entropy uh, function is convex, it's really nice because then we can just apply methods such as uh, stochastic gradient descent, which we've seen before, because it guarantees that, well, if we apply the stochastic gradient descent iterates, we move downhill this convex energy landscape and end up with our globally optimal solution. Okay, now for now, I'm not going to show that it is actually convex. Uh, you can find details about it in Bishop 4.3. Uh, point three. Uh, but essentially the proof is uh, we have to compute the Hessian of this error function with respect to W and show that it is a uh, positive definite. And if this is the case, then I'm dealing with a convex function. And that means that I have only one um, global optimum. Actually, I'll, I will say something about it in one of the upcoming videos when I talk about a second order optimization algorithm to find this uh, optimal solution uh, for W. But now let's focus a bit of what this cross entropy loss uh, looks like. 
So, uh, okay, we have the cross entry loss for reference. I put it over here. So for one data sample, this is the loss, right? So actually there should be a bracket over here. So it's minus of this entire thing. So it consists of these components, right? So whenever Tn is one, so I want to predict the value of Tn is one, uh, this is my loss. And whenever my target is uh, zero, then I'm considering this other loss, but they, these were probabilities, right? So the probability for the other class is given by one minus probability for, well, the first class. Okay, so now let's just focus on the case where I want to predict uh, the target t is one. So I'm focusing on this particular term and this y is my predicted probability for class one. This is what this logarithm as a function of y looks like. So on the horizontal axis is my predicted probabilities, which takes on a value between zero and one. And we're now focusing on the target as one. And we see that if my uh, predicted probability is close to zero, I have a high error. So I have a high loss. Um, so we really want to minimize, uh, reduce this error. So we want to push Y in this direction. And if I'm already close to my target, so now my prediction for the end data point is close to one and we see that this loss function is very close to zero. Okay, so this is what my loss function looks like uh, when I plot it against my predicted uh, probabilities. But it, maybe it's more interesting to plot it as a function of the linear component, as a function of this linear model uh, w phi. So my yn, my yn was sigma of w, like the logistic sigma of uh, w phi. And so if I plot it as in terms of this linear uh, function, then I get this error function. Now, why am I plotting it as a function of uh, W phi? I'm doing that because we used this model in our uh, least squares regression um, case, right? So in the least squares regression, let me write it down. In the least squares regression for classification, I assumed the model Y W transpose phi, where I used a quadratic loss, uh, my prediction y should be close to my target uh, squared. So that, that's what we did in the least squared regression case, right? And then we could also come up with linear decision boundaries, but we saw that we have actually, that outliers were penalized a lot, even though this was completely unnecessary. And it was due to the fact that this loss function was minimized around the value one, because we have this quadratic penalty that is minimized whenever my predictions are close to one. So that essentially says if this linear part um, is highly negative, well, then I have a strong penalty, that's good. But also if it's highly on the positive side of this thing, then I also push it back uh, to this one. Now, if you compare this to the logistic loss, so now I'm looking for the case. So I'm predicting here the target T is one. That's what I'm aiming for then I'm focusing on this model, right? So this is for T is one, I have to focus on this component. So then you see if I'm far away on, let's say this is my optimal decision boundary uh, defined by W, if I'm F point on this side, so highly negative, whereas actually I was supposed to be on this side, I have this penalty. So this is, looks a bit like a linear penalty whenever, so let me write it down. So this is like a, uh, linear penalty whenever uh, my point is mapped to the wrong side of my decision boundary. But you also see if now I'm fully on the right side of my decision boundary, let's say green is my decision boundary, uh, so that means I'm very much on this side, then I hardly penalize anything. So that's, that is a good thing. So we see that this logistic regression does not suffer from this a problem of outliers, which we saw in the, the least squares regression case. So we see that the penalty is close to zero when my input vector is mapped to the well, correct side of the decision boundary. Uh, then we see that my uh, penalty only assigns a very small value, a small penalty to it. And it also said if it's not too far away from the decision boundary, then I still assign some penalty, meaning that I'm going to push it a little bit further away from this uh, decision boundary. Okay, so we just saw that 
these type of points they form no problem for logistic regression okay so this really tells us that when we're talking about classification we want to work with logistic regression rather than least squares regression where we essentially made this analysis via this uh, linear part of our model uh, because in our logistic regression I work with probabilities which are obtained by this linear model and this logistic sigmoid which maps all these inputs uh, to a probability between 0 and 1 uh, but then if I make decisions so my decision boundary my decision boundary is essentially given via this probability it has to be larger than a half then I assign my data point to class 1 and if it's smaller than a half then it's uh, assigned to the other class and this means that equivalently it means that my linear model has to be larger than 0 uh, so my decision boundary for my linear uh, model lies at the value 0 now and that then tells us if my um, predictions are far away from the decision boundary so that's how we could interpret uh, these, these linear models we saw that in the linear discriminant uh, model video so if my points are far away from a decision boundary on the correct side so I'm somewhere over here I assign a low penalty but if I'm far away on the other side on the negative side then I have this large penalty and if I'm right at the boundary uh, right at the decision boundary I still have a penalty that pushes it that pushes it more to uh, well the, the, the correct side of the boundary okay so that's a bit of an ana analysis of how this loss function eventually leads to finding correct decision boundaries even in the case of uh, outliers okay so this slide wraps it up so we have classification with logistic regression the setting is we have a data set of input output pairs where I'm considering the, the two class case so I could label my uh, output with the label 1 or 0 um, before I do anything I map it through a new feature vector so each data point is mapped to a new data vector via basis functions then what I'm going to do is I, whenever I make a decision on the class so when I'm doing classification I'm basing my decisions on the posterior distribution for my class C1 given my observation x and it was parameterized by a set of w's uh, so this probability, this posterior probability is parameterized via my uh, generalized linear model with uh, well, my weight parameters W and my nonlinear function, the logistic sigmoid. And then to obtain these optimal uh, parameters W, I'm going to minimize um, the cross entropy loss. So essentially I'm going to minimize the negative log likelihood and we can do this if I have stochastic gradient descent for example because the function is convex I'm guaranteed to obtain uh, the globally optimal solution a W star and in one of the upcoming videos I'm also going to consider a second method for finding this W in an even faster way than a stochastic gradient descent so this part is coming up in the next videos but once we have obtained such an optimal W, uh, the classification is very simple. Um, so we have a new data point X and we evaluate my logistic sigmoids with my obtained uh, values for W. And whenever this obtained probability is larger than a half, I'm going to assign it to class one. Or equivalently, if my point uh, mapped through this linear function is bigger than zero I'm going to assign it to class one okay so this simply means that my decision boundary given my optimal uh, set of uh, parameters is simply given by setting this linear function to zero okay that summarizes uh, logistic regression next up I'm going to talk about how to minimize this cross entropy loss we just saw that logistic regression is a great choice as probabilistic discriminative model. And in contrast to regular least squares regression for classification, logistic regression properly deals with outliers. And with respect to full probabilistic generative models, uh, logistic regression is much more parameter efficient. Okay, so logistic regression is great for classification. Now let's see how we can optimize such models. So let's quickly go over the logistic regression setting. So we have this data set of input output pairs 
where I'm considering binary targets. So I'm considering a two-class uh, classification problem, which means that I can code my targets uh, with these binary labels, a one or a zero. And this one of a, and a zero coding allows me to select uh, the proper uh, model, right? So instead of uh, specifying for each class separately a posterior uh, probability distribution, so this would be for separately for class one, uh, the probability after observing uh, my data, I can model uh, the probability for each class in one function, meaning that if I'm interested in class one, then my T is one and I select, well, indeed the probability for class one. And if T is zero, then this thing becomes one. And I'm focusing on one minus this probability. So I'm focusing on the probability for my second class. Okay, so this thing over here really is my probability for a target T given my input X and my model parameters W. So these X and W together, um, they are mapped through a probability via this logistic sigmoid function. All right, so we have this probabilistic model for the uh, posterior class probabilities, and that allows us to define this overall joint likelihood function for my entire data set. So the likelihood that this entire data set was modeled via such a model uh, for the posterior class probabilities parameterized by a set of uh, parameters W. And again, I'm using the notation here that this phi n is really the feature vector uh, associated with the end uh, data point. Okay, and then the popular strategy for obtaining my optimal parameters w was uh, in this probabilistic setting via maximizing uh, the log likelihood. And the log likelihood in this particular case is given via the cross entropy loss, or actually this is the negative log likelihood gives me the cross entropy loss. And now in this video, I'm going to explain how we can minimize this cross entropy loss. Now, as mentioned before, this, this error function as a function of W is convex, uh, though it has not, it does not have a closed form solution because it's nonlinear with respect to, to W. Uh, so this makes the problem nonlinear and therefore I cannot find a closed form solution, but it is convex and that is nice. So it means that I can find the optimal, the globally optimal set of parameters W that really minimize this uh, negative log likelihood um, via uh, stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. This is my overall uh, loss, my total log likelihood given all my data points. And well, we can always apply gradient descent to go to the local or the global optimum in this case. Uh, but if my error um, splits in the sum of individual errors for each data point, then uh, this makes it a great candidate to apply stochastic gradient descent, meaning that we walk downhill this error landscape simply by taking a step along the gradient direction obtained by only inspecting one data point. So this entire loss for one data point uh, will be called the error associated with the end data point. So this is what my, looks look, uh, my loss looks like, right? So the sum over all these individual errors. Then the gradient or the stochastic gradient descent algorithm says that I'm going to find my new uh, weight parameter. So I start off with an initial set of weights and I'm going to update it by step by stepping into the negative gradient direction because that brings me downhill, that brings me down this error landscape. And my gradient was defined as the derivative with respect to all these model parameters. Uh, concatenated into a row vector. And that's why I have to apply a transpose over here because my weights are coded as a column vector. And well, we use the convention that my gradient is a row vector. That's so I have to put a transpose over there. Okay, so I'm updating my weights by taking a step uh, down um, the negative gradient uh, direction with a step size eta. And I'll give a little bit more uh, information about this eta in one of uh, the final slides. Okay, but we've seen, we have seen this recipe for stochastic gradient descent before, and it all relies on the computation of this gradient, or of this gradient over here. So let's see if we can analytically uh, compute this gradient, and if we have that, then we can insert it here, and then we have our update rule, which we can iterate. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to now look at one of these uh, components 
of uh, the gradient because if we know how to compute the gradient with respect to the jade parameter we can do this for all this for all these parameters um, so let's focus on this for now so i'm computing the derivative of my loss and this loss so i'm going to use the chain rule here so the derivative with respect to yn times the derivative of yn to wj right because my loss uh, is a function of these yn's and these yn's are in turn a function of uh, the model parameters w right so each yn was given by the logistic sigmoid of my weights with phi n so if i have to compute the derivative uh, of my error to w i can first compute the derivative of my error with respect to yn that's what i'm doing here and i'm multiplying it so this is a chain rule the derivative of yn with respect to wj okay so let's focus on the derivative of y with, of, of e with respect to y so that gives me the derivative of this thing so the derivative of the log is one over the thing inside the log so the derivative here would be minus tn over yn so recall we had this uh, minus sign over here minus because this minus also applies uh, for this term um, 1 minus tn over the derivative of this log that's 1 over yn times the derivative of the thing inside this log so i'm again using the train the chain rule here and the derivative of this thing with respect to yn is minus 1 so times minus 1 and of course this minus 1 cancels with this or it turns this into a plus so let me simplify it a little bit okay so this entire thing then still times yn uh, the derivative of yn with respect to wj okay great so i already computed this part of my uh, gradient and now i still have to focus on the derivative of yn so really my logistic sigma model with respect to wj so this is uh, what i'm going to focus on next so now we're going to apply the chain rule to this logistic sigmoid so first we compute the derivative of the logistic sigmoid with respect to its input times the derivative of my linear model uh, which is not too uh, hard and actually for the derivative of the logistic sigmoid this is actually what i uh, said a couple of videos back when i first introduced the logistic sigmoid i said it had this very nice property that the derivative of the logistic sigmoid is again an expression in terms of this function itself um, I promised this uh, expression would come in handy and well here it is we're going to use it I think I also said we're going to use uh, the chain rule a lot uh, <laughs> throughout this course and well again that's what we're doing we're con continuously uh, computing chain rules over here okay so there it is we compute the chain rule of this thing so first derivative with sigma with respect to its input so that gives me uh, this expression so let's just write it out so sigma of my linear model times 1 minus sigma of this linear model times the derivative of my linear model so phi n to um, wj because that's what we were computing right recall that the sigma of my linear model was called yn okay and then the derivative of my linear model with respect to wj that isn't too hard to show that it's going to be the jade component of uh, phi n but let me just quickly yeah let me just quickly write it out so we have the derivative of my linear model with respect to wj is given by or well, the derivative to wj of the sum so i'm just writing out the scalar product over here so the sum over all these uh, basis function components or feature vector components so wi times the i components of my end uh, uh, data vector and so i'm only observing this particular vari variable so w uh, j uh, whenever i equals j right so uh, this then the derivative of this entire sum is just phi n j because if i is unequal to j in the eyes of this uh, wj this is just a constant so the derivative of the constant is zero so yeah the derivative is phi of nj so we mark that let's insert this over here and then we've computed 
the full derivative. So this is then, and let me write it in the form of these y n's to simplify it a bit. y n times phi n j, right? Because these sigmas were y n. Okay, so now remember why we were computing this thing it was because we com were computing the gradient, uh, or the derivative of my uh, error with respect to the j uh, weight, and then we already computed this part, and then we had to compute uh, the derivative of my logistic sigma with respect to double j, and that's what we just did. So let's just insert it then over here. Okay, so this part was computed on the previous slide, and this is what we just uh, computed. So now we're going to fill this in. So that gives me t n over y n times the derivative, which is given as follows. So that's y n one minus y n times phi n j. And we all already see that things are going to simplify because these yn's uh, cancel out. Then plus what we see over here. So that's one minus tn over one minus yn times what, what we just computed. So that's yn times one minus yn phi nj. And also here we recognize that this particular term cancels with this over here. Okay, so let's write this out again. So we have tn phi nj minus tn yn phi nj and then the other term plus, uh, let's see, yn phi nj minus tn phi nj. Okay, and then these terms also cancel out and what we are left with is a very simple expression for the gradient, namely yn minus tn times phi nj. Okay, so that's really nice. We computed the derivative of the jade component of this error function, and it really simplifies to uh, the error that I make on my prediction. So because this was my prediction and this is my target. So this is my error times uh, the jade component of uh, well, the basis uh, factor of the feature factor associated with data point n. Okay, so this derivative is this very simple expression over here, and that's not entirely a coincidence. Uh, there's actually nice, some nice background theory with it. Actually, it follows that if you work with generalized linear models uh, that work with a particular type of activation functions uh, called link functions, then it turns out that uh, the derivative or the gradient with respect to error always takes uh, this form. Uh, so I really encourage you to take a look at um, Bishop 4.3.6 that explains that if I take uh, the derivative of my error with respect to my uh, W parameters, I end up with this form. Because it's not just for logistic regression that if I take the, the gradient of my error that it takes this form, uh, this, also, this particular form also shows up for different classes of models. And it has to do with the fact that if I choose my activation function, activation function equal to what we call a link function, then I obtain uh, this uh, particular result. Okay, so this particular node refers to a broader interpretation of why this gradient takes on this simple form. Uh, but now let's just focus on the specific logistic regression case. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, we're going to apply stochastic gradient descent on this error function. And to do so, uh, we split this total error function into a sum of these individual errors associated with each end uh, data point. And then we simply apply gradient descent uh, by computing the gradient for each data point. And we just obtained an expression for what this gradient looked like. So the jade component of this gradient was simply given in the following form via well, the, the, the error that I make multiplied with uh, well, the jade component of my feature vector. So that means that the gradient, uh, the transpose of the gradient, so my gradient itself is a row vector and the transpose of the gradient is a vector, is simply given by multiplying this error with my input feature vector. And that then leads to the very simple update rule that my new model parameter is given via my old model parameters, uh, minus um, yn minus tn, so this is the error 
times my feature vector. And it's really beautiful to see how simple my update, update rule now is, right? It's just my old uh, weight vector and I add, well, the error times my feature vector to it. And this reminds us of what we saw in the perceptron algorithm, right? In the perceptron algorithm, we also we had a weight vector plus actually my target times um, my, my feature vector. But what we did there, we only applied this update whenever we had a misclassified point. And now we're essentially updating for every point uh, weighted with the error that we make essentially on the prediction, right? Because this was a prediction. If my target is one, I want to this thing to be close to one. It's never perfectly to one. So uh, this will become a negative value, which means I'm going to add a little bit of this vector itself. So it's sort of like a soft version of the perceptron algorithm in that sense. Okay, so what I indicated in red refers to the similarity with the perceptron algorithm, uh, but this entire thing uh, refers to the update rule of my logistic regression. Okay, so this uh, slide summarizes the recipe for stochastic gradient descent for logistic regression. So we have this energy landscape, um, which isn't quadratic, I sort of draw it quadratically, but it is convex for sure. And uh, that means we can apply gradient descent to it. And the gradient descent algorithm is as follows. So we select some initial weight, W, and we specify a particular learning rate. And what we then do is we simply work, walk uh, downhill um, this, this arrow landscape with step sizes eta in the direction of the negative gradient. And the gradient is given as follows. So that really leads to a very simple update rule. And now there's some remark. Uh, so if eta is small enough, then I'm bound to converge to my global optimum value. So I'm bound to end up here at uh, w star, so the globally optimal value. But if my uh, step size eta is too large, what is happening is that I'm, I jump, let's say over here, and uh, my steps are too large, so I sort of keep skipping over the optimal value. So if eta is too large, then I may come close to my data point, uh, but uh, I will never reach this particular point. Uh, but if eta is too small, then it takes me a lot of time, a lot of time steps before I actually end up at my global optimum. Okay, so that's it. If I select my eta small enough, I'm bound to converge to my global optimum. So really the minimizer of my error landscape. And that gives me uh, an optimal, a globally optimal logistic regression model. Now what I'm going to do in the next video, I'm going to present an alternative to the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. I'm going to present a second order optimization method where a stochastic gradient descent is simply refers to, referred to as a first order opti optimization method because it is based on first order derivatives on the gradient. And uh, in the next video, we talk about a second order optimization method which converges faster to the global optimum, so with less iterations, and it also doesn't rely on picking a particular learning rate eta. In this video, I'm going to present a second order optimization scheme for finding logistic regression models. And this scheme will be called newton refson optimization. And along the way of deriving this second order optimization scheme, I will show that the logistic regression problem the logistic regression error function is actually a convex function and hence it only has one globally optimal solution. Again, a quick recap. We have data pairs, input output pairs, where the output is a binary target. So we're considering two class classification and we are going to base our prediction via a, a probabilistic discriminative model. So really we try to predict the probability of my data point um, belonging to a particular class, to class one. And uh, the probability of my data point belonging to class one is given by this logistic sigmoid function. Now, in order to obtain my optimal model parameters W, I'm going to minimize the negative log likelihood. And the negative log likelihood is given in the following form. And this thing over here is often called the cross entropy error function. Okay, and this cross-entry error function is a convex function with respect to W, 
which means uh, that it only has one globally optimal solution and we can find such a solution for example via stochastic gradient descent uh, and in this video I'm going to present a second order optimization algorithm to find our globally optimal parameters w and along the way I will show that uh, this uh, function is indeed convex by inspecting its second order derivatives. Now the approach is as follows. So this newton Revson iterative optimization scheme is in a way similar to stochastic gradient descent, uh, mainly based on the fact that uh, we have this iterative scheme where we start off with an initial guess and then we update my model parameters w at each uh, step. And now we're essentially going to make a quadratic um, estimation of my error function whereas previously uh, we used a gradient which ex essentially gives us a, a linear approximation of my function and with that I mean the following suppose we have this uh, convex error function because my uh, cross entropy loss uh, was convex and I have an initial estimate for my uh, parameters w so this is w time step uh, 0 what my gradient descent algorithm does, it uh, looks for the gradient. So let's say it points in this direction. And then I'm going to walk downhill this gradient direction. So um, really what this gradient does, it gives us a local approximation of my function as a linear function. Uh, so it looks like this. I'm, the error, it basically says my error increases if I go in this direction and it decreases if I go in this direction. And of course we want to minimize the error so we move along the negative gradient direction. But we have to pick a step size, right? Because it keeps going down forever because it's a linear model. So um, <laughs> if I really want to minimize this linear approximation, I just go to infinity and I get my error which is minus infinity. Uh, which doesn't make sense of course. So I have to pick a certain step size. So that's what we do. And every time we estimate the gradient, pick a step size and then we walk downhill until we reached our uh, optimal value. Okay, so with stochastic gradient descent, so with stochastic gradient descent, I have to work with a particular step size uh, eta. Now what we're going to do in this uh, second order approximation scheme, I have my, so these blue lines correspond to my uh, true error function, and now I'm going to approximate locally, so I'm considering um, my function around the weight uh, set uh, w naught and I'm going to make a quadratic approximation of my error function around this data point and maybe it looks something uh, like this. So I make this quadratic approximation so e uh, tilde is a function of w and it, it maybe looks something like this and what I'm then going to say my next uh, model parameters are going to be given by the minimizer of this approximation. So it's a quadratic approximation, so it has one global uh, minimum, and it lies, for example, at this particular point. So that will be my next model parameters at time step at tau plus one. Okay, so I'm going to repeat this. I again obtain this quadratic approximation, and my approximation says that the global minimum of my approximation lies somewhere over here. So, okay, that gives me the next point and so on. And by doing this, by making this quadratic approximation, I actually take a curvature of my energy error landscape into account. I sort of know from local inspection that I have to steer a bit in this direction and make my steps a step in this corresponding direction. And that in the end leads to the fact that not only I reach my uh, global optimum of my error landscape in less steps, it also shows uh, that I do not have to select a particular step size. Because in my linear approximation, I really do have to set a step size, otherwise I keep on going forever in one particular direction. Uh, but in the quadratic approximation case, uh, my approximation says there is one minimal value of my approximative uh, error landscape. Let's just pick that value. So there's no reason to set or select a particular step size. Okay, now in this video I'm going to explain how to obtain such a quadratic approximation uh, which essentially is done via Taylor expansion. Then I'll show how to minimize this uh, approximation and that gives me the next um, weight vector. And at some points, these points, they lie very close to each other because I've reached the global optimum. So basically I stop 
whenever my new iterate is very close to what I already had. Okay, so this gives me an algorithm for walking downhill this error landscape, uh, taking the curvature of my energy landscape into account. And in the end, I will converge to my globally optimal uh, value for W. Okay, so what does all of this look like? I said I'm going to approximate my error function W with a second order Taylor expansion around the weights that I'm currently considering. So I'm computing a second order Taylor expansion around W at time step uh, tau minus one. Now, what does such a Taylor expansion for multivariate functions looks like, uh, look like? So um, it's just a Taylor expansion as we've used to. So we take uh, the function value at the point that we're considering plus the first order derivative, which is now the gradient times a particular step size uh, relative to this uh, central point plus my second order derivative, which is captured via this Hessian matrix times, well, my step size squared. And in the multivariate case, it means um, I multiply it on the left and right. So this Hessian is multiplied on the left and right of this uh, with this step size. Okay, so this is what the Taylor expansion uh, looks like. It's an approximation. It's a second order approximation of my error function W um, where I'm approximated in the following. So I center this approximation around my current uh, estimate for W and this is then a relative offset uh, parameter. And this Taylor expansion requires to compute first order derivatives, first order multivariate derivatives. So it requires us to compute the gradient, uh, which we've done already in the previous video, but it also requires us to compute the second order derivatives, which are captured in this Hessian. And this Hessian is a matrix with rows I and columns J given by my second order derivatives of my error WI WJ. And this Hessian matrix is symmetric. It is symmetric because I can change the order here. Uh, the derivatives uh, in this uh, vector space commute basically. So I am, I am allowed to change this order and that tells me that the Hessian is symmetric. For now, let's just focus on the recipe. So um, now I want to make my update rule uh, using a optimal step in the right direction. And I'm going to pick the step delta w that minimizes my approximated uh, error function. So that means, so that's, that's what I've explained over here, right? I made an estimate of my error functions. Those are those green contours. And I take as next data points, the w that minimize this, uh, this approximate error landscape. Okay, and now my approximation. So this e tilde is a quadratic function of this uh, step size delta w, right? So you have a linear component and a quadratic component. And so it means it has one globally optimal step size. And we will find this by taking uh, the derivative with respect to my step size and setting it to zero. That's what, we, what we've been doing so far in any of these optimization problems, right? So we take the derivative and set it to zero, solve it, and that will give us my optimal value. And now we're going to do the same for this uh, approximated uh, error function. So that means, okay, we're going to compute the derivative with respect to delta w. So the derivative with respect to delta w of this term, so not to w, uh, but to my step size. So this is the parameter in this approximation. Um, okay, so we compute the derivative uh, that will give me uh, the gradient itself. Then we take the derivative of this quadratic term. We see delta w over here. So this one drops out and we multiply this with a two. Uh, we've seen this actually uh, before that um, the derivative of such a quadratic function will be uh, two times a half times well, what we had transpose Hessian. And of course this uh, factor cancels out. So let me just remove it. Okay, so this is the derivative with respect to the step size delta w and we set it to zero. And this is the, my optimality criterion, right? So this is what we're going to solve now for my step size uh, delta w. Okay, let's solve this. So we move the gradient to the other side 
and then take the transpose on both sides. So this is minus the gradient transpose. All right, I moved this to the other side and then took the transpose of both sides. And since the Hessian is symmetric, uh, this transpose doesn't do anything. And then we see that we have find uh, we find the optimal solution for the step size uh, to be minus Hessian inverse gradient. Okay, now let's do a dimensionality check or uh, let's see what, what we're dealing with here. So in our convention, the gradient is a row vector. Um, so taking the transpose turns this into a vector. So matrix vector multiplication gives me a new vector. So my new update step is again a vector. So that's correct because W is a vector. And now we take uh, a direction in this step. So we have our previous uh, weight uh, vector and we add now this step to it, which is given by minus Hessian inverse uh, times the gradient transpose of my uh, error. Okay, so let me quickly get back to this figure. So we were analyzing, uh, we're making an approximation of my error function around my initial uh, W uh, that gives me this, for example, this quadratic form over here, which is given by this Taylor uh, expansion, this Taylor approximation. And then we solve basically um, for the minimal value of this error function that gives me the next, uh, that actually gives me a delta W relative to this uh, initial uh, W naught. So we jump in that direction and that gives me the next weight. So that's what you see over here. This is the update rule. Okay, so we see that, um, well, first of all, we do not need to define a step size because we immediately jump to the next um, optimal location uh, given our approximation. So, and what we need to compute then is the gradient. Well, we've done that so far. Um, I'll go over that in a minute. And we have to compute the Hessian. And that's also what I'm going to show next. As for the gradient, we showed that in the previous lecture for, um, if I say my error, if I say that my, uh, let me write it here, if my total error of W is given by the sum over all its components. So that's denoted with this EN. Okay, this is my error. And this is the gradient uh, vector. Uh, so we took the transpose here of my error, of my individual error for this data point. So that was just the error that I make for that data point times uh, the vector. So for the full uh, gradient, it looks like this. So the sum over all data points of yn minus tn phi n. So, and we can write this in matrix vector notation as followed, follows. So we have this um, design matrix containing all these uh, feature vectors times my prediction vector. So stacking all my predictions in one vector minus uh, the target, oh, the target vector. Because recall that the data matrix or the design matrix is of size n by m. So for each data point, I had a feature vector and I stack them on top of each other. So I have all these rows of data points. And then if I take the transpose, that means I'm summing, I'm multiplying over the nth, uh, over the n axis of the data, the axis. So I'm multiplying all these errors with the corresponding uh, basis functions. And that will give me a vector of length m. Okay, so we compute the gradient in one step via this matrix vector multiplication. Now also the Hessian, we can write it in this matrix uh, vector form um, by computing, by writing out the i and j components of this matrix. Now we already computed uh, the gradient with respect to the j component, That's, that looks like this, this difference vector times the j component of uh, well, the end data point, the end uh, feature vector. So this thing over here is essentially d, d, w, j of my error function. And now I'm computing the i derivative of this thing. And remember, we're computing derivative with respect to w, and the w is hidden in this uh, y n, right? Uh, because each y n, uh, let me write it over here, each y n is given by the logistic sigmoid of my w vector transpose phi n. 
Okay, so let's compute this, the derivative with respect to w of this thing. This thing doesn't depend on w, so I have to focus on the product of y n times phi j. So that gives me the sum n s1, the sum remains there, phi j of data point x n, and then the thing that actually depends on w, so the d y n d w i. Okay, so this thing is what I uh, have to compute. And it's also this thing of which we already computed the derivative um, previously. So let me write it above. The derivative of this thing is y n times one minus y n phi i x n. Okay, so let me insert that. That gives me the sum from n is one to n of y n one minus y n phi i phi j. Okay, so the i jade component of the Hessian is given by this expression. Now let's also write this in matrix factor notation. So that gives me, so let's start off with this. So this was my express, expression for the Hessian. So y n phi n phi n transpose. And I can write it like this because uh, the Hessian is an m by m matrix, where for each i and each j I have m components. So essentially I'm multiplying, uh, making this multiplication for every i, j. And I can do this uh, by taking uh, the, the product of my factor n with its trans transpose. So that's essentially this thing describes this for every i, j. Okay, so this gives me uh, the Hessian matrix. Let me see if I can also reduce this uh, sum over n. Um, so we can do that by working again with this design matrix, uh, transpose some diagonal matrix. Okay, so what is happening here? Each design matrix is again a dimension n by m. So this will be, with the transpose, this will give me a matrix of m by n. So I sum over the n axis also for this case, where since this is going to be now a diagonal matrix for which there are n so the, the diagonal is given by yn1 minus yn, and the off-diagonal components are set to zero, so meaning if n unequals m. Okay, so now we also have an expression for uh, the Hessian uh, in this matrix uh, notation. Okay, so please verify yourself that this is indeed the case, right? That I can use these uh, design matrices with a diagonal matrix R, which essentially encodes these weights or these uh, components um, of N. Okay, so we have just derived the gradient and the Hessian uh, given the things that were provided to us, right? We have this data set, uh, which we uh, turn, uh, use the basis functions to create new feature vectors for each data point. So that's all encoded in this data matrix. And these are my predictions and these are my targets. And with that, I can compute the gradient and I can also compute the Hessian. Now that we have actually computed the Hessian, we can show that indeed the error function is convex. Um, where uh, we say that a function is convex whenever it's Hessian is positive definite. And positive definite basically means that if I multiply this Hessian on the left and right side with some non-zero w, then it always returns some positive value. So if we can show that this is the case, then we have proven that our Hessian is positive definite and indeed across entropy a loss is convex. So let's uh, quickly do that. So we have computed our Hessian as follows, right? Using these design matrices, which were of size n by m, so we have n uh, data points and m uh, feature vectors. And then we have this diagonal matrix, so a sort of weight matrix, which is of size n by n, which for each data point uh, uh, assigns the following weight, so the product of these two uh, probabilities. Okay, so what, what I'm going to show next is that for every uh, w, transpose Hessian W, that this returns some positive value. So let me just write this out. So it's FW transpose times my design matrix transpose times R times phi times W. And what I'm going to do next is make use of the fact that each of these YNs, they're either bigger than uh, zero and uh, smaller than one. 
meaning that I can take the square root of these diagonal elements. So actually, I can, this allows me to write R as the product of these two uh, square roots, where I'm defining the square root of my matrix R as the diagonal matrix um, given by the square root of Yn times 1 minus Yn. Okay, I can do this, right? So this expression can be rewritten as W transpose my design matrix transpose square root of R square root of R phi W. And what we're actually essentially seeing here is we essentially take the scalar product between two, two vectors. So um, let me make that a little bit more explicit. So we're actually computing the product of this uh, vector. So this is a matrix. This is a matrix times a vector it gives me some new vector. And I take the transpose of this and I multiply it with itself. So that's essentially what is written over here. And the scalar product of a vector with itself uh, was down to taking the norm of this vector squared. So what we see is that we can rewrite uh, W transpose hash in W in the following form. And well, uh, a norm always gives me a positive value um, or it gives me zero when the vector is uh, zero, but we're considering all non-zero uh, Ws. So this proves that for every non-zero W, my expression uh, returns some positive number. So my Hessian is indeed convex, so it satisfies this uh, criterion for all non-zero vector Ws. That's what we've shown over here. So indeed, my Hessian is positive definite, and this means that my error function, my cross entropy loss, is indeed convex. Okay, and then we have everything in place to uh, compute this update rule, where we have to compute the gradient, which we can do as follows, where we have to compute the Hessian, or actually the inverse of the Hessian. Uh, so this is actually a, a, a actually a computationally expensive step, but we can do this. And for the Hessian, we make use of this sort of diagonal weight matrix, where we weight this inner product between all these um, factors using the weights yn, 1 minus yn, and this followed from, uh, well, um, the computation of the second order uh, derivatives. Okay, and now with this, this in place, we can actually rewrite this update step to a particular form, um, which actually led to the fact that people started calling this the iterative reweighted least squares algorithm, um, because each update step can actually be formulated as a least squares problem where uh, the new uh, weights are obtained via uh, some equivalent uh, fitting uh, least squares problem. And I'm going to show this at fol as follows. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite this expression into a form uh, that corresponds to the solution to a, a weighted least squares problem. And I'm going to start off by factorizing this thing. So I move this thing up front. Um, okay, let me just write it out. Okay, you can see that this is still the same, right? So uh, this Hessian, uh, so this is actually the Hessian inverse. If I now multiply it with this, I end up with uh, W tau minus one. And if I multiply it with this thing, I obtain this uh, uh, form over here. So I'm just rewriting things now, because especially in the next step, it will start to become clear what I'm doing. So let me also just write that one out. Now, what I did here, I introduced this new uh, var variable, uh, z or z, um, such that I could write it in this form. So it's a, it's a lot of trickery going on here. Um, um, but I'm doing this because um, this term over here can then be canceled out because we have this r times r inverse, actually this phi times r times r inverse times this thing. So this entire thing then uh, can be get uh, rid of. And that would give me that this update rule is given in the following form. So this was the Hessian inverse as we saw it, R, Z. 
Okay, and this is what we wanted to see. We have that my new weights uh, at times at tau are given as follows. And just looking at um, this particular form, it resembles a lot the least squares solution, right? We've, we've seen this before, but then without the R. So if this R wouldn't be, be there, it would be just a least squares solution to some fitting problem. But now we introduce these R's. So these R are, are, are additional weights. And we have this Z, uh, and that's sort of the thing that we want to predict. So what kind of regression problem would this correspond to? I'm going to write that out over here. So this would actually be the solution to the following minimization problem. So we're looking for the weights W that minimizes a weighted least squares. Here we have W transpose phi n minus Zn, where this would be uh, the target in my uh, fitting problem. Uh, and these are like uh, additional weights that sort of weights uh, the importance of, well, the data points that I'm considering. So not to be confused with, with my parameters uh, W, right? These are just weights used to weigh the error basically that you're making. Okay, now that's the reason why people call this the iterative uh, reweighted least squares algorithm, because in every update step, I'm essentially solving a weighted least squares problem uh, where my weights are given by uh, these weights, which were also used in the Hessian computation. Basically the product of my probability for class one times the product uh, times the probability for my uh, other class, you know, a uh, one minus uh, the probability for class one. And my targets are given as follows. And to be honest, I cannot give a clear interpretation to this, but the point is in each step, we solve this um, uh, weight at least squares problem, where at each step we have to update the weights because these weights depend on W, on my current solution W, and I update my targets. Okay, so the main point of this slide was to show wh where does this iteratively re-rate at least squares uh, name come from. Um, so that this actually means that if we now draw this, so um, green here uh, shows the path obtained via stochastic gradient descent. So if we have curvature in our energy landscape, we sort of take a roundabout route because we just walk downhill uh, without considering like the overall landscape. Whereas in my second order um, optimization scheme, so the newton refson scheme, I actually take the curvature of my error landscape into account and that allows me to come up with a shorter uh, route. And the idea behind this newton refson optimization was um, that we uh, make an approximation of our error function like a quadratic approximation, solve it for its optimal location and jump to that point. Then again, we make this quadratic uh, approximation and immediately jump to that point where we start off with an, an initial uh, set of weights and the weights at the next time step where in each step, the new model parameters are obtained via this uh, weighted least squares uh, problem where at each <laughs> time step you solve uh, this um, weighted least squares problem with targets that are updated based on the current set of parameters and also my weights for this uh, weighted least squares are updated based on my uh, current predictions. Okay, now there's some clear advantages of newton refson over a stochastic gradient uh, descent. Uh, first of all, we have that there's no need uh, to define a step size. So that's nice, it doesn't depend on, well, this additional hyperparameter, the step size. Um, it also converges faster. Um, so faster convergence than stochastic gradient descent, but it requires uh, the Hessian. But most importantly, we need to compute the inverse of the Hessian. And this is computationally the most expensive step of this uh, update scheme, computing the inverse of the Hessian, because computing the inverse of a matrix often uh, scales uh, cubically with the number of elements in the Hessian, uh, with the number of basis functions that it considers. So it scales with m to the power three. 
And there's a lot of research going on on uh, figuring out which kind of matrices can be inverted quickly and also how to make maybe clever approximations to this. Uh, because it is nice that you can obtain your final globally optimal uh, solution with less steps. It's just that these steps are hard to compute and there are smart uh, approximations and alternatives to, to this actually. Okay, so what I described was an alternative for stochastic gradient descent, a second order optimization method. And at this point, I just want to uh, point out that such second order optimization methods do not just apply to uh, the logistic regression case, but uh, it could be applied to, to other type of optimization problems as well. In the next couple of videos, I'll be talking about artificial neural networks, also known under the name multi-layer perceptrons. We'll start off by interpreting neural networks as functions that compute feature vectors, uh, which are subsequently used for classification or for regression. Now recall that so far we have computed feature vectors from our inputs via fixed basis functions. In the next videos I'll show that we can actually learn such basis functions via neural networks. Now in this video I'll first explain what neural networks are and how they relate to these basis functions and then in the next video we'll go over some examples in the, const uh, in the context of function approximation. Now let's start by recalling how we were dealing with basis functions uh, so far. So the setting was uh, always we are provided with some data set and targets and then we want to solve some problem with it. And um, our data points were always considered uh, to be vectors in some d-dimensional uh, vector space. And then what we often did was uh, we first computed uh, feature vec vectors given my input. So my inputs were transformed to a new space uses, using basis functions and we can use the basis functions such that eventually a regression or classification problem becomes easier. And so far we really um, picked these basis functions ourselves just by inspecting the data we thought that maybe Gaussian Bayesian functions or maybe polynomials of a certain order uh, would be useful to, to solve a problem with. Um, okay, another thing is we typically use uh, set the, the, the zero basis function to one because that in allows us to incorporate um, the bias in our models uh, by just uh, considering functions of the form, so linear functions in the regression case for example, just taking the scalar product of my basis functions or my basis feature vectors with a set of weights. So then I obtain a linear model a linear function of w but it's a non-linear mapping because I first pull this x uh, through my uh, basis functions. Okay and then for linear regression um, we uh, were working with targets that could take on any uh, value on the real line so it was a continuous fitting uh, problem uh, so we do not work with any activation function we just work with this linear model. Now in the classification setting, our targets uh, took on binary values, so they could either be 0 or 1. Uh, so we had to work with a, a, a nonlinear activation function that basically ensures that we have this uh, property. And then we come up, can come up with uh, proper um, classification frameworks and optimization schemes. Um, for, for example, for binary targets, uh, an optimal approach uh, was proven to be logistic regression, in which case we still have this linear component over here. So that actually leads to linear decision boundaries in the end. Uh, but we have this nonlinear function over here. So this nonlinear activation function. So for classification, we considered so far generalized linear models. So a linear component, linear in W, uh, but overall nonlinear because we have this uh, uh, activation function. Okay, so that's what we've seen so far. And I also said that uh, maybe we also want to learn the basis functions ourselves because now we're hand designing them. We made choices there and uh, for low dimensional cases, we could still do it. But for higher dimensional cases, it's very hard to come up with a proper choice for basis functions. So ideally, we want to make this part of the learning uh, procedure. And that's uh, precisely uh, what we're going to do uh, when we optimize neural networks. Okay, now let me remind us again that uh, for convenience, we will work with a feature vectors which have like a constant one as the first component and then uh, the original data points, the original vector. So we prepend our data vectors with a one such that we can include the bias uh, 
the bias parameter inside uh, the set of weights that we're going to consider. Okay, and now we take on the viewpoint on neural networks as uh, functions that work with adaptive basis functions to compute the feature vectors. Uh, so these feature vectors are then later used for uh, regression or for classification. Uh, but the learning of this basis function uh, will be part of the learning process itself. And these particular basis functions will be parameterized via generalized linear models. And this means that each uh, basis function takes on the following form, right? So the basis function is a function of x and it is parameterized by its own set of uh, parameters w. And, it's, and so this basis function is defined in the following way. So it says linear mapping um, followed by some nonlinear activation function. So this part is just a linear model and this part is a nonlinear function mapping, nonlinear, uh, what we call an activation function. So to make this a little bit more explicit, our uh, linear part really consists of taking a linear combination of my input values uh, weighted with the corresponding uh, well, weight values. And these Ws, those are parameters that now become part of, of the learning procedure. And once we've linearly transformed our inputs, uh, we pull it through this uh, activation function. So we see that each basis function um, is now defined by some generalized linear model. Okay, and now we have defined our basis functions, which are parameterized uh, by a set of uh, weights W, which we all are now also going to learn. Okay, but now we have these basis functions and we want to solve problems with it. And we're doing this just like we've been doing uh, so far. So for the regression case, we just work with a linear model. So a linear model uh, applied to uh, my feature vectors. And these are my now computed feature vectors. And I'm going to take linear combinations of this to make a prediction for Y. So let me write this out. So this looks like my linear model at the scalar product with my new feature vector. Um, my new feature vector, I can write it in this way, W1 transpose X. And you see, I'm now indexing uh, the set of weights, right? Because this uh, set of parameters is associated with my first step of transformation. So uh, used in my basis functions. And then the second set of, of weights is used in my output layer that these contribute to my final output prediction. And what I did over here, I defined this matrix. So this a big W1 to be, um, well, the collection of all my basis function um, factors, right? So if I put them all next to each other, so let me do that. So each, a uh, basis function had its own set of uh, uh, linear parameters w and if I put them next to each other then I can obtain the predictions or the feature values for each m uh, in one go via this matrix vector multiplication where each time I multiply uh, the weights of basis function 1 with my input and then of 2 with my input and that gives me this column vector this column vector of uh, new feature values which are then pulled through this activation function. So this thing over here is what we've been um, used to seeing like this. So a vector of uh, feature values obtained uh, from some basis function, but now the basis function is learned. And then we obtain our regression model as a linear model. So uh, this scalar product of my model parameters W with this learned uh, basis function. So really a regression uh, problem can be formulated as a as a two-layer neural network in that sense. So we have a first layer that computes the feature vectors, and then we have a final layer that uh, contributes to my uh, prediction. Now, similarly, we can uh, use these learned basis functions um, to, to solve classification problems. And in that uh, setting, we work with generalized linear models, uh, but now it's a generalized linear model um, using my learned uh, feature vectors. So my feature vectors were obtained by this uh, weight matrix uh, one with my feature vector X. Where again, in this matrix vector multiplication, I multiply the set, the set of weights for each basis function with the input, the next basis function uh, for this input, and then pull it through this activation function. So again, this thing over here gives me my learned uh, feature vector. 
And then in a classification setting, we use as activation function, we use the logistic sigmoid, or in the multi-class uh, classification case, we worked with a softmax function to turn uh, these values into probabilities. Okay, so what I just uh, showed essentially defines two layer neural networks. And in the upcoming slides, I'll, I'll show some examples of deeper uh, neural networks. Uh, but these are just uh, two layer neural networks and we gave them the interpretation of uh, basically working with learned basis uh, vectors, basis functions. Okay, so that defines a two layer neural network and in as a model, as a mathemat mathematical model is given as follows. Uh, but we are also going to get used to these network diagrams. This is what you typically see when people explain how they design the neural networks to, to others. They work with these kind of visualizations because those are often more uh, easily, easier to interpret than these equations. And I'll show some example later on where this definitely is the case. So let's go over the components of multi-layer perceptrons of neural networks. So first of all, we have the input units. Um, so we have an input vector x, um, which is prepended with a one. So we have x1 up to xd. And each of these components is called an input unit. So each such value is represented with one of such uh, dots over here. So I have a d dimensional, a d plus one dimensional input because I prepended a one. And then each input unit is represented as one dot. So this dot, you should really think of it as taking on just one real number, right? It's, it's one of these components within my vector. Then we have what we call activations, denoted with A, and they're also indexed uh, with some index M in this case. So this A is a vector of activation, so A1 up to AM. And this a vector is obtained via this matrix vector multiplication, right? My first uh, model parameter is W uh, times X. And this gives me an M dimensional feature vector, though it's not yet the final feature vector because this is just a linear part. And we first have to pull it through this uh, nonlinear activation function to, to turn this into uh, what we refer to as the basis uh, function feature vectors uh, so far. Okay, but before we get there, um, we do this linear mapping and this leads to what we call the activations. So let's draw that over here in yellow. Then we have what we call hidden units denoted with Z and also with the same index M because these ZMs, those are the feature vectors obtained from the activations by really activating them with the corresponding activation function. Okay, so we have all these hidden units ZM and they're obtained by applying this activation function. So by applying the activation function H to A, and that gives me the corresponding uh, hidden unit. And these hidden units will in turn be used as inputs for the next layer, right? So these hidden units are the feature vectors at that point used to well, obtain my new feature values uh, using this linear uh, uh, combination of the hidden units. But we're considering here uh, the two layer uh, neural network. So my next layer would be then uh, my output layer and the units or the values at the output are called the output units. And these output units are typically denoted with Y with a particular index K. So this is the K output unit. And these output units, as said before, form this vector of outputs, a Y1 to YK. And these are obtained with my second uh, linear mapping, with my second set of weights from uh, my hidden units. And this would then give me my k dimensional uh, output vector. Okay, so each value in this output vector corresponds to one of such nodes and it's called an output unit. So this would be my k output value it's just a number it's just a real number so this is just a reminder at each node we should think that it replace some real value right and we call each of these values we call them well units so we have an input unit x uh, we have a hidden unit set m and we have an output unit uh, yk 
And then finally, we work with these uh, activation units. So each layer has its own activation unit. Uh, but typically, we just say we use one unit for how my network, except maybe for the output where we may maybe make specific choices uh, that depend on the problem, right? In linear regression, maybe you do not want to have any output uh, activation, uh, but for logistic regression or for classification, you maybe want to apply a logistic sigmoid or a soft max to the output layer. Uh, but generally we say uh, we stick with one choice for um, activation function that turns my activations into the hidden units. Okay, so these are all the components of a multi-layer perceptron of a two-layer neural network in this particular case. Uh, now it's only two layers. So we start off with uh, an input unit. So that's all those uh, input values, XD. Those are transformed linearly via my weights uh, in the first layer to give me the activations, to give me the activations of the first layer. And these activations are in turn, in turn turned into um, hidden units, the set amps by applying this activation function H to my uh, activations and then those uh, hidden units uh, are used as inputs for the next linear model so that's why we apply this w now here that gives me all these uh, output units and then we can decide to apply uh, another activation units to my uh, an activation to my outputs so we have inputs x we have this matrix factor multiplication with my first set of, of weights uh, w1 that gives me in the end the activations and then it gives me the, the hidden unit. So this hidden unit factor uh, set, which is then transformed via linear uh, transformation with my set of parameters uh, W2. And that gives me my output activations. Okay, so uh, that explains all the components. Now let's just take a quick look at choices that we have for the activation functions. Um, what is listed here are some popular choices for activation functions. Um, the logistic sigmoid, that's classically uh, one that is used a lot in neural networks. Um, we, for now, used it uh, only for the, the output layers uh, to turn a problem into a logistic regression problem or a classification problem. We, worked, we, we already saw this uh, logistic uh, sigmoid before. So this is the logistic sigmoid. And it's drawn over here as this green line, right? So it, it squashes all the values um, of my linear model to the range uh, 0, 1. And that allows us to interpret things as uh, probabilities, uh, essentially. Then what we see in red is the hyperbolic tangent. So the hyperbolic tangent, which is given by e to the power x minus e to the power minus x divided by e to the power x plus e to the power minus x. Okay, that's indicated here in red. Um, it also has this nice uh, squashing property, but now it, it squashes all the, uh, the values between the values minus one and plus one. And it has this sort of linear uh, part over here. So close to, to zero, this function is, is linear. Uh, but if my uh, activations take on very high values, uh, then those get uh, truncated at the value one, essentially. So those two are classically quite popular choices, uh, but it turned out that if you go uh, deeper into your networks, then uh, these activation functions aren't actually uh, so nice to work with. And this has to do that with the fact that uh, when we optimize these models, we have to compute the gradients. That, that, uh, what, that is what we have seen also in the other models. We apply gradient descent uh, type of methods and apply chain rules. And now if you pull things to such uh, activation functions, then you also need the derivative of these kind of things. And you see that both the logistic sigmoid and the hyperbolic tangent, they sort of flatten off uh, to some constant value. That also means that the derivatives at these locations will take on very small uh, values. And this leads to numerical instability in the end. And when we optimize neural networks with, uh, with such activation functions, and the type of activation function that doesn't suffer from this is the rectified linear uh, unit or ReLU. And that is given by the max of zero with A. So this function really is a linear model of A. So it has this linear part and everything below zero is just mapped to the value zero. So it's, it's like a threshold uh, function.
So this rectified linear unit, the ReLU, is by far uh, the most popular activation uh, function at the moment uh, uh, out there. And then I have a small but very important remark about working with activation functions. Um, because you could, maybe you're tempted to think, okay, why do we need activation functions? Things become much more simpler if we don't apply them. And the main reason actually is that it doesn't make sense if you build deep neural networks or neural networks without activation functions. Because if you do not apply an activation here, then I just concatenate linear operations one after each other. And a concatenation of linear operators in the end result in one netto uh, linear operator. So then you assign all these weights and in the end uh, you could have done this directly with one uh, linear model. Um, so in order to make things uh, complex and interesting, we do need activation functions. Otherwise, we just end up with some linear model. Okay, so let me just write that down over here such that we don't forget it. We need activation Okay, so don't forget about this. We do need activation functions, otherwise we're just learning uh, linear models. And then we don't need all this uh, complicated uh, structure over here. Now let's uh, familiarize ourselves a bit uh, further with neural networks by considering types of neural networks that we actually already saw throughout this course. First of all, we already worked uh, with one layer neural networks. So these are just linear models, uh, right, or, or maybe generalized linear models, and we work with them in the linear regression case. So really what we did in the linear regression case, we said, okay, we want to predict our outputs or maybe the target means of my target distributions um, with a parameterization uh, factor W, just via this linear mapping from input to output Y. So that's essentially what you see over here. All the input units are multiplied with the corresponding weights and that gives me my output y. And in the regression case, we wanted to regress any value on the real line. Uh, so we do not apply any activation function or in this case, the activation function is just the identity operator. Okay, so we already encountered uh, one layer neural networks. Uh, we also encountered them in the uh, classification case where we were building classification models for each class uh, K, we wanted to predict some probability and this probability was given by such a generalized linear model. So again, a linear uh, combination of the input. So each K output, each K class had its own set of weights, a W. And when dealing with K classes, we applied the softmax, the softmax uh, activation functions uh, to these activations such that these outputs could be interpreted as the probability for class K given my input X. So that looks like this, right? So each output uh, prediction YK was obtained via a linear combination of my inputs. And then uh, we applied a softmax activation function uh, to, to all these uh, output uh, predictions. So that describes a linear classification model uh, with K classes as a one layer neural network. So those are just one layer uh, neural networks. That's not super interesting, right? It's just regression or just uh, uh, classification via generalized linear models. So things become interesting when we go deeper. And what this essentially means is that we have all these uh, mappings, so a linear transformation followed via a nonlinear activation uh, function that gives me a new feature vector. Again, linear combination, activation function. So we apply all these mappings and you could think of it at, as in the end, ending up with a very complex uh, basis function as a function of x, right? This value is obtained via all these mappings. So it's a function of x in the end, where this basis function is then essentially parameterized by all the weights uh, before this. And then once we have obtained such a feature vector, uh, then these values can be used to make our final predictions to solve the problem that we were actually dealing with. And so this could be a multi a multi-target regression problem, or it could be a multi-class classification problem, or whatever the problem is that, that you're working on, right? So we can build very deep neural networks, where deep means really uh, how many uh, layers you have. So a deeper, networks, a, a deeper network has a lot of layers. So we can essentially now build very deep networks to come up with very uh, intricate, very complicated uh, feature vectors at this point. And this also exposes why we really like to work with such 
uh, diagrams because if I write this out uh, as an equation it looks something like this. So this equation corresponds to my diagram where we have these uh, inputs x, so those are my input units, those are transformed via the weights in my first layer um, to the activations, so the activations of the first layer and those activations are in turn transformed via uh, the activation functions into the corresponding hidden units. So each node, each value over here is called a hidden unit. Then uh, let me use a different color. Then uh, the next layer gives me the values of the next uh, hidden unit. And these hidden units are again used as input for the next layer. So a linear transformation followed by this activation gives me uh, the, the activations and the hidden uh, units at layer 3, which is then again linearly transformed followed by a final activation and this gives me my uh, outputs uh, y. So this is my neural network written out and it's nothing else as a, a stacking of linear layers, linear transformations followed by a pointwise nonlinear um, activation. And I'm just putting this out here as a reference. Uh, sometimes it's more convenient to work with this notation where this uh, O dot or this circle uh, denotes uh, function concatenation. So I'm concatenating a linear transformation with a nonlinear one followed by a linear by a nonlinear one. So this a circle means function concatenation. Um, yeah, okay, it's just for convenience sometimes uh, we write this, sometimes we write this, but quite often in this course, uh, we just show uh, the diagram and then uh, focus on specific parts of uh, my neural networks and write those out. Okay, and then it becomes easier to actually design such neural networks to be become creative in how we uh, actually transform my inputs in the end to a particular uh, feature vector that, that is used for classification or regression. So we can allow for skip connections, for example. And these skip connections follow the same principle. So it means that each input unit can contribute to another uh, activation by just taking linear combinations of these uh, hidden or input units and they can skip a layer which means in this case that uh, the activation of the units in this layer is formed by taking linear combinations of my uh, hidden units at the previous layer plus taking linear combinations of my inputs and we could decide to give such a layer such sets of weights its own index uh, for I think we would still refer to this as a three layer neural networks because it has this, uh, as a function of depth, it has these three uh, trainable layers. Um, and this is what we call a skip connection. So this is what we refer to as a three layer neural network with skip connections. And sometimes we make these choices of skip connections because it is theoretically motivated. Um, and sometimes uh, we, we just do this uh, because we empirically found that it is useful to do uh, such a thing. Either way, we are allowed to be creative with how we design our neural networks. This also means that we can decide not to connect every node, every uh, unit with, uh, the, the, with all the units in the next layer. Uh, for example, here we omitted, we omitted, for example, this connection and this connection. So these connections are omitted. And this leads to what we call sparse neural networks. So sparse neural networks. And also this, this is a choice that we can make. And sometimes we make this choice because it's convenient because we don't have too much processing power and we want to sort of reduce the computational load. So we sort of uh, remove some connections uh, leading to a sparse neural network. Um, but sometimes we also want to impose a particular structure um, and we can do that by, well, selecting which uh, nodes connect to the other nodes. And this is particularly so the case when we talk about convolutional neural networks, um, which have additional weight sharing. So uh, apart from deciding where to place connections, we can also decide to assign the same weights to a particular set of connections. So in this example, for example, the, the blue uh, connections all have a weight one, the green connection all have a weight two, and the orange connections all have a weight tree. So this is what we call weight sharing, that there are multiple connections, multiple uh, weights that essentially share the same weight. 
So this means that we can define convolutions also by neural networks, where we recognize maybe this convolutional structure here by moving this pattern of weights to the next node. So we see that at every feature vector is obtained by a linear combination of a local uh, neighborhood, and this local neighborhood shifts. Now this convolutional structure is best explained with, uh, with an extra uh, visualization. Um, let's first of all start out by denoting such a linear mapping from input to the next activations uh, via matrix vector multiplication, right? So we have, uh, let, let this be or, uh, the, the vector of all my uh, input uh, units and let this be the vector of activations. Then each activation, for example, activation A1 is obtained by multiplying all these weights, so all the connections to A1 A1 uh, with, um, well, the input vector. So we have this uh, row vector uh, multiplication. And then in the next activation is obtained also uh, by this uh, row vector multiplication. So this entire stack of activations can be obtained by this big matrix. So if all these weights that fully parameterize uh, basically all possible uh, linear maps from input to the next uh, uh, layer. And we're now going to turn this into a convolutional form. So um, convolutions are applied to structured data on functions on some axis. So now, for example, we consider a 1D signal. So it assigns for every time point on this axis. So let's just index it. So with a 1 to D. So I split this signal into D values. So each point on the signal represents one value x1. So let that be your input uh, unit, input vector. Now what a convolution does, uh, you apply this convolution kernel at every location. So we take a linear combination of my neighborhood values and that gives me the new value um, for my output vector, for my output signal. So let me write this out. So when we consider my output vector A to be obtained by this convolution or correlation actually uh, with a correlation kernel W, then the jade component of this output vector is obtained via sum over some neighborhood. Let's denote it with Y minus J. So uh, this distance smaller than K. So K is some kernel size. This is a smaller than. Okay, the sum of the values within this neighborhood uh, with a, a set of weights that are aligned with my data point I. So this is my shifted uh, convolution kernel uh, W. So this correlation or convolution looks like this. So I move my set of weights, my kernel around, and every time I take this inner product, I, pro I multiply this weights with my signal over there. So I have three weights over here, and that gives me the signal at this point. Okay, so that's what's happening. In order to obtain the, the value for my output at this location, I multiply this kernel, these weights, with uh, the underlying input X for this uh, small neighborhood. Okay, so that's what you see over here, right? My first uh, output value, so somewhere over here, is obtained by multiplying these weights with the first couple of uh, input data points. Then I move to the next data point, uh, and then I shift my weights accordingly. And basically it means I multiply the rest with zeros, but then my output A2 is obtained via W1, W2, W3 times X2, X3, X4. So I shift my kernel uh, all the time and that's what you see in this uh, matrix. Okay, so what you see is that this uh, convolution operator uh, is essentially a matrix vector multiplication with an incredibly sparse matrix. So there's a lot of zeros, so that also means there's a lot of multiplications and computations that I do not need to perform. And then on top of that, we have weight sharing. So these weights are shared uh, over this diagonal uh, band, which corresponds to a shift um, uh, of, of, of my kernel. Okay, so this leads to an incredible reduction of uh, parameters that we need to train, uh, but maybe more importantly, it preserves the structure of my signal. If my input, uh, if my input represents some signal, then I want to preserve maybe this structure because I, well, uh, then I can apply this, this weight sharing. So convolutional neural networks are a specialized type of neural networks that are super efficient uh, with the parameters. And that also uh, contributes highly to the success of convolutional neural networks. Most applications nowadays are built on top of these uh, convolutional neural networks. So when we have such structured data structures, we do not want to uh, fully parameterize uh, my neural network, but only work with maybe 
a sparse set of connections plus weight sharing. Okay, enough about uh, convolutional neural networks. So in general, we have these feed forward architectures and we can be very creative in how we design this. Sometimes we want to design it because we want to preserve data structure, meaning that maybe we want to sparsify uh, our network and uh, uh, apply weight sharing. So we can decide not to connect every node to every other data point. We can also de decide to put the same weights along several edges. And we also may uh, decide to put uh, skip connections in our network. Okay, so anything is possible really as, as long as uh, you form these, uh, these units, these hidden units at some layer uh, exclusively by taking linear combinations of uh, units of lower layers. So really we want to preserve this feed forward uh, mechanism because once we start including uh, closed cycles, then we have uh, some dynamics that can become very unstable. And um, so generally that's not what you want and it becomes actually computationally impossible to, to work with this. So these ZJs can be any hidden unit from one of the lower, from one of the lower layers. So that wraps it up for uh, neural networks. So now we know what they look like, uh, what they are actually and how to construct them. Um, so in the next videos, we're going to explore what we can actually do with neural networks. One of the main reasons for the popularity of artificial neural networks is the flexibility of the approach. It turns out that neural networks can represent basically any function that you want to approximate to any precision, of course given enough model parameters. Now this is a fact given by the universal approximation theorem. And essentially it says that we can use neural networks for all sorts of problems where we want to recover complex function mappings from input to output. And so far we, for example, have been very much interested in finding such ma mappings from input to output in the context of regression and classification. Now this slide shows the universal approximation theorem. And we're not going to use this video to, to, prove, to prove this theorem. We're just going to use it to gain some understanding and see what this theorem actually implies. So let's start off by, by reading what it says. So first of all, we're dealing uh, with function f. So that can be any continuous function on a compact area RD. And this will be the function that we're going to approximate with a neural network. Now such neural networks are based on uh, these linear layers and activation functions and let now this h be the activation function so the activation function of my neural network uh, which can be anything but it cannot be polynomial so that's the only uh, criteria that we have so what we then consider we consider a two-layer neural network as we've seen in the, in the previous uh, lecture and we're going to use this neural network to approximate this function uh, that we started off with, right? And we're going to approximate it to some precision uh, epsilon, so some small positive number, such that for every point x, uh, these functions are very close to each other, um, where closeness is given by uh, this uh, small number epsilon. Then this theorem says that there exist uh, two-layer neural networks that can become arbitrary close to my uh, function uh, f that I want to approximate, where closeness is controlled via this epsilon parameter. And this means that the, the, the smaller or the higher my precision, the more number of hidden uh, units I need. But it is possible to find such a number of, of hidden units that allows me to construct such a model that comes arbitrary close to my uh, function. Switching back to this basis function viewpoint, my two layer neural networks uh, learn these basis functions uh, phi m of my input uh, x. And so basically these construct uh, complex feature vectors, which in turn are used in this linear model and that, that is given by my two layer uh, neural network. And this two layer neural network can then be arbitrary close to the function that I want to approximate. Now I want to gain some intuition of what this uh, theorem essentially tells us. And I'm going to do that by starting off with, with ReLU based uh, neural networks. So basically this theorem says I can choose any activation function I like as long as it isn't polynomial. Now uh, the ReLU, so the ReLU was this um, max of zero and a. 
so with the ReLU, I can also come arbitrary close uh, to any function that I want to approximate. And I'm go going to show this as follows. First of all, recall that this uh, first layer can be interpreted as generating these basis functions, right? I have m of such basis functions after the first layer, and these basis functions are defined by m of such linear mappings that are then uh, pulled to such a ReLU activation function. And this ReLU makes sure that all these values uh, become positive. Okay, so I have m sets of weights. Now let's take a look at, at the 1D case. So let's suppose my input is one-dimensional. Then what my first uh, set of linear weights does, it assigns some, some, some slope. So it creates these linear functions uh, by multiplying x with the weight of my first basis function uh, in the first layer plus some bias, okay? So that generates this, this linear function. Uh, and then I apply a ReLU to it. So I'm only going to take uh, the positive part of this. So that means that everything below zero is mapped to zero actually. And that actually gives me then my first basis function. So this would be phi one of X. Okay, now let's uh, consider a, a different M. So basically uh, the, the next activation in my first layer. So suppose maybe this one has a negative slope. So it would generate this linear function uh, given by uh, w2, so that was my uh, second uh, activation of the first layer times x, so that's this slope, plus some uh, bias. Okay, and also this one is then activated with the ReLU, which truncates everything at zero. So if I take the ReLU of this thing, um, well, we got this uh, positive basis function. So this would give me phi2 of x. Okay, now let's consider also a third basis function, which maybe has a slope and the bias, which creates this uh, linear function over here, which is also truncated at zero via this uh, uh, ReLU activation function. So that will give me the third basis function. Okay, so what I just drew were, were, was this first layer, right? So this these linear components, I had M is a tree, I had three of such uh, basis functions in the end that for every X provide a particular activation. Then what happens in the next layer is I'm going to take linear combinations again of these activations. So essentially linear combinations of these basis functions. So that, uh, that allows me to give a response for every possible X. Uh, so let me draw that what's happening here. So that means also my final output is going to be a function of X and it will be given by uh, the weighted sum. So really this linear combination. So I assign a weight in my second layer to each of these basis functions. So that's what my output is going to look like. Okay, now let's move from, from left to right. So um, on the left, we only have really one basis function that is active and let's just give it a, like a positive weight, uh, weight one. So I really replicate this uh, basis function over here. Then my function remains a zero for a while. For a while. And then this particular basis function kicks in. Let's also give it a positive weight. So, well, the function uh, starts increasing. Then this uh, particular basis function kicks in. And let's assign it a negative weight. So if I add this slope, well, make it negative. Let's subtract this slope to this one. Uh, then maybe the function starts to look something like this. So essentially what is happening here that with such a uh, ReLU based activation functions, I create basis functions that uh, look something like this, that are only activated for particular values of X and are uh, zero otherwise. And then if I start to make linear combinations of these basis functions, then I get the result that my uh, resulting functions, they will become piecewise linear where we transition from one linear piece to the other. So here I have a linear piece, here it's a constant zero, here I have a linear piece, and here. The transitioning between these uh, points take place at the locations where my basis functions uh, become active. Okay, so that's the core idea behind uh, neural networks with values that I'm able to construct functions that are piecewise linear. And then the universal approximation theorem says that I can use these piecewise uh, linear functions, so these two layer uh, neural networks to approximate any uh, function to arbitrary precision. So let this be the function that we want to approximate. And let this, for example, the, be the epsilon interval 
uh, which we need to stay within. So that defines the regions uh, that I'm allowed uh, to pass through with my function. Then if I'm going to approximate this with a piecewise linear function, I could do something like this, like a segment over here, over here, over here. So in that sense, I can approximate this function with only three uh, basis functions. Now, if I'm going to reduce the interval, um, so I make epsilon smaller, then I have to stay close to my data, or I have to stay close to my uh, signal that I want to approximate. Uh, okay, then I can still can basically work with more of these uh, piecewise linear functions. And in this particular case, I need, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, basis function so with m is 9 I can now approximate my signal uh, to a closer precision so uh, for a smaller uh, epsilon okay so this is a sort of visual proof that I can approximate any uh, continuous uh, signal uh, with just these piecewise linear uh, ReLU networks up to some arbitrary precision and if I want to approximate this closer and closer I basically need more and more of these uh, uh, basis functions and with more basis functions, I mean more and more hidden units. Uh, with this, this M represented the number of hidden units in my uh, two-layer uh, neural network. Okay, uh, then it follows by induction that uh, deeper neural networks also have this property. And then we can talk about um, what is the most efficient way of starting approximating or constructing these complex functions. And let's consider the following. Let's, let's say we have a neural network with L layers. So this is a deep neural network. Uh, then we can appro approximate this uh, deep neural network with a shallow neural network, uh, let's say with only L, L prime layers, because that's what our universal approximation theorem uh, says, right? I can approximate any function, so also this deep neural network uh, with a shallow uh, neural network with only L prime uh, layers. Right? And I can approximate this deep neural network then with the shallow neural network up to some arbitrary precision parameter epsilon. Then it turns out uh, that the number of hidden units that I need to approximate this deeper neural network scales exponentially with decreasing epsilon. So with, if I want to be more precise, I need an exponential growth in the number of hidden units. And this in turn implies that uh, approximation with deep neural networks is more uh, parameter efficient. Now maybe that, let's take a second thought on that uh, in the context of these uh, ReLU networks. So in ReLU networks we saw that the expressive power of such a, a ReLU based deep neural networks is associated with the number of linear regions, right? So because we have a ReLU network leads to these piecewise linear uh, neural networks and well, the more pieces I have, the more accurate uh, my predictions or my uh, approximations become. And the number of regions that I can represent with uh, ReLU-based deep neural networks uh, scales uh, with the width. So it scales polynomial in width, but it scales exponentially with depth. And in this case, this D is uh, the input uh, dimension. So the most efficient way of, of gaining more region is not to, to widen my networks or to add more hidden units per layer, but simply to go deeper and consider more layers, right? Because then let's say I have a fixed number of parameters that I can spend uh, and I can distribute them over my network, design different networks so I can make choices. And the number of parameters as a function of width uh, scales quadratically because um, in these neural networks, I want to connect every input to the output of the, well, the next layer. So that's, uh, let's say, width times width, number of parameters I need there. And then for each layer, uh, I, I need this uh, quadratic number of, of, uh, of parameters. So my total number of parameters is given by width squared times depth. So when I'm then told, okay, this is the number of parameters that you can spend. Now make your uh, choices based on the width and the depth of the networks. Uh, then, um, well, it's clearly that most expressive power is gained by going deeper uh, with maybe less neurons per layer, so with less uh, hidden units per layer, um, than staying shallow with more neurons per layer. And then this also explains the popularity of deep neural networks versus shallow neural networks, simply because these deeper neural networks were able to, to perform more complex tasks. And this was sort of empirically discovered, but it was also theoretically proven via such uh, statements. So building deeper neural networks 
is uh, better in terms of expressive power and the, the type of problems that you can solve than uh, staying shallow. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of such uh, function approximations. Um, maybe first of all, um, what kind of problem does this correspond to? Are we now talking about classification or are we talking about regression? We're talking about regression, right? Because our objective is to map any input to a corresponding output uh, value. So these input output pairs are now given via my ground truth function f of x. So in this particular case, f of x is x squared. And we sample 50 points of this. So these are these blue dots. So those form my input output pairs, which we're going to reconstruct with a neural network. And our neural network is a two layer neural network with only three hidden units and a 10 tangent hyperbolic activation function and only one linear output, right? Because I want to predict this particular uh, value. So my neural network really looks something like this. So I have my input X and then we have this hidden unit. So I have only three hidden units. So this would be set one and I apply a 10 H on these uh, activations on these hidden units. And these are then combined via my uh, output uh, weights, so w2, to my prediction. Okay, and recall that these hidden units, like just before the output layer, take on the interpretation as my feature vector, right? So these hidden units as a function of x for my basis functions, for my basis functions that I can use to obtain my final prediction. And you see with only three of such basis functions, we can take linear combinations of these to, to form this uh, parabolic uh, shape over here. So we actually have a perfect reconstruction. Now figure B is then, uh, we're trying to approximate a sine of X. And also here we see, nice, so that's really nice, this idea that, that we're learning these basis functions. And with these three type of basis functions, I can assign weights to this basis function and that would give me the sine uh, reconstruction. Now these are nice smooth continuous functions but we can also approximate for example uh, the absolute value of x and then we have this a sharp transition going on over here so overall we have a good approximation but we see that the approximation wiggles a bit and here it takes a shortcut so um, of course we need some we make some errors and this basically implies that we need more hidden units to also represent these sharp uh, details. And then in figure D, we try to approximate the, the heavy side step function uh, HX. So it really takes on the value zero below this threshold and then it jumps uh, to one. So also again, a very sharp transition. Uh, so we see that actually our neural networks learns these basis functions that are also on or off uh, at particular uh, regions. And well, a linear combination of well, these basis functions then allows me to make this uh, step function approximation. So these are just some examples of functions that we can approximate. And in practice, that's also what we're doing with regression problems, right? We want to recover some, some, some function mapping. We do not know it, but we have these input output pairs and that's what we recover. And basically our universal approximation theorem says that, well, if my network is deep enough or if it's wide enough, at least uh, I would be able to represent it. And now the challenge is of course, to actually find uh, this particular model. Uh, using, for, for example, gradient descent optimization of some uh, loss. Uh, I'll talk about it in, in the upcoming videos, but that's essentially what we're doing here, function approximation. Okay, and then I want to uh, give this example again, go back to this ReLU uh, approximations, because I really like this idea of, of piecewise linear uh, function approximation and the idea that we have these basis functions uh, that are learned uh, in this process. So this is the result if I want to uh, approximate the sine wave uh, with a two layer uh, neural network uh, with only three hidden units. And so this is when I trained it and it converged. And this is for example, what I start off with. So I initialize with some random weights um, and biases, and then I'm going to minimize some loss function. So I make all these errors and I want to minimize these errors. And that's a criterion that I'm minimizing. And then I apply some iterative scheme over here and you see that my basis functions start to adapt to something useful, right? And we also see that the points where these uh, piecewise linear functions transition uh, exactly take place at the point where my basis functions are 
uh, active or inactive. Okay, but it cannot come perfectly close, right? Because it's too simple a model. Uh, for example, especially here, I, I'm making some errors. So um, if we really want to improve our representation uh, or approximation, then we really should increase the number of, of hidden units in our network. So that's shown over here in, on, in the right figure, right? So let's say I initialize my model randomly with a set of weights. So each, uh, let's say, basis function gets its own slope and an offset. Uh, and then I start... Uh, this learning process and I'm going to optimize my weights iteratively and you see it nicely converges to the actual signal and again we see that we actually have learned all these nice basis functions with a particular slope and a particular offset like an on off uh, location and that determines these uh, transition points okay but this is just essentially another example of uh, my universal approximation theorem at work where of course it's the fact that I worked with ReLU activation functions to obtain these nice uh, piecewise linear uh, approximations. So all this was talk about regression essentially, but function approximation also takes uh, a role in the classification with neural networks, right? So uh, let's suppose I have this data and it's drawn from some underlying distribution and these underlying distributions determine a true decision boundary. So that's what you see in green. So in green is what you see the, where the true posterior distribution for X equals the posterior distribution for uh, class two. So these decision boundaries are essentially obtained as the, the zero level set or some level set of a, a function that we are now going to approximate. Okay, so this is then a classification problem where the blue points correspond to class one, for example, and the red points correspond to class Two. So then again, let's think about what we're doing. So we're, um, how many inputs do we have? Well, we have two inputs. We have this two dimensional data set. Um, how many output units do I need? So I'm now designing my neural network, right? So how many output units do I need? Right, I actually only need one output, right? Because I have this uh, binary classification task. So the probability for the other class is given by one minus my probability for the first class. I could still encode this with actually two outputs and then work with a softmax, uh, but this is completely unnecessary, right? It's a waste of, of parameters. Uh, so I only consider one uh, output and I'm just going to make a choice to work with only two uh, hidden units. And I'm going to work with a 10H activation function. And because I'm considering classification, my neural network should, should spit out a number between zero and one because my prediction should, should represent some probability. So my output activation is going to be sigma, the sigmoid. Okay, so then my objective is, is really to, to recover this true posterior uh, distribution. And okay, now I'm, I'm training this neural network and this, this red line is what comes out. So this red line is obtained via my uh, two layer neural network with only two hidden units. Okay, so this is a very simple approximation. It does make this uh, division quite okay but if I want to really improve on this uh, so essentially if I want to reduce my epsilon in my function approximation recall that I'm approximating this function now with a neural network then essentially this tells me in order to represent such complex shapes I should increase the number of uh, hidden units okay to conclude uh, we can formulate regression as well as classification problems as uh, function approximation problems where in the regression case we really want to recover the true function map mapping between input output pairs and in classification we can consider it as approximating uh, my uh, posterior distributions uh, then the universal approximation theorem then says uh, that if I go deep enough or if I have enough hidden units then at least I would be able to to represent this this true function and now the challenge is, of course, to actually find this function. So now we're talking about optimization and minimizing error functions. And that's going to be the topic of the, the remaining videos on neural networks. Now that we familiarized ourselves with the concept of neural networks, uh, let's try to actually do machine learning with it. Now the starting point of any machine learning task is to describe the problem that you're going to solve and define how you are going to quantify the performance of your algorithm. Or put differently, you need to define a loss function or an error function that you want to minimize. 
Now, in this video, we briefly summarize the choices you should make when working on regression and classification problems with neural networks. So the setting is that we are provided with this uh, data set of, of measurements of data points and we want to do something useful with it. And in regression and classification problem, we also have targets uh, associated with it. But the, the point is we have this data, we want to do something useful with it. Uh, so we're going to design these neural networks that map these inputs to some output. And we can make a very uh, complex design over here that, that's up to you, uh, be creative with it. Uh, but, but now we're going to focus on the outputs and optimizing or actually training such neural networks. Uh, we're going to focus on how to find these uh, Ws. So the general steps is uh, define the number of outputs. This is basically given by the problem that you're going to solve, multi-class uh, classification or regression. So that defines the number of outputs. Uh, we also need to define an output activation function. Um, I'm going to say in the next slide how we are going to choose the output activation functions. Uh, but all of this is really motivated by what kind of loss function we're going to minimize. Now in this video, uh, we're going to use a probabilistic interpretation of the network outputs in order to, to make decisions on these choices that we need to make. And these choices depend on the problem that you're working on, right? So um, now let's first consider the regression problem. So the setting is we have all these input points. Uh, so each input is a d-dimensional vector and we want to map them to a corresponding target. And this corresponding target can take on any value on the real line. So now again, we resort to this probabilistic interpretation. So we have this uh, true uh, model that we want to recover that maps every x to a particular uh, target t, uh, but we have measurement noise. So we have uncertainty to take into account. Um, so instead of making just one point prediction, we consider uncertainty in our predictions with these uh, assumed uh, target distributions. And so far we've been modeling these target distributions via Gaussian, so via uh, normal distribution. So um, the probability for a given target, given my input parameters, is parameterized by this mean. So this is the model that we want to recover and there's some uncertainty on my predictions because I know my measurements aren't perfect. So that's described by this uh, variance or inverse uh, precision. Uh, but essentially we're making a prediction. So this Y, that's the model that we're going to recover and that models really uh, the mean of my uh, predictions. And now in this neural network setting, this thing is precisely the thing that we're going to model uh, with a neural network. Okay, uh, so that's the problem, that's the overall strategy. And then the set, so, don't, so then we're building a neural network that maps a single, uh, well, or a, a multi-dimensional input, so a d-dimensional input to a single target. So that also means that I need one single output unit, um, which is uh, given by my, so that's my final output activation and I need to apply, I need to make a choice on what activation function I should apply to my final uh, output activation. And since my targets are real valued, so they can take on any value on the real line, uh, maybe I do not want to apply any uh, activation function because, well, this uh, activation of the output is already some number somewhere on the real line. So when we talk about regression, we usually do not apply any activation function uh, to my output. Okay, so that defines our neural network. And then now, since we consider this in a probabilistic setting, we assume these target distributions. And then of course, we want to maximize uh, the likelihood, which corresponds to minimizing the negative log likelihood. So the error function uh, that I want to minimize, such that I get an optimal model, an optimal neural network, is given by uh, the negative log likelihood. Okay, and now we've seen this thing before, right? So we, we take the log of, of this normal distribution essentially, and that gives me this quadratic term. And these are factors that do not contribute to my error as a function of W, right? So equivalently, we can uh, minimize this sum of squared errors. Now let's take a look at uh, the case of binary classification. So we have these input uh, factors Again, uh, d-dimensional, but now my targets uh, can only take on the values uh, zero or one. And uh, again, we adopt this uh, probabilistic viewpoint on things. So we are going to say that my outputs, 
So my model, uh, this is my neural network. So this is my neural network that it models the probability of my target uh, value taking, my target taken on the value one. So uh, again, we assume uh, a target distribution which we want to model and we're now modeling uh, the Bernoulli distribution essentially. So my model spits out uh, the probability for class one and that also implicitly gives me the, the probability for the other class. And then we can use these labels uh, T to have this selection mechanism over here, right? So this is essentially uh, a Bernoulli distribution, um, which gives me the probability for class uh, one versus uh, the other class. Okay, so then if I have to decide uh, my output layer, how many, uh, how many neurons to put there, how many units, uh, so we're really assuming a single target which represents my, uh, the probability for class one. So uh, my neural network only needs one single output unit. So he denoted with A out, and we need to apply some activation function to it. Now, what would this activation function be? Now the targets are binary and the targets represent probabilities. So uh, they, they really the outputs, my model spits out a value between zero and one, or that's what it should do. And that's why we're going to rely on the sigmoid activation function because my model should represent the probability for uh, the target being one, and it should take on values somewhere on the range zero to one. Okay, so that motivates why we should use uh, the logistic sigmoid. Now again, because we adopt this probabilistic approach to modeling, uh, the natural choice to quantify how well my uh, probabilistic model performs is really to take a look at the likelihood, right? The likelihood that my probabilistic model actually describes uh, the data or the other way around that my data is described by such a probabilistic model. Uh, so we take a look, we want to maximize the likelihood, which corresponds to minimizing the negative log likelihood. And for uh, the logistic sigmoid case, uh, the log of my probabilistic models boils down to the cross entropy loss. So I want to minimize the sum over all my data points, the target the end times the log of my model plus one minus, so that's really the target for the other class, the log of one minus y x n. So this is my model. Okay, so when we're doing binary classification with neural networks, then my output uh, is a, a single output, uh, which is activated via the logistic sigmoid. And as loss function, we're going to minimize the cross entropy loss. All right, and then of course we can also consider classification with K classes. So my input is again a d-dimensional vector, but now my targets, now my target is also a vector. So for each data point n, I have a target that looks like this. So tn2, tnk, but each of these targets for each class. So for each data point n, I have k of such uh, targets, which take on the value zero or one. And this was uh, what we call the one hot encoding of my class, right? So with a one hot encoding, only uh, the, the, the target for my uh, Kate class takes on the value one and the rest is zero. So this is a one hot encoding of the Kate class. So the one hot encoding really encodes these true probabilities, right? So if um, the, it represents the Kate class and the probability for all the other classes is zero, uh, but it's one for that particular class. And now we want to recover such probability vectors that, so we want to really predict for each input X, um, well, the corresponding uh, class probabilities. So we want to um, sort of model this uh, target distribution and this target distribution is then a generalized Bernoulli distribution. So let me write that out. So it's really the product of all uh, probabilities for each class, but selected uh, via this uh, one hot encoding, right? So um, if I'm considering the Kate class, then only uh, the Kate model is active, right? So that gives me the probability for class K. So that's what we're trying to recover. So uh, uh, this probability distribution that we can test for every class uh, K, we can check what the probability is uh, for that class. So that's essentially given in this form. 
um, where each YK represents the probability for that class and the particular distribution that you see over here is typically referred to as the generalized Bernoulli distribution. Okay, so this means that now I have K targets, right? I have K of these probabilities that I want to predict. So this means if I want to design my neural networks, I should design it in such a way that it has K output units. Um, and these, so these output units represent the probabilities um, and they're obtained by applying some activation uh, function to my uh, output activations. So now we're considering uh, we want to predict probabilities. So that means that the sum over all my probabilities should equal uh, one, right? So this is what I want. I want the sum over all my uh, classes. So the probability for class K given my input X, which is modeled via my neural network. I want this sum uh, to sum up to one. And this is ensured by the softmax, uh, softmax activation function. So we saw before that this is uh, the, the generalization of the logistic sigmoid, right? Uh, with multi-class uh, classification problems, we can always formulate our probabilities in, in, in the context in the form of such a softmax uh, function. Okay, so that really describes my overall model architecture. I want to predict K output units and I want to use the softmax uh, activation function to really obtain my final probabilities from uh, the output activations. And now the corresponding uh, error that we want to minimize is of course again going to be the negative log likelihood of my uh, probability distribution. And that in the softmax uh, case again it gives me the cross entropy loss. So I'm going to sum over all uh, data points. So from n is 1 to n. And then I'm going to sum over all my classes, the true target TNK times the log of my prediction for that particular class. So this is uh, the cross entropy loss. This is the cross entropy loss associated with the, the, the K dimensional generalized Bernoulli distribution. So this is the loss that we're going to minimize. Okay, this then summarizes what we did, right? So we considered regression and we considered classification and now we want to design neural networks and define the loss functions that we want to minimize. Now in the regression case, in all cases we approach this from a probabilistic viewpoint. Now in the regression case, we assume a Gaussian target distribution because there's uncertainty in my predictions. And then I let my neural network make a prediction for the mean of these uh, distributions. And so that actually also tells us because this mean can take on any value on the real axis that my output activations, I have one output activation and it's activated with the identity activation function. And these ingredients together then tell me if I want to maximize uh, the likelihood associated with this uh, target distribution, I'm going to minimize the least squared error. Now for binary classification, we assumed a Bernoulli target distribution. So we really, my neural network makes a prediction for the probability for class one. Uh, and then the probability for both classes is given by this uh, at Bernoulli target distribution. And this also tells me that we want to work with uh, as output activation uh, function, uh, we want to work with the logistic sigmoid. So these ingredients together tell me that my loss that I want to minimize is going to be the cross entropy loss. And likewise, in the multidimensional case, we assume a uh, generalized Bernoulli distribution for K uh, classes and my neural networks uh, gives, makes a prediction for each of these classes. And to ensure that my output predictions are indeed, uh, can indeed be interpreted as probabilities, we need to apply a soft max function on all these output uh, predictions. Uh, and then again, we want to maximize the likelihood and this eventually boils down to minimizing the cross entropy loss. Now that we know how to design neural networks and are able to define uh, the loss that we want to minimize, let's recap how we can minimize losses via stochastic gradient descent. In this video, we're going to look at what it means to perform stochastic gradient descent in the context of neural network training. Now the setting is that we have just defined our neural network. So we know how many output neurons uh, 
I need and we know which kind of loss I have to minimize. This could be, for example, the least squares uh, loss in regression or uh, the logistic loss or the cross entropy loss in classification problems. And now our objective is to find the most optimal set of uh, model parameters W that really minimizes uh, this error function. And so far we have been really lucky that our error functions were always convex. So that meant that if we apply some gradient descent method or whatever uh, alternative, we always end up with a globally optimal uh, set of parameters uh, that really globally minimizes my error function. But now with neural networks with these complicated functions, which are highly nonlinear, I, no I no longer have this guarantee that my uh, error function is convex, which means that I can expect to observe several local minima in my uh, error landscape. And that is depicted over here. So this is my energy landscape and let's say I have two of such uh, valleys, uh, local optimal locations are these. So if I now apply gradient descent and I start at this point for example and I walk downhill, then I may end up in this local minimum and there's no way I'm going to get out of it because I just follow the gradient downhill, at this point the gradient is zero and all my surrounding in my surroundings all the gradients point uh, upwards basically so there's no way i'm going to ex escape my local minimum over here and i do want that because i want to go to the most optimal uh, set of parameters um, so how do we reach this global minimum now the short answer is we can there's no way we can guarantee that we will end up at a global minimum uh, but we can try to avoid local minima as much as possible and we are going to do this via uh, stochastic gradient descent. I'll explain this in a couple of minutes, how stochastic gradient uh, descent uh, helps with preventing to getting stuck in uh, local minima. But the challenge here is we are dealing with an error function which is not convex. Uh, so we have to deal with local minima. Now by far the most popular technique for optimizing or minimizing error functions in, in deep learning uh, is via stochastic gradient descent. And there's reasons for, for its popularity. First of all, it has a very simple update rule. Uh, it has a very simple update rule, maybe this one, because in stochastic gradient descent, I only approximate my gradients with, with one data point or maybe a few data points. So it has a very simple update rule, efficient to compute, but it has some properties that also prevents um, the, the, the gradient descent of getting stuck at local minima. But before we get there, let's review what gradient descent does. So we start off with an initial estimate of my model parameters W. So tau is uh, my tau iteration. And then I'm going to find my new set of parameters W by walking in the negative gradient direction, right? Because the gradient point upwards and I want to go downwards. So I take a step in the negative gradient direction uh, with some step size eta. And as I just explained, we're dealing with an error function that has a lot of local minima, so we quite easily get stuck at such a local minimum. So let's take a look at uh, this figure, which I uh, drew in preparation and which I'm now going to fill in. So the setting is as follows. So this gray region indicates some error function as a function, let's say, of two model parameters, W1 and W2. And I'm interested in obtaining this point over here. So this is my globally optimal uh, minimum. It's the lowest uh, error value I can find for all possible Ws. But then I have all these local minima, right? So uh, initially, of course, I do not know what my uh, optimal value will be. So I have to make an initial guess. And let's say uh, I start off with uh, this set of model parameters at, at tau is zero. So my initialization of the weights. Then what I'm doing with gradient descent, I'm going to make an estimate of this gradient or actually with full gradient descent, I make, uh, I actually compute the full gradient. So that's what this uh, arrow indicates. And I'm going to walk downhill and then again, check my gradient, walk downhill. Okay, so I walk downhill this len energy landscape or air landscape via gradient descent. And that actually leads to the result that I end up at this local minimum. And of course, if I would put my in initialization somewhere else, so maybe let's say over here, then a gradient descent will bring me to this local uh, minimum. And if I put my uh, initial weight over here, then maybe we would end up at the global optimal location. But because my energy landscape is 
is highly non-convex, um, I'm bound to end up at some local minimum. Okay, so that's the issue with uh, regular gradient descent. And now we're going to consider stochastic gradient descent. And this means that, now first of all, my error is uh, a sum of all these in individual errors. Uh, so that means I can also approximate my gradient by just computing the gradient for one data point. So the stochastic gradient descent method works as follows. So we choose some learning, some step rate uh, eta, we initialize, and then we sequen sequentially choose one point out of my data set randomly and use this, only this point to update my weights. Uh, so that gives me an estimate of, of the gradient based on the single data point and I'm going to use this uh, gradient to update my weights. And of course, instead of working with just a single data point, I could also maybe uh, average this gradient or take the sum of my error terms over a range of data points, uh, M. So maybe work with uh, 16 uh, data points to approximate my error. And that's what, and that is what you call a mini batch. So a mini batch of 16 of, su of such data points are, for example, used to approximate uh, the error. So I'm going to indicate that as follows. So I'm going to say that both of these uh, provide me an approximation of the gradient. So I'm going to de denote that with this uh, tilde over here. Okay, so now let's see how that would work. Um, I'm using this approximate gradient ID because now um, if I compute this approximate gradient at this point, for example, maybe it points in this direction because this energy error landscape looks slightly different for each data point. Maybe for one data point, it's more efficient not to change my Ws in this direction and for the other, it's efficient in, to do this in this direction. So for every data point, I would actually get maybe a different estimate of the gradient. So if I now do stochastic gradient descent, okay, I have a noisy estimate of the gradient. I take a step, I end up at this location. Again, noisy estimate. Uh, maybe that's somewhere over here. Maybe for this data point, it's in this direction. Okay, so I have these stochastic updates. And of course, that has still the chance that it end up at this uh, local minima. Huh? But because my uh, gradient estimate is so noisy, it could also be that at some point I estimate the gradient in this direction and take a step in this direction and then the next point. And so I am able to escape such local minima because these gradients, they look different for every data point. And that actually has the property that I'm able to escape local minima. And that could actually lead to the result that I'm, I will end up at another local minimum, which is even lower than what I encountered just, just now. Okay, so that motivates why it would be actually a good thing to work with uh, approximate gradients via the stochastic gradient uh, descent method rather than working with uh, the full uh, gradient descent. Okay, so to continue on this comparison with uh, gradient and stochastic gradient descent. Well, first of all, both rely on this learning rate, right? And we saw that actually before in, uh, in our video on uh, gradient descent. So if the learning rate is too small, um, then basically it takes me a long time to to end up at some local uh, optimal location. And in the stochastic gradient descent case, moreover, it may be more harder, it may be harder to actually leave such a uh, local optima because my step size are so small. So I always stay in this vicinity of this uh, local um, optimum location. But uh, conversely, if my step size is too large, then I completely jump over all these uh, optimal locations and I will never converge to, to anything. So what people tend to do is they tend to work with a learning rate schedule. Like they start off with a high learning rate. So that quite quickly brings me somewhere close to, let's say some optimal region. And then I decrease the step size and that brings me closer to the optimal location. And then I further decrease as so I really refine my optimal solution in the end. Okay, so these learning rate issues sort of both equally well apply to the gradient and the, the stochastic gradient descent uh, method. But then apart from the possibility to escape local minima with a stochastic gradient descent, there's another motivation for a stochastic gradient descent. And that's namely that they're much more efficient. So in order to compute this gradient, I only need to do this forward pass for maybe one or a few data points in my uh, mini batch. So this is uh, fast to compute. And if you would compare this maybe to uh, the full gradient, 
especially at the beginning, all of these gradients roughly point in the same direction because my initial solution is likely to, to be very poor, then, uh, then, then that means there's also a very clear direction to go to, to improve my uh, solution. And with this, I mean, if I have, for example, my initial point over here, so this is W0, then let's say my true gradient points in this direction. So that would be my uh, true uh, gradient. And then I have all these noisy estimates. Uh, for example, for data point um, one, the gradient for data point one, for example, points in this direction, uh, the gradient for data point two, maybe in this direction, so that it's a gradient of data point two, uh, maybe for uh, another one in this direction. So I have all these, well, noisy estimates, but roughly they, they all point in the same direction. So uh, especially at the start, I just want to have a, a course direction to follow and then just estimating this gradient with one data point would be enough to, to get me going in the right direction. So if you compare this to the full error, which is based on all data points, this is very expensive to compute, whereas uh, these gradients are only computed with a few or maybe even only one uh, data point. So this is super efficient uh, to compute. Okay, so that's summarized over here. I do not necessarily need the full gradient uh, because all my gradients are roughly aligned. So I can also make an estimate with one or a couple of data points. And then we saw this point that stochastic gradient descent is more likely to escape a local minimum since, uh, so if my total gradient would be zero, that means I'm not going to update my weights, but this does not necessarily imply that this gradient is the same for each data point, right? So if I visualize that again over here, let's suppose here I have a true gradient, which is zero, but uh, because this landscape looks slightly different for every data point, it could be that maybe uh, for this uh, particular data point, my gradient looks like this. And that means I would take a step in this direction. And then again, there I have some uh, estimate. Uh, so, um, Working with these noisy gradients really uh, allows you to escape local minima. Okay, so those are some strong arguments uh, for uh, using stochastic gradient descent over a gradient descent. Uh, but maybe then there's an argument against a stochastic gradient descent. So let's compare the two in, in a similar situation. So what you would do with a gradient descent, you would really directly walk downhill and that would end you up at this uh, uh, globally optimal, or let's say some optimal location. Now what would happen in the stochastic gradient descent case, uh, because I have these noisy estimates, um, I am probably going to take a very roundabout route to my optimal location. So I would need much more uh, iterates to converge to uh, a local optimum. But then again, the advantage of a stochastic gradient descent is, is that these uh, gradients are super fast to compute because I only need one or a few data points, whereas here I need to process my full data set. So the point of this slide is that stochastic re uh, gradient descent uh, requires more steps, but each gradient update is uh, fast to compute. Okay, uh, but then there's one final but very important uh, remark and that is that uh, because I have this uh, non-convex energy landscape, uh, my solution highly depends on how I initialize my model, right? So basically for every different starting point for my models, I may end up at a different uh, optimal location. And one sol final solution to which I converge to might be more uh, well, might be better than uh, the others. And that's nicely visualized over here. So this is a plot of the test error. So uh, test error. So the test error for different neural networks, which with a different number of parameters. So uh, what is plotted here is the number of hidden units. And so, uh, so I'm training networks for different uh, network complexities. So 10 means I have a lot of hidden units. So my network is complex and therefore I can also expect more local minima in my uh, error function. And this is a very simple model and therefore I can expect a smoother or uh, let's say um, cleaner or nicer uh, error landscape. 
So then for each model, so for each model complexity, I randomly pick a new uh, initial seed, so uh, initial set of parameters W. And for my simple model, I see that all of these uh, solutions of all these models, they converge to the same model with a particular, which give a particular test error. But if I go for the higher models, then my error functions are highly uh, non-convex, so a lot of local minima. I see that my solutions uh, depend a lot on how I initialize. So some initial Ws end up converging to a very poor local minimum, so I still make a lot of errors. Uh, but some models, uh, they are able to reach a very, very good uh, local optimal location, and therefore they, they, they end up with very strong models. And, and that's sort of a general trend, right? So with local minima, you have more stable uh, optimization methods um, because there's not much model complexity and not much variation really among my models. But if I go to very complex models, uh, then um, I tend to end up at, at local optimal locations. And then really the difference between this very complex, good working model um, is there with, with, with the same complex model, but now with a poor solution. So we have these high variations in test error. Okay, so this, this also means that always, whenever you report uh, your errors or your performance scores with neural networks, you, sh you should always um, rerun your training procedure with different initializations of W. Because uh, if you run it once and you end up with a model which is very accurate, uh, then you report it and you say, hey, yay, I, I got state of the art. Um, but maybe then someone re-implements your method and then discovers but way that you were just very lucky. Um, I actually end up with this model. So um, be fair about the numbers that you report and um, also report uncertainties on your performances. So the message is... So always run with several initializations because this allows you to gain some understanding on the uncertainty on your models. Okay, so that wraps it up for um, neural network optimization via stochastic gradient descent. Um, currently, stochastic gradient descent is really the method to optimize your neural networks uh, because they're so simple and they have these properties that, well, uh, they have ways of escaping local minima. But still, there's, this is not a guarantee that you won't end up at local minima. In fact, you're super likely to end up with a local minima. And that leads that you, to the fact that you also can expect variability in your models. The most popular way for training neural networks is via stochastic gradient descent. This optimization method updates the weights iteratively based on the gradient of the error that we want to minimize. Now in this video we are going to explicitly write out how to compute the gradients in neural networks. And it, it turns out that even though neural networks can be incredibly complex, the computations of gradients themselves is actually quite tractable uh, because it can be sequentially obtained via a consistent application of the chain rule of differentiation. Now just as the activations in a forward pass can be computed by evaluating the activations layer by layer, also the gradients in each layer can be sequentially computed by backpropagating the errors from the last layer all the way down to the first layer. Now since the multidimensional chain rule plays such a central role in this uh, optimization framework, let's take a look what it actually says, this multidimensional chain rule. We use this rule when we have to deal with a multidimensional function, so that it's a function of multiple input parameters, and each of these inputs, let's denote them with a G index with some uh, subscript D, each of these inputs is in turn again a function of another input. So let's put it like this, so we have all these, let's call them coordinates, each coordinate depends on some parameter X, and uh, my function F is again a function of these uh, coordinates, right? Now, if I want to compute the derivative of such a function with respect to x, so the, let's say is the lowest um, parameter in the hierarchy, then we have to apply the chain rule as, as we've used to, but now we work in this multidimensional setting. So I have to take into account the influence of a change of parameter x on all these input parameters. So that's roughly what it says. So I'm taking the derivative of f with respect to x, which can be thought of as um, the influence of a small change in x on the value of f. 
then the change that this a small delta x change induces is going to be a sum of the cha- of of the of the effect of changing x that it has on the d coordinate times and this is the chain rule essentially of f with respect to that particular coordinate right so all these changes on these coordinates uh, add up via the chain rule to a total change on my final uh, function f okay so that explains the multidimensional chain rule that's now let's try to translate this uh, to the context of our neural networks uh, first start off by recalling that my neural network is actually a nested function it's it's a function after function after function um, roughly looking like this so i have a neural network as a function of an input x and it's obtained by let's start it on the right so by first applying this linear transformation in the first layer uh, on x so that gives me the activations of the first layer then we apply some nonlinearity to it then again some uh, linear transformation of the second layer then again some activation function on it and so on so this means if you want to if we were to compute the derivative of this neural network with respect to x we have to apply a chain rule over here right to, to propagate the errors like the f- small changes that my x have on a to h to a to h all the way to the effect of my final the effect that it has of the small change on my final uh, output Okay, now also recall that uh, my neural networks, like these functions, are uh, multidimensional functions, right? It's, it's mappings from uh, an input vector to an output vector. So this f could, for example, be um, one single activation, let's say the activation of at layer L. And this activation was given via linear combination of all the, the, the activations of the previous layer, right? So if L minus 1, which again is a function of x. We have uh, the activation number two at layer L minus one, which is a function of X. And so we have all these activations. So we see that the uh, the activation unit one at layer L is going to be a function of all these previous uh, activations, which are in turn a function of the input X. Okay, so each activation is a function of previous activations okay so that's denoted over here so my f could be uh, my first activation and it's going to be a function of all these uh, activations uh, at uh, the previous layer okay and that then tells me that if we want to compute derivatives uh, these multidimensional derivatives and chain rules we have to rely on this particular formula which uh, we will get back to at the point where we actually start using it. But for now, uh, remember, this is the multidimensional chain rule. You should really remember this formula. Then uh, the setting is as follows. We have designed our neural network, uh, which is designed to to transform an input to a particular output. Uh, So we make some decisions on on the output, for example. And now my output um, is used to compute an error, right? So this output really defines the error. And then I'm going to compute the the derivative of this error with respect to this model parameters W. So I apply some gradient descent method, for example, to update my weights based on the error that I computed, right? So I need to evaluate uh, the derivatives of my error with respect to these weights. So, and then I just said that I'm going to need to rely on the multidimensional chain rule, right? Because if I want to uh, measure the influence that this W has on the error, it has to propagate through all these layers up to my error. So I'm going to need this uh, chain rule. Now let's think about the flow of information. So what we're actually doing. So we have this input and this input information propagates forward, right? So it's used to compute the, the activations at the next layer. And then we again compute it at the next layer. So essentially the information at layer L is obtained by looking at information that was available at the previous layer. And we use this very simpler rule that we just work with these uh, linear transformations followed by applying this activation uh, function to each activation. And that would give me the hidden uh, units at that particular layer. Okay, so this is called forward propagation, really the propagation of information from the input all the way to the output. Uh, 
And in this process, we are essentially computing all the possible activations uh, at, uh, at the hidden units. Then what we're going to focus on today is going to be back propagation. So the back propagation of errors. So again, once I've done this forward uh, pass, then I know what my outputs are. I know what my error is. And that allows me to essentially compute a gradient in the end. And I'm going to start off with by computing the errors or the derivative at this layer. And I'm going to propagate these gradients all the way back um, well, to, to the first layer using this chain rule of differentiation. So that's the task of back propagation. The goal is to compute all derivatives. Because recall that it is our objective, right? To uh, in the end have access to all these derivatives because those can be used to, to update my weights via stochastic gradient descent, for example. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to compute all derivatives uh, of my error function with respect to my model parameters and uh, I'm going to evaluate this error based on some data point xn. Now it is important to realize that if we consider the, the derivative with respect to let's say this particular uh, model parameter wji uh, then it's important to realize that a small change of this parameter leads to a change in the results only via this activation over here. So it only induces a change through this particular activation. So this means that I can compute this uh, derivative with respect to w WJI by the chain rule, right? Uh, because it only depends, it only, this error only passes through this A, uh, this jade uh, node. So I have to compute the, the derivative of my error with respect to this jade node. Let's mark that in red. And then of course the chain rule, I also need to compute the derivative DAJ DWJI. Now the computation of uh, dA to dWji, that's simple enough, right? Because we have this, uh, this simple relation over here. It's just a linear combination of my uh, previous uh, activations. Then the tricky part lies into the computation of this uh, derivative uh, of my error with respect to the jade uh, activation. Because this jade activation, uh, this one, um, is used by all other nodes downstream uh, connected to it, right? So changing this uh, particular activation has an influence on all these other activations and, and therefore it has a more intricate um, contribution to the final error. Um, so for now we're going to keep it a bit simple and we're going to introduce a new symbol which we call the node error associated with the jade node. So we're going to just define it for now to be this error, which we're going to take a look at uh, later on. So delta is the derivative of my error with respect to this uh, j node, right? And we're going to denote it with delta j. So delta j is this node error, and it's an error that we place at the j node. So then it means that my uh, derivative with respect to w uh, w j i is given by this node error times delta a j delta w j i. So again, looking at these terms, this is what we are set out to compute. So we want to update our uh, model parameters w j i. For that, I'm going to need the error uh, with respect to my jade activation. So uh, I'm going to, for now, let's call this thing a delta j, the node error. And then of course we need the derivative of the node aj with respect to uh, wji. Okay, so let's focus on that one first. Um, so this is what we just did. So we said we want to compute this error and it's going to be given by delta j delta aj delta wji. And now we want to compute this particular term. So um, before I proceed, I just want to mention that I'm not going to write out all these uh, layer indices uh, all the time. And I'm going to use the index notation to refer to the layer. So whenever I'm talking about, um, well, my final layer in this particular chain that I'm considering, I'm going to use the index K. So all nodes uh, in this uh, layer will be indexed with, with the index K. And then if I talk about the layer before this, I'm going to use indices j and the layer before this. So let's say layer minus two is going to be re referred to with index i. So whenever I write 
uh, ZI, this means this is a hidden unit corresponding to a layer L minus two. So this we have this ordering I, J, K going from layer minus two to minus one to my current layer. Okay, so with that said, uh, this hidden unit is based on the activation J, which is obtained via linear combinations. So I sum over I, the index in the previous uh, layer, W, J, I, the hidden units of that layer. Okay, so of this thing, I now need to compute the derivative with respect to W, J, I, and it immediately follows that, um, well, it's going to be Z, I, right? So the derivative delta aj to delta wji is given by zi. Okay, that's uh, simple enough. Okay, so then this is what we currently have. That's uh, my error, uh, my derivative with respect to WG, wji of my error function is given by delta j. So the node error j times zi. Okay, and now we're going to focus on this particular term, which we call uh, the node error. So now we are going to actually compute this derivative. And to do this, recall that my final error is going to be determined by, by these nodes. And these nodes are again a function of uh, the, the aj, of the node of which I'm now currently computing this derivative. So if I make this a bit more explicit, I'm going to say that my error function, it depends on these nodes a k so the nodes in uh, in this layer and these nodes in turn depend on this jade uh, activation right so each node contributes to the error and each of these nodes in in turn are a function of the aj that i'm currently considering so now i can compute uh, the multi-dimensional chain rule so in order to compute this i'm going to use the multi-dimensional chain rule which tells me that this derivative is given by uh, sum over k, so all the parameters that depend on uh, my jade um, activation. So all these, so I'm sum over all these parameters a k. The derivative delta e with respect to this parameter delta e delta a k uh, times the derivative of this particular parameter to a j. So this is just applying the multi-dimensional chain rule. And of course, uh, these derivatives are maybe also hard to compute, right? So maybe we have downstream, we have more intricate re relations, uh, which I'm not going to focus on at the moment. So again, for now, I'm just going to say, I'm going to call this thing delta k. So the node errors at these um, um, nodes ak, at these activations ak. Okay, so to keep it a bit simple, I'm going to denote this as the sum over k, my node errors k times delta a k delta a j. So the derivative of my k node to the j activation. So this tells me if I want to uh, compute the error at uh, node j, then I'm going to need the errors at the nodes at my uh, higher layer uh, in the network, right? So, so we're going to have this flow of, of information that uh, the error at my higher nodes are going to contribute to the error of my lower nodes. So this is essentially the idea behind backpropagation. But just for clarity, I'm going to write out that indeed each hidden unit, let's say the ZJ is obtained by applying this activation, uh, this activation H, to aj, right? And, and the same for my uh, y case, it's obtained from my kate activation um, in, in that particular layer. Okay, so we are going to leave these node errors uh, for now, uh, for what they are, and now we're going to focus on this derivative. Okay, so this is, now this is what we had so far, we were computing the derivative of my error with respect to wji, and this consisted of uh, the node error, the j node error times zi. And we were currently focusing on computing this particular term, and we saw that this particular term was obtained via a combination of my, let's say, upstream nodes, node errors uh, delta k. 
But in order to make this assignment, we need to compute the derivative delta AK to delta AJ. So let's now just compute this thing. And recall that my AK, so my gate activation, is obtained as a linear combination from uh, the nodes um, at the lower layers, right? So the hidden units. Uh, okay, so let's just insert that. So these ZJs that are directly obtained. So let me just write it out. So each ZJ was indeed obtained by applying this activation unit, right? So let's just uh, fi fill this in. We're going to compute the derivative delta, delta AJ of this sum over J, W, K, J, and then apply this activation function to my J activation. And this derivative directly follows from the chain rule and it's given by W, K, J times derivative of this activation function with respect to its input, evaluated at AJ. Okay, so that's simple enough. We compute the derivative of AK to AJ and that's given as follows. So my weight WKJ times the derivative of my activation function. And this is something that you can uh, predetermine before you start making all this compute computation. Uh, I'm going to give some simple examples of what the derivative of activation functions look like. But now I have a, a way of computing these uh, delta j, so the node errors, the j node errors, simply by taking uh, computing derivative of my uh, activation function at node j times the sum over k of the node errors at uh, the higher layers. So really, I'm just filling filling in this formula, right? So we just compute the delta a k delta a j. Uh, and that gives me this expression in the end. So that's, this clearly shows if I know the node errors at these higher layers, so delta k, delta 1, then I can obtain my node error at the node j simply via this update rule. So we have a flow of information, the flow of errors from the higher layers to the lower layers by multiplying each error with the corresponding uh, weight. So we have these higher node errors, which are multiplied by this weight WKI. And that together with the derivative of my activation function uh, gives me the error at node J. Okay, so this is something that we can actually compute, right? Because all these activations, we can compute them in the forward pass. Uh, these WKJs, we know their values, and we also know how to take the derivative of my activation function. It's just filling this in, and that gives me uh, the delta J. The only uh, starting point is actually computing the derivative at my very last uh, layers. And that's what I'm going to show uh, in the next uh, slides, how to do this. It's, it's, it's actually quite simple. So once you know the, the, the node errors at the last layers, we can propagate these errors all the way down via this particular rule. Okay, so then uh, this, this update scheme, so the scheme for computing this derivative has a very clear structure to it, right? So we have this forward pass, and in this forward pass, we propagate the information from the input all the way to, to the last layer using just the definition of our network. So each node at AJ is obtained from the activation from the, from the lower layers by this linear transformation where each uh, note that the previous layer was activated by the activation function, right? So this sum over i. So this really is how we define the network to be. The activations at this layer are obtained via linear combinations of my uh, hidden units at the previous layer. Okay, and once I've performed this forward pass, I also know the node values at my output, right? And these node values then determine uh, the error. This also means that now I can start computing the derivatives uh, of my nodes, of my error with respect to these nodes. Uh, specifically, you would start with computing the derivative, uh, the node error delta k. So at the outputs, I made these errors, and these errors were defined to be the derivative of my error function with respect to this particular node. And because my outputs directly determine the error, uh, we can simply compute this. Uh, which in the least squares error, uh, for example, boils down to yk minus tk. Right, suppose my error was given by uh, the sum of squared errors, or the squared error, 
dk squared, then um, the derivative of this thing would give me this. So I have a way of computing the errors at my output nodes. Okay, and then we also just derived a way for computing the derivative at the lower layer nodes via this update rule. So, okay, so now we can propagate these errors down to the lower layers uh, via this update rule. So the derivative of my activation at node j and then the weighted sum of my, all my uh, higher layered errors weighted with uh, my model parameters. Now I put this remark uh, down here because we have to, of course, be careful with, with skip connections. Um, so we could uh, have models that directly propagate information from here to here. Then of course we have to check for the links um, that, that, that contribute to, to this activation. So that means I'm summing essentially over all nodes upstream that are connected to the node that I'm currently updating. It's just something uh, to take into account. Okay, so that's essentially uh, the back propagation phase. So in the back propagation phase, I propagate errors from the end all the way down uh, to the lower layers. And then if I'm done with this back propagation, I also know what the derivative with respect to the model parameters w, j, i are, and that's simply given, that's one of the first things we derived. It's simply given by this node error z, uh, delta j times uh, z i. And these derivatives can then in turn be used in your whatever optimization scheme that you use. But almost any optimization scheme uh, relies on this derivative. And now let's just take a look at uh, the gradient descent algorithm, what it does. It does, we update the, the node parameter uh, wji. So at my next iterate, it's going to be the parameter that I already had. And then I walk in the negative gradient direction which was given by delta j times z i. Okay, so really this summarizes everything. So in a forward pass, I make sure that all my activations uh, are computed and then I can start the backward pass and I just start off by first computing the error at my output nodes and then I uh, back propagate these errors to obtain also my node errors at the lower layers. Uh, when I'm done with that, I not only have all the activations, I also have the node errors and then I can start computing the derivatives simply by taking the product of my node errors with um, the actual hidden activations. And this in turn can be used to update my weights in an iterative uh, update scheme. Okay, now I'm going to end this video with some examples. Um, so depending on your error function, maybe your errors may look slightly different. Uh, but we already saw actually for a particular class of activations and uh, targets that we optimize, we always end up with this very simple form of the node error at the outputs. For example, if we consider logistic regression, then we typically minimize this least squares error function and the derivative of this error function with respect to y is simply given by this difference. So this is the error that my target makes with respect um, uh, to the target, so the error that my prediction made makes with respect to the target. And a similar thing happens if we consider classification and uh, we use as error function the cross entropy loss. We computed this in the previous videos, we computed the derivative of the logistic sigmoid, which is the two class version of this thing. And then we saw that we end up with a very similar error. All right, so that's simple enough. And these are then the errors that we use to start off our back propagation. Now a final note on uh, which kind of activation functions you could use and what this would look like. Um, this is an example. Let's consider this two layer neural network. So a two layer neural network, which maps an input to some uh, k-dimensional output vector by passing it through one hidden unit uh, layer uh, directly to the output. And let's consider uh, the regression problem. So I'm not going to apply an output activation uh, to my outputs, um, but as for the hidden units, they will be computed by the 10H, uh, the hyperbolic tangent. So my activation uh, function will be the 10H. Now this ten tangent hyperbolic is given as follows, and it has a very nice derivative. So this is what I'm dealing with. So this is my activation function. 
and it has the following derivative. So this derivative, uh, we need this when we uh, apply our backpropagation, right? And we talk about regression, so we have this uh, quadratic error function, and we just saw that if we compute the derivative of this error function with respect to node uh, yk, then it's just simply given by the, the, the difference uh, between my prediction and the target. So I have my node errors at the output node, so now I can start backpropagation. And recall that the backpropagation, uh, so the backpropagation rule was given uh, by, well, the fact that I need the node errors at the, the last layer, so that's what I have. I also have the current weights, but they also need to compute the derivative of my activation function. So let's just fill this in. So the derivative of the tangent h is this thing, one minus um, the hidden unit squared, so one minus the hidden unit squared, and then times uh, the rest of it. So this is really my update rule, which I'm going to use to propagate the delta case down uh, to the lower layers. So step one is this forward propagation, then step two, uh, compute these node errors and propagate them backward uh, via this back propagation to obtain the node errors at the lower uh, nodes. And since we're now considering a two-layer neural network, I only need to compute uh, these uh, nodes at, at this layer, right? Because um, I, do, I do not have any weights at this point, so I do not need any node errors at this point. Right, so once I've computed all these delta j's, I'm essentially done with my uh, back propagation, and then I can simply compute uh, the derivatives of my error functions with respect to my model parameters uh, via this update rule, which was given by uh, the node error times the node of this uh, previous layer. And that's explicitly given as follows. Okay, so that wraps it up for error backpropagation. So this entire scheme uh, summarizes how to compute uh, your gradients in the end. Um, I would recommend just take your time, go over this example uh, after the video, uh, but whenever you have to implement this or whenever you need to know how to compute the gradients, just follow this scheme. We have a forward pass, moving all information forward that allows me to compute all the activations uh, in my neural networks. Then I need to compute the error that I make at the output and I can propagate it backwards uh, via this uh, simple update rule. And that in the end gives me an expression for the derivatives, which in turn can be used uh, to, to update my weights, for example, via a stochastic gradient descent. So far, we have covered supervised learning methods in the context of regression and classification. We now move on to the class of unsupervised machine learning methods. So this is what we've been dealing with in the supervised setting, right? So far, we've always worked with data of the form uh, input-output pairs. So we have a set of measurements, x, and the corresponding targets. And now we want to come up with um, either predictive distributions, like given a new data point x, what is the probability of observing a corresponding target t? Or we approach it from a discriminative uh, setting, um, and let's say a non-probabilistic setting, where we just want to model the relation input to output and we just model that by recovering some function f that performs this task and then we subdivided this uh, class of supervised learning methods into regression and classification problems where in the regression setting uh, my targets took on continuous values so anything any value on the real line so there was a regression problem uh, but we also considered classification problems where the target could only take on one out of a specific set of values and this target represents maybe a class. And now in the upcoming videos, we move towards unsupervised machine learning, where we have all this data set, this data set of observations X, but without a clear uh, target, which we want to, to recover. And now our goal is to do something useful with this data. We want to uncover the structure of the data, or maybe we want to infer uh, maybe hidden class labels. Maybe there are targets which we do not observe, but which we know that there, there, there should be such targets. And a first goal could be, for example, density estimation, where we simply want to reconstruct the probability density that generated this data set. This could, for example, be useful uh, for outlier detection. Uh, suppose I now observe a new X and I want to know um, well, the probability of observing this X and if it's highly unprobable, then maybe it's an outlier and there's something wrong with your detection system. I don't know. 
uh, could be anything, uh, but we could also use this probability to generate new data points in, in a simulated environment, for example. But maybe more interestingly, and that is what we're going to focus on in the upcoming videos, is the notion of a latent variable. And this latent variable Z, so let me denote this, let Z be a, a latent variable that influences how we observe, how we observe X. And that's actually better represented by this uh, probability uh, distribution over there, this conditional probability. And the idea is as follows. So suppose I have this whole uh, data set of, let's say, real estate related measurements. So uh, things like house prices, um, the size of the property, the size of the garden. Uh, those are all measurements related to a house on the real estate market. And so we have all these measurements uh, stacked in this uh, data set X. And maybe now we want to infer some structure of this data because you can imagine that maybe some of these values are highly determined by maybe the city in which the property is located. Uh, some cities, they well, uh, have bigger houses and more expensive houses and some cities only have tiny houses, I don't know. Uh, so we want to recover the structure such that maybe in downstream tasks we can rely on the structure for making particular decisions. So we then call this unobserved variable Z, this latent variable, it, it is unobserved, but we sort of assume and maybe even know that there is such a latent variable. There is such thing as a city which influences uh, all these measurements. And now um, the task could be maybe to recover this kind of structure, uh, recover the, the different cities that there are. Now such problems would relate to clustering. So uh, clustering my data points based on this latent variable. And in this case, the latent variable would be, for example, uh, the city. But we can also use um, unsupervised learning for dimensionality reduction. Suppose I have this whole set of measurements like house price, house price, property size, uh, garden size, a lot more. And maybe they can re be reduced to one or a few values. Uh, for example, maybe just knowing the property size uh, tells me a lot about the actual house price and the garden uh, size and stuff like that. So that's also going to be part of unsupervised learning is sort of uncover this structure that govern my data such that I can deal with less uh, parameters in the end. Now in the upcoming videos, we're going to talk about a lot about latent variables. So it will become uh, more clear um, uh, very soon. But, it is, but this is roughly the idea behind it. We have this observed variable X and that's the data basically. So we have all these X's, but we also have unobserved latent variables that influence how my axis came to be. And that is graphically depicted over here. And in formulas, it's constructed as follows. So we assume that there's such a structure of a latent variable influencing uh, my x. So my final probability of observing x is determined via this adjoint of observing an x with this uh, hidden or latent variable, which we do not know. Uh, but we can marginalize out this uh, z once we have this joint to obtain my probability for x. Okay, so that's how we do this. We assume there is such a latent variable and therefore there's such a joint uh, probability distribution. And that also means that we can make this factorization, right? Of, uh, so this joint is given by uh, the conditional of X given uh, my latent variable uh, times the, the prior or the probability for Z uh, in itself. Suppose I'm given such a latent variable, uh, then this tells me a lot about uh, what kind of values for x I can expect. And if I have a different latent variable, I have a different distribution for x. So uh, we have this uh, latent variable conditional distributions. And then of course, in order to reconstruct this joint, I am also am going to need a prior or some probability for this latent variable in itself. Okay, so that's the, the continuous situation and the same for the discrete setting, right? So when I talked about uh, predicting these house prices based on the cities, now Z could be my discrete latent variable. It could be city number one, city number two, etc. And then uh, my overall probability for pr making a prediction for a particular house price uh, can then be uh, obtained by uh, summing the probabilities for a particular house price X, for example, summing over all the probabilities uh, in all the cities, essentially. I hope this example somewhat makes sense, uh, but maybe we just move on to another example. Um, I talked about this clustering, like uncovering the structure of my data. And suppose all these points over here are all different measurements. Let, let's go to a different example. Let's say these measurements represent 
uh, we're observing animals and this axis represents, for example, uh, well, the height of the animal and the weight, something like that. So we see sort of see this correlation when we see, observe bigger animals, we also observe higher weights. And then we make this assumption that we're measuring actually, maybe we, maybe we make this assumption because we look at this data and we see roughly two clusters. So it's a bit dense over here and here, and there seems to be a separation here. So now we can maybe assume that we're actually dealing with two types of animals. So that would be my latent variable. For example, the latent variable could be, um, I don't know, animal type. And I said uh, the horizontal axis was uh, height. The vertical axis was weight. So then once we make this uh, assumption that there is a latent variable, namely the, the animal type, um, that influences my observations, then maybe it becomes more easier to actually model this uh, distribution that generated all these data points. Uh, meaning that I'm going to assume that my the probability for a particular observation X is going to be given by the marginalization over this joint uh, PX and my latent variable, where I made this factorization of um, a probability of X given my um, animal type times the probability of observing that animal uh, type uh, in the first place. So suppose my latent variables are uh, cats and dogs, I'm only measuring cats and dogs, then uh, suppose I'm measuring a dog, then maybe I assume the probabilities of observing a particular weight, width and height is given as follows. So dogs are typically heavier than, than cats, for example. Uh, so assume maybe a width and a, a height somewhere around this point, And then of course we have some spread uh, around this. One dog is uh, larger than the other. And so maybe there's such a distribution for cats as well. So uh, let me draw that. So let's say the average cat has some height and weight corresponding to a point over here and then there's some spread around it uh, like <laughs> not every cat is the same so then we have identified two distributions in our latent variable modeling uh, approach where uh, the first one correspond to uh, the probability for my width and uh, my weight and height measurements given that um, i'm observing a dog and with the other de density, I'm modeling basically the width and height, um, given that I'm uh, observing a cat. So now I split the problem into modeling uh, two separate distributions, which are uh, separately easier to model, uh, but they still give me the information that I'm after, namely the probability for making an obser observation X. So uh, via this marginalization process, by marginalizing over um, well, cats and dogs, uh, essentially. And then via this marginalization, I would be able to recover the probability distribution uh, for the data that I uh, just observed. Okay, so that's essentially the idea about unsupervised learning uh, with latent variable models. So we assume that there is such a latent variable that influences how my data is generated. And now I'm going to use this to, well, to apply structure to my modeling uh, approach and to uh, my data essentially. And in this case, you could think of it as a clustering approach because we sort of group all these points together with one latent variable model and cluster the other points with another model. And now this also means with uh, such a probabilistic interpretation that maybe I can, given a new data point X, I can try to infer uh, which class, which latent variable class it would belong to. And uh, because now this point has a higher probability in uh, the, the conditional uh, class for cats, I can probably tell that this uh, data point belongs to the measurement uh, of a cat. Okay, and then we can also um, use this idea of latent variable modeling uh, for dimensionality reduction. For example, in this right figure, suppose I have all these 2D measurements, so all these points over here. Uh, we see that in this case, they are nicely concentrated along this, this red curve. So what I'm actually looking at is actually a one-dimensional um, manifold or one-dimensional data structure where my latent variable could, for example, encode for a particular point along this line and that would actually then tell me also, well, um, what my observation in terms of these 2D data points would be. 
And that will be the main idea about working with continuous latent uh, variables to use it for dimensionality reduction and sort of to recover the underlying structure of my data with well continuous latent variables. And this will be uh, covered in uh, the next lecture, uh, so in the video series uh, numbered with 10. Uh, but today, uh, in the upcoming videos, we're going to focus on discrete latent variable models. And we're going to start off with uh, clustering in this non-probabilistic setting. So really focus on a classical k-means clustering algorithm and later we move to a probabilistic setting which uh, more closely models what we just uh, discussed in this example. Clustering falls in the category of unsupervised learning methods uh, where we are set out to learn the structure of the data in terms of a discrete set of clusters. Now today we cover one of the most famous methods for clustering, namely k-means clustering. Now remember, we're talking about unsupervised learning, so we're considering data points uh, without targets, so just observation x, and that could be visualized as follows. Suppose we have these 2D measurements, uh, which results in this uh, green point clouds. And uh, now we're, what we're going to assume is, we're going to assume that there's a discrete latent variable, and this latent variable encodes for uh, the cluster or the, 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 the latent class, which we do not observe, but we sort of assume that there are that there is some latent variable that um, results in the fact that we are observing my data points in, in two clusters, uh, roughly. And now we're set out to recover this uh, latent variable. Now let's put it like this. All our observations, x, are drawn from this, uh, well, a probability distribution for x. So when I make an observation, sometimes it lies over here, sometimes it lies over here. Uh, but generally we tend to see these two clusters. So we're going to assume that there will be two clusters, uh, a discrete latent variable which can take on two values. And let's denote it as follows. So we have a latent variable z, which uh, either means it came from the blue class or it came from the red class. Then basically this means that my data point is either drawn from this uh, conditional x given um, well, I'm, I'm considering the red class, or we say my data point came from uh, my blue class. So I, then I have this conditional x given my blue class, where points drawn from this blue class are most likely to occur around this uh, blue cluster center. That's sort of um, the latent variable approach that we consider here. Now in this k-means clustering approach, we're actually going to discard the idea of probability. So we're not going to talk about uh, these probabilities uh, we're just going to perform this clustering, and but we can still talk about uh, clusters as being uh, latent variables, right? So this, yeah, so, so these latent clusters that uh, are responsible for particular sets of, of data points. So now, so now we're going to let go of this probabilistic interpretation, and for now, not talk about probability distribution, but we're going to make hard assignments. We're going to say that this point either belongs to this. A blue latent class or it belongs to the red latent class but our original data set in itself doesn't have this uh, latent variable information right we're only observing these axes and that's why we call it this this green so we do not encode for classes at this point but once we have done our clustering then we can look for new data points and make a hard assignment for the latent variable uh, blue versus red. And we're going to do this via the k-means clustering algorithm, uh, which is based on the fact that each cluster has its own mean. So the cross over here is called, uh, well, let's say the mean for cluster one, and then this cross is going to be the mean for cluster two. And then whenever a new data point comes in, this x for example, we're going to check which mean is closest, and then we simply assign a point to that uh, class. All right, so that is what we're going to do. And then the k-means clustering algorithm works as follows. We can formulate it as a minimization problem. So we, what we're dealing with is all this, this data set of observations xn, and we're going to cluster them. So those are those uh, green points. And we're going to cluster them into two groups, for example, or let's say in k uh, clusters. Now we can do this by minimizing the following um, error function or loss function. And now this error will be a function of my cluster means and uh, the labels that I assign to each uh, data point. So each point is going to belong to one of the clusters. 
that's encoded via these uh, latent variable assignments z and k where each uh, z and k so for each data point n i consider k classes and this value is either zero or one and that leads to a sort of one hot encoding of my um, latent variable uh, classes meaning that my latent variable uh, z and k looks like this so my end uh, latent variable looks like uh, z and one z and two up to z and k and this factor consists of zeros and ones where it is only one for uh, the class to which it is assigned to, right? So it's a one hat encoding of uh, the Kate class. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to assign each data point to one of the classes via this one hot encoding um, of my latent variable. And I'm going to do that in such a way that my total error is going to be minimized. So that means for a fixed uh, K, for a fixed cluster K, I'm going to pick a mean and then for all points in this cluster, I'm going to sum over the square distance from this point to this mean, right? Because this thing is only one if, uh, well, if the kth index is indeed one. So I'm only summing the errors uh, within one cluster. So going back to this uh, example, suppose I have a cluster mean mu is one, then I look for all points which are assigned to cluster one. And then I want this me uh, mean value to be placed at such a place such that the distance uh, of all points to this cluster mean is as, as small as possible. But this also works the other way around. Suppose I have fixed a certain mean, then I want to assign the points uh, to the closest mean, because by making this assignment to the closest mean, I'm also going to minimize uh, this, this loss function. So I have two things that I'm going to change, uh, the means and the assignments. And this leads to an iterative optimization scheme uh, called k-means clustering, which is as follows. So we are going to initialize uh, the cluster means mu k with some random initialization. So this was my green data set and then I'm going to consider two classes. Uh, so I randomly place these two cluster centers over here. So that's step one, this initialization. Then I'm going to iterate the following. First of all, I'm going to make an assignment of each point uh, to the closest uh, cluster mean. So that's essentially uh, stated here formally, right? For each xn, I'm going to select the cluster. So I'm going to take the minimal cluster or the cluster that minimizes the distance. And that will be the cluster to which I assign this point to. So that looks like this. So I have this cluster points initialized like this, and these blue points are all closest to this one, and the red points are closest to this one. So this is the assignment step, which we are going to label as uh, the E step. I will explain in a minute why we call it the E step. So this will be step, the E step, the assignment step. And then once we make this assignment, we're going to update the means. So that's denoted with the M step, simply by taking the average over all my data points within a class. Remember that the set and case is, is only one for this data point when it corresponds to the K class. So I'm really summing only for a fixed K, I'm summing only for the points within that class and average over it. So uh, now I'm updating my cluster means. Okay, so this update step will be denoted with an M, the maximization step, and this leads to a new set of uh, cluster means, right? Um, so we have all these blue data points. We have slightly more blue points on this side than on this side. So my mean is somewhere over here. So that's what you see over here. And the same for the red, it's heavier on this side. So the mean over all my red points is going to be located over here. And now once I've done that, I again go to perform this E step or also the assignment step. And that gives me this new distribution of points. Now all points closest to blue to this cross will be marked as blue and all points closest to the other uh, cross will be marked as red. Okay, now we're going to iterate this. So once we updated our assignments, we're going to update again the cluster means. So that's the maximization step, the M step, and that gives me a new set of, of means uh, mu k and again we update our assignments by assigning each point to the closest uh, cluster mean then we again update our cluster means then we again make this assignment and so on and we keep doing this until convergence so at some point the cluster means will not change anymore 
Uh, so you see that this solution is exactly the same as this solution. Uh, so we reached convergence and we're done with the clustering algorithm. Okay, so this is a very simple algorithm consisting of an E step and an M step. And uh, we call this, this is a sort of instantation of the expectation maximization algorithm. So we call this the expectation step. And we call this the maximization step. And for now it is a bit artificial to call it the expectation and maximization step. But later on we will consider a probabilistic version of uh, k-means clustering in which uh, this expectation has a particular mean and the maximization step also has a particular meaning. But for now let's ju just use it as labels. So we have an E step in which we update the assignments of each point to the corresponding cluster and we have an M step uh, which is used to, to find the new uh, cluster means. And that described this very simple algorithm where we have this assignment step, assignment step, uh, followed by an update or maximization step, update of the means, and we iterate this. And the nice thing about this algorithm is that with every step, so both with the expectation step, with the E step, or the assignment step, as well as with the M step, we reduce this error function that I defined before and it keeps reducing until it reached convergence. I recall that our objective j is defined as j is the sum over all my data points, sum over all my clusters, z and k times the distance of my end data point to uh, this particular cluster mean. So that was what my objective was uh, defined to be. And then we have this assignment step and by definition of this assignment step, for, for each xm, we're going to select uh, the label set n such that this thing is minimized. So really by definition of this assignment, we're going to make a decrease in this uh, loss function. Okay, so that's essentially this assignment step. And once we've made this assignment, we're going to update the cluster means. And then again, this results in a decrease in this loss function because we're going to uh, choose uh, the means mu k such that this error is minimized within that cluster. And I'm going to show this in the, the next slides actually that this uh, maximization step or this m set really reduces uh, this uh, cost function j. But essentially what is happening here that after this m step the majority of points within this cluster will get closer to the cluster mean. Okay so we iteratively keep increasing this uh, loss function until it converged. So we're actually able to show that the k-means clustering algorithm will converge, but it actually is going to converge to a local minimum because as a function of both mu k and z and k, so these cluster means and the cluster labels together, uh, this loss function is uh, highly um, non-convex. And this uh, property of convergence to a local minimum is actually obtained by fixing a particular mu and then updating z and k. And then and then fixing z and k and then update the mu k, so this m step. So once this is fixed, this will become a quadratic loss as a function of mu k and hence a convex uh, optimization problem. So each of these individual steps solves some a convex optimization problem, but when we treat these, this loss as mu k and z and k together, uh, we're dealing with a non-convex uh, problem, which means that depending on my initialization, depending on where I place these points, I may end up with different um, partitionings uh, in the end. Okay, so this tells us that this k-means clustering will find a local minimum, but it is not guaranteed to find the global uh, minimum uh, assignment of, of points and uh, cluster means. And so the best thing that we can do is really work with random restarts. So uh, we start with different initializations and then we let the algorithm converge. We do this multiple times and in the end just select uh, the clusters which really minimizes a j over all these uh, random restarts that I did. So that's the best thing we can do, just run this multiple times and in the end uh, select a solution that really has the lowest uh, value for j. Now what I'd like to show next is that this m step actually really minimizes this j so we can derive this uh, step by uh, fixing uh, my uh, class labels or my uh, assignments and then finding the mu k that really minimizes this convex optimization problem. And the approach that we've been taking so far 
uh, a lot of times is taking the derivative of this loss with respect to mu k. This is the parameter that we're going to update and set it to zero. So what would the derivative of this uh, quadratic uh, function be in terms of uh, mu k? Now, first of all, we know that this L is uh, a class index, right? So this mu L. Uh, so this derivative only does uh, something whenever L is the same as k, meaning that this derivative is only non-zero only when L is k. And hence, uh, this sum disappears and we can just fill in the k over here because that's the only case where uh, the derivative does actually do something. And then, of course, we can pull this derivative inside the sum, right? Because this sum in itself doesn't depend on k. Okay, that's uh, step one. And then the derivative of this quadratic form, we also computed that before. So what we're actually doing here is computing the, the mu k of xn minus mu k transpose xn minus mu k and this will be equal to minus 2 minus 2 times xn minus mu k transpose okay so uh, this is derivative and we we set it to zero and now we're going to solve it with respect to the cluster means mu k so that's what we're doing in this uh, bottom part so we take the transpose on both sides uh, so actually we just get rid of this tra transpose essentially we're going to split this sum and then we move this part, which depends on mu k, uh, to the other side. So solving this tells me that the most optimal uh, cluster mean values are obtained simply by taking the average over my uh, cluster points of my of my data points within this cluster. Because recall that the z and k's only take on the value one whenever my data uh, my end data points uh, belongs to the k class. So really, I'm summing over my my data points within this, this class and then I normalize by the number of points within this class. So re really this is taking the average over my uh, points in this cluster. So that explains that with this uh, M step, we're really minimizing our objective function here. So in that sense, maybe this M step can be interpreted as a minimization step, uh, but we call it a maximization step because when we move to the probabilistic setting, um, this M step actually solves uh, the maximum likelihood uh, of my probability uh, distribution. But that's something that we discuss in the upcoming video. For now, it's clear to know that the k-means clustering uh, algorithm minimizes uh, this objective j step by step uh, via in, both in the expectation step as well as in uh, the, the m step, in this case, a minimization step. Okay, now let's go over some applications of k-means clustering. In this first example, we're going to use it for image compression. And this is an example from the book of Bishop. And maybe it is a somewhat old fashioned or naive way for image compression, but it will get us started on, well, what kind of applications can be solved with uh, k-means clustering. Now, the idea is here to represent this image with as little data as possible. And we're considering the following problem. So we have uh, data points, which will be our cluster. So the xn's, each xn is one pixel, and this one pixel has an R, G, and a B value. So those are my uh, pixel values. Now, instead of storing all these pixel values of all these RGB values, I'm only going to store uh, the cluster to which each point belongs to. So this point belongs to the blue class and this one to the yellow class. And then with this information, I can reconstruct such an image. But if I consider, let's say three different colors, uh, then this would be a representation that I can store uh, cheaply. And if I use 10 colors, basically I'm saying I want to represent this image with only 10 colors and I'm going to store for each pixel uh, which class color this uh, belong to. Right, so we're going to cluster all these uh, color pixels into K clusters, K clusters, where each cluster represents um, is a color representation. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're just throwing all these color pixels into one big pile and then we're going to, and then we recognize that there are a lot of colors that are similar. So we're just going to group, we're going to cluster all these colors that are similar together. We call them uh, yellow, for example, and all these points are similar. We call them blue. And this allows us to compress the data because now 
I only have to store, let's say, I have all these pixel values. I only have to store, uh, let's say, this pixel belongs to class 1, this to 2, this to class 1, uh, etc. So I only have to store these uh, integer values at all these pixel lo locations. So suppose my pixel, my image contains x by y pixels. Then now I only have to store x times y um, integers, which represents uh, the classes. So these are uh, either uh, one or two, for example, in this two class case. Whereas in the original image, I would have to store all these RGB values. So RGB for one pixel, RGB for the other pixel, um, yeah, etc. So that would mean I would have to store X times Y times three of such values, but also now my values, uh, so this number of values uh, in the range 0 to 255. So I have much more data to store. Okay, again, so this is maybe a bit naive way for image compression. There are way better methods uh, than this, um, but the idea is there, right? So we can use clustering also for compression and maybe also now in this image uh, segmentation or an analysis task also for segmentation because now pixels that are of similar color, they are closer together. So we have sort of the segmentation of, let's say, blue and, and yellow. Of course, a bit uh, silly method for segmentation because it doesn't take any spatial relations into account, right? Just similarities between colors. Okay, uh, enough for uh, about image compression. And um, there are also, also some limitations of k-means uh, clustering. And one of the main limitation is that k-means clustering only generates spherical clusters. So let's write it down, only generates spherical clusters. And this has to do with the fact that my clustering is based on distances of points to my cluster centers, uh, based on the Euclidean distance. And then, well, uh, all points with equal distance to my cluster that forms a sphere, right? So with this kind of complex health moon data sets, uh, you will never make uh, a proper uh, clustering with k-means clustering. Another uh, limitation of k-means clustering is that each cluster has the same size. So let me write it down, each cluster Each cluster is of equal size. And that's in this mouse data set. So this is sort of a, a Mickey Mouse kind of figure. So we have a face and, and two ears over here. Um, ideally, we want to cluster these ears uh, separately. And if you work with three classes, um, again, because we use this same Euclidean distance for each class, we end up with clusters of, of about equal size. And of course, we can increase the number of, of clusters. This sort of solves the problem because now um, each cluster is of about equal size and then these ears can be separated and then I would just need still need a way to, to cluster the face using these three uh, separate clusters. But that could be considered a limitation of k-means clustering, right? That each cluster is assumed to be of equal size and whereas in practice most data sets this will not be the case and we will come up with a solution to this in, in our probabilistic uh, framework actually. Now we can come up with some interesting points of improvements for uh, k-means clustering. Uh, first of all, uh, recall that this uh, error function that we minimize, so this j, is actually a sum over all my data points and the sum over all my clusters of z and k and then the Euclidean distance of xn to my cluster mean, my k cluster mean. And so this is a fu an error function which decomposes into a sum of individual errors that I make. So this also again makes it a candidate for stochastic uh, gradient descent for minimizing this particular thing. So that's nice. So also for this k-means clustering we can apply stochastic gradient descent to minimize j for example to update our cluster means. So that gives me the following update rule. And in that way I can come up with a very efficient algorithm that only considered uh, one data point at a time. Now one issue that I pointed out in the previous slide is that this k-means clustering is based on uh, the Euclidean distance of, of a point to the cluster mean. And so what we could also do is consider other type of distances between points. And this actually results to uh, what is known to be the k medoids algorithm. So it follows the same structure as the k-means cluster. Uh, but now uh, my distance, my Euclidean distance can be replaced by 
any other um, dissimilarity measure or distance between uh, my, my, my points Xn and, and clusters mu k. And in this way, we can also introduce distances that are less sensitive to outliers. Uh, maybe you recall from previous videos that uh, this least squares minimization problem is highly sensitive to outliers, especially in the, the classification case where I'm dealing with uh, discrete data. Maybe also when my data isn't uh, nicely Euclidean, I can introduce different type of, uh, of distance metrics essentially. Okay, so in summary, the k-means clustering algorithm, it is a very famous algorithm and it's widely used uh, primarily because it is so simple to implement and it is a very fast algorithm. But it also suffers from some uh, problems, right? Uh, first of all, we saw that it uh, only converges to local minima, uh, so it does not provide a global optimal partitioning of my data. Um, we saw that the clusters that arise from uh, k-means clustering, they are... Uh, sort of spherical, right, because of this Euclidean distance. And also the k-means clustering algorithm is sensitive to the scales of features. And with that, I mean the following. Suppose my data looks like this. So I have, let's say, a two-dimensional data set of points, which are maybe stretched in one direction. So this distribution, and we have another set of points stretched in the, uh, along also the same direction then ideally you would want to cluster this uh, into these elongated clusters, right? Uh, but what's happening with k-means clustering is, again, that we assume a Euclidean distance. So we draw these circular clusters uh, at these points. Still, they would be able to find this um, division between the data sets, uh, but you can imagine that maybe uh, this algorithm is sensitive to changes along uh, this direction compared to uh, this direction. Now, ideally, you want your uh, clustering algorithm to take this anisotropic distance into account, or alternatively, we can uh, pre-process our data to make it isotropic. And that's something that we will learn in uh, the lecture 10. Uh, when we talk about principal component analysis, we will introduce a whitening operator, which turns this data set into, uh, well, isotropic point clouds. So we can turn this into isotropic features uh, via a widening operator, and that makes it actually more, the data more suitable to work with uh, k-means clustering. Um, another limitation of k-means clustering is um, that we have to choose the number of clusters in advance. Uh, so this requires some pre-knowledge from us. So like, okay, I'm going to assume that there's k latent clusters in my data sets. Maybe because someone told me so, or maybe I inspected the data and I roughly saw two point clouds. Okay, but then there's also a lot of heuristics for automatically determine uh, the right amount of clusters K, which we're not going to cover in, in, in this course actually. Um, and then finally, and this is what we're going to solve in the upcoming videos, is that now the cluster assignments are hard. And if you have overlap between the distributions, then maybe you're not fully sure whether a point belongs either to the red class or to the blue class. And we can deal with this uh, via a probabilistic uh, modeling approach. And that's what we're going to discuss next using Gaussian mixture models. Before I proceed to uh, Gaussian mixture models, I'd like to briefly go over the method of Lagrange multipliers for solving constraint optimization problems. Um, in the upcoming video, we will be optimizing Gaussian mixture models, uh, and this involves a constraint optimization step. Moreover, uh, later on in this course, we will again encounter constraint optimization problems, which we will solve by the method of Lagrange multipliers. Uh, so it's worthwhile to take a moment and go over this method. Now, the setting is that we're set out to find the maximum uh, location of this uh, function f. So f is the function that we're maximizing, but we're doing this subject to a constraint, which we're going to uh, denote as follows. Uh, and this is maybe abstractly put, but what you look at here, we say that my point x should lie on this level set, right? This g of x equals c represents a level set. So all the, all the, the values that are that takes some constant value that's actually denoted over here. Uh, but maybe let's make this a bit concrete. Um, so my g of x could be, for example, the function that takes the length of my vector x, and we want this to be equal to some number. So we're looking for points x uh, which have a particular length. This could be a constraint, right? 
So this g of x can be thought of as this function that spits out the length for each possible x. So this really is a function and um, setting it equal to c uh, creates this level sets of points uh, that indeed all have the same uh, length. All right, um, maybe we could make this a bit more uh, visual. So let's say, uh, so I'm now plotting my function g of x as some density, right? Uh, so that's how I'm going to uh, plot this. So give me a moment to draw this. Okay, so this, this gray region could represent my function, my constraint uh, function g of x. Um, so maybe darker means a, a higher value or a lower value. Uh, but the idea is that then when we fix some c, we select all points which have the same value, right? So that creates this level set. So this level set then defines the points of x, uh, the points x that satisfy uh, this constraint. So we want our solution to lie somewhere on this red uh, level set encoded via my well constraint g of x is c okay so that's uh, the constraint but then we're mainly interested in finding the maximum of this particular function uh, f of x uh, so let me also make a drawing uh, of this okay so suppose this orange red region is the function that we want to maximize and it has its maximum over here at this point so darker means uh, higher values so actually my really my optimal location would be at this point uh, but now um, I am optimizing under this constraint so I actually only am allowed to pick points on this red curve okay and now the Lagrange multiplier method uh, provides me a way of finding this point which really takes on the maximum value of this f of x but still lies on this uh, constraint on this uh, level set and the idea is as follows uh, first of all we note uh, that this useful property that the gradient of g of x the gradient of this function that defines my uh, constraint is always perpendicular to well this constraint level set that, that's really a property of level sets so that's also nicely discussed in uh, the appendix e of the book of bishop actually this entire lagrange multiply method uh, can be found also in, in that uh, chapter um, but what it says really is that if i take uh, the gradient of g so this will be the gradient of g um, it, it always is perpendicular to this uh, level set so wherever i look on this level set the gradient of g is perpendicular to it then another uh, important observation to make is that at this constraint maximum the gradient of f so the function that we want to maximize uh, this gradient should also point uh, perpendicular to this uh, constraint surface uh, because if i for example consider this point the gradient of f points in this direction so this would be the gradient of f and this actually means that i still have a component of this vector along this level set right because we if we want to optimize f so now we're talking about optimizing so this can be done via gradient ascent so we walk uphill towards the maximum so actually i want to move along this gradient and now the problem is constrained so i cannot make the step directly in this gradient direction but i could only move along my uh, level set along my constraint and since uh, this gradient still has a component uh, in this direction so I could actually move in this direction and that would optimize my function f. So as long as this gradient isn't uh, perpendicular to, um, well, the gradient of, of g, I am still able to move into a direction uh, that, um, that optimizes f. So suppose you do that, then at this point the gradient again points in some direction which isn't fully perpendicular to my level set so it allows me to move a bit in this direction. And at some point, really when there's no improvement anymore to make then the gradient both of f and uh, the gradient of my um, constraint they are either parallel or anti-parallel okay so this tells us that at a constraint maximum the gradient of f should also be perpendicular to the constraint surface otherwise i would still have a component of this gradient uh, which isn't fully perpendicular to my level set and that would allow me to well update uh, my point x a little bit in the right direction um, but when they are both perpendicular uh, then well I cannot further improve my, my function values anymore 
Okay, so this means that at such an optimal location, uh, the gradient of f and the gradient of g are either parallel or anti-parallel. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they have to be the same, right? Uh, they can point in different directions and they can have different lengths. Uh, but it essentially means that there exists such a, a value lambda such that the sum of these two uh, gradients equals zero. And this lambda value uh, will be called the Lagrange multiplier. So with that said, uh, we basically are saying that at such an optimal location x, we need to satisfy a uh, this constraint uh, for some optimum value lambda, which we are not sure yet what this value is, but there exists such a lambda such that uh, this constraint is satisfied. And now it's going to be helpful to work with a so-called Lagrangian function. So this Lagrangian function is a function of x and lambda, um, which uh, basically is my function that I'm going to all multiply plus lambda times, uh, well, this is actually the constraint that we need to satisfy. Because then what you then see if we look for uh, stationary points of this Lagrangian function, so the points where the derivative with respect to x and with respect to lambda are both zero, that's a stationary point, so an optimal location, an optimal setting for x and lambda. We see that such a stationary point of my Lagrangian function uh, satisfies uh, my uh, original constraint, right? Because if this is satisfied, so let's say the derivative of x um, of this Lagrangian function, then this means I'm obtaining uh, this criterion, right? Uh, the derivative with respect to f gives me the gradient of f plus lambda times the gradient of g uh, of x. So that's really results in this uh, particular constraint. And if we find a solution for uh, the second thing, so the derivative to, uh, to lambda of my Lagrangian function, then this really implies that um, my constraint really, uh, the constraint is satisfied because the derivative of uh, my Lagrangian with respect to lambda will give me g of x minus c, which we set equal to zero. So that defines a stationary point and that gives me this equation. So we see uh, we can introduce a Lagrangian function and if we find an optimal location in this Lagrangian function with respect to x and lambda, we have solved our constraint uh, optimization problem. Okay, so it's probably helpful to take a look at some concrete example. Um, so the situation is as follows. So we're set out to maximize this function of two uh, variables, a function of x1 and x2, and it looks like this. And it's uh, graphically depicted over here with these blue um, contours. And then we have this constraint, uh, which is encoded as follows. So we have the constraint that x1 plus x2 minus one should equal to zero. So again, let's make this drawing. So f of x is the function that we want to optimize and we see immediately for x1 and x2 equals zero, then this thing is uh, maximal, right? Because for every deviation from zero, this thing will get smaller. So um, this function is concentrated uh, around zero. Uh, so let me, make again the same drawing with these uh, sort of density plots. Okay, so darker means a higher value, right? So uh, this red orange colored plot represents my function that I want to optimize. And really the optimal location is right at uh, the point x1, x2 is zero, uh, but we're not allowed to select this point because we need to find points that lie on this uh, constraint uh, surface or this constraint level set. Um, and so this level set is obtained by taking a look at uh, g uh, of x1 and x2, right? So let me also make a plot of that. So this g of x is really a, a linear function, right? Which has a certain uh, direction. So along this direction, we have an increase of, uh, of g of x. So the, the gradient of so this is the gradient of g always points in, in this uh, particular direction. And let's again take a look at um, this intuition of, of, of Lagrange multipliers. So the gradient of f points in this direction. So that actually means if I select this point, I could still improve my function values f by moving in this direction. I'm not fully allowed to move in this direction, but I'm still allowed to move along this, um, this level set. So basically the next optimal point uh, would be this thing. And if I look at this location, my gradient points somewhere in this direction. So I still have this component uh, on, along my level set, which allows me to move, move in this direction. But really at some point, uh, my gradient 
points in the same direction as the gradient of uh, my, my constraint function. And then there's no way that I can improve my function values uh, f anymore by, by moving along this line. So this is, this is again a recap of uh, really this constraint, right? So we just again showed that at such an optimal location, the gradient of x uh, is aligned with the gradient of, of, of g with some multiplier lambda because delta g and delta f are not necessarily the same. So they can have different lengths and different uh, signs, but at least their directions are the same. So there exists such a lambda for which uh, these two gradients uh, are the same. So that was the principle of this uh, method of Lagrange multiplier. So um, we define then this Lagrangian function because then if we compute the stationary point of this function, we actually found our solution. So this is the Lagrange function that we're now going to define, where this thing over here is my function f of x1 and x2. And this thing over here is lambda times g of x minus c, but c is uh, zero in this example, right? So this is then uh, my Lagrangian uh, function. And then we're going to look for the optimizers uh, of this function. So we take the derivative with respect to x1, x2, and lambda, set it to zero, and then solve this system of equations for x1, x2, and lambda. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, the derivative uh, with respect to x1, we see an x1 over here, so that gives me minus 2x1. We see an x1 over here, the derivative will give me plus lambda. So this directly tells me that x1 is going to be um, lambda over 2. Uh, the same here in the x2 case, we find this uh, uh, equation. If we solve it, we get x2 is also lambda over 2. And if we take the derivative with respect to lambda, so that gives me this constraint uh, function really. And we can now fill in the x1 and x2 that we just uh, derived. And that tells me that lambda equals 1. Okay, so this tells me that the optimizer of this constraint optimization problem is given by the following. So x1 takes on the value a half, x2 takes on the value a half. And this lambda was used as, as an aid in deriving this solution, essentially. Okay, so that describes the method of Lagrange multipliers for uh, solving constraint optimization problems. So the recipe is uh, define the function that you want to, to optimize and also write your constraint in the following form. As a function, g of x equals uh, some c. And then with this, you can define such a Lagrangian function. So f of x plus lambda times g of x minus c. And once you have defined such a Lagrangian function, then only thing that is left is look for uh, the stationary points. So set the derivative of x to zero, set the derivative of lambda to zero, solve it, and that will give you your constraint uh, solution. In this video, we are again going to adopt a probabilistic viewpoint on machine learning now in the setting of unsupervised learning via latent variable models. We are going to assume that the data is distributed via a mixture of Gaussians, and it turns out that with such a viewpoint on the data distribution, we obtain a probabilistic variation of the k-means clustering algorithm. Now the idea is as follows, so we have this, this data, unlabeled data, so we only have uh, measurements x, uh, but we assume they are distributed via some probability distribution that is composed out of a mixture of Gaussians. Like some points come from one of those Gaussian distributions which have a certain mean and variance, and some points come from, a, from another distribution. And now we're going to model this in the generative setting. So recall from the, the classification videos that this uh, generative modeling is, is the most, is the broadest class of probabilistic modeling, right? Because it, um, well, the goal is to end up with a model for the probability distribution uh, from which these data points x are drawn. So that means once I have such a description of the probability distribution, I can generate new data samples. So that's the generative aspect of things. Uh, but we also have been obtaining such models via marginalization process. So we assume uh, that there is such a latent variable, so the three different classes, and then my probability distribution over x is obtained by marginalizing out this latent variable uh, z. And what we did so far is we factorized this. So we said that this joint uh, can be obtained by the product of these latent variable conditional distributions. So uh, what is the probability of observing an x if I know that I'm looking at uh, my latent variable uh, z times 
the prior or the, the probability for observing any of such uh, z at all. And note that this is similar to what we've been doing in the classification uh, case, right? Where we also worked with such uh, class conditional distributions. So the probability of observing a particular x if I know that this data point came from the class, uh, well, uh, z in this case, in combination with a prior probability for observing that particular class at all. Now we work in the unlabeled data setting, so we do not really know which classes there are, but we're just going to assume there is such a ordering or structuring in my, in my data where each data point came from one of the latent variables uh, and uh, maybe some of the such latent variables are more likely to occur than others. So we make the splitting as follows. So these would be my uh, latent variable conditional distributions and this would be the prior for the latent variable. And then just as in the classification case, once we have obtained such a, a latent variable conditional distribution and we have these latent variable uh, priors, we can obtain via base rule also the posterior uh, probabilities for observing this latent variable given my observation x. Okay, now let's go over what I just described, but now uh, graphically. So um, first of all, this is our data. So we have all these measurements x without any label, any information on the latent variable. So we just color code it here in, in purple or pink. Um, so these are just my data points but I'm going to make this modeling choice, right? I say that uh, this data actually comes from such a joint distribution of a point X and a particular latent variable uh, Z. So that's essentially, so we say that this, in this plot, the data comes from my distribution P of X, but we make this a breakdown. So we say that actually we're observing a data point X together with their latent variable class, which is drawn from this joint uh, distribution so whenever we observe a data point, we think of it as it actually belongs to a particular class. So the blue, the blue class, for example, or it, it belongs to, to, to the green class. So every time I observe a data point, X, and actually also maybe such a latent variable. So that's color coded here, a point with a color. Uh, but then when we do this marginalization, we discard uh, this color or this uh, latent variable, and we just end up with these uh, points. So that's sort of a modeling approach. And then we split this joint probability distribution into these latent variable conditional distributions and, well, the prior for that uh, latent variable. Where my latent variable distributions are assumed to be Gaussians with a certain uh, mean and a certain uh, standard deviation or a covariance matrix. And then we assume a Gaussian distribution for each of these uh, latent variable uh, classes. So what's indicated here in blue is basically saying a data point a blue is drawn from this uh, class conditional or this latent variable conditional distribution. Um, let's say Z is uh, blue. So really what this says, it says that uh, my final data distribution is obtained as a mixture of Gaussians, right? Each Gaussian has its mean and uh, covariance matrix. So those are uh, these conditional probability distributions and we are weighting these distributions with a particular probability for observing that particular uh, latent variable. So these will be called the mixing coefficients in the end, and these are my Gaussians. So that gives a Gaussian mixture model. Okay, and then uh, because we adopt such a generic, a generative model, we can also infer the, the, the posterior probabilities of observing a particular uh, data point set. Right, so um, that's color coded here. So these are the posterior probabilities from my latent variable given my observation X. Meaning if I observe a particular X, I can check for the probability uh, that it belongs to uh, ZS1, ZS2, or ZS3, and I'm going to color code that in this particular plot. So if a point clearly com came from the blue class, it's, it's colored blue. When it came from the green class, it's, it's green, um, according to my uh, probabilistic model. Uh, but when I'm uncertain, I'm going to mix these colors. Like I'm going to mix the ink that uh, sort of generated these uh, colors. So that's graphically depicted over here. So in, es in essence, this is a sort of K a soft version of the K-means clustering method, right? Because I, now if I have a new data point, I assign a probability of it belonging to one of the classes. I'm not going to say this belongs to the blue class. I'm just going to say with this probability, it belongs to the blue cra uh, class. Okay, so that's the setting of this Gaussian mixture model. Uh, we can use it 
um, well, to model our data distribution and then run it in the generative setting to generate new data points that sort of follow the distribution that we have been observing so far. But we can also use it uh, for, uh, let's say, cluster assignments in a soft probabilistic way. Okay, so then essentially what we're doing is we made these observations of these data points and then we're going, we're going to model the distribution that may have generated this data point, right? So we are going to parameterize our probability distribution in the following way. So, uh, well, that's just explained. So we explain this with a Gaussian distribution and this with just a probability, just a number uh, for observing this particular latent variable. And I'm going to describe in detail how we're going to model these distributions. But once we have such a model for the distributions, uh, we can, of course, maximize the likelihood of uh, my uh, distribution actually describing this data. So again, once we have a probabilistic model, we can optimize it so we can tune all these parameters um, via the maximum likelihood approach. So that's really the principle that we're going to stick to. And that's what we're going to do again today. So we're constructing this probabilistic model uh, P of X. And we're going to model these uh, conditionals with Gaussians and these distributions uh, essentially with uh, generalized Bernoulli distributions, just like we've done before also in this generative uh, classification setting. Okay, so let's go over our modeling approach. Uh, first of all, we assume that we're dealing with discrete latent variables, which really means that I'm going to assume that there are only k clusters or k classes that describe my model. Uh, I'm going to factorize uh, my distribution with only k, in this example, three uh, different classes. That, that is what it means. Uh, so this is a discrete variable that only can take on the value 0 or 1. So my data point can only belong to one of these uh, clusters. Right, so then I need uh, to describe this probability distribution for the probability that my data point belongs to this particular class, meaning that, that zk equals 1. And I'm going to model that with just this number, uh, like we've done before in the classification setting. So this pi k is really the probability of observing my uh, k class. Okay, so this number should represent a probability, so it should take on the value between 0 and 1. And also, because we consider this as a probability, the sum over all my k classes uh, should equal to 1, right? So this really imposes a constraint, which we have to deal with uh, later on when we actually start to find, uh, optimize for these particular values uh, by k, because these are now my model parameters, right? Then I'm going to model the clusters uh, with Gaussians, meaning that these cluster conditional distributions are going to be modeled uh, with Gaussian distributions. Again, so these kind of distributions are going to be modeled with Gaussians and each Gaussian has a particular mean and it has a particular covariance matrix which defines the shape of uh, this distribution. And of course, then with these two uh, modeling choices together, so we have a prior and these cluster conditionals, we can obtain the joint probability distribution for observing an X together with a particular um, cluster label or value for the, the latent variable. So it's, it's going to be the, the product of my uh, cluster or a latent variable conditional distributions, which we modeled with a Gaussian, and then the product with these uh, priors, which we modeled with uh, these numbers uh, pi k. And then with these two components, uh, we have everything in place to construct a generative model, right? So in the end, we were uh, modeling our distribution for the data point x, which can be obtained uh, via this joint probability for x with the latent variable, the unobserved uh, latent class, let's say, um, yeah, via this marginalization process, right? So we can run this in the generative setting. And um, let me explain that what I mean with that. So we can generate new data points by first drawing a latent variable according to my uh, prior distribution, which I'm now modeling. I have these pi k's. So with probability pi k, I select, well, the k uh, cluster. Then I'm going to use this Kate cluster to generate a new data point given my uh, cluster conditionals or my latent conditional points. And that then would give me a point somewhere um, well in line with the distribution that I uh, had observed so far. So running this in a generative setting would mean I randomly pick a color according to my uh, priors, a blue, uh, green or red. And then suppose I pick the red point 
and then I'm going to uh, generate a data point according to my Gaussian distribution and it gives me a point maybe somewhere over here. So then we generated a new data point. Okay, so that explains the generative aspect of things. Uh, but maybe we are also interested in inferring uh, the posterior probabilities from my latent variable. So this is actually um, inferring the latent cluster, meaning that if I made an observation for a point X, I can assign probabilities to this point belonging to one of these unobserved clusters. And this follows from Bayes' rule, right? So we have this uh, cluster conditional uh, times the prior uh, divided by uh, the, the evidence, so my marginalized distribution. So um, if you write this out, it's as follows. So this P of X can be obtained by the marginalization over my clusters. So now here indexed uh, with a J. So this is actually my joint probability distribution factorized, factorized in these two uh, components. So, and if we then insert our uh, modeling choices, so we said the priors were modeled with some uh, number of pi k and the conditionals were uh, modeled with Gaussian distributions, then this is really uh, the formula for obtaining my conditional, uh, my posterior probability for, um, well, my observed data point X belonging to one of the, the latent uh, clusters. And for convenience, really, we're going to introduce this new symbol, gamma. So this, this gamma will be called uh, the responsibility. So really the responsibility, responsibility that class K takes for explaining data point X. Okay, so that's an, a symbol that we introduced now, this gamma set K is essentially the posterior probability for uh, my, my Kate class given my observation X and it will be called the responsibility, the responsibility that my Kate class uh, takes for explaining data point X. And in a way it's something like this, when I observe a new data point X, if it's close to point blue, then uh, the blue class is pretty certain and says, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this belongs to my class. So I take this high responsibility for this point. But if my point is somewhere between classes, then both classes, uh, produce a low posterior probability and in that sense take a low responsibility for this particular point. Um, but either way, this name uh, responsibility really refers to uh, the posterior probability. Okay, so we have such a probabilistic model and we have observed our data points, right? And well, we can model uh, now my distributions, uh, which the, with these uh, pi's and the, the mu and the sigmas of my uh, uh, Gaussian distributions but I still have to set those, right? So I have this uh, probabilistic model and now I want to infer what parameters are most optimal, uh, which parameters lead to the distribution that most likely explain my data. So with this in place, I can define the log likelihood and we're going to maximize this um, in order to find the optimal parameters uh, that describe my data. So we've done this uh, many times before. So we define our probability distribution. We have our data, so we can define uh, the likelihood and we can define the log likelihood. Um, so we make this IID assumption again, that each data point was drawn from the distribution that we're actually uh, modeling. So then we can make uh, this factorization over all my individual uh, data points. Now, the log of this factorization results in the sum of all these log likelihoods for the individual data points. Uh, but now things get tricky uh, because so far uh, our distributions were relatively simple. It was just an exponential or some other distribution and then the log of this thing gave, gave us something nice. But now we're considering this mixture of Gaussian. So actually we, we have to take the log of a sum of different components. And this is something that we can no longer analytically write out. So really because of this sum over here, the log of the sum of these components, I cannot further, let me write it down. I cannot further simplify this because of the sum. So what now, how are we going to maximize this log likelihood? Now we're going to do this via the expectation maximization algorithm. So we're going to iteratively improve our log likelihood and I'm going to explore, uh, explain that in the upcoming slides. Okay, so this is what we're set out to do. We're going to maximize the likelihood with respect to my uh, model parameters. And so this is the likelihood, the log likelihood actually. So let me write this down. This is the log of the likelihood of my entire data set. So I'm going to abbreviate it with P of 
uh, capital X. And what we've been doing so far, uh, we maximize this by uh, looking for the stationary points of my log likelihood. And that means that if I, for example, want to optimize uh, with respect to my parameter mu k, I take the derivative of mu k of my log likelihood and set it to zero and then solve it for mu k. But now, because we have this complicated expression, so uh, the log of the sum of all these components, I can no longer find a nice expression for mu k. Because if I take this derivative, I still have something that um, depends on all my other parameters. But what I could do, and this is the trick behind the expectation maximization algorithm, I'm ca I can write my uh, solution for mu k. So, well, it is some expression. And I'm going to keep it still as a function of these responsibilities, z and k. So that's the essential approach uh, behind this. So I cannot find a nice closed form solution from mu k because this, if I take this derivative, set this to zero, uh, solve it from mu k, I still have something which depends on mu k, sigma k, and the other parameters. Uh, but it turns out that we can group all the remaining parameters into this responsibility term. So this responsibility term still depends on my other parameters. So on pi k, on uh, even on mu k, and uh, the sigma k's. But what I'm going to do in this expectation uh, maximization algorithm, I'm going to fix uh, these, uh, these posterior probabilities or these responsibilities, and then solve for my mu k's and all the other parameters. So and then I have obtained these new parameters, I can update my responsibilities, and then again, uh, again, iterate this uh, solution, this maximization step, and solve for uh, the parameters. And I think in the, the upcoming uh, slides, it will become clear what I actually mean with this derivation step and how this uh, scheme works. But the general structure is uh, we can eventually find local minima of this uh, highly non convex optimization problem by alternating the following step. So we can update the expected posterior so this isn't our final posterior yet but we call it the expected posterior so given my current parameters I can evaluate these posterior distributions or these posterior uh, probabilities so that's like an assignment step right each data point is assigned to one of the k classes uh, via these posterior uh, probabilities and then once we made this assignment we can actually just fill in the, the solutions that we derive from mu k as a function of these uh, posteriors, as a function of these responsibilities. And that gives us the pi case, the mu case, and the sigma case, so my model parameters that maximize um, my log likelihood for a fixed uh, posterior. So in a bit more detail, the expectation maximization algorithm is as follows. So I said we are going to maximize the log likelihood. This log likelihood is a complicated function uh, because if we adopt the strategy that we've been doing so far, let's look for stationary points, then we cannot find a closed form expression from mu k, but we find something that depends on uh, these gammas, on these posteriors. Now, this is a preview of what is coming up. So I am going to derive how to obtain these mu k's, these pi k's, and how to express this in, in terms of these, uh, these gammas. But this is a preview that shows that we can actually find this mu case in terms of this gamma. The same for the sigmas. So we are able to find such expressions. So that means that we can actually iteratively update our model parameters. So once we know, uh, once we have evaluated our posterior distribution, so once we have made this assignment during the expected step, we can update our model parameters, mu k, pi k, sigma k, and once we've updated our model parameters, we can update our uh, posteriors. And we keep on iterating this. And this actually gives us then a algorithm which is very similar to what we've been doing in the k-means clustering algorithm. And it is as follows. So we first initialize uh, the pi case, the mu k, and the sigma k. So let's just initialize it with just some random mean and some isotropic uh, covariance matrix. Okay, so then with these initial parameters, I can perform the E step. I can update the expected posterior. So I can update the expected posterior, gamma, z, and k. 
So this comma refers to the posterior probability of a data point uh, X belonging to that particular class, right? So that's color coded here. So we can make these soft assignments with uh, a certain probability. And let's say this point belongs to the blue class and also with a certain probability it belongs to the red class. And in this particular case, we get a sort of mixing of these colors uh, because there isn't a very strong assignment that we can make. Okay, so now we have updated our gammas and once we have done that, we can move on to the maximization step. So the step that actually maximizes uh, my log likelihood via uh, the, <coughs> the following update rule. So that's the maximization step, which basically says that I'm now going to find my new model parameter. So the mean of my Gaussian distribution and its covariance matrix such that it is most likely describing this particular set of points that are probably belonging to uh, the blue class. Okay, so then we have these new model parameters. Then again, we can update our posterior probabilities of a particular data point belonging to this class. And that gives me this new uh, expected uh, uh, update step, right? And then with these new gammas, I can ob uh, again obtain uh, my new model parameters in this maximization step. And then I'm iterating this expectation maximization steps until I uh, converged uh, to something nice. And at this point, it's maybe worthwhile to point out that this expectation maximization algorithm for Gaussian mixture modules, uh, models is actually much slower than the k-means clustering because here, only after 20 of such iterations, I am able to find a uh, configuration that doesn't change anymore uh, between uh, succeeding steps, steps. Now I'll get back to this point of slow convergence uh, later on. But this essentially described the expectation maximization step. Um, so this was a preview and I haven't really showed how to derive uh, this maximization step, how to derive uh, these expressions. So that's what I'm going to do next. So we set out to maximize the log likelihood. We take the derivative of this thing, set it to zero, and then uh, define our solution in terms of these uh, posterior probabilities. And I'm going to start off with deriving this expression uh, from mu k. Uh, so let's do that. And before we get there, I want to make this following remark, which is a recurring uh, thing in the upcoming derivation that, well, first of all, we are working with multivariate, uh, multivariate Gaussians uh, to model our conditional distributions. So for a given class k, I model the probability of observing an x with, with such a Gaussian. And now I'm going to take the derivative uh, with respect to mu k of, of this Gaussian. And really here I want to show that the derivative of such a Gaussian is again a Gaussian multiplied uh, with this uh, front vector, with this particular vector. And you can imagine where this comes from, right? Because this Gaussian is this exponential and the derivative of an exponential is the exponential itself times the derivative of the things inside the exponent. So that leads to the fact that I'm seeing this Gaussian again. That's uh, because of the exponent. And then we have this term over here, and that's because of the derivative inside uh, the exponent. And this follows from taking the derivative delta mu k of a half x minus mu k transpose inverse covariance x minus mu k. And we've computed these uh, derivatives uh, before in the exercise classes. Uh, so essentially this derivative is given by um, a half times x minus mu. In the previous videos, we covered unsupervised learning with discrete latent variable models. In the upcoming videos, we will consider continuous latent variable models instead. And before we move on to a full probabilistic interpretation of such models, uh, we start off with a non-probabilistic version of it. Today we will talk about principal component analysis. It is a method for dimensionality reduction which can be derived via several principles. Now in this video we will derive principal component analysis via a maximum variance formulation and in the next videos we will derive it using a minimal reconstruction error viewpoint and a probabilistic viewpoint. Now the main goal of such continuous latent variable models really is dimensionality reduction. So the goal is dimensionality reduction, um, where we treat our data. So our data lives in a high dimensional space. For example, my image can be of 100 by 100 pixels, uh, but we're going to assume that actually the, the true underlying data structure is of lower dimension. 
And maybe this is best explained by an example such as uh, the following. So let's say we are observing these images of a tree and this tree is generated by uh, well, by, by shifting it, so by translating it a, li a little bit to the right or to the, uh, to the top, uh, rotate it a little bit. So we have all these images that uh, represent a tree and this tree is rotated and translated. Now the images in itself are highly high dimensional, right? So they're 100 by 100, so let's say 10,000 pixels and each pixel value can take on really any value on the real line. But so if I were to generate one random image, I would have so many possibilities for, uh, I could pick a value for each of these 10,000 values. Uh, so that's what we see. We see all these images consisting of these 10,000 pixel values, but we see a lot of similarities uh, between these images, right? And now, especially in this particular case, once you realize that all these images are a tree, it's just that they're translated and, and rotated, uh, this actually means that if I have one core representation, this particular tree, then actually my latent space only consists of three parameters. So that will be the, trans the two, two translation parameters and one rotation parameter. So if I have this core representation of the tree, then I can generate any of these images with just three values. Now that's the idea about dimensionality reduction. That we assume that there is such a structure that actually my data comes from a lower dimensional space and what we observe may be high dimensional but intrinsically it, it's, it's of low dimension and we want to recover this particular uh, manifold or this particular low dimensional description of the data. Now of course this is a very simplistic example right but the idea of such lower dimensional uh, manifolds it makes sense and it works in a lot of applications but if we stick for example to this uh, digit recognition uh, example uh, we could consider the latent space to be much bigger, right? Uh, there's so much variations uh, that take place. Uh, we could consider scaling, for example. Uh, we could consider not just the digit tree, but all digits uh, zero to nine. We could consider different colors and different handwriting styles, and, and this goes on, right? But still, even if you consider all those variations that you can expect, then it's very probable that the, the number of latent variables will still be much fewer than the, the 10,000 dimensions that my images really have so the, the, the size of this vector space so it makes sense to proceed in, into this direction of dimensionality uh, reduction right now in this example uh, the latent space is a non-linear transformation of the image right because i cannot just uh, transform like a scaling parameter in one step to an image it probably is a very complicated model to do so but in principle this is how we could treat it so we're searching for this uh, latent subspace uh, which we can then transform to our final observation. So these actual digits via some model and this model can be highly nonlinear. Uh, maybe that uh, I'll, I'll cover that a little bit in, in uh, video 10.4. Uh, but for now, we really stick with latent variable models uh, that represent a linear embedding of my data. And later we consider the generalizations uh, to, uh, to the nonlinear case. So that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to find a linear projection of the data and we're going to do it in such a way that the variance of this projected data is maximal. So what we're essentially after in this principal component analysis framework with this maximal variance approach is that we, we have this high dimensional data. So we have points in a high dimensional space and we observe variations in several directions. And our task is to, to recover these uh, principal directions, these principal component among which the variation is, is maximal. So, so the idea is that we, uh, for example, measure high dimensional uh, vectors. Uh, I can only draw this in 2D now, so 2 is high dimensional in this case. So we have all these measurements and we want to reduce these 2D measurements to just a 1D uh, component. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, the axis of maximal variation. For example, if I take a look at this data, it's elongated in one structure, so we have a lot of variation in this direction little variation in this direction. So if I'm going to make a projection, um, it's best I do it along this direction and maybe not so relevant to do it along this direction. So our objective now is to recover these axes of uh, maximal variations and these axes will be called principal components. So this is again summarized over here, maybe now in a bit more detail. So I have this data set of, of points, observe, these observations which lie in some d-dimensional space. Again, here's a 2D uh, visualization. So these are my uh, 2D observed uh, data points. 
And now I want to project this to a lower dimensional space. So I want to project it on this line. So now a 2D point is represented with a 1D point somewhere on this line. And this projections will, uh, will be done via orthogonal projections, right? So if I have this data point, I look for the closest point on this direction, on this line, and that will be my new embedding. And then my objective is to find this direction among which uh, the, the variation in my point is large. So if I look at this, I have variation is large. And of course, this is a relative notion of variance. So let me pick another direction for to compare it with. Suppose I picked this direction. So this will would have been my, my uh, U1. Now, if I project the points to this uh, particular line, uh, then this point ends up over here, this point somewhere over here, uh, this one over here, this one over here. Then along this line, I actually have a, a smaller variation in comparison to the projection to this uh, purple line over here, indicated in green, this variance. So my objective now is to find a direction U1 uh, that results in a maximum ver variance of the projected points onto this uh, line. Okay, so that is going to be my objective. And then instead of, so now this was a, a 2D to 1D mapping, an example, but in general, we consider D-dimensional uh, data points and we're going to project it to m-dimensional um, hypersurfaces or lower dimensional uh, spaces where m is assumed to be given. And now we, before we proceed, I just want to recap some uh, basic definitions that we've seen many times actually. So the mean is defined as, as follows. So we indicate it with uh, an overline x. So that will indicate the mean over all my data points. And then we have a covariance matrix obtained in the following way. And such a covariance matrix is then uh, given to be symmetric and positive definite. And these are some properties which we will uh, use later on. Okay, now let's try to build this up from a simple concept. And we start off with a 1D projection. So my data is D-dimensional and I want to project my data now onto this uh, one-dimensional line using this as a direction vector. Then the projection of such a data point onto this vector so it's simply given by taking this, this inner product, the scalar product, uh, this essentially gives me a single value, right? It gives me a scalar value, which I'm going to know with Zn1, and it's just a single value. Okay, and then we can also obtain uh, the mean of all these projections simply by uh, projecting the mean itself. And this actually directly follows from um, linearity of, of, of the mean. And with this, I mean, if I take the expectation over my uh, new um, projected values, I could do that by, of course, taking the expected value over these uh, projections. But by linearity of this expectation, I can take this uh, projection vector outside and order it in the following way. So you see, we can also first compute the mean of my data and then project it. Okay, but that, that's just a useful property. So what we're really after was this direction vector u1 and also really the length of a direction isn't too important. Actually, we're only interested in the direction itself, right? So we're going to search for uh, direction vectors u1 which have a length one. So we normalize this, uh, this direction vector. Okay, so the objective is to find the vectors u1 that really result in a projection with maximal uh, variance. So uh, let's take a look at the variance of the projected data. So the variance of this uh, projected component. Okay, so that's given here, right? So the, the, the average over the, the square distance of each projection to its mean. And we can see we can write it out into a convenient form. So first by starting off recognizing that this U1 uh, can be factorized in the following way. So then we have this form. And if we then write it out, so we expand the square uh, we see that we can write it in the, in the following way because this is a scalar product uh, between two vectors and I can change the order by putting a transpose and moving this to the left, put a transpose there and that gives me this term uh, multiplied with, well, the term that I already have. So this is nothing else as rewriting. And then because these u1s do not uh, depend on my index n, I, I can keep the, I can pull this sum inside and that gives me the following. And this we do recognize, right, as uh, the covariance of x, which we denoted with uh, this matrix S. 
Okay, so that gives me this very convenient expression for the variance of my projections, right? So this is what we were computing, the variance of my uh, projection in this uh, direction, uh, mu1. So this variance is really nicely given in a very uh, convenient way. Okay, and that's what we were doing, right? We were set out to maximize the variance of my projections. And so this is the variance of my projections and we want to maximize this, but we have to do this under this constraint that the, the, the length of these factor is one, right? Because if I do not do this, then maximizing this, we're just picking a U1, which is incredibly large. So then my objective would be infinite. So I really need this constraint. So let me write that down over here. Okay, so we're dealing with a constraint maximization problem. And we covered this before and we spent a separate video on this. Um, so we can do this via the method of Lagrange multipliers. And this method relied on the definition of a Lagrangian. So I had to define a function that I'm optimizing. So that, that's this particular thing. So f of u1 plus my Lagrange multiplier times my constraint function minus c, where this is my uh, constraint function. And then the steps were to, to compute the stationary points of this Lagrangian with respect to the parameters that you're optimizing, meaning that we have to take the derivative of my Lagrangian with respect to uh, u1, and that's given as follows, all right? It directly follows from this. And we set it to zero and then solve it for u1. So if we do this, so we compute this derivative, we solve it for u1, so we can write it in the following way, which really tells us that uh, the u1 that satisfies this constraint is an optimizer of my constraint uh, optimization problem. And this is uh, what you may recall from your uh, linear algebra course. This is that we have to uh, solve a uh, eigensystem uh, problem. So whenever we see this, that this matrix times a vector is the same vector, but just scaled with a, a scalar. Such a vector is called an eigenvector and this particular scalar, this lambda one, is called an eigenvalue. So this is a particular system of equations uh, called uh, an eigensystem. So this tells us that we're looking for u1 and lambda one, which are respe respectively called the eigenvector and eigenvalues of my matrix S. And in this particular context of principal component analysis, these u1s will be called principal components. And so these principal components are essentially the eigenvectors of my uh, matrix S. And then using this uh, identity, you can show that the variance of the projected uh, data is really given by a lambda one, right? So in the previous slide, we showed that if we project our data point onto such a vector, uh, then take a look at the variance, that this variance is given by u1 s u1. So this is the variance, and if we see that s times u1 uh, satisfies uh, this, this eigen uh, system constraint, and we can re replace s u1 with lambda u1, and since, so, okay, let me do that. So u1 transpose lambda 1 u1, that's lambda 1 u1 transpose u1, and that equals lambda 1, because, well, I have this constraint that uh, these vectors are of a uh, unit length. So that tells me that um, like uh, an, a matrix S has in principle as many eigenvectors as, as its dimension, right? So I can pick any of these U1s and that will be an optimizer of, of this problem. But really I'm looking for the one that maximizes this, uh, this function over here. And this function, the value of this function for a particular U1 is given by its eigenvalue. So this tells me that really uh, we are searching for the eigenvalue vector with largest eigenvalue. Okay, so we just looked at the one dimensional projection case. So if we were to pick one direction to which we want to project our data, then let it be the eigenvector with uh, the largest eigenvalue. But if you want to project this to an M dimensional space, then it turns out then we just need to select the, the M largest uh, eigenvectors, which really means it's going to be the, the vector of all these uh, projections at n1, at n2, etc., where each component is given by the projection onto, well, the first eigenvector, and then the second is obtained by projecting to the second eigenvector, etc. 
And that is indicated as follows, right? So our projection is going to be obtained in the following way. And before we uh, do this projection, we take the conven convention that we first center all our data points around uh, the mean. It really means if I have this uh, data set of points, what I'm first going to do is I'm first going to subtract the mean, which puts it around the origin. And then we project it on uh, the principal uh, directions. All right, so that is what we do with uh, principal component analysis. And this UM is then uh, the matrix in which all my uh, eigenvectors are put, the largest eigenvectors or the ve eigenvectors with largest eigenvalues, that's how I should call it, are put next to each other. And these eigenvectors are then indeed called uh, the principal components. So what we can do, we can compute all these eigenvectors and eigenvalues and we sort them in a decreasing uh, eigenvalue size. So the largest ones uh, will be indexed with one and then two, and the smallest one will be indexed with, uh, with the M, the M uh, eigenvalue. And because our matrix S is positive semi-definite, also my eigenvalues will be uh, positive. Okay, so it makes sense to select uh, the eigenvalue vectors with largest eigenvalue because then you can show that the total variance of the, the projected data is given simply by the sum of these eigenvalues. And we want this to be as large as possible. We want to capture the most variation. So we really need to pick the vectors with largest uh, eigenvalue. And I suppose this is really a definition, right? The, uh, the total uh, variance, because typically we talk about covariance of those uh, M-dimensional uh, vectors. The covariance matrix, it's a matrix, and now we want to reduce it to a single number. So what you could do, what's often done is simply take the trace of the covariance matrix, and this gives you a quantity that characterizes uh, the total variance. And then you can show that the trace of the covariance matrix of my uh, projected vectors uh, set, that this is given by the sum of the eigenvalues. I'm going to show that in the next slide, actually. So now the idea of these such eigen decompositions is that if I work with symmetric positive semi-definite matrices, then I can make the following factorization of my matrix S. So I can de decompose this into a diagonal matrix. So on, on this diagonal matrix, I have all the eigenvalues and these U's are then my eigenvectors. So the U's are the orthonormal uh, eigenvectors. And the idea is as follows. So suppose I have my uh, data and I have all these uh, data points, so centered around the origin. Then originally these data points are expressed in, well, uh, the, the basis that you usually work with. Then what these U matrices do, they really apply a rotation uh, to my data because they are, are uh, orthonormal. It means that if I uh, multiply with this matrix, so if I multiply with uh, U transpose, I'm actually performing a rotation of my data. So what I actually, I'm rewriting my data points in terms of these vectors. In terms of these eigenvectors actually. So I have this uh, covariance uh, matrix which characterizes, uh, well, the covariance in my data. And I can describe this covariance also now in, uh, in an orthonormal basis where this covariance is really a diagonal matrix and I can always rotate it back to my original form uh, by using this uh, orthonormal transformation. So yeah, this decomposition can be thought of as a uh, change of basis where we really apply a uh, rotation. Now, I really hope you recall such things from your linear algebra course, otherwise maybe this is indeed maybe a bit, bit abstract. Uh, but I really want to show you this, that we can me make such decompositions and that it implies some nice results, actually. For example, if we look at the total variance of, of my data, um, then this is given by the trace of my covariance matrix, as I explained before. Now, this covariance matrix can now be decomposed in the following way. And a property of the, the trace is actually that I can shift uh, the matrix inside this, this trace which would give me u transpose u. And since this is an orthonormal basis, this matrix uh, multiplication results in an identity, right? Because I have uh, an orthonormal basis. So u y transpose u j is one only if 
y equals j and it's zero otherwise. So if I evaluate all these matrix factor multiplications, I actually end up with the identity, meaning I have this uh, diagonal matrix lambda times the identity. Well, that doesn't do anything, so I end up with the trace of my diagonal matrix. So this implies that uh, my total variance is simply given by the sum of all my eigen eigenvalues. Okay, so here's a practical note. So this whole PCA boils down to this uh, eigen decomposition of my covariance matrix, right? And this, uh, there's, there's plenty of tools to, to do this actually, uh, though a full eigen decomposition is typically quite expensive. So as mentioned, we talk about high dimensional data here, which we want to reduce. And computing the full eigen uh, decomposition is of the order d to the power 3. So this is super expensive. Uh, but in practice, so, and that's we're set out to, to reduce the di dimensionality. So we're looking for an m, which is uh, smaller than d. And that actually means that they only need up to the m component. And there's efficient algorithms uh, to do that. So that, that really uh, reduces the complexity uh, quite a bit. Um, for example, in Python, you could rely on the, such methods for singular value decomposition, but I really want to make the remark here that singular value decomposition is a sort of generalization of this eigen uh, decomposition that also works for uh, matrices that are not necessarily positive uh, definite, but in the case that your matrix is positive definite, then the singular value decomposition uh, simply boils down to the eigen uh, value decomposition. So this is just a reminder, there's so many tools out there to compute your eigenvalues and eigenvectors and try them out. Some are really highly specialized for symmetric uh, positive definite matrices and uh, well, some, some are faster than others. And this really tells you that you can either rely on a singular value decomposition or eigen uh, decomposition tools. Okay, so we have a way of computing these low dimensional uh, projections and we do this via the principal components. Uh, but still, how do we choose the number of components? Basically, I started off by saying that M is given, uh, but of course you always need to choose this in some way. And what we can do is we can take a look at, um, well, how much variance I'm actually discarding by picking a particular M. So a good way would be, for example, uh, so the idea is I want to project to this lower dimensional space and I want to preserve 90% uh, preserve of my variance. So let's say that is our target. Then I can pick the M such that this is indeed the case. Because uh, remember that the total variance of my projection was simply given by the sum over the, uh, of the eigenvalues um, corresponding to the eigenvectors that are used in my projection. So this sum from uh, j is 1 to m of lambda j gives me the total variance of my projection. And if I compare the ratio with my total variance of my unprojected data, um, then I can evaluate this for different m, right? And that gives me the, the following plot. So you see, if I only use one component, then I lose a lot of uh, variation in my data, uh, but it quite quickly increases. And only, let's say, after five components, I already passed this 90% threshold. And at some point, it flattens off close to 100%. So it means that there are a lot of components that can easily be, be discarded because they only uh, account for very little variation in my data. And this little variation is typically considered noise. So this means that the main structure of the data, the main variation in the data can be captured with just a, a couple of such uh, principal components. All right, so what can we use PCA for? Uh, first of all, our objective was dimensionality reduction. And this makes sense when we have very large dimensional data, right? And we want to reduce computation time. For example, if we project to this lower dimensional space, we and we consider a neural network or some logistic regression uh, model. And if you use these lower dimensional projections as input, we have simply less computations and multiplications to perform, right? So it really reduces computation time, but we can also use it for compression. If we want to store this data, um, well, then storing the lower dimensional uh, projection obviously saves you a lot of uh, storage space. But also from a point of view of overfitting and regularization, uh, this also makes sense. We saw that if my classification models have a lot of parameters, and for example, if you could consider logistic regression, then I need a parameter for each of these uh, input uh, values in my vector. Uh, so I have a lot of parameters and therefore a high chance of overfitting. And so if I'm able to reduce the dimensionality of my data, I need less parameters 
And therefore I maybe also need less data points because I'm less prone to, to, to do overfitting. And then finally, in, in this context, uh, PCA can also be considered as a method for feature selection. And this is actually something not covered in this course, but there are methods that given my high dimensional uh, data vector, I'm going to select only the features that are relevant. We actually saw a little bit about this in the, the lasso case for uh, L1 regularized um, regression. So that's a way for feature select selection. But then PCA can also be considered as a sort of feature selection method, but I would rather call it a feature extraction method. So from all this high dimensional vector, um, just pick the things that are relevant, combine them into one new representation. So PCA really learns new representations of my input that capture uh, most information or most variation in the data. Another application is that of a 2D visualization of high dimensional data. Now, in this case, we consider uh, the digits, uh, the MNIST digits. Um, I think they're actually 28 by 28, but it, it doesn't matter. So um, images with a lot of pixels. And of course, also these can be treated as vectors, right? So we can flatten such an image, which gives me just one big vector for all these uh, pixel value. And I can compute uh, and do principal component analysis on such vectors, which really mean that if I uh, do this PCA on all my in images and here green means uh, low variation, uh, red means a variation in, let's say, a negative direction and blue in a positive direction. So this is a represent representative direction in my space of digits. Meaning if I want to make a distinction between uh, different uh, data points, I have to look for those regions uh, indicated in blue and red, uh, really. So once I have computed such principal components, I can project my images onto such uh, components, which gives me two values, like how much does my image resemble this particular pattern and how much does it resemble uh, this particular pattern. And that, that gives me these two components and I can plot those and then I can visualize how similar points are uh, to each other. And that's what you see over here. And it's nice to see that actually this one is clearly distinct from all the other points. Uh, this is the four, it's, it's completely different uh, from all the other points. The zero is also somewhat easy to uh, distinguish from the others, but there's a lot of overlap between the trees and the twos. So just by, looking, just by making this visualization, I already get a feeling that if I want to build a classification framework, it is going to be hard to classify uh, the twos uh, from the trees because well, uh, you have a two like this and maybe a three like this. It's somewhat similar. Um, and that is nicely captured and visualized via such, uh, well, uh, PCA type visualizations. Now, another nice side effect of PCA is that the features that are obtained, so these projected uh, features, they have no correlation in this uh, projected space. And with that, with that, I mean the following, right? So actually I, I made this drawing many times already. So if my if I have my original data points, so according from to some distribution, uh, so those are vectors which have let's say an x1 and x2 component, and with correlation I mean that if I observe a large x1, then I also observe a large x2. Now we already saw that if we express this in um, in terms of my uh, principal components then we actually apply a rotation, a change of basis essentially from my uh, canonical basis to my uh, principal component basis, which rotates the data to be aligned uh, with the axis. So then we no longer see this trend that with increasing component one, I also have an increasing value in, in the other uh, component. So, th so this is what I mean with um, there's no correlation in this uh, projected space. And this also means that uh, the covariance matrix of the projected data is diagonal, right? So this diagonal covariance matrix means really that there's no correlation uh, between my, my feature values and it can nicely be derived. And I did a similar thing uh, just before. This is the covariance matrix. If I write it out, so this is one particular projection. I take the product of these projections. So that's this over here. It can be written out in the following way. So uh, my basis transformation multiplied on the left with my covariance matrix and then on the right, and my covariance matrix could be decomposed via this eigenvector uh, uh, decomposition. And because my eigenvectors are orthonormal, this will re actually result in a matrix, which is diagonal for a large part. And then the remaining components are all zeros. 
right? Where we have uh, D columns, D columns, where these are the first M columns and these are the remaining D minus M columns and they have M rows. And that then gives you the final property that my uh, covariance matrix is this diagonal uh, matrix consisting of uh, the eigenvalues. You can actually also derive this uh, using the property that U I S U I equals uh, lambda i, uh, but that's uh, okay. That's something for you to verify that, that this is indeed true. Okay, but the main point is that my covariance matrix of the projected data is a diagonal matrix consisting of these uh, eigenvalues. And then we can use this property to go one step further. So what we did here was we showed that, well, my projections have no correlation in them, but we can also now use this property to make this a circular, an isotropic covariance matrix simply by scaling using these eigenvalues. And that is called widening. And this widening is sometimes also referred to as sphering, right? So I'm turning my distribution into some uh, spherical uh, distribution. And this operation is relevant in quite some applications where we have to deal with standardization. So standardization typically refers to the notion of subtracting the mean of my data and divide by the standard deviation. And you do this because sometimes you have to deal with different uh, data sets that encode the same thing, but are are acquired in a slightly, maybe with different devices, for example. And uh, depending on the calibration, uh, maybe in one device, the data points are a bit drifted off or scaled uh, differently than, other, uh, uh, than on other devices. So you want to standardize uh, your measurements such that you can combine them essentially. And so what, what, that's what you do with PCA. You can widen the, the, the data by applying one step more. So what we already did, we centered and decorrelated the data. So the centering by subtracting the mean and then decorrelating uh, by rotating this to my new basis. But and then if I want uh, my covariance matrix of, of Z to be uh, to have unit standard deviation and like a diagonal uh, identity matrix as a standard deviation, then I have to multiply it with the square root of this uh, diagonal um, eigenvalue matrix. So these steps are really as follows. So I have my data, I have this point cloud somewhere over here. Then in the first step, I sub subtract the mean, which gives me the data aligned on my origin. Then I project it to my new uh, basis, to my principal components, which really implies this rotation of the data points. And then I rescale it with one over the square root of my diagonal matrix, which really encodes the, the covariance of my uh, projected data. And this would result in a spherical data distribution. Okay, so we covered principal component analysis by searching for the direction on which I could project my data and that led to a maximum variance in this new, new representation. And it turned out that uh, these principal directions or these principal components were obtained by selecting the eigenvectors of my covariance matrix that correspond to the largest eigenvalues. Now in the next video, we're going to give a slightly different interpretation to PCA based on the idea of projecting, projecting my data points to a lower dimensional space from which I am still able to recover my original data points without too much loss of information. In the previous video, we talked about principal component analysis and we approached it from a maximum variation point of view. Now in this video, we will revisit PCA, but now approaching it from a minimal reconstruction error point of view. So now we're going to approach uh, PCA via this minimal reconstruction error viewpoint. And the, in the end, I will show that it actually leads to uh, the same technique, the same principal component analysis technique as we saw in the maximum variation formulation. Uh, but I think it's important to also get familiar with this reconstruction error viewpoint. Because if you look at, at modern latent variable uh, models like, uh, that are nowadays typically based on neural networks or deep neural networks architectures, these are highly uh, nonlinear and they're typically uh, trained or optimized by minimizing such type of uh, loss functions. So the idea is as follows. So we have a true data point and we have a generated data point which is generated from some l low dimensional latent variable. So we can think of it of having this latent variable uh, set which generates this uh, approximate data point. And the set M will be uh, of lower dimension of my true data point. So 
I'm probably not going to exactly uh, represent my true data point, uh, but this is going to be an approximation and we want to minimize this loss. Now in general, such a reconstruction from a latent variable can be uh, nonlinear. Though now we will stick to the uh, linear case where we say that my uh, reconstructed point is just given by working with this basis. So we're, ex so we're treating my latent variables as coefficients of a basis and we expand it. And then we have this sort of bias or offset term, which we will derive to be uh, the mean over all my data points. So this xn has its own uh, latent representation, which is of lower dimension. So this is the reconstruction model that we're going to assume, where we call this zn can be called uh, the latent variable. Uh, actually, it here represents the basis uh, coefficients. And then this um will be uh, the basis. And it's going to be a basis of size rd by m. Right, so if um, if I have m of such uh, basis coefficients, I can use it to reconstruct uh, my true data points, my d-dimensional uh, data points, and my latent variables are then indeed uh, m-dimensional. So that's how I'm, how I'm going to model this, and this is kind of similar as what we've been doing in the previous video, right? Because uh, before, let me write it down. Before we focused on this embedding, right? On the embedding set is um transpose xn. So we were really trying, we were really looking for this projection uh, onto a particular set of uh, vectors, onto this basis via this matrix um of my data points. And that would give me, uh, let's say, my latent embedding. And this latent variable, we wanted to have maximum variance. Now we approach it slightly differently. Uh, we're going to say, um, we are dealing with these latent variables and this basis. And now these latent variables together with this basis should lead to uh, an approximation or a reconstruction that closely resembles the original data point. Okay, and the idea is then that uh, maybe originally I work with, well, the usual basis, let's denote it with E1 and E2 in this two-dimensional setting. And if I were to have a vector, let's say uh, one, two, it would be a point uh, somewhere over here, right? It has value one on this axis and two on this axis. And similar to what we've been doing in the previous video, uh, we will uh, look for a new basis. It's called U1, U2. And expressed in this basis, we have of course a different uh, set of uh, coefficients, which represent uh, my vector. So my vector can be thought of as V um, is let's say alpha one times u one plus alpha two times u two, where um, this is alpha one, the component along the direction u uh, one and alpha two is uh, this component. Now this describes a change of basis, right? So we're now going to express my vector in terms of this new basis. Uh, but remember that the point of principal component analysis was the dimensionality reduction. So actually we're looking uh, for a basis, a lower dimensional basis, uh, by which I could still approximate my, my vectors uh, as close as possible. So this vector uh, V, uh, maybe we are going to re represent it only with this first uh, basis vector, which gives me uh, this point over here. And if I do that, then of course, yeah, I'm going to make this error. Uh, so now I want to choose my basis, um, well, as good as possible as to minimize uh, this particular error. Okay, so that's described over here. So we're going to express my data points in, in this new basis. So these are my basis vectors and these are the corresponding uh, coefficients uh, that allow me to reconstruct my original data point. Now, these, uh, this orthonormal, this isn't assumed to be an orthonormal basis, which means that the inner product between all these uh, different uh, basis vectors is only one if I take the inner product uh, with itself. And that also implies that the length of these vectors are uh, of unit length. Then the coefficients, so these coefficients are simply obtained by taking this inner product or the scalar product of my original vector with this particular basis. And this is really a uh, property of orthonormal basis. Because in general, if I just pick an arbitrary basis, we won't have this property, but now we, we are dealing with this. So we say that 
the UJs are orthonormal, and then these coefficients are simply obtained by taking the scalar product. So in terms of this new basis, then my data points are simply represented via the following formula, where these are all these uh, coefficients, well, and these are my, my basis vectors. And if I indeed work with D uh, of such uh, basis vectors, so I have a complete basis, I can always represent my data point in such a way, in, in, in express in now in this new basis. So this is just a change of basis and I can always do that. But now our objective is to work with the lower dimensional basis. So I'm only considering, let's say, the first M of such basis vectors. And I want to choose them in such a way that I still have an accurate uh, reconstruction. So the first M coefficients will represent my uh, latent variables. So these are really data dependent. So each data point has its own set of latent variables that represent this data point in a lower dimension. And then we have this shared uh, offset component. So the remaining basis functions just get some, some coefficient that is uh, shared for all data points. All right, so that's our objective to find such uh, basis factors and these uh, components that make sure that in the end I can make such a uh, data point specific reconstruction using these latent variables. And as said, we're going to do this by minimizing the error that I make, right? So this is my original data point. This is my uh, approximated data point via this latent representation. Um, so let's take a look at what this error looks like. So this is xn. And this is my approximated xn. Now we see that these, uh, these two vectors are the same for, for the first m terms, right? So these are the same expressions. I'm subtracting them. And this one runs from i as 1 to m. So uh, the first m terms uh, will cancel. OK, that's essentially this, this first step. And then, of course, um, so now we're only considering sums from m plus 1 to d, because that's the only thing that remains. And then we see then we can merge these two sums. So that's done in this step. And that gives me the following expression for um, this difference vector. So this difference is really determined uh, via this particular uh, expression. OK, now our objective is to minimize this, right? So we are considering this minimal reconstruction error uh, viewpoint. So this is really the loss uh, that we're minimizing. So if we substitute what we found in the previous slide, then essentially this is what we have to look at and this is what we have to minimize. So we follow the same strategy as always. So this is the error that we want to minimize um, and we want to find the parameters that uh, minimize this thing. So what we do, we take the derivative, we set the derivative of this thing with respect to the parameter that we optimize to zero and then solve it. And if we do this uh, for uh, my bi coefficients, then it turns out that these bi's are simply obtained from uh, my average data point. And now I'm not going to do this uh, derivation here in this video. It's actually not too hard, but it makes sense, right? So these bi's were not uh, specific to any data point. So they are shared for each uh, data point n. So if I then want to set these coefficients in such a way as to minimize this quadratic error for each of these data points, yeah, then of course it makes sense to, to choose this to be the coefficients uh, obtained uh, from uh, my average data point. Okay, so you can show that this is indeed the case. And then uh, these are my uh, bi's uh, substituted in my expression for, uh, well, the error that I want to minimize. So now what's left is minimize this particular thing for uh, all, the, all the u ones, so all these basis uh, factors. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to write out this term and we start off by expanding uh, the square over here. So um, yeah, this step is really expand the square. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move these uh, sums up front. I can do that, right? Because these are all just linear uh, operations. And let's focus on this transpose. That's going to be the next step. Um, so we first of all observe that what you see over here is just a scalar, right? So this is scalar and this is a vector. So the transpose of this expression really boils down to taking the transpose of this factor. And that gives me, um, well, uh, this one over here. Okay, and then we observe that this, the scalar product u i u j is going to be zero for all i unequal to j, right? Because that was the whole property of my uh, orthonormal basis. So my basis factors are all orthonormal. 
And so that also means that the scalar product is only one if u is equal to j. So that basically means that I can get rid of this uh, entire sum. Okay, and uh, the, next thing I, the next thing I'm doing is changing the order of these uh, two vectors, right? Because recall, I can take a transpose b is the same as uh, b transpose a. And that gives me, so uh, if you may change this particular order, it will give me this thing, right? So now, it, now I reformulate it into something that we recognize as the covariance matrix over here, right? If you take the sum over all these data points. So in the end, the expression that we're going to minimize is going to be this particular thing where this S is my uh, covariance matrix. And now it's starting to look a lot like we derived in uh, the, the, the maximum variance case, right? So this is what we just derived. So this is the, the, the loss or the error that we want to minimize. And it turns out that it boils down to minimizing this particular term for uh, basically the, the, the discarded basis functions. And similar as before, so we still haven't found these basis functions actually, right? That's still, uh, we, we have to minimize this thing. Uh, so it's, it still is a minimization problem, but now it's still under this constraint that uh, ui, the norm of ui is equal to one. So we're going to do this, uh, well, again, via the method of Lagrangian multipliers. And this then similarly, as we have seen before, uh, results to the case that I'm actually solving this eigen system such that these basis uh, vectors are essentially my eigenvectors and these are my eigenvalues. So that also means if we just then substitute over here, then we get that we actually minimize. So from m plus one to d, these lambda i's. So this u i s u i represented my variance along this uh, i basis component, right? And it was essentially summarized via this uh, eigenvalue. So this tells us that the minimal error uh, reconstruction or the minimal reconstruction error formulation really boils down to minimizing the variance of my discarded basis, right? Because we want to minimize this thing, right? So the sum of all these lambda i should be as small as possible. So that essentially means we're looking for the largest eigenvectors and eigenvalues such that the remaining d and minus m are the smallest because essentially we want to expand this thing in the, the largest eigenvectors. Okay, great. So we saw that this minimum reconstruction error formulation nicely corresponds with the uh, maximum projected variance uh, formulation. But in some cases, it's actually more intuitive to approach this from a minimal reconstruction error. And that is more so the case when you talk about compression, right? Because we want to be able... So now, okay, now let's consider compression. So we have this a digit that we want to compress. So we want to uh, summarize this particular image with only a couple of, of uh, latent variables. So that's essentially what we've been discussing in this video, right? So we want to re represent this digit with a couple of latent variables, uh, which can be used to expand in this, this basis. And then we have the shared um, mean or offset uh, parameter. So when I look at the eigenvectors, these are really the images that uh, express most variation among the different digits. So uh, if I compare the five, the one and the eight, uh, the difference is mostly explained via these type of regions. And we can sort them into, well, a decreasing order of importance for this uh, uh, variation. And, that we, and then what we do in this video, we're going to represent my image in terms of these eigenvectors via this reconstruction formula. And then we see if we only compute, only use the first 10 eigenvectors, I can roughly represent my images. It's super blurry, but if you look closely, you can still figure out this maybe a five and one and a three. Uh, oh, well, that's actually an eight. So, okay, we make errors here. So in order to come up with a proper reconstruction, we need more of such eigenvectors. Um, so yeah, if we take 50 of such eigenvectors, uh, now we can actually identify the digits more clearly and we go up to 200 eigenvectors, we have a very clear representation, a very good reconstruction of my images. So this tells me that these images, they, they are high dimensional, right? I think they were 28 by 28. So that's, let's say 700 pixels. And I'm now able to represent these same images with only 200 of such coefficients uh, without any loss of detail. So, so that means there is a lot of redundancy in my pixel basis uh, representation. And this also means we can highly compress our images using this uh, latent representation. 
And this also holds for images in general, right? So this is actually one of the first uh, examples I covered in this course um, when I talked about applications of machine learning. So also these images can be compressed because there's this common structure that can be shared. Uh, so again here, if we look at all these images and compute the eigenvalues, uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors over my entire database, then it turns out uh, that the most descriptive features are ordered as follows, right? So first of all, uh, differences between images can be explained by maybe looking at images that slightly look to the right, this one looks a bit to the left, and then uh, most variation among those images uh, is obtained by looking at the smile, some people smile, some people don't, and then uh, there's more and more subtle, uh, subtle differences between these images captured by these uh, lower level uh, eigenvectors. So in this context, and that's what we covered today, we were looking for this latent representation of, so this is me, of my face over here uh, with some latent variable, right? So meaning I can explain my face with just these latent components, let's say uh, these eigenfaces. Okay, so this is another example of compression, where really we have these high dimensional images, they consist of thousands of pixels, but in the end, the content the content in itself can really nicely describe with, with just 150 of such uh, latent variables. Uh, some encoding for smiles, some encoding for, I don't know, how the eyes look and uh, things like that. So we have all these variables which maybe you can give them an interpretation, but in essence, my images live on this lower dimensional uh, uh, manifold of latent variables. Now we come to a third view on principal component analysis. And this time we adopt a probabilistic viewpoint on latent variable modeling. Now remember that in video 10.1 I talked about probabilistic latent variables and then discussed that the Gaussian mixture model was a probabilistic version of the discrete latent variable model obtained by k-means clustering. Now in this video we do something similar and approach principal component analysis uh, which isn't necessarily considered a probabilistic approach from the perspective of continuous latent variable models. Okay, now we, now we do this because probabilistic models have some uh, advantages over discriminative uh, models, right? Uh, because they allow to generate new data points once we have obtained a full uh, description of our distribution and it allows us to deal with uncertainties. Now the approach that we're going to take is that we're going to uh, define a probabilistic latent variable model and of course, again, once we have such a probabilistic model, we can optimize it via uh, the maximum likelihood. And as we will see, this gives us uh, a, a third alternative view on a principal component analysis. And in our modeling choices, we're choosing to work exclusively with, with Gaussian uh, variables because that keeps uh, things simple, uh, essentially. Now the setting is as follows. Uh, we're dealing with all these data points, uh, these, all these xn's, and each xn is a d-dimensional vector. And now our objective is to come up with a generative model. So we want to really model this full probability distributions, uh, which we can then use to generate new data points. So suppose all these uh, blue dots are my measurements. I want to recover the distribution that uh, generated uh, these measurements. And my assumption is going to be that intrinsically each data point really came from a lower dimensional distribution. So in this example, again, uh, my data points are 2D, for example, but it came from a one-dimensional uh, latent uh, variable. So similar to the discrete uh, latent variable models, we assume that each data point actually has an associated uh, latent variable uh, value. And we're going to marginalize over this latent variable. So this is what we're going to model. So this joint distribution of X together with its uh, latent variable uh, representation, but we are going to marginalize out this latent variable and that gives us in the end a probability distribution for X only and that's indicated on the right figure. So the idea is that intrinsically my data point came from this, this latent uh, distribution with some probability and then once I have drawn such a uh, set then this gives me a probability for making a particular observation for X, right? And this probability is modeled by this well, conditional probability. So given Z, what would be the probability for observing a particular X? And we're going to also model this, right? So we assume that there exists such a system, such a model that maps my latent variable to its true, um, let's say value in observation space. But, but of course there will be uh, uncertainty associated with this, uh, meaning that I'm not observing my, my, uh, my true 
observation essentially on my true data point but uh, because of measurement noise it may lie somewhere in this vicinity uh, according to some probability that's indicated with these red lines so let me turn that into a density so let's say darker means a higher probability so this uncertainty will be incorporated in in my uh, conditional uh, probability distribution which we are going to model right so the generative process is then as follows so we draw Intrinsically, my point came from this, this latent uh, representation, which is mapped uh, through some point in my um, observation space, but there's noise associated to it, so it's not perfectly on this line, so maybe this generated this data point. And then I observe the next uh, point that's somewhere over here, which leads to a point, let's say, somewhere over here. So we have this mapping from latent variable to my actual observation. And so for each latent variable, I have some probability of observing a particular uh, corresponding x. So that, that's these gray regions, right? With higher probability means a darker region. I'm going to observe a point in this region. So um, because we model this uh, prior probability to be also a Gaussian, we observe most points close to this, this mean over here, right? Um, so most observations will be somewhere uh, on the center of, of this, this line. Um, with some uncertainty again associated with it. So if I do this and place such a uh, uncertainty distribution around each point, yeah, I get this very uh, dense region. And if I draw the level sets of this, so really the level set of the sum of all these possible uh, distributions, I obtain my final um, generative model uh, P of X, right? Via this. So I overlapped all these densities and that was essentially the marginalization process, uh, which I was doing by hand. Okay, so I feel like I've sort of messed up this figure, so maybe it's time to move on to uh, formulas again. Um, so this is what my generative model looks like, right? So we have this latent variable, which is mapped to this higher dimensional space via some uh, linear model W. So this is going to be part of my uh, modeling assumption. So we're going to model this linear map at W together with this uh, bias mu. So this is really our, uh, let's say, forward model from the latent variable to my observation. And then there's noise associated with each uh, observation. And so we're going to make the following modeling choice that my uh, continuous latent variable will be Gaussian distributed. So basically my latent variable will have most likely its value close to zero, but there's a spread around it, right? So I'm going to model this prior from my latent um, to be Gaussian distributed. Okay, so this z is a random variable coming from a, a Gaussian distribution. And then we have our uh, forward model. So basically this part um, of which its main component is this matrix W, right? So there's a D by M uh, dimensional matrix because my uh, latent variables were M dimension. So this matrix turns this M dimensional vector into a D dimensional vector. And then we have this uh, offset component. And then we have this other random variable which is also assumed to be uh, Gaussian distributed. All right, so that really models my uh, generative uh, model. And since all these random variables are Gaussian distributed, so we have a Gaussian prior and uh, we have Gaussian noise, it turns out that my um, conditional model for X given this uh, Z and this noise actually is also going to be a Gaussian distribution. So this is also Gaussian. So when we talk about these conditional distributions, we fix a particular z and then talk about the probability of observing a particular x. So we assume that we have sampled a particular z and then we're going to think about the probability of observing this uh, particular x. And that is then described by my forward model. So my point will be centered around the point to which my linear model uh, maps it to. And then the only uncertainty is uh, due to the contribution of this noise, which is going to be isotropic in this d-dimensional space with some uh, sigma uh, squared uh, variance. So that tells me that my conditional distribution for observing x given z will be also Gaussian distributed. Okay, and then we have uh, all the components in place, right? So we have a, a prior, which is Gaussian. We have a conditional, which is also Gaussian. And then this marginal, uh, which is given by this marginalization over z of the product of my conditional with the prior will also be Gaussian. Okay, so this is also going to be a Gaussian and we rely on the results of chapter 2.3 in the book of Bishop that this probability distribution is essentially an, a Gaussian 
with some mean, which I do not know yet, and also some uh, variants, some covariants. And actually, you can derive this using the rules in this chapter, but it's kind of a tedious task. So we're approaching this now from a diff different uh, approach. So the idea is that I'm just going to rely on the fact that my output, my marginal, is going to be a Gaussian. So it has some uh, mean given by the expected value of my random variable and the covariance given well by the covariance of this random variable. And because we know what the forward process uh, looks like, we know what the generative process looks like, we can actually compute the expectation and the covariance of this random variable. So that's what we're going to do. So if we compute the expectation of x, it will give us the mean of this uh, Gaussian distribution. All right, so we have to compute the expectation of this uh, forward model where z is a random variable and epsilon is a random variable. Uh, due to linearity, I can move this w outside and I can split this into these separate expectations. Um, the expectation of a co constant is the constant itself. And we know that the expectation of z is going to be zero because that's our uh, modeling assumption and also the expectation of my noise is also going to be zero. So this is zero. So that tells me that the expectation of x is going to be given my mu. So we have found the mean of my uh, Gaussian distribution. Okay, now what about the covariance matrix of our Gaussian distribution? Let's also just compute this, right? So uh, we start off with the definition of the covariance matrix that is given as follows, right? So my uh, random variable relative to its mean uh, squared and the expectation of this thing. Okay, now in this step, we just plug in our forward model. So X was given by W Z plus mu plus epsilon. And these uh, mu terms here cancel out. So if I just fill it in, I get the following expression. Uh, the next step is that we simply expand this uh, square. We expand this and that gives me the following. Then we use uh, linearity. So the expectation of the sum can be split in these separate expectations. So that's what we do over here. We use linearity. And then also this we can compute, right? So if we, uh, this can be derived from the covariance of my noise. So the covariance of epsilon is given by the expectation of epsilon, epsilon transpose plus the expectation epsilon expectation of epsilon transpose. And this has to equal sigma squared I, right, because that was our uh, modeling, that, that was our model, we said that my uh, noise was Gaussian distribution with this covariance matrix. And also we know that the expectation of my noise is zero, so that's zero mean. So this tells me that this particular term is given by sigma squared I. So that's basically given by this uh, short derivation over here. In a similar way, we uh, derive that the expectation of set set transpose is going to be the identity matrix because, well, we said that my latent variable was also Gaussian distribution with unit uh, covariance matrix. Okay, so that's uh, that. And then for this particular term, we can actually, it, it follows that this has to be zero. And that's actually given as follows. So my random variable set and epsilon are independent. So the covariance of a set with epsilon is going to be zero. And this covariance is given by set epsilon transpose minus expectation of set, expectation of epsilon transpose. And because they are independent, this has to equal zero. And we know that, well, the expectations of these individual random variables is zero. So that tells me that the expectation of z epsilon transpose is also going to be zero. Okay, so this short derivation shows that this component is going to be zero. And that results in the following, that the covariance matrix of x is given by w, w transpose plus sigma squared i, and we're going to call this c, the covariance of my random variable x. Okay, and therefore we found that my marginal distribution which was going to be a Gaussian as it's mean given by mu and its covariance matrix uh, given by C as we have just derived. Okay, so we just derived that my final marginal distribution, which describes all my observed uh, data points essentially, 
is given by this uh, by this uh, Gaussian distribution with a particular mu and covariance matrix. And we got there by making the following modeling assumptions that we had this, this uh, prior on my latent variable. So we said it was Gaussian distributed. And then we have this forward model or this uh, conditional probability that once I have observed the Z, what would be the uh, probability of observing a particular X? And we model this uh, conditional probability to be also Gaussian distributed, where this was really my linear, uh, let's say, forward model from a, really a fixed point Z to a fixed point on my true blue uh, observation uh, line, essentially. But then there was noise associated to it uh, that's given by this uh, isotropic uh, covariance matrix. Okay, and then these two modeling choices together gave me my final marginal distribution, which was also uh, a Gaussian. So the point now is we have such a probabilistic model for X and that means uh, it still depends on my model parameters mu, w and sigma squared, right? So these are model parameters. I haven't given them a particular value yet. But now we can choose these values based on maximum likelihood, right? Because now we have this uh, probabilistic model that could describe my data points so we can also test for how likely it is that uh, my model with these sets of parameters actually describe my, my, my data points. So we're going to optimize my model parameters uh, via the, the maximum uh, likelihood, the log likelihood approach. And well, we, again, as I said, we're dealing with Gaussians and these Gaussians, we can take the log of them. So it gives me these uh, front factors and it gives me the, the, the thing that was inside the exponent. So when we optimize this, again, the recipe is take the derivative with respect to the thing that you optimize, set it to zero, and then solve for the particular parameter of interest. And if we do this for the mean, for example, then we take the derivative of my log likelihood with respect to mu, that gives me this particular thing. And when we solve it, so we set it to zero and we solve it from mu, we obtain uh, the following expressions. So we have done these type of derivations many times already, right? And not completely unsurprisingly, uh, the mean mu is going to be given by uh, my sample mean. And now while this recipe is, is kind of simple, right? Uh, the actual computation, the actual uh, way of deriving these w's and sigma squares is actually a really tedious task. And I'm not going to do this. Uh, actually, it's really hard. But the point is we can do this and we can find closed form solutions for my parameter mu, sigma squared and w. And I've uh, listed them here as follows. So I'm not going to do this derivation, but we can again uh, try to get some intuition at what we're looking at here. So we had our uh, data distribution and we assumed it to be uh, modeled via some, some Gaussian. So let me indicate this as follows. So this is then the covariance matrix that basically describes the shape of my uh, distribution. And the shape of this Gaussian was then given by C is a W, W transpose plus sigma squared I. And this really came from our modeling choices, right? That we said we had this such a forward model and we have isotropic noise. And to get a bit of intuition, and I hope it helps, uh, we're going to think about this, this covariance that we try to uh, model. And the idea is as follows. So we're going to assume that our true, so our co observed covariance, so we have variation because my uh, latent variable uh, varies, but we also have variation uh, that comes from the fact that I have observation or measurement noise. So I'm going to say that my observed covariance of my data points, so these blue data points, is, is a combination of my true covariance uh, associated to my latent variable uh, variance and let's say some noise uh, covariance matrix. And then we saw in the previous videos that such covariance matrix, uh, when we think about these uh, projection spaces or these uh, basis functions, UM, so really the eigenvectors, and these were the eigenvalues of my covariance matrix. So we can make this, we can make this decomposition of S, right? Then in terms of this eigen decomposition, we can also split this into a part uh, given by, well, the, the, the largest set of eigenvectors plus the part that corresponds to the set of uh, smallest eigenvectors uh, and eigenvalues. And uh, that's going to be indicated with this uh, minus sign over here. So whatever the interpretation we give to this uh, covariance matrix, um, in terms of such an eigen decomposition, we can always make this splitting because my individual eigenvectors are all orthonormal. So I can split this matrix in, in the following way. Now, similarly as done before, I'm going to assume that uh, the covariance of the noise is going to be captured via the uh, 
the principal components with the smallest eigenvalues. And likewise, I'm going to assume that, that the covariance, like the true covariance that actually came from the variations in my latent variables is going to be described, it's going to be described via the, the eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues, so the main principal components. Okay, so that's step one, where we're making the splitting of my observed covariance, so this uh, capital S, into something that relates to the true covariance of my uh, latent variable model and some noise, measurement noise. Then we know that my probabilistic model, uh, so this uh, P of X, had a covariance matrix C, and this covariance matrix uh, was given as follows. So we're really building this Gaussian model with the following covariance matrix determined by my W uh, parameters and my uh, sigma squared, my noise uh, parameter. And our objective is of course that this covariance matrix of my model should represent uh, the true covariance. I'm not interested in, in modeling this noise. So my objective is that this covariance should match my true covariance. So that's the third step of this logic. So C should match as true. So if you fill this in, that gives you the following, right? So that U M. Okay, so if we then solve this for W, let's move the sigma squared I uh, to the other side, then actually the identity, because my matrices are uh, orthonormal, these U M's, so I could also multiply my I on the left and right with this uh, U M. It's still the same thing. Okay, so if I rewrite this, so I move everything to the other side, so I have U M lambda M plus sigma squared I U M transpose. Okay, so that was really the third step in this logic. So if I now um, solve for W, I get this particular expression, right? So again, the idea was that I'm observing this uh, distribution of data points um, with some measured covariance. But then we said this covariance is composed of a true component and uh, let's say this uh, noise component. And this noise component, we're modeling with sigma squared i. So if we are going to model my uh, true covariance, then I have to set my w in such a way that I take into account this noise uh, parameter because uh, my model takes into account, my sigma squared takes into account this additional uh, variance. So that's that sort of explains this this a subtraction uh, over here. Okay, so really in this approach, I'm splitting my covariance into these uh, independent uh, components, right? And it nicely turns out, so what I'm doing here is not really a full rigorous proof, but I'm trying to stick with some intuition here, but it turns out that if you really compute the variation, so the sigma squared parameter by this maximum uh, likelihood approach, then it turns out that the sigma squared is really the average of the discarded discarded variance, right? Because these lambdas, these lambda really describe the variance along my uh, directions encoded by, uh, in these, these eigenvectors. And the m plus one uh, dimensions are basically discarded. So that's sort of summarized in this uh, sigma squared, which describes this isotropic uh, covariance. Okay, so that's a lot of talk about this probabilistic model, but the main point is that we are able to derive closed form expressions for my model parameters, so mu, sigma squared, and w, and they found in such a way that my probabilistic model in the end uh, is going to match my true uh, covariance. And then I have this modeling choice, right? How to pick m. If I pick m very low, that means basically I assume a lot of noise, uh, because then these components become large. I start summing over a lot of discarded covariance matrix, so I assume a lot of noise, meaning I assume a lot of noise in my measured data. So really I expect my true data to be highly concentrated and all the rest is noise. And the other way around, if I trust my data a lot, then I'm not discarding too many um, principal directions. So this sigma squared will become small and then my uh, estimated distribution is nicely approximated my true measured uh, distribution. Okay, so we just covered principal, uh, probabilistic principal component analysis and it really provides a probabilistic generative version of principal component analysis, which we can also use to draw samples from it. So with this probabilistic principal component analysis, uh, we end up with Gaussian distributions with the number of parameters really restricted uh, essentially by the, by the latent space. So this is 
essentially a modeling choice. So I say my latent space consists of M components, and this really restricts the number of parameters in my Gaussian distribution. Now, and these are some side notes. So since we're now working with a probabilistic model, we can also adopt a fully Bayesian approach to really select the dimension of my latent space, because so far it was always a model choice. So how many M's, how many components am I going to consider? In this Bayesian setting, we can automate this process of selecting M. And similar to what we saw with the Gaussian mixture model, which was really the probabilistic discrete uh, latent variable model of, let's say, k-means clustering, a discussion mixture model could, have, could be optimized by an expectation maximization algorithm. Now also now in this continuous probabilistic latent variable model, we can also exploit a, a particular expectation maximization algorithm. Though now this is not really necessary because we have close solutions to our uh, final probabilistic model, um, which we extensively dis discussed just now. Um, but sometimes it is actually convenient to resort to this expectation maximization uh, algorithm. Okay, so that wraps it up for principal component analysis. So far we covered really three views. So we, either we said we want to find this lower dimensional subspace and if we project on it, then I want to preserve maximal variance. Or we said, okay, um, I want to be able to reconstruct my uh, original data points from this lower dimensional space and I want to minimize my reconstruction error. And finally, we covered a probabilistic uh, approach to uh, this continuous latent variable modeling. Okay, and then we saw several applications. We saw that we could apply PCA for dimensionality reduction. We saw that we could use it for 2D or 3D visualization in the sense that these high dimensional point clouds are very hard to analyze, but if we can make this low dimensional projection, we can actually visualize it. We can use it for compression. We can use it to widen the data, so decorrelating the features in my data. And this is actually not covered, but we could also use it for denoising, right? In the sense of this minimal reconstruction error, if we discard all the components that we consider to be noise, then we end up with uh, representations that are, well, um, free of that noise. Um, and then finally, like all these three methods uh, were based on linear models, right? So uh, that's, that's the limitation of this current PCA approach. And in the next video, I will briefly give some directions for non-linear probabilistic models or non-linear uh, principal component models, uh, essentially. This week we covered principal component analysis, which is essentially a linear method for dimensionality reduction. In this video, we're going to take a look at nonlinear alternatives that effectively lead to the recovery of nonlinear principal components. So why do we want to consider nonlinear methods? Uh, well, of course, simply because they are more powerful, right? Uh, because for example, consider this example, uh, we have this distribution of data points and it seems to be clearly concentrated around this one dimensional uh, structure. So if we want to reduce our data points to a single number, we want to essentially project it onto this, this uh, line indicated in red, right? Now, obviously this cannot be done with uh, linear principal component analysis, right? Because it just looks for the largest directional variation and maybe it's something like this. So you would have the, this linear model where each point is mapped on this uh, particular line and it's no longer really representative of my original data points. So this is something that you may get out of a uh, linear uh, PCA. But ideally we want to recover this uh, representation, right? So um, now the question is really, can we do this with nonlinear PCA then? And the answer is yes, there are indeed several approaches that would be able to recover this this lower dimensional uh, structure indicated over here. And uh, we're going to cover um, some of them in this video. So maybe the first sensible thing that you could do is maybe try to turn this into a linear problem. So suppose this is my data set. So it follows this, let's say one dimensional uh, parameterization of my data. Uh, there's noise around it. And we want to recover this uh, particular line. Now what you could do of course is to maybe work with, with basis functions. So we, you turn this into a new feature representation. Um, so let me write this out so we can use, so we can use predefined feature vectors to map my each, each data point uh, to a new point in this, in this new space, right? And if I'm clever, I, I pick my uh, basis function in such a way that this is sort of unwrapped into this uh, linear uh, thing. And then we can do principal component analysis in this space where, and well, of course, now, is, now there is one clear principal direction. 
And so we can nicely recover this one dimensional uh, structure in this new uh, feature space. If we project it back, we maybe get something out, something like this. So using these basis methods, we are in principle uh, able to recover such a lower dimensional uh, manifold structure. But of course, this is super complicated because how am I going to choose my basis functions? To be honest, I cannot imagine which type of basis function to pick here or which type of feature factors to pick here that turns this into a linear problem. But in principle, this is possible, right? But the challenge remains how to choose uh, your basis functions. And of course, one way to go about this is to learn your basis functions again via neural networks. And that's something that I'm going to show in one of the, the next slides. But first, let's stick with this idea of working with these feature vectors, which is uh, phi's of x. So the approach that I just, just described was essentially trying to linearize the data, right? By making a particular choice for my feature vectors that would turn this complicated point cloud into something which is a more uh, linear structure uh, to it. And then once you do it, you can do principal component analysis in this uh, space, into this feature space. And that would give you a principal component uh, like this, for example. And recall that principal component and that re relies on this eigen uh, decomposition of my covariance matrix so in the original space it looks like this and in my feature space this would be the covariance uh, matrix of course assuming that the average over all my data points of these feature factors is zero right because in general uh, the sample covariance of such a random variable is given in the following form where we still have to take these averages as, into account but for now let's assume uh, the, the average feature value over all my data points is zero. And then we get this expression for the covariance matrix. Okay, so in principle, we could do something like this. We do PCA on this covariance matrix, and that would give me this principal component, and we can find ways to map it back to my uh, original space. Now, it turns out that similar to the linear regression case, uh, where we did linear regression with basis functions, uh, also now the solutions, which are the principal components, uh, can be expressed entirely in terms of the original data points via the definition of a kernel. So if we define this uh, kernel to be this uh, product of these uh, feature vectors, then of course we can still just proceed as we have been doing so far. We compute the eigenvectors of uh, this covariance matrix U1 and the, the i component is then simply given by uh, the projection of my feature vector onto this uh, component. But now it turns out that uh, these projections can also be obtained directly from my kernel. So um, I can do so by uh, computing the eigenvectors of this uh, kernel matrix. And that would give me these uh, principal components in, in the kernel space. And then using these components, we can compute uh, the projected values uh, simply by summing over all my data points, uh, the values within my uh, vector uh, with the corresponding uh, kernel values. So I realize I'm skipping some details here, but the, the main point is that instead of working with the principal components of C, which is really explicitly defined in such uh, basis functions. So what I'm doing there, I compute this covariance matrix, uh, which is now M by M dimensional, right? Because each um, feature vector was of length M. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to compute the eigenvectors of this N by N matrix which essentially encodes for all similarities between one data point to the other and then once we have obtained the i eigenvector and this particular eigenvector is of length n then i can show that uh, the projected uh, component so this component value so this is really the same as this and i can show that i can also obtain this component purely in in terms of my original data point xn using this eigenvector uh, a just omitted and using uh, the definition of my kernel. Now, the reason I'm doing this is uh, because now we can apply the kernel trick. So we can essentially just define this, uh, replace this kernel with any uh, valid kernel. And that's going to be the topic of next week to, to see what kind of kernels we can choose. But essentially the, the idea is that this kernel corresponds to some choice of basis. And now I'm not explicitly choosing my basis, but I'm just formulating a particular kernel. I make a choice for a kernel. And I'm doing that because now this kernel could implicitly represent uh, feature vectors that are of infinite dimension. And this makes it a very uh, powerful technique because you can imagine if you, uh, let's say, choose M uh, basis functions, let M go to infinity. So you consider all sorts of basis functions, then there is probably maybe some direction which really describes my main direction of variation in a, a reliable way. 
So that's essentially the main idea behind this uh, kernel trick. And we will cover it uh, in much more detail in, in the next week. But essentially it describes a very powerful method. Let me write it down. So this is a very powerful method. Because this allows me to implicitly work with infinite dimensional feature vectors, which really implies that my M can be infinite. But I do not have to explicitly compute all these feature values because that's encoded in these kernel functions. Okay, but that essentially covers uh, kernel uh, PCA in a very summarized form. And for more details, you can check out uh, chapter 12.3 in the book of Bishop. But for now, it's sufficient to know that, uh, well, of course, we can choose to work with basis functions. And when we do, do that, we decide to work with basis functions, then we can also decide to work with kernel functions instead. And instead of explicitly defining my kernels, uh, uh, sorry, my basis functions, I can also just define some kernel, which maybe implicitly represents a, a particular basis. Okay, now then this is an example of, of kernel PCA. So this is a highly symmetric data set of two concentric circles. Uh, so we can clearly see two, two separate classes, uh, call it in, in red and blue, though uh, the data, the algorithm itself doesn't see these classes, right? It just observes this uh, point clouds. Then if I apply principal component analysis to this, I'm trying to look at the directions of main variation and whatever direction I look at, it's going to be exactly the same, right? So uh, this is actually the result. If I project my data points X to my principal components, I'm just, I'm doing nothing. I'm really, I'm, I'm just rotating actually. Uh, look at this point, it's now rotated to this, but apart from that, um, the data set is exactly the same. So with principal component analysis, I do not really gain new insight in, in my data. So now I said we can work uh, with kernel PCA. So I can define this uh, radial basis function, uh, which we're going to cover uh, next week. Uh, but the idea is this uh, kernel really is some sort of measure of similarity or closeness uh, to, to all the points. And this intrinsically describes an infinite dimensional uh, Gaussian basis, uh, essentially. Then the interesting thing is if we use a uh, kernel PCA with uh, such kernel functions, we actually are nicely able to separate our data. So what you see on the horizontal axis is uh, my first uh, principal component. So, so the, the set one value of each data point and on the vertical axis, we have the set two values. And these values are now obtained via highly nonlinear functions. And that's actually indicated over here with these level sets. So these level sets indicate the corresponding Z1 values. So these level sets indicate the value for Z1 as a function of, of X. So on this side, it assigns, uh, let's say, positive values. And then on this side, it assigns negative values. Z1 is uh, positive. On this side, we have in green, we have Z1 is negative. And these wide regions correspond really to a Z1 is uh, zero. So we see that this uh, first principal component really pulls apart this, this blue point cloud, right? Because points on the left uh, are assigned a negative value, points on the right are assigned this uh, positive value, and it doesn't do really do anything with uh, the red uh, points. They're all mapped to some low value close, uh, close to zero. So that's what you see over here. And then this kernel PCA also learned this uh, Z2 component, which isn't plotted over here, but we see that it sort of uh, disentangles the data based on the distance of a point to the origin. So all these red points, they get some negative value and then the blue points get some positive value. So we have some isotropic uh, function mapping over here, but which is still uh, super nonlinear. So the main point of this slide is that if you use linear PCA, you now it's illustrated in 2D. So you have these um, principal components that really are based on a particular direction. So uh, the component value linearly increases if you move along uh, one particular direction and then the second component increases in this direction. So um, in this 2D space, really nothing happens. And these principal directions, they, they can be scaled, of course. Uh, but in this particular case where there's no clear uh, direction of main variation, really nothing happens to my data. And then if we work with kernel functions, uh, we are able to recover highly nonlinear mappings from uh, a point X to its uh, principal component value. And this may be a bit abstract for now, but we will look into more detail into such uh, kernel methods uh, in the next week.
Okay, so for now let's move on to a different way for uh, dimensionality reduction. Now we can also do this via neural networks. And these type of neural networks are typically, typically called autoencoders or auto-associative neural networks. And the idea is actually, well, similar as before. So we have our input x and we want to map it to some latent variable, to this lower dimensional representation of x. And we call the neural network that does this, we call it the encoder. So that is essentially uh, this part of the neural network that takes an input and maps it to uh, some latent variable. Uh, we can make this uh, part of the neural network very deep, which results in a very complicated mapping of x to my latent variable. Uh, and then we are also working with a decoder. And this decoder reconstructs uh, my uh, original data from these latent representations. So it turns this lower dimensional vector into my original higher dimensional uh, point via this, um, well, generator or decoder. And again, this decoder can be a very complex uh, neural network. And typically you try uh, to match, uh, to make this design somewhat uh, symmetric. Okay, and then with such a design in place, so we have an input which is mapped to some latent variable and this latent variable can then be reconstructed. And now the goal is of course that uh, these uh, reconstructed data points, they should be similar to my original data points. So similar to the uh, minimal reconstruction error formulation of principal component analysis, we're now also going to uh, optimize my neural network weights as to minimize uh, this uh, reconstruction error. Okay, so that looks something like this, right? So we have uh, our original data point and we have our reconstructed data point and we want to minimize this error. And we're uh, optimizing this with respect to the model parameters of my uh, neural networks, right? So each of these function mappings is parameterized by a neural network, which con is, consists of all these weights, same for the generator or the decoder. Um, so this is what's happening, right? So fw, which takes as input is x, maps, uh, spits out this, this latent uh, variable uh, set. And this is in turn used by uh, the decoder uh, to turn this into a uh, reconstructed data point. And because these functions, they can be deep, they can be very abstract neural networks. So these function mappings are highly nonlinear. And so there's also, you cannot expect to find a closed form solution to, to this problem. So what people typically do, they, they solve this via stochastic gradient descent or whatever optimization method, which is nowadays popular to optimize uh, neural networks. And currently still it's stochastic gradient descent or any variation of this. Uh, now, we already identified the similarity with uh, principal component analysis from this minimal reconstruction point of view. So we can actually formulate this PCA or this sort of architecture also in the form of a, of a neural network. So we have here a, a mapping from X to Z and in my principal component analysis, this F was really a linear mapping, right? It was given uh, by the following. So we subtract uh, the mean of my data points and then we project it to this latent variable. So this is really a linear projection and we can think of it as let's say the first weights in my, uh, the, the weights in my first layer and this is uh, the bias in my uh, first layer and in the reconstruction part we consider these sets to be the the, the basis coefficients um, corresponding to this particular basis so this can then be thought of as uh, the weights in my second layer that maps my uh, latent variable to the original data point and it also has this uh, bias so this shows that for a particular choice of my uh, neural networks uh, weights uh, namely these principal components, I actually recover principal component analysis. So principal component analysis can be thought of as a two-layer autoencoder uh, without any activation functions. It's completely linear. Okay, but now in this autoencoder uh, viewpoint, uh, we relax this constraint that it has to be linear and we can choose very complicated uh, functions f and g. And then as before, so we can uh, reconstruct original data points via these models. And again, when working with images, for example, we can assess the quality, right? As we also have done in the PCA reconstruction case, this was my original image and I can reconstruct it for different uh, models for different settings of the principal components. Similar thing you can do now also in this deep learning uh, setting. But actually as a bonus, and this is really interesting and it's a popular line of research uh, in the deep learning landscape at the moment, is that we can also use this generator part or this, this decoder part to generate uh, fake data, right? So what I could do, I could just pick some uh, latent variable set and then pass it through my generated and it spits out some reconstructed image and you, you can check how realistic this thing is. 
Now it turns out that we can design such a uh, such autoencoders in a probabilistic setting where we really take on the interpretation that my latent variable actually comes from some uh, probability distribution. So my encoder really maps my input x to some latent variable z, which has some place in this uh, probability in this latent uh, distribution. Um, let's say it came from some distribution p of z. And then you can design your optimization framework in this probabilistic setting that in the generator phase, we can randomly sample a, a point Z from this distribution to generate a new data point. Okay, if, if you want to learn more to this uh, probabilistic, so variational autoencoder setting, I can really recommend looking at this paper, Variational Autoencoders by Kigma and, and Welling. But the main point is then that once we have sampled such a set, we can generate a fake image. And that's indicated over here. So if this set of images, uh, one like either on the left or the right, I really don't know. Uh, one of these sets of images is real and the other is generated via such uh, autoencoder. And to be honest, I can't remember anymore which is real and which is not. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this is fake because we have these weird artifacts going on over there. Um, but then if I look at this image, I have this figure over here, which I cannot really assign to any digit. Um, so this is really interesting. So with such an autoencoder, you can generate images, you can generate digits, which are never written by any human before. It's just completely generated via this um, neural network. And then of course you can push this a bit further and actually generate uh, natural images, like images, let's say these, these portrait uh, photos. And this is a really popular line of deep learning research to generate data as realistically as possible. And what you see is a result from a variational autoencoder type of neural networks. But actually the, the, the deep fakes that you typically see out on the internet are not necessarily of a VAE type, a bit more like generative adversarial networks or whatever other network uh, that currently runs the state of the art. But with VAEs, you can actually get, can get pretty far. So obviously there's, there's quite some artifacts uh, going on in, in these type of images. But the idea is that all these images, they are randomly generated. So uh, they came from a latent space, a low dimensional latent space. So I pick one of such factors, a Z, and plug this into my generator and that constructed these type of Im images. And that actually allows for all sorts of things. For example, we can interpolate between images. Uh, so you can do this experiment that you have an image of a young person and an old person, and then you can sort of regress how this person would change over time to match the, this face, this old face, for example. And people are trying to put a lot of effort in trying to disentangle different features. So if, if you were to see a face of, of me and you want to know what I would look like as a girl, then you can sort of uh, move this uh, latent variable in, in this space and, and move it to the, the female side, uh, let's say. And so that sort of brings us back to the very first video on this principal component analysis, that we want to recover this latent structure that explains all the variations in my data. If I look at images of people, then I don't know, some people have bushy eyebrows, some people don't, some people uh, are female, so, some people are, are not. And uh, so there's all these variations and all these latent variables that sort of tell me what the picture would look like in the end. And in the first video, I considered this case with, with the, the MNIST digit tree, which was translated and wrote it, but, but it goes way beyond that. Okay, so these kind of experiments are really fun and popular, but maybe at first sight, they are at the same time also not particularly meaningful. Uh, on, on the contrary, uh, the generation of deep fakes imposes some very real ethical problems. So whenever you work on such topics, I really want you to think hard about why you should want to do these type of experiments uh, in the first place and, and what value does, they, does it have. Um, for example, such images are nice because we can interpret them and it actually led to the discovery of very elegant dimensionality reduction methods that are now used uh, for example, to also explore the space of, let's say, molecules for drug designs, right? Because we can, in principle, also uh, learn a network to generate molecules that can have uh, particular properties that can help with curing diseases, for example. But at the same time, we also see that such technology is, is used for deep fakes in, let's say, way less noble applications. All right, but I don't have time to give an extra course on ethics in AI, but I really want you to be aware that this is actually a very important and big topic uh, in itself. Okay, that's all I have to say about it now. Uh, that really ends this uh, video series on dimensionality reduction via latent variable models. So far, we have been working a lot with basis functions. They allow us to map our data to new feature spaces in which the problem that we're trying to solve becomes easier. 
And then our linear model so far were explicitly parameterized by a set of weights, where essentially a weight was assigned to each feature value. Uh, but we also saw some previews that indicated that we could alternatively rewrite our predictive models purely in terms of the data points themselves, via the so-called equivalent kernel. Now, this week we will expand in the direction of this kernel viewpoint, in which we do not explicitly work with model parameters. This week we focus on what we call non-parametric models. Okay, so this is what we have been doing so far. We've been working with a fixed set of basis functions uh, to map our inputs x to this vector of uh, new feature values. And then we use this new representation to do linear regression or uh, linear classification. So we build this linear regression model really via this uh, linear function mapping parameterized by this uh, set of weights w uh, plus this bias term. And in the classification setting we consider linear classification models uh, because this linear part in the end results in some linear decision boundary. Uh, but this f actually uh, turns this linear part into a nonlinear thing, for example a probability. Now the reason for working with basis function was uh, let's say we have this one dimensional case with uh, let's say data points of one class over here and over here and then let's say if the other class my points were over here and we're building a, a linear classification model I cannot place a decision boundary that perfectly separates the two classes uh, but if I map these feature values so these points lie on some axis uh, x if I map them to a new space let's just say I perform the mapping x squared so this would be uh, my feature vector, uh, component 1 for example, is given by x squared. Then my original data points are mapped well, to this uh, parabola and that actually leads to the result that now in my new feature space I can draw a clear uh, decision boundary that separates the two classes. Okay, so that's what we've been do doing so far. So we mapped our uh, original features to a new uh, feature representation via these basis functions, uh, because then we can still work with this relatively simple model like linear regression or uh, linear models for classification. But then of course, such an approach highly relies on uh, choosing, choosing appropriate basis function, right? So uh, we also looked at in the case of actually learning these basis functions via neural networks, where this first layer of the neural network uh, could be thought of as a learned basis function, um, let's say the empt basis function that maps a particular x to a particular value. And then my uh, regression or classification is then based on a linear combination of these learned basis functions. Now in the upcoming videos we're going to revisit these basis functions and how to design them or how to choose them. But the main commonality between all these uh, models is that they are explicitly parameterized by, the set, by a set of model parameters W. So what we've been uh, focusing on is, is actually finding this optimal set of Ws and we could adopt a probabilistic viewpoint where we um, use the maximum likelihood approach, a maximum posterior approach to obtain a point estimate for W, so a single set of parameters W that describes my model. Or we could do this in a full probabilistic way uh, where we consider, let's say, a probability for each, each choice of W that I can make. So in the maximum likelihood case, I make a point estimate for W and for in the full Bayesian case I consider a posterior distribution for my model parameters W. So this distribution is tuned uh, to my data set. So and then you could say that at test time you can essentially discard the training data. I'm done, I know how to pick my W or I already picked my uh, W or I, I have a probability distribution that describes which uh, W I should use uh, from now on. Okay, so what I've described so far can be considered as parametric models. So those are models with a finite number of parameters. And then we have what we call non-parametric models. So those are essentially models that do not rely on an explicit definition of, of parameters. And in the upcoming videos I will show that for each of such non-parametric models we can equivalently define some parametric models that really de is defined by a set of, of model parameters. But by resorting to this non-parametric uh, viewpoint, uh, it allows us to actually work with models that implicitly, so not explicitly, but implicitly work with an infinite number of parameters. So that is obviously untractable when you work in this parametric uh, model viewpoint, but in this kernel uh, based viewpoint or this non-parametric model viewpoint, we can actually do this thing. 
So the main point then is that with parametric models, we work in a finite dimensional parameter space. So we just search for the optimal set of parameters. And then the non-parametric viewpoint, uh, you can sort of think of this as uh, trying to pick models out of this infinite dimensional space of functions that perform the task that we want to do. And at this point, maybe that sounds a bit abstract working with these function spaces, uh, but it will become clear in the upcoming videos, especially in the next lecture, so lecture 12, uh, when we talk about Gaussian processes. And then the approach that we take to uh, non-parametric modeling is via kernel methods. So in uh, these methods, they base their predictions not uh, on a set of model parameters, Ws, but they base their predictions on my available training data. And we encountered this idea before when we talked about the so-called equivalent kernel in video uh, 5.1. So the idea is that we have a, a linear parametric model, so it's uh, parametrized by a set of weights W. And we saw that such linear models can be recast into a equivalent dual representation. And in this video, I'm going to explain what I mean with, with such a dual representation. But the main point is that now in such a dual representations, uh, my predictions are based on a linear combination um, of the kernel function evaluated at data points. So I have my, all my data points and then my prediction is based on the linear combinations of these uh, data points via the kernel functions, where this linear combination is weighted via, with this uh, dual representation A. So we have some duality of how we represent our models. So we either do this via um, explicitly by my model parameters W or via a factor A that is used in a weighted sum of my predictions for each data point. Okay, and so we do this via uh, the kernel function. Um, so this kernel is essentially defined as the scalar product between this feature factor uh, for one data point uh, with the feature factor for another data point. So this is what we define uh, the kernel to be. Okay, and then it turns out that with such a kernel functions, uh, we can obtain a dual representation of my uh, linear models where my predictions are based on uh, the kernel evaluations for my existing data point relative to, well, the, the point that I'm testing for now, weighted with a corresponding set of weights uh, uh, encoded in this dual representation A. And now you should think of this kernel as measuring the similarity between two data points. And, and in that sense, uh, if I have to make a prediction for a particular data point, let's say x prime, then I'm going to compare how much it looks like uh, my original or uh, one of my data points in my uh, training set. And now the similarity then in the end determines how much my prediction is based on this particular data point. Okay, so this kernel is some sort of a similarity measure in the feature space defined by this mapping uh, phi of x. So this is essentially an inner product between such feature factors and this kernel uh, can be thought of as a sort of generalized inner product or a nonlinear version of the, uh, the inner product. Okay, so now let's make this a bit more explicit. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going over the example of a rich regression and I'm going to derive a dual formulation. So I'm going to express my linear model. Uh, so uh, this is essentially my linear model. I'm going to express it in terms of this kernel. Now, first of all, um, when we choose a set of parameters w, we minimize some objective of some error function, right? So we're now going to minimize this least squared error. So we want our model uh, for a given input x uh, to map closely to a corresponding target. And I want to minimize the error that my prediction makes uh, relative to well, my ground root target. And in order to prevent overfitting, I'm going to include this L2 uh, or this rich regression uh, penalty, right? So this prevents my weights of becoming too large and therefore it has this uh, regularization effect which prevents overfitting. So then the general strategy as always is, uh, we try to solve this, this is a convex optimization problem. So if we can find a stationary point of this thing, so if we can find uh, the W for which the derivative of my error function is zero, then we have obtained a globally optimal set of uh, parameters W. Okay, so let's do this computation. So we take the derivative of J with respect to W. Um, so that gives me uh, this particular thing over here. And we set it to, to zero. And now we solve it for W. And we start off with the following. So we're going to factorize this. So we want to have this W up front because it shows up here and here. So let's do that. So I can do it by writing an identity over here, right? Because it doesn't change my uh, factor uh, W. So, and then I can move this W outside and factorize it in the following way. 
And what I also did in this step, I moved the sum over my tn's to the other side, a side of the equation sign. Okay, and then from moving from here to here, I applied this trick, which we've also been doing a lot, like changing the order in a scalar product uh, can simply be done, changing the order and then switching the transposes. And that allows me to move this w to the other side. And I do that because now I have something in the form, let's say, a x is b, then that means x is a inverse b. So that's essentially this particular um, step over here. And that gives me the solution for W. So we can write it in the following form. And to make it a bit more convenient for ourselves, we work with this matrix vector uh, notation. So our derivative in terms of this matrix vector notation is given as followed, uh, follows where we have uh, relied on the definition of this uh, design matrix. And this design matrix stores all the feature vectors for each data point, right? So this uh, particular uh, matrix is an N by M uh, matrix. So it has N rows, so N data points, and each for, for each data point, I have M of these feature vectors. So when working with these uh, design matrix, I can formulate um, my solution in terms of this uh, design matrix as follows. Where here, I'm taking the inverse over an M by M matrix, because in this matrix, matrix multiplication, I sum essentially over this n axis. So I sum over all the data points, uh, the outer product of these uh, feature vectors. Okay, so our goal was to minimize this sum of squared errors, which had this uh, quadratic uh, weight penalty. And we just derived the solution to be of the following form. Now what I'm going to do next, I'm going to just rewrite this particular solution uh, via a matrix inversion lemma, such that in the end we can write it uh, using this, this kernel uh, notation. So in the end we want to rewrite things in, in terms of this kernel, and this kernel encodes all the inner product between basis functions, whereas so far these uh, matrices were based on the outer product of, of uh, the basis functions. Now I don't want you to remember this particular formula over here, but I do want you to remember, and whoops, there's a minus sign missing over here. I do want you to remember that uh, we can rewrite this inversion or this matrix into a, a new form via this formula. So there's many identities for rewriting uh, inverses of matrices, and now we're going to rely on this particular one, where we fill in uh, P minus 1 with lambda i, uh, B, that will be my design matrix, and R will be the identity matrix um, for n data points. So for example, this B is phi transpose, this R is R inverse, that's essentially I, the identity, and then we have phi, uh, we have a P inverse, so that's lambda I M inverse of this thing, and so on. And essentially this allows us to rewrite uh, the expression for W in the following way. So where we now see that this particular matrix product now is transposed to the following form where we have uh, phi identity doesn't do anything and then phi transpose. So that gives me the following expression and now we've written uh, this matrix product in the following form which we can replace with our definition of the kernel. Okay, so uh, what we did, we just rewrote the expression or solution for W such that we have this kernel popping up over here. Okay, so we just obtained that our solution W can also be expressed in terms of this kernel. And now if we make the following definition, so let's call this particular thing, let's call it uh, A, my dual variable. So th that's just a definition that I make for the moment. Then we can say that my solution W is obtained via this mapping from my dual parameter, via this design matrix. So we have this dual representation between A and W via this design matrix uh, using my definition of the dual variable. Now we can call these things like the primal variable uh, W because that's the thing that we're mainly interested in. That's uh, what we started off with uh, that defines our model. Uh, but equivalently, we can also maybe talk about a dual variable, which actually represents in the end the same model, the same thing, uh, but in terms of this A. But you could also approach this from an optimization point of view where you say, okay, my main objective is to minimize this particular functional, which I'm going can formulate in a constraint optimization problem, introducing this parameter z, uh, basically here inside this uh, squared error. So this is thing that you minimize in the constraint that z is my original thing, and I have this regularization term. 
And then when you talk about constraint optimization problems, you can talk about uh, a dual problem, which when you solve this dual problem, you actually have solved your original problem. And it turns out that this is the corresponding dual uh, Lagrangian or the du dual objective that you want to minimize. And uh, the minimizer of this dual uh, optimization a problem leads to this particular dual variable. So we will look into this primal dual a few points in one of the upcoming videos as well. But for now it's sufficient to know that I can have a primal variable which really represents my model in its original form, but I also have a dual representation which actually gives me the same model in the end, but this one is based on the kernel and this one is based explicitly on these basis functions. So they both rep represent the same thing. We have my primal view viewpoint which is a uh, linear model described by my set of parameters W. So that's the, the form that we've been used to seeing. But now if we insert this expression for W based on my dual variable in here, then I can show that we can rewrite it in the following way. And this shows that in my dual formulation, my predictions for a new data point X prime are based on my original data points Xn via this kernel weighted with the corresponding uh, dual variables. Okay, so what I just did, I started off with my ridge regression problem. So that, that essentially results in a linear model of the following form. And I showed that we can equivalently also describe such a model if I had this dual viewpoints where my predictions are no longer based on a, a weighted sum of my feature values, but my predictions are based on a weighted sum of my kernel values uh, for each uh, data point. Okay, now let's take a look at what this implies from a computational point of view. So in uh, the dual approach, my dual parameters, which really describe my model in the end, are, are obtained by uh, solving this particular inversion uh, problem. So we need to take the inverse of this kernel plus lambda i n. And because this is a matrix of size n by n, uh, the, essentially the, the, the computational cost for obtaining my a is of order n to the power 3, because this is the computational complexity of taking an inverse. Then in my primal uh, viewpoint, I have to take the inverse of an m by m matrix. Um, so that is that's actually much cheaper, right? Because typically you have uh, less uh, feature vectors than you have uh, data points. Now, what does this look like from uh, once you have obtained such a model, you want to make predictions. Then you can show that uh, in the dual case, uh, my predictions are of order n by m because I have to evaluate m multiplications inside this kernel, right? Because this was the inner product for e with each fe feature vector with the feature vector of the input uh, data point. Uh, so, and I have to do that n times uh, in order to compute uh, all the multiplications in this uh, sum. And then in the primal case, this computation is just of order m, right? Because I just have to multiply uh, my weights, each weight, so I have m of such weights and I multiply them m times with the corresponding uh, feature values. Okay, so this really makes you wonder why do we want to resort uh, to this dual viewpoint at all, considering that the computational cost associated with this uh, is, such, is, is that high, right? Because usually you would have way more data points than you have um, uh, model parameters. And then the main reason is that in this dual approach, I actually do not explicitly need all these parameters, which means that in theory, I can also go, I can use feature vectors of size, which are maybe infinite dimensional. So you can, with such kernel approaches, I can maybe work with kernels, which have, let's say an infinite amount of uh, feature values, and therefore they can be extremely powerful, right? They can represent all sorts of uh, decision boundaries or regression models. So as we will see, by resorting to this uh, kernel viewpoint, we can obtain very powerful methods. Okay, and then such a kernel methods do not re rely on the explicit computation of features or the explicit definition of features, but are rather on the similarity kernel. And well, equally as for the basis functions, there are some heuristics on choosing, uh, choosing basis functions. We also have something similar for uh, defining your kernel functions. And actually it turns out that there is one particular kernel function which is able to represent all sort of functions. So it is, it's actually not too hard to design your, your kernel method. But yeah, then these dual methods, they can be slow at predictions uh, as we uh, see looking at these computational orders. Uh, but what we will uh, discuss in one of the upcoming videos, we're going to look at a kernel method which is based on sparse solutions. So I have a sparse set of uh, ANs of uh, what we call support factors which define my prediction. So I do not have to evaluate this sum for all data points, 
basically this tells me with these sparse solutions that my predictions are obtained with only let's say a couple of uh, data points which have non-zero uh, support values. And with support values, I mean uh, these AN, so these dual variables. So if we call the number of non-zero uh, dual variables N prime, and let's say uh, we only have a few of them which are non-zero. That essentially means that I only need to perform the sum for the, the ANs which are non-zero. So the computational cost then associated with these sparse solutions will be of order N prime uh, times M. Uh, so uh, at test time, these models are actually not too much demanding and are actually close to the computational order of my uh, primal case. Now, the purpose of the upcoming videos will in the end uh, be to derive such kernel methods which have sparse, sparse solutions and such methods will be called, called uh, support factor machines. So we have just introduced the notion of a dual formulation for linear models, which relied on a definition of a kernel function. I also said that in this kernel viewpoint, we can implicitly work with feature representations, which can in principle be infinite dimensional. In this video, I'm going to make precise what I mean by this. The main idea behind it is that we will not explicitly define the kernel via the basis functions, but just give a direct definition of this kernel without ever having to talk about the basis functions that may have generated this kernel. This is what is called the kernel trick, and I'll explain it next. Now, the kernel trick works by formulating your optimization problem in such a way that the input vectors xn only enter in the form of scalar products, uh, or when working with basis functions, in the following form. Now, what we then do is we're going to replace all instances of this scalar product xn uh, with some other uh, data point xm with a particular kernel function. So this kernel function is going to replace um, the role of this uh, scalar product and should represent somehow some sort of generalized inner product or some nonlinear inner product. So this kernel function then captures all these similarities between all data points and stores them into one big matrix whose elements we can denote with the nm. So all these kernel evaluations, we're going to store them, store in a gram matrix, which is going to be of size n by n. Okay, so that will be this gram matrix, which we will be using uh, later on. Okay, so that is what we do with the kernel trick. We, re we replace all instances of this scalar product or of this feature-based scalar product with some kernel k. And this kernel k uh, then implicitly corresponds to a scalar product in some possibly infinite dimensional feature space. So implicitly it represents this product, but we're not going to write this out. We're just going to say, I have some kernel. I will give some definitions later on, but we, we have some kernel that characterizes this, uh, this scalar product. Now we cannot just pick any kernel k, it has to be a valid kernel. And a valid kernel is a kernel whose gram matrix is a symmetric positive definite uh, for all possible choices of xn. Which essentially means that if I take some vector z, multiply it with k both on the left and the right, where z is this uh, n-dimensional vector, right? Because k uh, was a uh, n by n-dimensional matrix, then this uh, thing should evaluate to some uh, positive uh, number for all possible z. And you can immediately see that if we define our kernel directly via a basis function, so let's say we uh, decide on some basis function, then uh, the kernel uh, that is obtained by k of x, x uh, prime is phi x transpose phi x prime. If I define my kernel in such a way, then it immediately follows that this results in a positive definite uh, gram matrix. Because if I write this out, so for any vector z, k, z, it's given by z transpose. This is my design matrix, design matrix transpose z. Um, this is equal to phi transpose z. And then the transpose of this entire thing, phi transpose z. And this equals the squared norm, which is uh, always bigger or equal than uh, zero. 
Okay, so if we are working with a particular kernel and we have to show that it is indeed a valid kernel, then we can always try to write it in such a form and then it immediately fo follows that it is indeed a valid kernel. But in some cases it, it can be incredibly difficult to write it in such a form and then we can adopt a different strategy for proving that my kernel is indeed a valid kernel. And I'll do that on the, on the last slide by showing um, which manipulations we can apply to uh, valid kernels to construct new kernels out of the things that we already knew are valid kernels. But we will discuss that later. So for now uh, it's sufficient to know that if I have a kernel of in such a form it is indeed a valid kernel. And that also means that I can uh, formulate this thing which actually we've called before an equivalent kernel in uh, chapter 3.3 if I recall correctly. Uh, we encountered this particular form where we have this feature vector with a covariance matrix in between. So we are allowed to call this thing a kernel because we are actually able to write it in this particular form uh, in the following way. So we know that this covariance matrix sigma is a positive definite matrix. So we can perform this eigen decomposition. So splitting it into uh, these eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And then we can also take the square root of such uh, a matrix by just taking the square root of this diagonal and then mapping it back to its original form by multiplying it on the left and right with, uh, with my eigenvectors. And because the matrix is uh, positive definite, uh, I can always take the square root of these uh, diagonal uh, eigenvalues. And if I do this, then I can define uh, my new uh, feature vector, let's call it psi of x, by multiplying my original phi of x with the square root of this uh, covariance matrix. So that allows me to write it into the following form. And we just discussed that this is indeed a, a, a valid form for, for a kernel. Okay, and these kernels, we encountered them in video 5.1 and uh, in chapter 3.3 of the book of Bishop when we talked about equivalent kernels, where we showed that in our linear regression case, we can also make our predictions based on linear combination of my data points via such, uh, via such kernels, uh, actually. So this means I can work with a particular basis, so let's say a polynomial basis, so uh, this is x, x squared, x to the power 3, so we have all these polynomials. This describes my feature vector uh, phi of x and this is the corresponding uh, kernel. Here plotted uh, for uh, the zero points relative to all uh, the other data points on my uh, x-axis. And we can do the same for a uh, Gaussian kernel and for uh, let's say a sigmoid. So these examples can also be found in the book of Bishop. So each set of basis functions defines a particular kernel and this kernel then characterizes how I'm going to make predictions based on my original data point. And what you essentially see in all of these kernels that uh, when points are close to each other, so points close to zero, that's my reference point in this case, then I take on high values and then I move away of it and from it then these values become lower. So that essentially means that my predictions are going to be dominated uh, by points that are similar to my uh, reference point. Okay, then there is a very important statement to be made about kernels, namely that for every positive definite kernel, there exists some uh, phi vector uh, that describes this kernel. So this means that I can just define some kernel, I only have to show that it is positive definite, and this then in turn implies that I'm implicitly working with uh, some basis functions phi, which in principle can be infinite dimensional. And this is just good to know, it justifies that we can actually do this kernel trick because it means that, well, we can switch to the kernel viewpoint completely and solve our problems with this viewpoint in mind, but that, that also means that implicitly we're solving some original problem where I actually use some uh, feature vectors. And I'll give some examples of kernels in, in the next slide. But the main point is that in general it is difficult to obtain these uh, basis functions explicitly, but that is not a problem because once we have obtained a valid kernel, we do not necessarily have to retrieve the corresponding basis function, we just know that there is some basis function that describes my kernel. Now here's an example of a case where we can actually derive the corresponding basis function of a kernel. So let's say I'm going to define my kernel in the following way. So let's say it's given by a one plus the scalar product of these two vectors and then square this whole thing. So that defines a valid kernel. So we can show this by first expanding the scalar product and then expanding the square. So that looks like a one plus x1 z1 plus x2 z2 product with itself, so x1, z1, x2, z2. 
Okay, so and then if I write this one out, so then I have 1 plus 2 times x1 z1 plus 2 times x2 z2, uh, etc. So what I did here, I, I grouped the terms of equal uh, with equal indices, right? Because then I can rewrite it in the form uh, phi x transpose phi uh, of z, where this particular vector is now called phi x and this particular vector is phi of z. You see, we apply the same uh, functional transformations to each of the components in z and x respectively. So the first basis function, so uh, let's say this thing will be my first basis function, so it's always uh, one. This thing will be my second basis function. So it just takes the first component and multiplies it with the square root of two and it goes on, and this is then my uh, sixth basis function, um, which really multiplies the first and the second component within my vector, and then multiplies it with the square root, because if I multiply this with this, I get this uh, particular term. Okay, so I just showed that I can make a definition, so here I just defined this polynomial kernel, uh, then I showed I can rewrite it in this particular form. So this means that uh, my input is uh, two-dimensional, so these x and z factors are two-dimensional, and I define a kernel on them. So this just re returns some number, which represents maybe a similarity between two data points. Then if I define my kernel as such, then this really implies that implicitly I'm mapping my uh, 2D feature vectors to some six-dimensional feature vector by these uh, phi of x's, which I've uh, just derived. So implicitly, I will be working with a six-dimensional uh, feature space. But again, I do not have to explicitly compute uh, these products using my basis functions that correspond to my kernel. I can just work with my main definition of the kernel and formulate my entire problem in terms of these kernels. Okay, then here are some, uh, some common choices for kernels. So first of all, we have this generalized polynomial kernel, which we just encountered. Uh, so of this form with some to the power m. Then we have Gaussian kernels or the squared exponential kernels. These, this is really one of the most popular classes of, of kernel functions uh, because they implicitly define an infinite dimensional uh, vector space. Meaning really that the features, the feature vectors that are implicitly used with these kind of kernels um, can be of dimension, uh, actually are infinite dimensional. You can show this. Now in the next lecture, so lecture 12 point uh, something, I'm going to take a closer look at variations of this exponential kernel and show that it is actually a very powerful uh, parameterization of my kernel, which is super flexible and can represent all sorts of uh, functions. Okay, um, but then there's another class of uh, kernels which is worth mentioning and that's the class of radial basis functions. So that's all kernels of the form uh, where I'm not... So my kernel is always a function of two inputs, so an x and an x prime, and my radial basis functions are really just one dimensional functions which take as input the difference vectors um, squared, so the square distance between my x and my x prime. And with this set you see that indeed this Gaussian kernel is a radial basis function. And actually this terminology get mixed up quite often, so quite often people say we use radial basis functions, and then really the question is, well, what kind of radial basis function? And quite often they say, yeah, of course, the Gaussian kernel. Um, so when people talk about radial basis functions, they often refer to uh, the Gaussian kernel. But it generally said a radial basis function is just a kernel of this particular form. And it can be different from, well, the exponential kernel that you see over here. Okay, so these are examples of valid kernels. Uh, but then you can be creative in designing your kernels. Uh, but you have to be aware that this kernel that you design, it needs to be a valid kernel, right? So it uh, should generate positive definite uh, gram matrices. Now, the main point of this slide is to show you that there are plenty of manipulations that you can apply to existing kernels to obtain new kernels. So suppose all these kernels are valid kernels, then I can generate a new valid kernel out of this, for example, by multiplying the kernel with a constant, or multiplying this kernel to the left and right with some function, or I can even take the exponential of, 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 of a valid kernel, and that also gives me a new valid kernel. 
Now, I don't want you to remember all these rules for, for changing uh, kernels or for constructing kernels. I just want you to know that if you have to prove that your kernel is a valid kernel, you can rely on these type of uh, manipulations. And actually, a nice example comes from the book of Bishop, where he basically showed that uh, these Gaussian kernels, so the kernel that's defined by the exponential minus the squared Euclidean distance from point x to x prime, um, let's just scale it with a 1 over 2, that this can be simply derived, or not necessarily simply, it can be derived from um, a particular kernel, namely the regular scalar product between these two vectors. So really the idea is that we can start off with a kernel which we know is a valid kernel, uh, we can sum it and multiply it, so we can multiply it and we can uh, sum such kernels uh, in order to obtain this uh, expansion of the square over here. Then we can take the exponential that's also allowed. And so we can apply all these manipulations to turn this core kernel into this particular form. And that then also then uh, shows a proof uh, for showing that this kernel actually constitutes a, a valid kernel. Okay, but then important to remember here that each of these kernels, which can be very complicated by using all these uh, combination rules, that each of these kernels actually correspond to some implicit feature representation. We talked about the kernel trick, which allows us to implicitly work with infinite dimensional feature vectors and in which the obtained models base their predictions on a linear combinations of the training data using the kernel. Now we will introduce a particularly powerful machine learning method based on this kernel viewpoint. In this video, uh, we define support vector machines, which eventually will turn out to be models that, that base their predictions on only a few of the original data points, and they are therefore fast to compute. Now in this video, we first start with a geometric motivation, or let's say derivation of support vector machines, and then in the remaining videos, we will explain support vector machines in the context of kernel methods. So before we explain that kernel methods, uh, they can be very powerful because they can implicitly work with feature representations that can be infinite dimensional. But these kernel methods can be also somewhat slow because they uh, base their predictions uh, on an evaluation of the kernel function for all possible uh, training points. Now support vector machines base their predictions on only a subset of the training points. So if I relate this to my original models, we have this, uh, let's call it the primal viewpoint, in which I have models, predictive models, could be classification or regression that are parameters by a, parameterized by a set of weights W. So they are of the following form. Maybe in the classification setting, uh, we have some generalized model, but let, let's consider regression in this case. And then we talked about what we call a dual viewpoint in which my uh, model is parameterized by these dual parameters which essentially define how to base my prediction uh, on a linear combination of my kernel evaluated uh, relative to um, all my uh, existing data points in, in a training set. Now in general these uh, kernel methods are slower than my uh, regular linear models, right? Because I have to evaluate this kernel uh, for, for all of the data points. But now with support vector machines, we're going to develop such kernel methods, uh, such kernel machines that work with uh, these, these dual components, which are sparse, meaning that there are only a few non-zero ANs. So we, can we only have to evaluate this kernel for only my support vectors, uh, essentially. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in the remaining videos. We're going to derive support vector machines, which are these, which is a kernel method in which the predictions are based on only a, a subset of my uh, uh, original training set. And these methods can then be applied for a classification, for regression. But it turns out that you can also apply uh, such kernel methods, such support vector machine methods, actually, for a novelty detection or anomaly detection. Now, I'm not going to cover this in the videos. Uh, but it's good to know that, that you can do such thing as anomaly detection. And the main idea is that I can train my kernel method uh, with my training set, of which I assume that there are no outliers or it's like a normal uh, proper data set. 
Um, but then if a new test point comes in, then I have a way of determining how unusual this particular data point is. Okay, but the main point is with support vector machines, we can cover uh, the applications that we're used to and a little bit more. And then another important property is that the support vector machines are obtained via a convex optimization framework, which means that there is only one solution that is optimal. And we are able to derive this particular solution. And this is nice, right? And you don't have this, for example, with neural networks, where you have to rely on a lot of local optima, and maybe one solution is better than the others. With support vector machines, we deal with a convex optimization problem, so we only need to derive one particular solution. Now, a possible disadvantage of support vector machines is that we do not have a good probabilistic interpretation of these models. Um, but as, so we will cover this in the next lecture, actually in the next lecture, we're going to cover probabilistic kernel methods. So uh, we do have probabilistic alternatives to support vector machines, but those are not necessarily uh, sparse anymore. So uh, that's a nice property of support vector machines that they work with uh, sparse uh, support vectors. Okay, so today we're going to talk about support vector machines for binary classifications. And we're going to derive these support vector machines from a principle of maximizing uh, the margin in my classifier. And with that, I mean the following. First of all, we are going to consider a linear classifier, right? So this particular model, so uh, this defines a particular decision boundary. And we're going to say that points uh, that are mapped to the positive side of this decision boundary. So for which Y evaluates to some positive number that is assigned to class one. And if the model evaluates to a negative value, then this uh, point gets uh, assigned to the negative class. So there's a typo here. This should be a smaller than. Okay, so that's just a linear uh, classification. And then for now, we're going to assume that my data set is linearly separable meaning that it is possible to define a decision boundary for which my data sets are perfectly separable. So this is actually an invalid decision boundary because it doesn't nicely separate the classes. Uh, but this is a valid decision boundary, so it classifies all points correctly. Uh, this one is also a valid one. And this one is also a classifier that does a perfect job that perfectly separates uh, the two classes. So this one doesn't separate the classes. Uh, but all the other three, those are actually uh, perfectly performing classifiers. Though one out of these uh, three options is better than the others, right? And it is this one. And why is this the case? Well, it is the case because it has the largest margin from the decision boundary to all other points. Um, considering the following, suppose one of my data points just lies out of uh, this distribution then now it's incorrectly classified. The same for this case, uh, but it isn't the case in, in this particular figure. And this is the case because my decision boundary is so close to my original data points. So it's very sensitive to these uh, kind of situations. And the same if I have a data point just out of the red distribution, it's still close by. Well, in this case, it, it gets uh, misclassified, uh, but in this case, it won't be. So this tells us that we're looking for a decision boundary which is far away from all the points, basically. So we want to maximize the margin between my decision boundary and really the closest point in my data set to this decision boundary. Now, let's see if we can uh, characterize or capture this notion of a decision boundary of this margin in, in formulas. Now, first of all, recall that my decision boundary is given by the following equation, right? It's all the points for which uh, y of x evaluate to zero. So that, that's this decision boundary on the right. Uh, in the red uh, color and points on this side will be assigned a positive class and when y evaluates to, to, ne to a negative number it gets assigned to the negative class so that's indicated over here. Now also recall from uh, the video on uh, discriminant functions that we can capture the distance or the distance from a point x to the decision boundary let's denote it with the r it's indicated with the following formula so really the absolute value of y uh, divided by the norm of w. So the distance to the decision boundary scales with my value y. And in the figure, it's indicated with this distance, uh, right? Okay, so now if you want to maximize the distance from all points to my uh, decision boundary, uh, I have to maximize this particular thing over here. And so I have to compute the absolute value of my prediction. Uh, but now also recall that uh, my data set was perfectly, it's linearly separable. So that means I can find a model that correctly assigns a positive value for each data point if it indeed belongs to the positive class 
and a negative value if it belongs to the negative class. So that really means that uh, my model is able uh, to satisfy this constraint that for each target, I give the corresponding signed uh, output. So if my target is positive, plus one, I need to return a positive value. So it returns this product is positive. And if my target is negative, I need to return a negative value. So this product is also positive. So that means in this linearly separable case, I do not have to write this absolute value, this modulus uh, sign over here, but I can just take the product TN, YN over here. So this really defines uh, the same thing. Okay, so we have a way of quantifying the distance of a particular uh, predicted point to the decision boundary. So let's, now let's give a definition of the margin. So we're going to uh, define the margin as the per perpendicular distance from the decision boundary to the closest point Xn. Meaning that if this is my decision boundary, then this is the closest point over here. So this is the closest point. And my and the distance that it has to my decision boundary will be called the margin. Okay, so for each data point, I can determine the distance to the decision boundary that's given by this uh, formula over here. And now I want to select uh, the point which minimizes this distance, right? So the closest point to my decision boundary. So my margin is defined as follows. So it's really defined by the index n that minimizes this quantity, which represents the distance to the uh, decision boundary. So this is the margin and we want to maximize this uh, with respect to my model parameters w and b. Uh, but now there's some ambiguity uh, going on. There's several choices for w and b that satisfy the same margin or that lead to the same margin actually. And you can see that as, as follows. So I can multiply my w with some value kappa. So kappa times w times b and times w. And this evaluates to the exact same value as you see on the left hand side. So I can choose multiple values for w of b that all result in the same margin. So there's some ambiguity in my optimization framework. So I'm going to constrain it. I'm going to say, uh, I mean, I can choose my w um, in several ways, but now I'm going to say I have to choose my w in such a way that for the point closest to the decision boundary, the numerator, so this term evaluates to one. And I can do this, right? Because um, I'm minimizing this particular thing. I can choose several values for kappa that result in the same margin. So let's just make it simple for ourselves. Let's choose kappa in such a way that this numerator evaluates to one. Okay, so that's, uh, that's set over here. And once I've done that, then this also implies that for all the other data points, uh, this numerator will be larger uh, or equal to one. Okay, so that then defines my margin. And then my objective is to maximize. So I'm going to choose the model parameters that maximize the margin. And this margin is a function of W and B. So for a particular set of W and B, this will be my decision boundary. And then this will be the margin. You see, I can still widen this uh, interval uh, to really fill this gap. And this could be, for example, my optimal uh, decision boundary because it really maximizes uh, the margin. And now in this case, so we have actually two types of data points, points that are lie exactly on the decision boundary. So those are the points for which uh, this expression evaluates to one. And for all, all other points, uh, the numerator has some value bigger than one. Okay, with this in place, we know that the distance to the decision boundary is given by uh, this expression. And we also said that the numerator in this term is going to be equal to one where this thing is equal to one for the point closest to the decision boundary. So the point closest to the decision boundary uh, for those terms, this numerator equals uh, one. So that really implies that the distance, so the margin size uh, for these points is simply given by one over W because for the points closest to the decision boundary, this term evaluates to one and thus the margin size is given by one over uh, the norm of W. Okay, that's nice. So that tells us really that uh, this is the problem that we're solving. We want to maximize this quantity, but still under the constraint that for my closest point, uh, the numerator evaluates to this thing. So this uh, property needs to be satisfied for the closest point. And equivalently, this means that we can actually impose the following constraint to my maximization problem. Right, because maximizing this particular thing means minimizing this value for W and that also leads to a, a downscaling of this particular term, but we, it cannot be smaller than one. 
and this constraint will then make sure that the points closest to the decision boundary will have uh, that this expression evaluates to one and all other points so further away from this decision boundary or further away from the margin will have a uh, positive uh, value for this uh, particular term. Okay, so that then really defines the problem that we're trying to solve. We want to maximize the margin under the constraint that uh, this particular term has to be bigger or equal to one for all data points n. And instead of maximizing this particular thing, we're going to minimize the norm of W, right? That, that, for, that forms a, an equivalent optimization problem. Because the optimizer of this minimization problem of a W squared is going to be equal to the maximizer of this thing. And we prefer this form actually. So uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to maximize the margin by minimizing the squared norm of W under the constraint that for each of my end data points, uh, that each for, for each data point, this particular term evaluates to um, bigger or equal than one. This then defines a constraint optimization problem where we have a quadratic uh, objective that we want to minimize under linear constraints. So this constitutes a quadratic programming problem. And we, there are plenty of algorithms in place that can readily, readily solve these type of problems. And now what I'm not going to do is, is uh, I'm go not going to explain exactly how to perform this optimization, how to solve this problem numerically, but I do uh, want to explain the main principles behind constraint optimization, because this the, the main principle behind uh, constraint optimization is derived from the fact that um, equivalent to this primal optimization problem, so this is what we want to solve, we can formulate a corresponding dual optimization problem and uh, via uh, the dual Lagrangian. And if we are able to, to solve this dual optimization problem, then we have also solved our original primal optimization problem. And it turns out that this optimization via this dual objective naturally uh, leads to this dual viewpoint or this kernel viewpoint that we've been uh, talking about before. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to talk about uh, constraint optimization problem with this perspective of solving a uh, optimizing a particular Lagrangian versus optimizing a dual Lagrangian, and then I'll apply these notions to this this specific problem of a of obtaining a maximum margin classifier and show that we naturally obtain a kernel method for a classification in which the dual vector is sparse meaning that my predictions are based on a sparse subset of my original data points. And as such, we will derive a sparse support vector machines. We already spent a separate video on constraint optimization under equality constraints. In this video, I'm going to build upon this video, but now consider the problem of optimization under inequality constraints. Now we just saw that when optimizing maximum margin classifiers, we need to solve a convex optimization problem under inequality constraints. Now we will be able to solve this problem by first formulating a dual optimization problem. And then it turns out that the solution to this dual problem gives us eventually the solution to the original problem, which we started off with. Now the starting point is the same as before in the case of optimization with uh, equality constraints. So when we considered a problem of maximizing a particular function f with respect to x subject to a constraints that um, x could only lie on this particular level set. So it could only lie on this red uh, curve. Then we showed that we could solve this problem uh, by introducing a Lagrangian and then uh, the stationary points of this Lagrangian in the in it gave us the solution to this uh, problem. The main idea was that we were looking for points on this level set uh, that were maximal with respect to uh, f of x. And we saw that such a point can no longer improve its values for, for f if both uh, the gradient with respect to f or, or the gradient of f with respect to x, I mean, um, is perpendicular to my level set as well as uh, the gradient to my uh, constraint is perpendicular to the level set. Now the gradient of my constraint uh, is always perpendicular to the constraint surface. That's really implicit in the definition of this uh, level set. Uh, but then the gradient uh, with respect to f is only perpendicular uh, to my level set if I can no longer improve my, my point. And the idea was that if I consider a point which isn't optimal, my gradient points in some direction and I could still move a bit along my level set to improve my value, uh, function value uh, f of x. So as long as 
my gradient of f if it isn't fully perpendicular to my level set i can still move my point along this level set until it is indeed fully perpendicular and then uh, there's no improvement anymore to be made to moving to the left or to the right for example okay and that told us that at such an optimal location uh, both the gradient of f and the gradient of g are aligned so they're either in the pointing in the same direction or they have opposite signs uh, so we have this uh, Lagrange multiplier that makes sure that this uh, equation is satisfied. And then the approach was that we define a, a Lagrangian function um, whose stationary points give me the final solutions. Because if I find a point uh, which satisfies uh, this, so the gradient of my Lagrangian with respect to x and lambda is zero, then I satisfy both my original constraint because the gradient with respect to lambda gives me uh, g of x equals zero. So indeed, so this satisfies my original constraint and the gradient to x of my uh, Lagrangian gives me the following optimality constraint. Okay, so the solutions to this constraint maximization problem can be obtained by looking for the stationary points of my Lagrangian. Now in the optimization with in inequality constraints, uh, things uh, get slightly different, right? So now we optimize a function f of x, where my g of x uh, is not necessarily equal to zero, but it can also be larger than zero. So this, this kind of constraints leads to regions in which my uh, solution can be found. And such regions are indicated in this figure, in this, this red uh, shaded area. And then we can identify two type of situations. Uh, one is that suppose my function f of x has its optimal location uh, around x, x, b. Then this means that I can find a stationary point of f of x. So this optimizer really satisfies my constraint g of x. So there's not nothing much that I have to do about this. But there may of course also be points where actually the, the global optimal location of my function f um, would be, let's say, somewhere over here. Then I have to really think carefully about my constraints. So I cannot just select this point. So this, this point is an optimizer of f of x, but it doesn't satisfy this constraint. So my uh, solution will be found on this boundary. And then we actually we deal with the constraint optimization problem that we just saw. Namely that uh, both the gradient of f of x have to, has to be parallel as well as the gradient with respect to uh, my uh, constraint function. Because if, if they weren't parallel, then it means I could still update my point and move into the direction that optimizes uh, f of x. Okay, so that tells me that if my optimal point lies outside of this region, then actually uh, the optimal point that satisfies the constraint will, will lie on, on the boundary. And actually we have that this needs to be satisfied, that this gradient uh, uh, of my function and the gradient of my constraint, uh, they are uh, anti-parallel in fact. And this is an important difference compared to the previous case uh, where we just said, okay, my gradient of f and gradient of g both have to be uh, perpendicular to my level set. Now uh, we see that also my gradient of x has to be anti-parallel to a g of x. Because suppose my uh, gradient was pointing inwards, yeah, then I could, uh, of course, move in this direction and uh, end up in my, uh, well, uh, globally optimal point. So if indeed my... Uh, function f of x has its optimal location outside the region, then it means that the gradient of f, a, f of x points outwards. Okay, so now we have this additional constraint that my Lagrangian multiplier uh, has to take on a positive value. So let me write that down. Okay, so that is similar as we've seen before, uh, but now really remember this in this inequality constraint optimization, this mu can only take on uh, positive values, this Lagrangian uh, multiplier. And then in the end, we work with the exact same uh, definition of my uh, Lagrangian. I'm going to call it a primal Lagrangian because in the next slide, I'm going to also look at a dual Lagrangian. So my primal Lagrangian is the same as before. It's just that now my mu has to take on a positive value. And then it follows that the stationary point of my uh, primal Lagrangian satisfies my original constraint if indeed the, the obtained uh, values from mu also uh, take on a, a positive value or zero. And it turns out that we can formulate this into a max-min or a min-max uh, optimization problem um, where we uh, maximize my Lagrangian with respect to x. So we really want to maximize this function with respect to x, but we want to minimize uh, these mu parameters. And we will see in a minute why, do, why we want to minimize with respect to mu. Uh, but whatever we do, we need to satisfy these constraints, right? So this uh, follows from the discussion that we just had, that mu is either zero or it's positive. 
this follows from that we have to satisfy my uh, original constraint. And this is what we call uh, complementary slackness, that at least one of the two has to be zero. Right? Because if g of x is uh, bigger than zero, then I'm inside this region I do, and I do not want to enforce this uh, particular constraint. And conversely, if, if mu is uh, bigger than zero, then I'm actually enforcing this constraint, meaning that my point has to lie somewhere on this uh, boundary. So g of x has to equal a zero in that case. Okay, so we're still considering this problem of maximizing my function f of x subject to the constraint that it needs to lie inside this uh, particular region or on its boundary. And then uh, the recipe for solving this is via this max min uh, uh, problem, where I need to take into account that these KKT conditions, so that's what these uh, constraints are called, uh, they, uh, they are called uh, the Karushkun Tucker uh, conditions, that these conditions need to be uh, satisfied uh, at all times. And then the idea behind this approach relies on the definition of a dual Lagrangian. So this dual Lagrangian is defined as the maximum of, of, over x of my uh, primal Lagrangian. So my primal Lagrangian is given as follows, right? So my original f of x plus uh, the Lagrange multiplier times my uh, constraint. And it is a function of both my uh, primal variable x and my dual variable uh, mu. And then my dual Lagrangian is defined as taking the maximum of my primal Lagrangian with respect to x. And this gives me a function that only depends on mu now. So it no longer depends on x because I already took the maximum over this thing. So I'm considering this dual Lagrangian, which is a function only of mu. And we can obtain this dual Lagrangian via the following steps. So first of all, uh, we want to maximize this with respect to x. So we're uh, going to find look for stationary points for which uh, the gradient of my Lagrangian with respect to x is going to be uh, equal to zero because then I have at least found a, a local maximum. And depending on your problem, you then also have obtained your, your global maximum for this uh, Lagrangian. Uh, but then this constraint can be used to eliminate x from my primal Lagrangian. So that uh, I'll give an example in the next video when we consider the specific case of deriving support vector machines. But in general, you can use this constraint then to, to eliminate x from my Lagrangian. And that gives me a dual Lagrangian, which only depends on mu. And it actually then follows that this particular dual Lagrangian gives you an upper bound for this uh, function value. So we're looking for the maximal function value f of x under this constraint. It turns out that this dual Lagrangian gives you an upper bound on this uh, maximum value as a function of mu. And the idea is as follows. So we're looking for uh, maximal values of f of x, uh, but we only consider points that satisfy this constraint. So let's call, let's call these points uh, that satisfy this constraint, uh, let's call them feasible points, and I'm going to indicate them with uh, x prime. So x prime are points which satisfy this constraint. And then, uh, well, let's, let's pick a particular point, f of x prime, that gives me a particular optimal value. And then depending on whatever x uh, prime I pick, it can be a low value or a high value, and we're actually looking for the highest possible value f of x uh, prime. Now let's call this particular point, let's call it uh, p star, so the solution to my primal problem. So I'm going to indicate the solution to my primal uh, maximization problem, I'm going to indicate it with uh, p star. Now when I look at this uh, definition of the Lagrangian, it's always f of x plus mu times g of x. And both mu and g of x are always pos positive for these uh, points that satisfy the constraint, right? So my Lagrangian will always be uh, larger than the actual value f of x. Actually bigger or equal. So that's basically this thing. So uh, whenever I pick a particular x prime, it's a Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian x prime of mu is going to be larger than uh, my uh, f of x prime. Okay, and then in the formulation of my dual Lagrangian, for a fixed value of mu, I'm going to pick uh, the maximal solution of this Lagrangian. So I'm maximizing over my uh, variable x. So this dual variable, so this dual Lagrangian, will always give me an upper bound of the actual, um, actual primal point, right? It will always be larger than, than this point because we have uh, these terms which are always uh, positive. Now the main idea is to uh, come up with uh, the smallest upper bound for my original primal problem. So now I can vary mu and for some mu I get a, a large uh, value of this, this dual uh, Lagrangian, so a, a high upper bound. Uh, but we want to 
lower and lower and we get a, we want to get the tightest possible um, upper bound on my solution. So that's what we do over here. So we want to minimize this dual Lagrangian with respect to mu as this gives me an upper bound on my uh, original uh, solution. So uh, we minimize over mu and that gives us for example this dual solution. So the mu that actually gave me the minimal uh, upper bound. Okay, and we call this a difference between uh, the minimal uh, dual uh, Lagrangian uh, versus the maximal primal uh, solution. We call this difference the duality gap. And in general, in general, we have weak duality. So we always have that uh, the dual Lagrangian gives us an upper bound on uh, my primal uh, solution. But in our particular case, we work with problems in the support vector machine setting. We work with problems that are convex and for which we actually have strong duality, meaning that um, the minimizer of my dual uh, corresponds with the maximizer of my primal problem. Okay, and that's summarized over here. So actually for almost all convex problems, we have that we have strong duality. And this means that if we solve the dual problem, so if we solve the problem of minimizing, uh, so this is a dual problem, of minimizing my dual Lagrangian, still subject to the constraint that my mu should be bigger than zero. But if I have solved this problem, this dual problem, then I obtain a optimal parameter for mu. And then I can just plug this in my Lagrangian, fix mu at this point, and then maximize my Lagrangian with respect to x. And that gives me my final um, solution to this uh, original problem, on, to this original constraint optimization problem. Okay, so such constraint optimization problem heavily rely on the notion of a dual Lagrangian because this dual Lagrangian gives us an upper bound and if we can reduce this upper bound then we get closer and closer to the optimal uh, solution of my original problem. And in many cases, especially cases that we consider, um, we see that we can actually obtain the tightest upper bound as possible, meaning that if we solve the dual problem we also have solved the primal problem. Okay, so then the recipe for solving such constraint, uh, so this such inequality constraint maximization problem is as follows. So first we define the Lagrangian. Um, that's straightforward, just formulate my constraints in this uh, form that g of x has to be equal than, uh, bigger or equal than zero. Then we compute the dual Lagrangian by maximizing my Lagrangian with respect to x. So we find a stationary point of this with respect to x and use it to eliminate x from my primal Lagrangian. And that gives me my dual Lagrangian. Okay, and when we have obtained the dual Lagrangian, we're going to minimize it with respect to mu, uh, still under this constraint that mu has to be bigger or equal than zero. And when we've solved this, we can solve for the, the, the primal problem. Now note that we're still uh, minimizing with under constraints, but this uh, minimization problem is, uh, is always going to be convex, uh, first of all. And it's generally much easier than my original problem, uh, primarily due to the fact that my dual Lagrangian not only depends on these Lagrangian multipliers and not uh, on both x and mu. So this is a function just of mu and it gives us an upper bound. So it doesn't directly give us the solution uh, x. Um, it just tells us which mu parameter should I choose uh, in order to solve this uh, maximization problem in the end. Okay, that's all you need to know for now. Um, so when we solve such inequality constraint optimization problem, we will define a dual Lagrangian and a dual problem uh, because minimizing this means that we have the tightest uh, upper bound for my original problem. And in the convex optimization cases that we consider in this course, we actually ob obtained a solution to my primal problem if we solve this dual problem first. Now that we know a bit more about inequality constraint optimization, let's apply the principle of dual optimization to the problem of training maximum margin classifiers. We will show that via this dual optimization approach, uh, we naturally come to a kernel formulation of the maximum margin classifier, for which we can show that the classifier itself will base its predictions only on a few data points. Such data points will be called support factors, and the classifier itself will be called a support factor machine. Previously, we considered the optimization of linear classifiers by the principle of maximizing the margin. So a linear classifier bases its predictions or its decisions on a uh, linear decision boundary. So if points fall on one side of this boundary, they will be assigned to one class. And if they fall on the other side, they will be assigned to the other class. Now, uh, we reason that we actually want to margin this, this boundary because that will give us the, the most stable uh, linear classifier in the end. Okay, so what we did, we derived an expression for 
uh, the distance of each point to the margin. And that was actually given by this expression over here. So uh, the distance of a point to my decision boundary is given by R. And then we said, let the closest point to my decision boundary uh, define the margin. Let that be the margin. Then it turned out that we could uh, select several W that, that would give me the same margin size. So in order to keep things simple, we decided to calibrate this W such that uh, this term in the numerator evaluates to one. And then we get this very simple expression for uh, the margin, namely one over uh, the norm of W. Okay, so by resorting to this definition of the margin, we actually have that for all data points, we have that this particular term evaluates to one or uh, bigger, to, uh, bigger than one. And yeah, now our objective is to mi maximize this margin. So we maximize this quantity and that is equivalent to minimizing this particular quantity. So a half times uh, the norm of W squared. So this is much more convenient to work with. So we formulated the following constraint minimization problem. We want to minimize uh, or actually maximize the margin, minimize this thing under the constraint that this entity uh, evaluates to one or bigger than one. Okay, so that's where we ended and that's where we continue now. So now we know a bit more about constraint optimization and we know how to solve such problems. And this relied on a definition of a Lagrangian and a dual Lagrangian. And now the objective of this video is to derive this dual Lagrangian and this dual optimization problem and then show that we can obtain solutions to this problem uh, based on a, a kernel uh, viewpoint. Okay, so let's do this. Let's uh, maximize the margin. So this means we're going to solve this uh, minimization problem. So this uh, inequality constraint uh, minimization problem. And the first step in doing so is to define uh, my uh, primal Lagrangian function, right? So that, that's given over here. So this is essentially um, f of w. So my uh, main objective that I want to minimize. And now minus all my uh, constraints. So this uh, thing over here is my constraint and I have n of such. For each data point, I have this particular constraint. Now, um, a, a note here. So in the previous video, I talked about a constraint maximization problem. Now I talk about a constraint minimization problem. So that's why we see this minus sign and not uh, the plus as we have saw, uh, seen in the previous video. And then each of these ans uh, denote uh, the Lagrange multiplier. for each of the n constraints uh, that I have. Okay, and then in this optimization framework, I have that my uh, primal parameters, so those are my w's and b's, so my model parameters, my primal uh, variables, uh, they have to satisfy the KKT conditions as well as my dual uh, variables. And this basically means I have primal feasibility, so that means that, well, my primal variable w needs to satisfy this constraint that we put over here. But then we also have that our dual variables need to satisfy this uh, constraint, that they have to be uh, larger um, or equal uh, to zero. And then we saw in the previous video that we also have to deal with complementary slackness. So that's that at least one of the two has to be equal uh, to zero. That's uh, captured in this uh, particular expression. Now, and then our objective is uh, to derive the dual Lagrangian. So the dual Lagrangian was defined as uh, the minimization. So again, that was a minimization because I work with this constraint minimization problem. So the dual Lagrangian is the minimizer uh, of my uh, primal Lagrangian over X and B for a fixed uh, set of um, Lagrange multipliers A. And then the strategy is to uh, first de derive the stationary points of my uh, primal Lagrangian and then use them to uh, eliminate uh, my primal variables from my original Lagrangian. And that gives me a dual Lagrangian which only depends on my dual variables A. And then the idea was, because I've now worked with a convex optimization problem, a constrained convex optimization problem, uh, this means that I have strong duality, which means that the maximizer of my uh, dual Lagrangian uh, then defines my uh, globally optimal solution in my uh, primal case. So our objective is to really derive this dual Lagrangian because that gives us access in the end to our uh, final solution, which we are after. Okay, so let's derive the dual Lagrangian then. So this was our uh, definition of the primal Lagrangian. And now we're going to compute the derivatives with respect to our primal parameters and set it to zero and then solve for our primal uh, variables. So if we take the derivative with respect to W, so we have a half, uh, yeah, let's call it W squared. So that gives me W transpose. 
And then we have a W over here, so that gives me minus the sum over a and t and x and uh, transpose. And this is set equal to zero. And we can move this particular term to the other side and take the transpose on both sides. And that gives us uh, this expression for W. So that means uh, in terms of a, in terms of my dual variables, uh, my W is expressed as follows, because then it satisfies this optimality criterion. Okay, then similarly for uh, the derivative with respect to b, we can compute it. So we only see b over here, so we have minus the sum a n times t n uh, times b. So this is the particular derivative. So this tells me that we have this additional constraint actually on my uh, dual variables a n. Okay, so we just derived these constraints on w and a n. And now let's use it to eliminate uh, my, uh, my primal variables from... Uh, from the primal Lagrangian. And we'll do this by factorizing uh, this particular term over here. That makes it a bit easier for us. So we see this W um, over here and we see it over here. So let's make this a factorization. So we have a W transpose. Okay, so that covers uh, this part and yeah, this part. And now let's take a look at the other items. So then we have Okay, so I'm just writing out this particular term, right? Uh, and I'm writing it in a slightly more convenient form. And then we recognize that we have this expression for W. Uh, so that's what we recognize over here. So this means we can rewrite this as minus a half W transpose W, right? Because uh, well, a half W minus W gives me minus a half W. Okay, so this term reduces to this. Then in this term, this b doesn't depend on n, so we can move it up front. So that gives us 1 minus b sum over n is 1 to n, a n, d n, and then we have the other term. Okay, and then now here we can use this identity, namely the sum over uh, all n, a n, d n, e evaluates to 0, so this thing. It's going to be zero. That simplifies things a lot. And then we just fill in this expression for W that we have over here. So let, let's just fill in. And that gives me the following expression for the dual Lagrangian. So we have this dual Lagrangian given as follows. And we still need to deal with these particular constraints. So this was, uh, well, the, the dual feasibility constraint that we already have from the KKT conditions. But now we also still have this additional constraint given uh, over here. And know that this particular constraint will now always be satisfied, right? Because we use this expression in our um, derivation here. So we use this to eliminate W using this particular form. Okay, so now we have derived our dual Lagrangian. And now we can formulate our dual optimization problem, so, which means that we want to maximize this dual Lagrangian with respect to A, with respect to our Lagrange multipliers, uh, still under the constraint that each of these Lagrange multipliers has to be uh, equal to zero or bigger than zero, and we have this additional constraint over here. Now, this is a constraint optimization problem that we can solve. I'm not going to solve it explicitly in these videos, but there are numerical solvers to do this uh, for you. But the main point to realize here is that we deal with a convex optimization problem in the primal case, so that means that uh, the, the solution to this dual optimization problem, so the maximizer A that maximizes dual Lagrangian, then essentially in the end gives us the solution to my uh, primal problem. And we can actually get back to my primal uh, solution via the following derived entity, right? So we saw that the optimality conditions for the, uh, the primal Lagrangian gave me this. So if I find the optimal ANs via this problem, I can directly map into my uh, weights W via this uh, particular expression. Okay, so now we are able to solve our original uh, maximum margin uh, problem um, via this dual uh, optimization problem. And now we can make things more interesting uh, because now this whole optimization framework, the maximum margin a classifying framework was based on these original data points. So on my feature space, in my original feature space, let's say. But now we can make things more interesting by working with a kernel. So we can apply the kernel trick and replace every instance of Xn, Xn, Xm with the kernel of xn, xm. So that gives me this uh, dual Lagrangian. So this would really mean that um, I would implicitly work with a feature space defined by this kernel and this kernel could uh, represent maybe some infinite dimensional feature space. So this is very powerful. So now we can actually 
obtain maximum margin classifiers in a very high dimensional feature space by applying uh, this kernel tricks and that leads to eventually to very uh, non-linear decision boundaries right because in this space it could only work with linear decision boundaries but if i apply some basis function transformations on my data points i can uh, map this to a non-linear decision boundary okay but we applied this kernel trick to uh, the dual lagrangian so that tells me that my solutions can be obtained via such uh, kernels via such abstract uh, feature representations but of course my decisions also have to be made then using the corresponding kernel. So let's see if we can also rewrite this. And that means that we have to rewrite our predictive model into this kernel form, right? So this was my primal formulation of my uh, predictive model, they parameterized with these Ws, but then we saw that we uh, derived from the optimality constraint of my Lagrangian, this mapping from uh, dual variables to my uh, primal variables. So if we would simply substitute this, it gives us this dual uh, formulation of my predictive model we again apply this kernel trick. So we see that also now my predictive uh, models can be defined in terms of this kernel and uh, the dual variables a n. So really this thing is uh, the dual formulation using the kernel trick of my original uh, linear classifier. Okay, so we derived a way for um, building maximum margin classifiers, namely by optimizing this dual Lagrangian that gives me this uh, solution for A, so with respect to my, it, it gives me a solution for the dual variable, and then uh, my classifier can be expressed in terms of this dual variable via this uh, kernel representation over here. Now the interesting thing is because we put this into this uh, dual formulation framework and we have this KKT constraints, we can actually say things about these uh, dual variables. Uh, first of all, we can say that uh, well, du dual feasibility is satisfied for our solutions, meaning that all my uh, dual variables are either positive or they are zero. So let, let's consider these two cases. Let's consider the case where an is positive. Well, we have complementary slackness, so that means that uh, the product of these terms has to be zero always. Uh, so if an is positive, that means that this particular term is zero. And that in turn implies uh, that tn times yn equals 1. Uh, so this was really my definition of uh, the support vectors or uh, the vectors that really have the closest distance to my margin, uh, to my uh, decision boundary. So these are the points for which an is bigger than 0. Okay, so those are my uh, support vectors. Those are the points that directly lie on my margin. So those are the, the, the vectors that actually define my predictions. Uh, but then this complementary slackness also implies that whenever a n is zero, or maybe conversely, whenever this term uh, is larger, uh, is large, so this will work essentially all the points beyond uh, the margins, this expression evaluates to bigger than zero. That means that my dual variables have to be zero for all, all, all these points that do not lie on the margin. So all these points, they get assigned a zero a n. So a n is zero for these points. And therefore they do, they do not contribute to my uh, final prediction. And that explains why we can uh, call such models support vector machines, because they only base their predictions on, on a very few points that support my uh, final prediction. Okay, then a final note. So we, uh, I talked a lot about these uh, dual variables, which we can uh, derive via my uh, dual optimization uh, framework. Uh, but of course, my predictions also depend on, on these Bs, right? On these Bs. And now we can find these Bs actually using the fact that for my support factors, this expression holds, right? We saw that whenever a n is bigger than zero, then we have that this uh, expression holds. That's actually that this thing is equal to zero. Um, so that's how we can find Bs. So we can just pick one of these xn's for which I have a non-zero a n and, and then solve it. So so let's do that. Let, so this is my predictive model where I now fill in this xn and then my predictions are based on all the support factors, uh, all the, the factors which have non-zero um, dual variable a. So that's indicated over here. All indices that are uh, have non-zero uh, dual variables, those define my uh, predictions. Okay, then I'm just rewriting this. So I multiply everything on the left and right. So I multiply it with tn on both sides. And then use the fact that 
the square of the tn, which was only minus 1 or 1. So this thing always evaluates to 1. So that brings me to, to this particular line. And then I can move this uh, to the other side. And that gives me the expression for b. And, and I'm done, basically. Okay, so once I have derived my uh, dual variables, uh, my bias term can be directly obtained by just picking one of these uh, support factors and evaluate this expression with only that uh, one data point. But it turns out that it's actually much more stable to average over all support factors because maybe my numerical solver will make some errors in these uh, in obtaining these uh, dual variables. And then it's, it's actually more stable to just take the average over all my obtained b's for each uh, non-zero support factor. Okay, but that's all there is to it. And then we can actually build this uh, maximum margin classifier, right? So, and we can choose a kernel however we want. Uh, so this it now then defi defines my maximum margin classifier. And in this particular example, um, we are going to build this support factor machine using Gaussian kernels. So with kernels of this particular form. And implicitly, these uh, kernels, they represent infinite dimensional uh, feature spaces. And now the interesting thing of this particular experiment is we have all these observed uh, data points and we want to classify them in two groups. They're labeled, so the blue class and the red class. This data set is not linearly separable, right? So in my original space, I could not, could not draw a decision boundary that separates the two classes. But now when I use this kernel trick, I actually implicitly map uh, these data points to this high dimensional feature space in which there exists actually a linear uh, uh, decision boundary that perfectly separates the classes. So that's the main strength of support factor machines that we can uh, use this kernel trick to come up with very, uh, with basically very complex uh, decision boundaries. So let me draw that actually. So here in black, you, uh, well I'm now drawing it in green, is the obtained decision boundary and what you see over here. So the encircled points are uh, the support factors. And what I'm drawing here in red is going to be the margin for the red class. And when I, what I'm drawing now here in blue is going to be the margin for uh, the blue class. Okay, now a final note, suppose my data set contains some outliers, then okay, these points would, would still be valid. But let's say I would have a data point somewhere over here. Then actually uh, this support factor machine is guaranteed to separate the data sets. So then you would actually have a very complicated decision boundary. Maybe it looks something like this, uh, or maybe it actually adds this region uh, to the blue classification uh, region. And these very complex shapes can be achieved by uh, tweaking your kernel a bit. Basically a large uh, sigma means I have uh, very smooth decision boundaries and when it becomes smaller, I'm allowed to make these very shaky uh, decision boundaries. Uh, so I do have some control over how smooth I want my decision boundaries uh, uh, to be. But a better approach, and that is what we're going to discuss in the net next video, is to relax this constraint of hard separability of these two classes, uh, actually. And we're going to do that uh, by defining what we call a soft margin classifier. In the maximum margin classifier formulation, we assume perfectly separable data sets. But in practice, we can certainly expect overlap between the class conditional distributions. So then does it still make sense to work with this maximum margin classifier? And what would then be the margin uh, when points incidentally fall on the other side of the decision boundary? Well, we will solve this problem by introducing slack variables that allow for some points to lie on the wrong side of the margin. It will still result in a kernel method with a sparse set of non-zero dual variables and hence this soft margin classifier can still be called a support vector machine. So we saw in the previous video that we were able to build maximum margin classifier that really ensured that each data point was uh, mapped to the right side of the decision boundary with a sufficient margin. And we were able to build such a uh, classifiers because we used the kernel trick and that allows us to work with very complex uh, feature representations that re that eventually leads to very nonlinear decision boundaries. Okay, but then still in practice we can expect that uh, the conditional distributions uh, that they have overlap, right? So uh, we can actually expect that some points may fall on the other side of uh, the decision boundary. It's inevitable. So what we're going to do, we're going to reformulate this maximum margin classifier to allow for uh, some training points to be uh, misclassified. So we actually are going to work with a sort of adaptive margin. And then the idea is that in most cases, we still have this 
regular maximum margin case, but we allow some points to lie on the wrong side of the, the margin boundary. Uh, we allow for this, but we will give it a penalty and that uh, introduces a new optimization uh, objective. So the setting is as follows, like uh, we have this uh, linear uh, classifier, which classified points to either one class or the other class. And then before we work with this margin and this margin was uh, defined uh, by the distance of my closest point uh, to my decision boundary uh, on both sides, right? So these were my uh, support factors in the maximum classifier case. But now what we're going to do, we are actually going to allow some points to lie on the other side of, of the margin. And before this was not the case, it would actually result in a smaller margin that could still separate the data set. But now we are going to allow for this, uh, but we're going to penalize this. Uh, so these points are going to be penalized with the distance that they have uh, to this margin. So those points will be penalized with the distance that they have uh, towards the margin. And that eventually leads to a very um, decent and stable uh, margin that's that separates the two classes, but some points are allowed to fall on the other uh, side of the margin, even points that are very far away from the decision boundary, but then they will also have a very large penalty. So for such points, it would be actually worthwhile to actually move the margin, but for small deviations like these small outliers, uh, it's actually okay to allow for this and just penalize it a little bit with some uh, slack variable. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Each point that lies on the correct side of the margin gets a penalty of zero, so they are not penalized, and points that lie on the wrong side, uh, they actually get a penalty proportional to their distance uh, to the margin. Okay, so let's try to capture this in, in formulas or in equations. So uh, we are going to introduce these slack variables, which represents the penalties that I am going to assign to each data point. And then we say that um, all points that are on the correct side of the margin uh, they do not get any penalty. So Xi n will be zero for those points, uh, but for points that lie on the wrong side of the margin, then uh, the penalty is proportional to the distance uh, to the margin. So recall that Y n is uh, uh, proportional to the distance uh, of this point to the margin, and this uh, T n is either uh, plus or minus one, and this Y n is uh, proportional uh, to distance to the decision boundary. And whenever my point falls exactly on the decision boundary, this thing evaluates to one. That's, that's the definition that we have. So points that are still on the decision boundary, uh, this distance evaluates to zero or this penalty evaluates to zero. And when I'm further away from like on the wrong side of the margin, then this will get assigned a, a positive value. Okay, so previously we had this hard constraint that T n times Y n was always bigger or equal than one. So um, so meaning really that each point has to lie on the other side of the, of the margin, but now we have soft constraints or soft margins, actually meaning that we're going to sort of uh, shift this allowed boundary for each data point a little bit based on this penalty that it has. So for each data point we work with, let's say, a soft constraint, so we are able to sort of move this boundary uh, depending on uh, this penalty. But then, of course, this penalty cannot get too large, right? So, and that's captured with this hyperparameter C. So to formulate this into an optimization framework, we just we changed our hard constraint to the soft constraint. So they're still constrained, uh, but they depend on some Xi n uh, parameter, which is now going to be part of, the, of my primal variables, the things that I'm going to optimize over. And I'm going to do this as follows. So this term makes sure that my uh, margin is maximized, right? Because we were... Um, maximizing the margin, so we are maximizing 1 over uh, the norm of W, which means I'm going to minimize a half times the norm squared uh, of W, plus I have this penalty that my Xi and I actually want them to be zero, but I allow for some, uh, some offset, so um, I'm going to penalize the sum of all my uh, slack variables with some constant C. Okay, so when C is large, I have a large penalty for the Xi, so basically it means I do not want to see any exceptions. I really want to have a hard uh, decision boundary. And if a C is small, then, then it's easy for me to allow some uh, slack. Okay, and then we're going to optimize this thing again. So we're dealing again with a uh, constraint in, in an inequality constraint optimization problem. So we're going to define uh, the corresponding Lagrangian. And that's the, done over here, right? So where uh, this particular term is the function that we want to minimize. And recall that now I'm doing a minimization problem. So I have this minus 
as signs over here. And then these ANs are my uh, uh, dual variables, are my uh, Lagrange multipliers, and these mu ANs are my Lagrange multipliers. And my dual optimization framework says that these Lagrange multipliers uh, have to be positive or equal to zero, right? So that's part of my uh, KKT conditions. So again, let's recap the steps for doing this constraint optimization. So first of all, we define uh, the Lagrangian. That's what we just did. Then uh, write out uh, the KKT conditions to, to, well, to, to see really what you're dealing with and what uh, the solution need to uh, satisfy. Then we can solve for the, solve for the primal uh, variables. And then use this to obtain uh, the dual uh, Lagrangian. And then finally uh, solve uh, for the duals. And because I still have strong duality in such a convex optimization framework, if I solve for the duals, I actually solved for this primal uh, optimization problem. Okay, so, uh, so let's do this. So we have here our Lagrangian function just derived. I have my Lagrangian multipliers, which have to be positive. And then I have these KKT conditions, right? So uh, this follows from the general recipe of optimization via these uh, dual uh, Lagrangians. And we always have these three types of KKT conditions, right? So I have that my, uh, I have dual feasibility. So uh, basically this, that my Lagrangian uh, multipliers have to be uh, positive or equal to zero. I have uh, primal feasibility so that my original constraint is satisfied. And I have that the product of these two has to equal to zero. So at least one of them has to be uh, equal to zero. Okay, so I have this for my um, margin constraints and I have this for my uh, slack variable constraints because I said that my slack is going to be positive, right? So I'm going to move only move the margin in, in one particular direction. Okay, so just a sanity check, just think about how many constraints are we actually dealing with? How many conditions do we need to satisfy? Uh, well, we have for each data point, we have all these constraints, right? So each data point, we have three KKT conditions. So we have three times N uh, constraints uh, for this particular uh, margin constraint. And we have three N constraint for my uh, slack variables, uh, basically. So in total, we have six N constraints in total, where N is the total number of, of data points. Okay, so we have identified the constraints that we need to satisfy. And uh, now we move on to deriving the dual Lagrangian, right? So our first step towards this goal is to uh, find the optimality conditions for my uh, primal variables. So meaning I'm going to take the derivative of my primal Lagrangian with respect to these uh, variables, set it to zero and solve for these primal uh, variables. Okay, so we did this before. So that gives us this expression for W. And it gives us an expression that also needs to be satisfied. So these two actually, we derived them before and they are exactly the same as before. But now we have an additional constraint, right? If we compute the derivative with respect to Xi n, so we see that over here. So we have C and we have uh, Xi n times A n and we have Xi n times mu n. So we have that this also needs to be uh, satisfied which means that my uh, dual var variable is given by C minus uh, mu n. So this gives me actually a new constraint. Now, same as before, we can use these conditions to eliminate my primal variables from my uh, primal Lagrangian. And that gives me this expression for the dual Lagrangian. And this uh, dual Lagrangian, so that's what we did, uh, just derived. So this dual Lagrangian is actually the same as what we had in the hard uh, margin uh, classifier case. And it, actually, if you verify this uh, elimination process, you see that we also get rid of this uh, mu and dual variable. So actually my dual Lagrangian only depends on my dual variable A and no longer on, on mu n, though mu n does play a role in my uh, constraints, right? So we cannot just uh, forget about it. Okay, so then we have the following. So uh, we have an expression for W in terms of my uh, dual variables. And we use this expression to eliminate dual, uh, W from my Lagrangian. So this uh, constraint will always be uh, satisfied. 
And then the constraint that we are still left with is this particular one and this one. So that's my new constraint. And this particular constraint, we can rewrite it using our KKT conditions, right? So a n is given by c minus mu n. Well, mu n is always going to be bigger than zero or smaller than zero. So that actually means that, um, well, this thing on the right hand side will always be c or smaller uh, than c. So let's mark that. So this thing, let's mark it with a star, implies this inequality here uh, at, at the bottom, right? So a n is always smaller than, uh, than c. And we also have this like a dual feasibility that a n is always bigger or equal uh, to zero. And that implies this inequality over here. So this is really uh, what we're dealing with. So we want to maximize uh, this dual Lagrangian under these uh, particular constraints. So actually the same uh, problem as before, but now uh, my solutions, my dual variables needs needs to lie within this particular box so that it needs to be larger than zero and smaller than C. So this is actually what we call uh, box constraints. And this is still a problem uh, which we can solve. And again, I'm not going to solve this by hand over here. There are numerical, so numerical solvers that uh, can do this uh, for you. But the main point is again, we are able to uh, maximize this particular thing and find a solution for A and via this expression, this also gives me a solution for my uh, primal uh, problem. Okay, so that's what we're doing, right? So we derived the dual Lagrangian and we do derive these constraints. So my dual problem is maximize this Lagrangian under the, the, the constraints that I'm still uh, dealing with. And then also here we can make this interesting by applying this kernel trick, right? So uh, uh, in my original problems, I have these xn's over here. So that means I'm looking for a linear decision boundary in my original space. But by uh, changing this via the kernel trick to this uh, kernel, I can actually obtain very complex nonlinear uh, decision boundaries because these kernels implicitly represent very uh, expressive or even infinite dimensional uh, vector spaces. And then the same as we saw in the, the, the regular maximum uh, margin classifier case, we can also rewrite our predictive model in terms of these dual variables a n and, and the kernel itself. So when you look at this, it seems that nothing really changed, right? I still have the same model. I still have the same dual Lagrangian that I optimize, but it turns out that because we have this additional constraints, um, my support factors are uh, slightly different actually. It turns out that now, in addition to my original support factors, which lied on um, well, the margin itself actually, we now also have these extra support factors that lie on the other side of, uh, of the margin. And these support factors are uh, associated with points which actually have some slack penalty uh, associated uh, with them. And now this interpretation for these support factors can be uh, derived as follows, so, right? So now we're going to look at what, what can we actually say about these dual variables a n. Well, first of all, we know that these a n's they are either uh, zero, they are bigger than zero, or they are uh, and they are smaller than c. So this is what what we know. So really, we deal with uh, three types of support factors. So on the one hand side, we have points for which a n is zero. Um, we are dealing with points which are bigger than zero, but smaller than c. And we would have points uh, for which a n equals uh, c. So let's think about this. Uh, like for a majority of points, they will lie on uh, the, the correct side of the margin, meaning that this particular expression over here, so this expression over here will be uh, bigger than, than zero. And that in turn implies, because of this uh, complementary slackness, that my a n uh, will be zero, right? So the majority of points will have uh, support zero or like a, a support dual variable zero. So these points, they do not contribute to my uh, final predictions. Okay, so then let's take a look at the cases for which a n is bigger than uh, zero. A n is bigger than zero means that this particular term has to evaluate to zero, right? So those will be the points uh, for which uh, this is true. So those are either points on the margin or points for which we shifted the margin actually uh, with this uh, slack uh, penalty x i n. Okay, so bigger than uh, zero but still smaller than c. So what does it mean when a n is smaller than c? 
we actually saw before that we had this expression for a n we had that a n is given by c minus mu n right that was derived in as, as part of my uh, uh, optimality conditions a n is given by c minus mu n so this means when a n is smaller than c that actually implies that mu n is bigger than zero and again, we have this complementary slackness. If mu n is bigger than zero, then actually my psi n has to be zero. Okay, so that actually means that for points uh, for which a n is smaller than c, uh, we have that psi n is zero. And those are exactly the points on the margin. So those are these points. Okay, and then equivalently, we can derive that if a n is c, then that means mu n is equal to zero. And that means that we can have this positive uh, slack uh, variable psi n. And because a n is positive, we still have uh, this particular constraint. And then we can see, because our margin was a distance one from uh, the, the decision boundary, we can conclude that points that are uh, correctly classified but within the margin, they have x i uh, smaller than one, because then this thing still evaluates to a positive value. So it's, it's still on the right side of uh, the decision boundary. But then we also have uh, slack variables for points that are actually misclassified. And those are the points for which xi n is actually bigger than uh, 1. So that's uh, that particular point over there. Okay, so all in all we see that the majority of points get a n uh, equal to 0. So that essentially means that these points do not contribute to my final predictions. And then we have a bunch of uh, points for which a n is uh, bigger than, than 0, but still smaller than c. And those will be the support vectors. So my final predictions will be determined via these points. Uh, which have non-zero uh, a n values. Okay, then finally, let's think again about the role of this uh, penalty C. So C was the overall penalty of, of allowing for slackness in my uh, margins. So we have that we maximize the margin, uh, but we give a penalty uh, to points that lie on the wrong side, and this penalty uh, was uh, weighted with this uh, factor C. So let's think about what happens if uh, c goes to the limit infinity uh, that actually means that i'm going to infinitely penalize uh, slackness so that means i am not going to allow for this kind of slackness i'm just going to adapt my margin and i'm going to make a very maybe very wiggly margin and this could actually result to overfitting in some sense but yeah i, I can do this and then it, the result will be a hard margin classifier So I obtained uh, the original uh, formulation that we, that we had before. Uh, then I could also consider moving C all the way down to zero. Uh, what would this imply? This actually implies that I allow for an infinite margin, or at least a very large margin. And actually every point, and that's the downside of things, every point then becomes a support vector. And then, of course, I lose the advantage of the original idea of support factors that my predictions are only based on a few uh, data points. Okay, and then the trick is to set this C. Uh, it should be large enough such that I have uh, a fast uh, decision system, so a support factor machine with only a few support factors. But of course, if I set it too large, then maybe I am at the risk of doing overfitting and I get this very wiggly um, uh, decision boundaries. Uh, but again, if I make it too low, uh, then basically all my points become a support vector. So it's it's really a balance of finding the right uh, penalty term C. Throughout this course, we have been introducing machine learning methods from both a probabilistic viewpoint as well as from a non-probabilistic viewpoint. For example, in regression, we could just work with least squares regression to obtain a linear regression model, or we could formulate our model as a predictive distribution and optimize it using maximum likelihood or the maximum posteriori uh, approach to obtain our final uh, probabilistic model. Same in the classification case, we could develop a non-probabilistic method such as the multi-layer perceptron and optimize it using some loss function or we define a probabilistic generative model and optimize it by maximum likelihood. The same in the unsupervised learning setting, we introduced principal component analysis as well as a probabilistic counterpart that again could be optimized via the maximum likelihood approach. Now also for kernel methods, we can adopt a probabilistic viewpoint. 
So we just discussed the uh, non-probabilistic support vector machines and in the upcoming videos we will introduce a probabilistic kernel method. And the idea is that we're going to introduce a sort of distribution from which we can sample functions. So the random value will not be a single number or a vector, but it will be a full function which will look different every time I sample it. Now such distributions will be called Gaussian processes, and in order to get there I think it is good to go over some core properties of Gaussians first. Now one of the first properties that is very convenient to memorize is this marginalization property of Gaussians. The idea is that um, we say that two random variables, x1 and x2, we say that they are uh, jointly Gaussian distributed if they are drawn from a multivariate Gaussian distribution as follows. Now the idea is that this multivariate Gaussian distribution has some a mean vector and a covariance matrix and it spits out a new vector every time I, I sample it. And now we look at the components of these vectors and we call them these uh, separate random variables x1 and x2. So looking at these individual components, we see that these individual random variables are jointly Gaussian distributed. So if I then plot this uh, probability density for uh, x1 and x2, I see that uh, well, uh, some combinations of x1 and x2 are uh, uh, more likely to be, to be sampled. Now in general these random variables they can be vectors themselves, so this would be a vector and this a vector uh, and this would be a single covariance matrix, but now for visualization purposes we, we focus on uh, the scalar random variables, right? So x1 is just a scalar and this sigma11 is also some scalar number. Okay, and then the idea of this marginalization property is that if I am interested in the distribution for only this uh, first random variable which I can obtain by integrating out x2 from this uh, joint distribution, so that's the marginalization process. So we marginalize uh, out x2, so we marginalize in this direction, and that gives me a distribution uh, for x2, right? Sorry, a distribution for x1. And th this distribution for x1 will in turn be a, a Gaussian distribution again. So uh, the distribution for x1 is a Gaussian with mean mu1 and sigma 1, 1, so the covariance uh, 1, 1. So really that, that, that tells me that if I have such a joint uh, distribution with a mean component mu 1 and this covariance uh, 1, 1, then I can just use this to define my uh, marginal distribution uh, P of x1. And the same for the second random variable. If I now marginalize out x1, so I project to this margin, so this will be uh, the probability for x2, then also this distribution is simply a Gaussian with the corresponding mean and the covariance uh, sigma 2, 2. So, okay, so if I have this joint distribution with uh, mu 2 for the, the mean component for the, the second uh, random variable and we have this uh, part of the covariance matrix, then my marginal for uh, px2 is simply given by uh, the following uh, Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that's simple enough, right? Uh, it's actually not too complicated to, to actually derive these uh, results, though I'm not going to do this here. For that, I refer to the book of uh, Bishop, chapter 2. Um, but then let's move on to a second important property, and that's uh, the conditioning property, and that works as follows. So again, I have these two random variables that are jointly Gaussian distributed, uh, according to this multivariate Gaussian distribution, so that may look something like this, right? Now, if I look at the conditional uh, distribution for x1 given x2, so actually now I, I change the axis I see, sorry about it, so this is axis x1 and this is x2. So let's say I'm going to fix a particular x2 and then I'm going to look at what probability uh, x1 has. So if I draw that out, uh, then I obtain a distribution, something like this. Uh, so this will be the probability for x1 given x2. And it turns out that this uh, conditional distribution is again a Gaussian, um, which has a particular mean. So the mean can be derived from uh, my means uh, in my original distribution and the covariance matrix. So the covariance is given by uh, this uh, 1, 1 component, and it also is partly based on this uh, sigma 2, 2 component. Uh, but it's also based on these cross components uh, 1, 2 and 2, 1. Okay, so just based on, if I um, 
factorize my covariance matrix as follows, then I can obtain uh, the covariance matrix for my conditional distribution as follows. And, and in a similar way, we can derive an expression for uh, the mean of my uh, conditional uh, distribution. I don't want you to remember these particular formulas. I just want you to know that uh, whenever I have a Gaussian and I can factorize it in, in such a way, so I can split it, for example, in a x1 variable and an x2 variable, then I can obtain uh, uh, a probability distribution for these conditional distributions, which are again Gaussians, and I am able to derive the mean and the covariance of these uh, Gaussians. Okay, then let's have a look at uh, the summation of random variables. That's also a convenient thing to remember how to do this. And the statement is as follows. So the sum of two independent Gaussian random variables is also a Gaussian random variable. So x is a random variable drawn from a distribution with a particular mean and a covariance matrix uh, sigma. And y is also drawn from a Gaussian but with a different mean mu prime and a sigma uh, prime. Then if we define a new random variable as the sum of these two random variables, then it turns out that uh, this random variable is actually drawn from a uh, also, again, from a Gaussian distribution in which the means are simply added and the covariance matrices are added. Okay, so that's easy to remember, right? Uh, but it's important to recall here that X and Y are independent. So be careful with that. When X and Y are indeed independent, then uh, the new random variable is simply obtained by summing uh, the, the means and uh, the covariances. Okay, and finally, I want to talk about uh, sampling correlated Gaussian uh, random variables. Now, the context is as follows. Now, suppose I, uh, in my framework, whatever method I'm, I'm building, it's more convenient to work with random variables that are independent. So I am able to sample this, this vector from an uncorrelated normal distribution. So each component in X is independent from one another. And then maybe later on, I'm... I'm considering this forward model that, that turns this random variable in a new random variable y via this, this linear uh, transformation. Now then it turns out that this uh, y uh, random variable uh, is actually considered to be drawn from a normal distribution again with a particular mean uh, mu and a covariance matrix a, a transpose. Okay, so if I have an uncorrelated random uh, variable and it's mapped to another random variable y via this linear model, then this y uh, uh, is actually a random variable relative to this normal distribution. But we can also look at this the other way around. So suppose I say I have a random variable according to some uh, normal distribution with a, a mean and a covariance matrix, but I do not have access to an algorithm or a sampling method that samples from these correlated uh, normal distributions. I only have access to this um, independent uh, distribution samplers but I still want to sample such y's, then what you can do, you can make a factorization of this sigma, uh, and you could do that as follows. So for example, via Koleski decomposition, uh, so common methods, uh, almost any numerical tool could, uh, has an implementation of this to, to split uh, my matrix, which is positive definite into these A and A transpose bars. Or, also, or uh, similarly, you can uh, compute an eigen decomposition, and this is what we have done before, and then you can take the square root of, of my uh, eigenvalues and define your matrix A as follows, right? Because it's, uh, if you write this out, then you, you get back to your uh, covariance matrix. So the idea is then, if you are able to split my covariance matrix in this A, A transpose, uh, which you should be able via the Koleski or the Eigen decomposition, then you can always sample Ys by just sampling from a uniform uh, Gaussian distribution, apply this forward model, and that gives you your uh, sampled uh, random variable. Now this ID is sometimes uh, referred to as the reparametrization trick. So there you go, you learned another trick. Okay, so for now that's all you need to know about uh, sampling random variables that are jointly Gaussian distributed. Where we say they're jointly Gaussian distributed if we can make this factorization, right? So this multivariate Gaussian distribution with some covariance matrix and mean vector, it returns some vector. And if I look only at one part, so let's say the x1 part and the x2 part, I split my covariance matrix as follows. And that gives me the following properties, namely that if I'm only interested in the distribution for the first random variable, x1, then I can look at this normal distribution, which is simply given by the mean uh, mu1 and the covariance uh, sigma1,1. 1, 1. 
And if this x1 just consists of a scalar value, uh, then this is a scalar value and this is a scalar value, but x1 could also be a vector and then mu1 is a vector and this is a small uh, covariance matrix. And the same holds for uh, the marginal uh, for x2. And then from this uh, splitting of my multivariate Gaussian distribution, I can also directly obtain the conditional uh, distributions, which are again Gaussian with uh, particular means and covariance matrices for which we have expressions. And then finally, if x is an uncorrelated Gaussian random variable, so x is drawn from this uh, uncorrelated normal distributions, then I can turn this into a correlated random variable, variable via this uh, forward model, right? And conversely, if I have a normal distribution with some covariance matrix, I can split it into this A, A transpose, and that gives me a way to, to actually generate these correlated random variables from these uh, uncorrelated random variables. The purpose of the video series in this lecture is to derive a non-parametric viewpoint on Bayesian linear regression. And we just covered some essential properties of Gaussians that will play a role in our derivation. And now let's make a start at moving towards our non-parametric Bayesian modeling approach by revisiting the Bayesian linear regression model that we have discussed some lectures ago. The approach that we took in our probabilistic linear regression case was that we assumed some true relation between an input and an uh, output, so an input uh, x and a target t uh, via this linear model. So uh, we could work with basis functions to make this mapping a bit more interesting and complicated, uh, but then eventually this, this model is parameterized by these model parameters uh, w. So we say there is this mapping from x to t, and now we're set out to recover uh, the, this, this transformation parameterized uh, by w. And we're going to recover this, this model based on our observations. And then we said, okay, we have uh, all these observations and they capture this relation from x to t somehow, but I also am going to assume that there is a measurement noise, right? There's always errors uh, in, in my data and I'm going to model these er uh, errors with uh, Gaussian noise actually. So I'm going to say that I'm actually measuring my target but there's some noise on it. Sometimes I'm measuring uh, a slightly too large target and sometimes a, sli a slightly too, too low uh, target. Okay and with these modeling assumptions in place we can write this in matrix vector notation as follows. So this is really uh, my linear model mapping each of these uh, data points uh, well, to let's say the true target via this uh, linear model W, so that's actually this thing in matrix vector notation. And then we have noise on each target variable and this noise is independent, right? Each measurement is different. So uh, this is a vector of all the noise components for each uh, measured target. And I have N of such. So this is an N-dimensional multivariate Gaussian uh, with independent uh, random variables which we are going to give a covariance of uh, 1 over beta, where beta is my precision parameter. And then it turns out that the distribution for my target variables is parameterized via a Gaussian, right? Because I'm going to assume that my noise is Gaussian. And then it turns out that uh, the, the probability distribution for, this, uh, for these targets is given via this uh, forward uh, linear model and this uh, noise variance. And this then essentially gives us the likelihood of our uh, data being described by this model with this set of model parameters w, right? Because using this probability distribution, I can test the probability of my uh, uh, targets t uh, given my input x. And if they indeed came from this distributions modeled uh, with this w, then indeed I have a lot of high probabilities. But if this data set didn't come from such a distribution, then uh, yeah, I would uh, sample a low probability. Okay, so that really was the basis of all this probabilistic uh, modeling uh, methods, right? So we defined a likelihood and then we could say, okay, then we want to maximize this likelihood. So we want to pick the, the parameters W that really maximize the likelihood and therefore represents the most uh, feasible uh, distribution or, or model. Okay, and then we could move further in this probabilistic viewpoint by saying that also my W uh, came from some probability distribution, meaning that I'm not going to make a point estimate for W. I do not, do not dare to make a particular choice for W because I think that maybe there are many models that are equally likely to uh, describe my data. So I'm going to work with a probability uh, distribution for my model parameters W that essentially describe how likely it is that uh, these model parameters or how probable it is that these model parameters uh, describe this, uh, well, th this observed uh, data set. 
So, but before we get there, we just assume a prior uh, distribution on W. So without any information, I say, okay, this is the probability that uh, my W should take on particular values. And then we could obtain uh, the posterior distribution via a base rule, right? So given my likelihood and given my prior, I can obtain a posterior distribution for W after I observe my data set. And this is again going to be a Gaussian distribution, which has a particular mean uh, determined by my data and it has a particular covariance uh, matrix. Okay, and we've done these derivations before and they mainly rely on the fact that both my likelihood uh, my prior and my posterior are all Gaussians, right? So I stick with the choice for Gaussian distributions and then everything that follows that still is a Gaussian. That's the main thing really. Okay, so then we derive a probability distribution for the probability that W should take on particular values given my data set. So that means that there are maybe multiple model parameters W that um, are highly probable given my observed uh, data set. Now, then what I could do if I want to make predictions so if I want to make predictions, then I can do this uh, Bayesian model averaging, right? So where I say that my predictive distribution is going to be a weighted sum of my parameterized uh, predictive distributions, parameterized by W, weighted with the corresponding posterior uh, probability, right? And because everything was Gaussian so far, also this predictive distribution will be a Gaussian, and we are able to derive the expression for uh, the predictive mean and uh, the predictive uh, variance. And so that means that after we obtain these uh, predictive distributions, which no longer explicitly depend on W, uh, we have models like this, right? So suppose I have only one data point, then my predictive distribution says, okay, for new values for X, I can sample this, I can sample the, the mean. So I expect my prediction to lie over here, but there's a high uncertainty. And that's reflected with this uh, sigma squared term, right? Which is depending on the X star, which I'm considering. So this would be X star. And then we see if we add more data points, uh, then, well, my model becomes better. So the predictive uh, mean becomes closer to the true model. So that's this red curve is the predictive mean and the covariance also becomes uh, smaller or the variance at each uh, fixed prediction becomes smaller. Okay, and now this week we're talking about kernel methods, right? And this is actually, we, we had a peak preview of, of that before where we called this particular thing, we called it the equivalent kernel. And, and then if we make this definition, then, and this uh, predictive mean is actually given by the sum for all my data samples of my uh, targets in the training set, which are now weighted with the kernel uh, evaluated for each data point relative to the, the point that I'm currently uh, considering, right? So these uh, predictive means are really linear combinations of uh, kernels. Where now in this case, these kernels are explicitly derived from our modeling assumptions. So we assumed a prior, which uh, led to a posterior in the end, and that was used to come up with these predictive distributions. So these kernels really came from our modeling choices. Now what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to directly model our predictive distributions using kernels. So in the next videos, we're going to adapt a a uh, non-parametric viewpoint on Bayesian uh, regression, and it relies on the notion of a Gaussian process. And the idea is as follows. So with our Bayesian predictive distributions, we have actually point that we make a prediction for the mean and we have a variance for that particular mean, right? So, and if we can look at this all jointly, uh, we obtain this full distribution for all X and the corresponding targets T. And this actually came from the fact that uh, I'm considering mul multiple model parameters W, right? And so each W, as a particular probability. So if I sample really for my uh, posterior distribution for W, then maybe I obtain this particular model and it's uh, likely to come close to my uh, sample data points because that's how it's uh, conditioned to be. And if I sample another W, which is sampled from my posterior, I maybe get this uh, or I get this. But the idea is that every time I sample a W, I obtain this new uh, uh, model for my predictive mean. And that's the main idea that we were after now. So here we obtained a posterior distribution from uh, my model, like the, the likelihood and this, this prior. But now we want to directly model such a posterior distribution, uh, essentially saying that we want to come up with a distribution that generates a new uh, function every time I sample it. And I want this a function that I sample randomly uh, to come close to my uh, data points. Okay, so that's going to be covered in the next video. So now let's wrap up uh, this video on our revisit of Bayesian linear regression. 
Now, linear Bayesian regression suffers from a limited uh, expressiveness, right? Because essentially our models are uh, linear in W and we could make it more expressive by working with these basis functions, right? So uh, initially my models are defined on my input data X, but we could transform it to a more complicated space using these uh, basis functions. But then of course, along with this expressiveness also comes more uh, parameters W. And this essentially implies that it is going to be expensive to train more and more expressive models, right? Because it requires us to invert this uh, covariance matrix, which is of size M by M. And another issue is that we need to be careful in how we define our basis functions then, right? Because um, suppose we make poor choices for my basis functions. So let's say my data is distributed somewhere like this. So I have some data points uh, here indicated with these crosses. And let's say I work with Gaussian basis functions and one of my basis function is placed right over here. So it means it, it doesn't really add to the expressiveness of my model because this basis function will return the, the value of zero for basically all of these data points. Now, this is a general problem when, when working with basis functions, right? How to choose them. Um, but now the thing is, we actually saw that in the final mean predictions, we can write this in a equivalent kernel form. So this means it's a, it's a suitable candidate for applying this kernel trick. And we saw that with the kernel trick, we can actually implicitly work with feature representations which, which can be of infinite dimension without explicitly having to compute such uh, basis, such feature vectors. So that's what we're going to do in the next videos. We're going to derive a fully kernelized way for, uh, well, essentially deriving a non-parametric uh, pr predictive distribution. And we're going to do this via Gaussian processes. So we just motivated that we want to work with non-parametric predictive distributions. And the way by which we will achieve this is via Gaussian processes. So let's start off with the definition of Gaussian processes. Now a Gaussian process is a collection of random variables and any finite number of which is jointly Gaussian distributed. Okay, so let's think about what this means. Suppose we have a finite collection of random variables. Uh, then we already saw that in the multivariate Gaussian distribution case that if I have a vector of random variables, which are drawn from a Gaussian with a particular mean and a particular covariance matrix, then we already saw that if we take a subselection of these random variables, then the vector of these uh, variables is again uh, normal distributed with some mean and some covariant matrix, which could be derived from this factorization of the covariance matrix uh, that we saw over there. And this property is actually directly given by this uh, marginalization property of the, the Gaussian uh, distribution. Now, a feature of Gaussian processes is that we can actually also handle a collection of random variables, which is of infinite size. So we have an infinite number of uh, random variables. And this is sort of skipped in, in this uh, definition over here. So this collection of random variables is, uh, so these random variables, they are indexed with, with time or space because a Gaussian process is a uh, stochastic process. And now I do not want to go into full detail what then in turn is a stochastic process, but the idea is that we can have an infinite uh, number of random variables and each of these random variables is indexed with a particular point in time or in space or some, on some continuous manifold. And because we can, in principle, uh, consider all points in time, so that means I have an infinite amount of uh, random variables. Uh, but now I actually prefer to adapt this uh, functional viewpoint. So this, what I'm going to explain next, actually represents the same thing, the same definition. So what is typically done is to uh, think of Gaussian processes as a representation of uh, distribution over random functions. So just like with the normal distribution, it spits out a vector. You can think of a Gaussian uh, process as a distribution that returns a random function. And then this uh, function that is sampled from such a Gaussian process, that, that can be sampled at a particular uh, point X, right? On which this uh, function is defined. And so this uh, function evaluated at, at point X is actually a random variable uh, denoted with F of X, right? Because my function can look different every, every time I sample the function. So that's actually what it says. So I'm, I'm going to observe my function f given my input x, and every time I observe something slightly different, but it is a random variable, so it has an expectation, and this expectation is given by this mean function. 
So this mean function is again a function of x and the covariance uh, between two different points on, on my function is given by uh, the kernel function. So this kernel function really quantifies the amount of covariance uh, between how much my function uh, varies uh, at a particular point x um, relative to another particular point uh, x prime. Okay, so this Gaussian process uh, gives me a particular function and this function may look different uh, every time I, uh, I sample it. But on average, it returns uh, a particular function. So let, let this be uh, m of x. And then the blue lines are particular samples uh, f of x. Then I can look at the, the variance for a fixed point. Uh, so this could be, for example, the covariance of f of x with itself. So really that's the, this pointwise uh, variance. But then we can also have correlation, right? Meaning that if I have a variation in this point, then uh, this implies that my uh, point close to it, for example, is also going to be high. So there's a high correlation between these points. And this uh, covariance between different points, that's given by uh, the kernel, essentially. Okay, now let's see what happens if I uh, am going to sample this, sample this function on a collection of input points, x1. So these are my points on which I'm going to observe my function f, and this f is going to look uh, slightly different every time I observe it. Then it turns out that this uh, vector is going to be given by this normal distribution with a particular mean and a, a covariance matrix, right? Because the covariance between each of these points, so the covariance between fx and fx prime is given by uh, this kernel. And the mean of this random variable is given by this, this mean function. So the mean function for each x uh, observation point, I'm going to evaluate it. So if I'm going to observe my function f, then this vector of observation is going to be a random variable drawn from this multivariate uh, Gaussian. Okay, now let's verify if this is indeed a, a Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process said that uh, any finite number uh, of which, so any subset of, of my random variable is also going to be Gaussian distribution, distributed. And that actually follows then directly from this marginalization property of Gaussians, right? Because I can uh, split uh, my observation set into two parts. So, um, this entire vector is split into an F1 vector and an F2 vector, and then I can also split the covariance matrices and this, uh, this average vector. So that gives me that the probability distribution for my uh, F1 vector is also a Gaussian distributed. And that was the main point of a Gaussian process, that each subset in itself is also going to be a, 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 a Gaussian distributed uh, variable. So we show that if we start off with a finite set, then we can also always break this down into these uh, subsets. But this generally holds for all observations uh, x that I can make. And this holds because my kernel is a proper kernel. So that means that this particular gram matrix is always going to be uh, positive definite. Okay, so uh, we see that we can think of Gaussian processes as sort of distributions that return a uh, full function. So I can sample from this Gaussian process and that gives me one uh, function and I can evaluate these functions at uh, points, let's say observation points, and that gives me a vector, which is a random vector, a random variable uh, drawn from some multivariate uh, Gaussian distribution characterized uh, by this, uh, this kernel function. So let's try to make this a connection between random variables as vectors and random functions a bit more concrete. And we're going to do this by thinking of such a function f drawn from a Gaussian process as an extremely high dimensional vector drawn from an extremely high dimensional multivariate Gaussian distributed. And with that, I mean the following. So let's say this is my uh, function f of x. Then I can vectorize this function, right? So I can sample it at a set of points uh, x1, x2, x3, and so on where at each point I obtain, uh, this is the function at x1, this is the function value at x2, this is the function value at x3. So I obtain this random vector, so this random variable, which is a vector of all these random variables in themselves, right? Because each sampled function value is a random variable in itself. And I have n of them. So if I sample n of these points, I get an n-dimensional uh, random variable. Now we could also decide to, to sample this function on a denser grid, right? So at, at closer intervals. And this would in principle then give me a vector 
um, of let's say infinite dimension if I let this number of sample points go to infinity. So that's how you should think of such a continuous function as an infinite number of these uh, random variables uh, next to each other. And it is then the kernel that characterizes the correlation between all these points, uh, all these infinite amount of, of points. And because my kernel is a continuous function in itself, it is able to capture the correlations between all possible axes on my continuous uh, input uh, domain. Okay, but so we can have such a uh, random function drawn from a uh, Gaussian process and I can sample it on a set of points and it gives me a vector, a random vector. And so this also gives us a way to sample Gaussian processes, right? Because we're interested in maybe evaluating this function at a particular set of input points x. So let's define a grid on which we want to sample this function. So here I draw a regular grid. Um, what I then do, I am going to construct the gram matrix. So the matrix of all these uh, kernels evaluated for one point relative to the other. And then really I have defined a multivariate Gaussian distribution of size equal to the number of data points uh, that I'm going to uh, sample or consider. And then I can simply draw uh, these vector values from this Gaussian distribution and that gives me a, a different vector every time. And now in the next video I'm going to give some explicit examples of such randomly sampled uh, functions. But for now, let's continue a bit with uh, the notion of this Gaussian process in general. And actually, I'm going to show a particular example where we already encountered a Gaussian process, actually. We actually already encountered such a Gaussian process in the context of Bayesian linear regression. So suppose I have this model for a function f of x, and it's parameterized by a set of weights w. I saw this bracket is put in the wrong location. Okay, so we have this linear model parameterized by a set of weights w. Then in this Bayesian linear regression case, I can put a prior on W, right? So I can decide not to just pick a particular W and then fix my function, but I can say, oh, I have a random variable W, which if you sample it, it generates a new function every time I sample it, right? And then we can define distributions for W in several ways. Well, we can start off with a prior saying that, okay, this is my prior distribution for W, but we also saw that later on, uh, we derive these posterior distributions for W, right? Which are, is a bit more informed uh, distribution defined by my observed uh, data space. But the general idea remains that I'm going to assume that W in itself is also a random variable. And now let's just say it's drawn from this uh, Gaussian uh, distribution uh, given over here. So with zero mean and some uh, covariance matrix. Then uh, this f of x is actually Gaussian process, right? So I can evaluate the expectation for uh, these function values. And now you can show because my uh, expectation of my prior on w is also zero that, um, well, from linear linearity, it actually follows that the expectation of f of x is given by the expectation of the product of phi of x and w. Phi of x doesn't depend on w, so I can take it outside and this thing is zero. So the expectation of my function is going to be zero. But then I also need to know the covariance between two differently sampled points, uh, f of x and f of x prime. Uh, well, because it has a zero mean, this is my uh, expression for the covariance, so the expectation of the product of these two functions. And I can write that in the following form, again using linearity. So this is just the product of this together with its uh, transpose. And then I have to compute the expectation of w squared and that is simply given by this uh, covariance matrix. So we see that the covariance, so we see that the covariance of these uh, two random variables because the function evaluated at a point gives me a random variable. So this covariance is given by the following expression and we can define this to be a kernel, right? So the kernel. So this tells me that basically for any a collection of points for which I make these observations, I can write this out and, 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 and compute the expectation and the covariance. And so for any set of observations x to xn, uh, these are all jointly Gaussian. So such a function f of x is distributed according to a Gaussian process with the kernel, the kernel given uh, as follows. Okay, and now to wrap things up, uh, we just learned that a Gaussian process can be thought of, uh, of as a distribution uh, from which I can sample full functions. And these distributions are characterized uh, by a kernel and a mean function. Right? Such Gaussian processes are characterized by a kernel function and a mean function, uh, which describes uh, the expectation of my function values at a particular point x and the covariance between two of such uh, sampled observations. 
Now in the next video we're going to have a closer look at some explicit examples of, of Gaussian processes by picking one particular kernel and see what the resulting uh, functions drawn from such a Gaussian process uh, looks like. Now that we have defined Gaussian processes, let's have a closer look at what kind of functions can be generated uh, when I make a specific choice for the kernel. We're going to focus on the kernel because it will eventually be the kernel that, that fully determines the characteristics of the functions that are drawn from uh, my Gaussian process. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to work with a fixed grid, so a fixed set of points x1 up to xn on which I'm going to evaluate the functions that are drawn from this uh, Gaussian process. And remember that the function evaluated at this fixed point x is a random variable in itself. So I'm essentially observing an n-dimensional uh, random variable. Then what I'm going to do for simplicity, I'm just going to set uh, my predictive mean or this mean function to uh, the constant zero and let my uh, random vector or my functions be fully determined uh, by this uh, kernel function. So from a practical point of view, I'm just sampling n-dimensional vectors from some Gaussian distribution with a covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix is given by the Gram matrix, right? So the, the matrix that consists of all these pairwise evaluations between all the point pairs uh, of this kernel function. So once I have built this Gram matrix for a particular choice of kernel, I can just sample my uh, functions or the, these, these vectors uh, from this uh, multivariate Gaussian. Okay, then in this video, we're going to consider the following kernel. And this kernel consists of this uh, exponential part, so uh, the exponential part, and it consists of this uh, part, which I'm going to say is uh, the linear part. And later it will become clear why we can call this uh, the linear part, essentially because it's linear with respect to only one of these uh, variables. But okay, we have this, this kernel of this particular exponential form and it has these four parameters, right? So it has uh, theta zero, which uh, sort of amplifies this exponential over here. We have this uh, theta one, which sort of scales the distance between point pairs. Uh, sorry, this is an m actually, so xn minus xm. And then we have a theta two term, which is like a global offset in this kernel. And then we have this linear term uh, determined, uh, weighted with this uh, theta three parameter. And what I'm going to do in the remaining uh, slides, I'm going to explore what the influence is, or what the effect is of, of choosing a particular theta and see what kind of uh, functions roll out of this uh, Gaussian process. So what we're going to do in this experiment, we're going to sample uh, function values on this grid of points. So I'm go going to sample these x1s or these xn's from minus 5 to 5. So this is the interval that I'm considering and I'm going to uniform it's uniformly sample this with, with n points. So really what you see over here, for example, this red curve is this function evaluated at all these uh, sample uh, regions or sample locations. And then it's going to look a continuous if I uh, let n go to infinity. So basically in this experiment, I set n to be uh, very large. Okay, so then I have all these end data points. I can pre-compute uh, my uh, gram matrix, right? Is this kernel uh, k? Basically, I'm going to evaluate this kernel k for all these uh, point pairs in my uh, set of grid points. And then in order to generate my random vector, I sample just from a uniform uh, uncorrelated distribution of length n. So I'm going to just pick this random variable and then, then I'm going to apply this uh, reparameterization trick, right? So I want my uh, vector to be distributed according to this covariance matrix, but I'm going to do the following. I'm going to uh, split this uh, covariance matrix into these two symmetric parts and I can do that, remember this. Uh, we can do this with a Koleski uh, decomposition or an Eigen decomposition. Because once I've done this uh, factorization, I can just sample from this uh, uniform uh, Gaussian distributed distribution and then generate my random sample f just by, by this linear mapping, right? So that's the reparameterization trick that I explained before. Okay, so this is the recipe for generating these random uh, functions. So every time I sample such an f, I generate a different vector, which is going to be plotted here as this uh, continuous function. So now let's see what happens if I turn on or off some of these uh, components. Uh, in this case, I'm going to focus 
on this uh, particular uh, theta zero term, so this prefactor, and I'm going to turn off, uh, well, uh, this part essentially, I'm going to set theta two and theta three to zero. And essentially what you see is that now the amplitude of my signal increases. It's still a random signal, but now it lies in this interval of a minus four to four somewhat. Uh, and in this experiment, actually, I set theta zero to one and you see less, way less uh, amplitude in these oscillations. So this uh, theta zero component uh, encodes for amplitude. And that's somewhat expected, right? Because this uh, kernel essentially characterizes the covariance matrix of these functions that are uh, sampled uh, from it. And if K is just multiplied by some constant, so it means I blow up this uh, covariance and thus I have uh, larger variations. Okay, so theta zero uh, encodes for uh, the amplitude of my uh, sampled functions. And now what I'm going to do next, now I'm going to focus on this theta one term. So this particular term over here. And uh, still I'm, I'm turning off this, this linear part. And now just by inspecting this formula, you can already tell that this sort of uh, encodes a length scale of covariance, right? Uh, because this is the distance, sorry, again, a typo, this is the distance between n, uh, xn and xm. And if this distance is small, this exponential takes on a, a, a large value and, and thus there is high covariance between these points. And then this theta one determines how quickly this particular term decays to zero if points move away from it. And if theta one is small, then I quite quickly decay to zero, this exponential term quite quickly decays to zero when points get uh, further apart. So, so that's maybe best visualized if I compare it to uh, this different uh, experiment where I set theta one to two. So here I set it to 0.5 and we see this uh, oscillations over here. So it's quite kind of wiggly. But then if I turn it up to a factor two, then we see we get a much more smoother signal, right? Because now I increase the length scale at which a points covariate uh, together. So that means if this point takes a, a high value, then the points surrounding it should also take a, a high value. So we have this long correlation uh, length scale. Now that also means that if I let this uh, theta one parameter uh, become very small, so now it was uh, smaller than uh, in this case. So here I have a smooth function and here it becomes more wiggly. But if I let this go to zero, then this really means that this exponential only takes on the value one when xn and xm are exactly the same. But if they are different, then it immediately decays to zero. So that means that if theta one goes to zero, then my kernel uh, converges to this identity matrix. And that in turn means that um, I'm actually just sampling points from a uh, uniform uh, Gaussian distribution. So that means that eventually for a small theta one, I would actually be just looking at random noise really, or white noise, uh, I should say actually. Okay, now let's take a look at this offset term theta two. Uh, so I am actually going to turn off still this particular part and for this I make some re reasonable choices theta zero and theta one. And I call it an offset term because if I now look at these functions, they vary a lot uh, in their offset, right? So this function is clearly higher than this particular sample, sampled function. And that has to, to do with the fact that uh, this particular uh, theta two induces a correlation which is independent of position. So, so that means if uh, one of my random variables is, is large, then all the other random variables should also be large, right? Because independent of what, whatever the location or the relative position to this point, uh, they are correlated. So this point is correlated with this point via this uh, t2 term over here. So let's take a look at a, an extreme case. So what we do here, we set this term off and we set uh, this term off as well. So now it becomes really clear that we're looking at this offset uh, theta two, right? And this essentially means we have this uh, perfect correlation between my data points, right? Uh, because if this point uh, takes on my particular value, then all my other points have to take on the exact same value uh, because we have this correlation over here, which doesn't depend on X. It just says that each point is equally correlated with one another. And that results in uh, the fact that I'm now observing straight lines every time I sample a, a function from this Gaussian process. Okay, then also let's have a look at this linear term. I call this a linear term, uh, theta three, so this particular part. 
and I'm going to turn off this uh, offset term again. So what you see now, it, it seems that these random functions, so they're still random, but it seems that they have some drift in them. So they have a particular uh, slope. And this is why we can call this actually a, a linear term. And again, this is uh, amplified this effect when I set all the other attempts to zero, right? So I'm now turning off this exponential fully. I'm turning off this offset term. And I'm only going to look at this, this linear uh, covariance term over here. And maybe you should think of it this way. So this is an inner product between two data points, right? And this inner product is large. When, so it's a sort of similarity measure. So when two points are exactly the same, it takes on a high value. And then when you move away from it, uh, then it decreases. And if you move in the same direction of this x, uh, then then it keeps on uh, amplifying its its magnitude, this inner product. So we have this linear behavior behavior in uh, when points are similar, it's high. When they are dissimilar, so moving away from it, it gets smaller, and moving towards it, it gets higher. And when my random variable is or my axes are just a one D point, then we clearly has have this uh, linear behavior. Okay, so now we got some feeling about what kind of functions can be generated with Gaussian processes. And uh, we considered the uh, kernels of this exponential form with these uh, four parameters and we sort of tweak them and see what, what's happening. And now that we have some feeling, let's in the next video actually do some probabilistic modeling with such Gaussian processes. And so with that, I mean, uh, these Gaussian processes, they define a sort of distribution over the functions that I'm going to use to, to model data. Uh, but they're not informed by the data themselves, right? They do completely different every time I sample it. And now I want to adapt these distributions of functions that can represent my data. I'm going to adapt them based on the data itself. So in that sense, I'm trying to recover a posterior distributions, a uh, bit distribution for functions that could uh, potentially fit to my data. So now that we familiarized ourselves with the idea of Gaussian processes, let's use them to derive predictive distributions that describe uh, a particular data set of interest. Now the setting is as follows. So we assume we have observed a set of input output pairs. So an xi with the corresponding fi. And we assume the following model. So we assume that our observations fi are made uh, through this observation model where we have some mapping xi to some uh, corresponding yi. So this is, let's say, a forward model. Uh, but then we also have measurement noise. And this measurement noise is going to be uh, Gaussian distributed. And we're also going to assume that we have a Gaussian process for this uh, forward model from an xi to the corresponding output. Which means actually that we're not going to think of uh, the outputs being generated by a fixed function but we say that these functions, there's some flexibility or variability among these functions that do that perform these mappings. So that essentially reflects uncertainty in my model, right? Because in the Bayesian regression case, we said, okay, this forward model is parameterized with a set of parameters W, and we also expect some uncertainty in these parameters W. But now we treat this on a functional level. So we immediately think, okay, this Y is some some functional mapping from x, y to an output domain, but these functions, they can vary a bit. So we're going to assume we have a Gaussian process for this uh, model y, um, meaning that this discrete set of observations is going to be characterized by a, a Gaussian distribution, and we're going to model that with zero mean and the covariance matrix being uh, fully determined by uh, the, this kernel. Okay, so this is our modeling approach. We're trying to recover this uh, distributions over functions essentially. And then, so this y is a random function. So every time I observe it, it, it is a different function. And there's this random noise. And um, because this is a Gaussian process and my noise is Gaussian, the sum of these things uh, will also lead to a Gaussian random variable, right? So we saw that in the video on uh, properties of, of Gaussian distributions. But it essentially means that my observations are drawn from such a normal distribution with a covariance matrix determined uh, via this, this kernel uh, function and some noise parameter uh, beta minus one. So what we've done over here, we essentially derived a non-parametric model A non-parametric model, it's non-parametric because I work with Gaussian processes, so they generate just some functions which have some characteristics defined by this kernel, but there's no true or explicit parameters used. And if you compare this to the parametric model that we used before, so 
So this was uh, the case in our Bayesian uh, linear regression example. So we have some forward model which is explicitly explicitly premised by a, uh, a variable w. And if I then also say that w is drawn from some distribution and this w could be, or this distribution could be the prior distribution or it could be a posterior distribution after I observe my data set. But once I say w is also a random variable, then actually this could be uh, formulated in this form by saying that uh, my kernel is given by the equivalent kernel. Okay, and this conversely also tells us that this parametric approach that we had before was just a specific case of this more general uh, Gaussian process uh, approach that we currently uh, take. So in this Gaussian process uh, approach, we essentially take a possibly infinite dimensional feature space approach to uh, Bayesian uh, modeling. Okay, now let's see what it means to make predictions with Gaussian processes. So the idea is that we have a set of training points, so observations that I already made in the past of input-output pairs, so this x with uh, the corresponding values for f, but now I'm going to make predictions for uh, new data points and want to see what the corresponding uh, f uh, star values are going to be. So the star indicates like new data points for which I want to test. Then the idea is as follows. So, so, so the idea is this, that my Gaussian process model these function, right? And of course there's a variability uh, among these functions. But the idea is that suppose I have some set of training points uh, x, for which I know the corresponding uh, feature values or the, the, the function values. And now I also want to evaluate, I want to look at the, the the function values at, at the different data points. So let's say points that I haven't observed yet. So in principle, I could consider this as evaluating the, fun evaluating the function values for both the, the x's and the x stars. So that gives me the following factorization. So this is my complete Gaussian process. But now I'm going to factorize this with an f and an f star, right? So I'm going to split it into, let's say my training set and my test set. Then using the Gaussian uh, conditioning property, I can formulate these conditional uh, probabilities, right? For uh, the function values at these, let's say, unseen uh, data points, f star and x uh, star, given my original data set via the following uh, equation. So this is what we um, formulated in, in uh, the video on the properties of, of Gaussian distributions, that uh, if we can make such a factorization of my uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution, then we can define the conditional as follows which have a particular mean and a particular covariance matrix. Okay, and that's interesting, right? With this Gaussian process formulation, I say that my observations of my function uh, values are obtained from such a multivariate Gaussian distribution, and I'm going to split it into a set of points that, uh, that I call my training points and a set of test points. And then I can make this conditional factorization that gives me a new Gaussian distribution. So from, from this Gaussian conditioning property, I can actually directly obtain uh, the posterior distribution for what my function value should look like given my already observed uh, training data points. So now let's consider the following uh, example, right? So we are modeling this uh, sine wave. So blue is the ground root sine wave. And then we have some observer, observed data points, uh, which are sampled from the sine wave with some noise. So they do not lie exactly on these blue points, uh, on this blue line. But these red pluses are my observed uh, data points. So these are my corresponding training points that determine this uh, big X and F uh, vector. And then this uh, dashed line is given by evaluating my Gaussian process on these uh, X stars and F uh, stars. So essentially all the points that I'm going to use to make this, uh, this plot. Then with such a data splitting, so of true observed data points and now my predicted uh, points, I can see that my uh, posterior distribution has a particular mean and a covariance matrix, right? And this mean is going to be determined by my original data set, where uh, the mean at a particular point uh, x star is given as a combination of my, well, original data points, weighted fit this uh, inverse uh, kernel uh, operator. And it turns out that this product between the, the kernel evaluated at the stars relative to the added axis, this takes on a high value whenever x star is close to another point in, in my gram matrix, uh, essentially. So that means that whenever our points are close to my data points, they take on a similar value. So my predictive mean 
is really determined by these data points. And you see that indeed uh, the prediction, so the red dash line is close to my uh, true signal, so the blue line. Uh, but if I move away from the data points, uh, I can actually make uh, larger errors, right? So large error. But at the same time, and this is interesting, at the locations where I have large error, I also have large uncertainty. So we also see that the uncertainty increases when I move away from the data points. Because this uh, covariance matrix, so that essentially captures this uncertainty, it, uh, it is intrinsically large, but then I can subtract this particular term over here. And again, the product, this particular product takes on a large value whenever x star is uh, close to x. So then I would subtract a large value and that's what you see over here. Whenever I'm close to the data point, I have a low covariance, a low variance. But if I move away from it, then this particular term becomes smaller. And then I see that my covariance uh, increases actually. So, so also my uncertainty increases when I move away uh, from the data points. And this actually gives me a nice bonus for working with these probabilistic models that they allow us to identify regions of large uncertainty. And this uh, can in turn be used to uh, in inform my sampling process. So if I want to improve my model, then, yeah, then it's best to uh, gather new data points in regions where I have this large uncertainty. And this is called active learning, which consists of identifying these uncertain regions following by gathering more data for these particular uh, data points. Okay, so what I really plot over here are uh, my predictive means. So uh, this means really as a function of my test points, uh, x star, and the covariance really as a function of this x star. So the covariance was given here, plotted as a plus minus uh, three uh, standard deviations. But of course I can also explicitly draw functions from this Gaussian process, right? And that's what I do over here. So this is the case when I only have one data point and then I draw the functions from this uh, posterior Gaussian process. So this. So I'm going to call this the posterior Gaussian process, right? It's, it's still a Gaussian process, but it is informed by my uh, data points and I can use it to make new predictions. And so I, when I draw functions from this posterior Gaussian process, I see that most functions, they tend to go to this uh, point quite closely, but when I move away from it, they can do whatever they want. So they become increasingly random in that sense. And if I have more data points, then they still all pass through these particular data points. And if I have more and more points, then they all tend to agree on the points on which uh, we sampled them. Okay, so that's to be ex expected, but it's nice to actually see this, right? And then the variation among these functions that is captured in this uncertainty or in this uh, covariance functions. So uh, now finally, um, I, so we are able to construct posterior uh, distributions using these kernels, right? So that's what I talked about. But still these kernels, they are parameterized by the set of hyperparameters, right? So in the previous video, I considered this exponential kernel, which was a really flexible kernel uh, uh, to use, but it still depends on these uh, four hyperparameters. And I haven't said anything about how to choose these uh, hyperparameters, actually. You can make a reasonable choice and that can help you approximate a lot of type of functions, but actually you want to tune them to get the best out of your uh, model. So what you can do, of course, is uh, you can resort to uh, cross-validation, where you want to minimize the error with respect to my uh, predictive means, or what you could also do, and that's maybe what you should do, because now we're in this probabilistic setting, we have that our Gaussian process is really defined by this, this matrix C, right? Uh, defined by my kernel, uh, matrix, this gram matrix, and the, this noise uh, parameter. And we assume that my data points were generated via such a Gaussian process actually. So what we can do, we can just fill this in. So this is a, a normal distribution for my function values f. So it assigns a probability of these particular observations. So we can just plug this in and evaluate uh, the probability of this vector being generated by such a, a Gaussian process. So I can use this form to construct a likelihood. So I'm going to choose my kernel parameters by um, maximizing the likelihood, where I should know that this covariance matrix depends on my kernel parameters theta. Theta, it's all in the C, and actually it's all actually specifically in this uh, kernel function. So, and since this is a Gaussian distribution, I can take the log of it and that gives me this uh, tractable expression where these C's actually still depend on 
uh, my model parameters theta and I'm going to maximize this. And of course this is uh, still a very complicated function still but I can numerically solve it for theta. I can do some gradient descent or whatever to, to optimize this log likelihood with respect to my model parameters. Okay, so that's all I have to say about Gaussian processes. Uh, they provide a very flexible way to derive predictive distributions in a non-parametric way by choosing a kernel that describes the Gaussian process. And now these uh, predictive distributions can be thought of as the posterior Gaussian processes where we condition our function evaluation for unseen data points on the data points in our, data, uh, in our training set. So that was captured in this particular equation, right? So this describes a general Gaussian process and now we have a set of uh, training data points and a set of unobserved or new training points for which we want to generate the, the corresponding function values. So we can condition my prediction on the existing data set by factorizing my uh, multivariate Gaussian in the following way. And that gives me this conditional distributions, which are still Gaussian distribution with a particular mean and a particular covariance matrix, which are entirely based on this uh, kernel. So in that sense, these predictive distributions are non-parametric models because they do not rely on explicit parameterization, but they are fully characterized by these uh, kernel functions. In this lecture, we are going to talk about methods for combining machine learning models. And the essential idea is to create better performing predictive systems by just combining individual models in a particular way. Now in the upcoming videos, I'll explain some of the most popular and effective methods for a model combination. Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to talk about methods for uh, combining models. And this uh, basically covers the chapters 4.1 up to 4.4 of uh, the book of Bishop. And what I'm going to start off with is uh, placing a particular method for model combination, uh, which, we have, uh, which we have already seen, namely Bayesian model average, in the context of this more general approach to uh, model combination methods. And this more general approach uh, relies on the notion of committees, uh, committees of, of experts, of, of classifiers or predictive systems. Right, so I could have a committee or a set of classifiers and I'm going to combine them to come up with their final predictions. And there's several ways to come up with these uh, different models and ways of combining them. And we will cover them in, in the next video. So first we're going to cover bootstrap aggregation and random subspace methods. And then we talk about uh, boosting to obtain a particular a committee of experts or a committee of classifiers or regressors. And then finally we cover a particular machine learning method, uh, namely decision trees. Uh, which are extremely uh, powerful and also simple to use and simple to use in, in, in combination with these uh, combination methods. And then I'm going to show that if we uh, combine decision trees together with this approach for um, forming your committee, namely bootstrap aggregation and random subspace methods, we arrive at the notion of random forest, which is another very powerful machine learning method. Okay, now uh, so far we have considered many different models for classification and regression, right? And now it is often the case that the overall performance of your method uh, can be improved simply by combi combining multiple models in, in a particular way. And that makes sense, right? Suppose you have one method that works well and you have another method that works also well, then maybe combining them leads to an even better system. And this is what you actually see if you look at the rankings of, the, of Kaggle, so all these... Uh, machine learning challenges, those are typically won, these challenges, they are typically won by uh, methods that apply some form of a combination of, of, uh, of expert systems. And we already saw an example of such a basic model combination method when we discussed the bias variance trade-off, right? So uh, basically the experiment was where we were training L different models, L different regression models, and then make a final prediction simply by taking the average of all these models. And that leads to a model which has a low bias and a low variance, simply by combining, uh, by averaging over my models. So methods that combine individual models to come to their final prediction are called committees. They, they consist of a committee of individual uh, predictors. So a particular way of uh, obtaining these committees is simply by averaging over a set of models, right? So I can just train a bunch of models uh, independent from each other. And then once they're trained, I can combine them. Uh, but there's also more clever ways of obtaining these models, and that's via boosting. This will be covered in one of the upcoming videos. So uh, we can form our committee in a clever way where uh, we try to add a new member to a committee, so a new machine learning model, a new 
classifier, for example, which is based on the previous model. So uh, suppose I know that the other committee members, the other model models fail in particular settings, then maybe the new committee member should focus on improving on that. And that, that's, that's one of the ideas behind boosting. And we'll cover that in, in the next video. So boosting relies on the idea of training multiple models in sequence, right? So the next model is going to be based on the performance of the, the previous uh, model. Okay, and then it turns out that forming your committee of models in such a sequential way uh, can lead really to huge improvements over uh, working with just individual models. Okay, so that already covers some ideas for forming uh, these committees uh, of models, right? Uh, so once we have such a committee, we can make a prediction by maybe just averaging the response of all my uh, predictions. But we can also look at this slightly differently, like an alternative to, the, to this is model selection. So we have this committee of, of models and then for each prediction, we can maybe decide to select just one model to make the prediction. And this particular one model is then supposed to be the expert, right? The, 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 the predictive model that is supposed to do the best job on the particular input uh, that is presented to it. Right, so in such a model selection approach, we can decide to select a model uh, based on the input. So we have a, a selection mechanism which uh, checks the input and then selects the corresponding uh, model. And a famous example of such methods is a decision tree. So that's going to be covered in, in this lecture and one of the upcoming videos. And the idea is that um, we have a selection a process of, of selecting my final uh, expert to make the uh, prediction uh, based on a sequence of binary selections. Now I suppose this, this represents my decision tree and I'm going to present it with a particular input sample. And then here we have some selection criterion that says, oh, based on my uh, input X, um, I pass it on to this branch. So if, for example, X1 is higher than some threshold, then I move it on to this branch. And then here we have another selection criteria, uh, basically another um, middle person or like a sort of semi-expert that is smart enough to, to sort of guide the, the selection process in the right way. And then it says, okay, yeah, based on X2, it's higher than this value. So maybe I pass it on to this particular expert. And so you, you pass on these decisions to a final expert so this would be the final expert that then decides okay um, well now that I see this feature um, I say this is the corresponding output or I say, uh, output or I say this is the corresponding output so in that sense you can work with highly specialized experts uh, because uh, a lot of information is already filtered out in this selection process and this particular uh, classifier then only has to focus on one particular feature for example to make a very basic decision that allows it to discriminate this point eventually into uh, one of the two categories for example. So these decision trees have, they have this very clear selection mechanism where uh, information is passed on from one expert to the other until the final expert makes uh, the final decision. So it's, it's fun to think of these uh, methods as really as a committee of experts that collaborate to come to a final decision. But you can also think of mixtures of experts in a soft selection manner, right? So that my final prediction, so what is the probability for my target T given my X, is based maybe on uh, a soft combination of particular predictive models. So this is one predictive method, uh, predictive model conditioned on an expert number, right? So I have K of such uh, expert uh, predictive methods. And then whenever a new input X is presented, um, this pi of K then assigns the appropriate probability for K being the appropriate expert to make this decision. Okay, and this then looks very similar to uh, the Gaussian mixture model, right, that we uh, encountered before, where uh, this pi of k is a mixing coefficient, which depends on x, so it really decides how much to put a particular predictive model into this mix of uh, predictions, and this is then, uh, this represents then one of the experts. So we can think of model selections in, in various ways, right? So in the first example, we uh, work with decision trees where my final experts are selected via this very nice uh, process of very simple binary uh, decision rules. Or we could do it in a soft manner that we have all these prediction, predictive experts uh, which are selected based on a weighted average, essentially. And now what I want to do next is focus on the difference between uh, Bayesian model averaging in comparison to model combination methods in general. Uh, basically, I started off this video by saying that, uh, well, Bayesian model averaging is a form of model combination methods, but this is not entirely true. Uh, so I have to rectify that by explaining the main difference. And the main difference is going to be that with Bayesian model averaging, we are essentially set out to 
recover the model that is uh, responsible for generating my particular data set uh, of interest. Whereas in uh, model combination uh, methods, we typically think of my data set being generated by, maybe via several processes and my predictions are made by several predictive systems as opposed to the single one that is eventually going to dominate this uh, Bayesian model averaging. So the idea is as follows. So we're going to focus on this difference between Bayesian model averaging and, and uh, model combination methods in general. And now we already, so we're going to take the following example. We have already seen a model combination method for density estimation, namely Gaussian mixture models, right? So we're, we're now considering this probabilistic viewpoint. Uh, so in this context, we use several Gaussians to uh, produce this density P of X via marginalization over some latent variable Z. And the idea was that this latent variable Z indicates which component of the mixture is responsible for generating the data point X. Right, so that works as follows, right? So we have this joint probability. So we say that each, uh, to each X, we have an associated uh, latent variable Z and we can factorize it in the following way. And then my uh, P of X is obtained by marginalizing over these uh, latent variables. So this discrete set of latent variable uh, values that Z can take on. So we marginalize over Z, X given Z. So this is my probability of X given my latent variable Z and then times the probability of uh, Z. Okay, so that tells me that my probability for X is, is, is given by a mixture of these, uh, let's say, expert distributions that know how to generate X um, well, for each uh, latent variable type. Where each of these experts, where each of these uh, components has its own uh, Gaussian distribution, right? So with each latent variable value Z, we have a different uh, Gaussian distribution. Um, okay, so then the setting is, right, that we have these joint probabilities for an observation X and its latent variable given by the following factorization. So we have the latent variable conditional distributions and we have a prior or a probability for the latent variable uh, in itself. And then the density over an observed X is simply obtained via this marginalization process, right? So we marginalize uh, out of a set. So we're not interested in which of these uh, distribution was responsible for generating this uh, particular probability. So we're just going to marginalize out a set and that gives me the marginal distribution for just X alone. Okay, and then suppose we have this data set of all these observations uh, stored in this big matrix X, then we can compute the probability of making, of observing this actual uh, data set, right? So we can assume IID, namely that each data point is uh, independent from one another, but they are drawn from the same uh, Gaussian mixture model in the end. So that's what you see over here. And then you can make this factorization, right? So the probability of observing of observing this entire data set given my model is given by the product of all these individual uh, probabilities. Okay, so and then these individual probabilities were obtained via a marginalization over um, the joint probabilities of my uh, data variable Xn with its corresponding uh, latent variable. And this can no longer be reduced. We cannot just get an expression for my uh, data set at once, but we see that my full probability factorizes into this product, to this product of all these individual probabilities that all have their own latent variables uh, set n. So that's really a big observation. So each observed data point xn has its own latent variable set n. Okay, and what we're going to do now is we're going to compare this against uh, what it looks like for Bayesian model averaging. So uh, we're considering Bayesian model averaging and we're going to consider that we have different models which are indexed with some uh, uh, variable H. So I have capital H of such different models. And I'm going to take this at a relatively abstract level, right? So one model could be uh, like a fully trained model using, uh, let's say, polynomial basis functions. And another model could be uh, based on Gaussian basis functions. And yet another one with just 10 basis functions, another one with, with 1,000. So each of these choices gives me a different model. But maybe we could also think of this uh, like one age is one set of parameters for the same model. So we can approach this from different levels of abstractions. But the idea is we have all these uh, probability distributions uh, given by a particular choice for model age, and then we have these prior probabilities uh, P of H. Then in this uh, Bayesian model averaging approach, I'm just going to uh, say that my final distribution is given via this, this essentially this weighted average of all my uh, probability distributions, right? So I marginalize out this uh, model choice. And the idea of this Bayesian model averaging is that in the end, we're going to assume that just a single model is responsible for explaining my entire data set. 
And it's just that we're uncertain of uh, which model is the actual model that does this. And this uncertainty is reflected uh, in this probability distribution uh, over my models. So that's how you should think of this. We have uncertainty of what model is actually explaining my data. So, and then in this uh, Bayesian setting, we can also look at the posterior distribution for uh, the probability for uh, picking a particular model, giving my data. And we saw that if we add more and more data, then these posterior distributions become sharper and sharper, more focused on one particular model. Okay, so that's the idea in this Bayesian model averaging. We start out with uncertainty over which model is actually correct, but then if we start observing more and more data points, I can really zoom in on what would be the appropriate model. So this distribution, this posterior distribution for H, given my data X, becomes sharper and sharper, and we focus on one particular model, which is going to explain uh, my entire data set. And this then explains the main difference between a Bayesian model averaging versus uh, model combination methods in general. Where in Bayesian model averaging, we say the entire data set is generated by a single model. We're just unsure about which one it was. Whereas in general, in model combination methods, uh, we can combine different models and think of it that my data points are possibly generated by, uh, well, a mixture of different models. And that was exemplified in this Gaussian mixture model, right? So suppose you have uh, two data points, a point X and a point X prime, then it can be that they can, that they're actually generated by different latent variable models, right? So this can arise from a, a latent variable set and this from a corresponding latent variable uh, set prime. So these axes, these observations can indeed come from completely different models. And this is something that you will never see in a, a Bayesian setting. Okay, so we just introduced the idea of model combination methods. Now let's go over two of the most simple but effective methods uh, for model combination, namely bootstrapping and feature bagging. And I'll justify these approaches from a viewpoint of reducing the variance in the bias variance decomposition of the expected error. Okay, so here we are in the, the overview, right? So we just introduced the idea of model combination methods and put it in contrast uh, to what we already saw, namely Bayesian model averaging. And now I'm going to explicitly show some methods to form these uh, committees, namely via uh, bootstrap aggregation and via the random subspace method. Okay, so essentially the simplest way to construct a committee is simply by training several models and then uh, let my... Uh, eventual prediction be the average over these models. But then of course I need ways to, to train these different models. And one way of training different models is simply by picking different data sets. And for every new data set, I'm going to train a new model. And that was essentially what we did when we talked about the bias variance uh, uh, trade-off. So what we did in the bias variance uh, decomposition video, we, we, we talked about the data set being a random variable in itself, right? So I can have this process that generates new data sets. So, and every time I observe a data set, I can train a model and this model has a certain performance. And then if I make a new data set observation, train my model again, my model performs slightly different. So I can talk about an expected error that my model is going to make given all these over and over newly sampled uh, data sets. And then we saw that this error decomposes in a bias which essentially explains the difference between each of these trained models and the ground, fun ground truth function that needs to be predicted. So the bias essentially characterizes how well my model would be uh, able in modeling this ground truth function. I mean, if I have a very simple model, then I probably have a large bias because my models will be different from what my true very complicated model is, is going to be. Uh, but then this, is, this was balanced against a variance term, right? And this variance represents the sensitivity of a model to the individual data points that it was uh, trained on. So if I train a model on an observed data set and then I train it again on a different data set, then these models, they can look completely different. And if they uh, look completely different every time I train them, we say there's a high variance in, in my model, right? And now in the ideal setting, we want that both the bias and the variance is going to be uh, low. We want uh, my model to become a good approximation of my ground root, but I also want that every model will be uh, uh, similar. So I don't make errors because my data set was just slightly different than the way it was before. So what we're going to do next, we're going to talk about constructing committees by taking this uh, bias variance decomposition uh, into account. And to do so, let's 
take a recap of this bias variance decomposition example. So the example is as follows, so, uh, right? So I'm going to generate L data sets, let's say 100 data sets uh, consisting of 25 points. And each data set is generated as follows. So I'm just going to uniformly sample a point on the, the x-axis. So actually, I'm going to uniformly sample 25 points on the x-axis. And then I'm going to pull them through this uh, sine function. So this is actually going to be my ground root function that I want to approximate. It's given here in green. So green is the function that we're approximating. And so we're randomly sampling points on this sine plus some noise. So we have some epsilon noise uh, to each uh, measurement. Okay, and then the experiment is as follows. So we have L of these uh, data sets and we're going to fit a linear uh, regression model to this uh, using Gaussian basis functions. It's just a choice, but, so, but we use 24 Gaussian basis functions and know that we only have 25 uh, points per, per data set. So this is a really, this is really a flexible uh, model, right? So, so it can actually quite easily overfit on, on these data sets. And then in order to control uh, the complexity of these models, so they are intri intrinsically complex, they can represent all sorts of functions, but really the complexity is going to be controlled via this uh, rich regression penalty, right? So we're going to put a penalty on the size of the weights. And when lambda becomes very large, I do not allow my weights to take on high values. And when they become very small, then basically it means I have no uh, penalty at all. And I can get very uh, noisy uh, models that, that overfit essentially. And that's what you see in these figures, right? So if lambda is indeed very high, then I put a large penalty on W, and then I actually see that my models, they're sort of damped, uh, right? So um, if I take the expectation over these models, I compute the average model that's depicted uh, on the right over here, we see actually a large bias, right? So we see that the average model is completely different uh, from my ground root model. So that's the idea of uh, the bias that the expectation of my data sets of my models trained on each of these data sets. If that is a very much different from my uh, ground root, then I say I have a high bias. But the good thing is that uh, I have low uh, variability among models, right? So I have uh, low variance. And so, and then we saw that, that we have a trade-off between the two, right? So and now if I have a very flexible model, then maybe each individual model is kind of noisy, but you see it nicely follows the overall structure of my f function. So if I take the average, so that's uh, the red curve over here, it's super close to my ground truth. So we see that these very complex models, they tend to have a low bias. So they tend to approximate my true signal well on average, but individually you see a lot of variance between the models. So um, against low bias, we see actually high variance. Okay, this is something we already saw, right? That we have this trade-off between uh, variance and bias. And ideally you want to have uh, both of them low. You want to have reliable models that are the same every time, that are not too dependent on a particular data set that they observe. But of course, I also want these models to be accurate. So I also want a, a low bias. And now what this example really shows, now suppose I have all these data sets and all these trained models, but then I can just average them, right? And that leads to a very low bias, even when my models are very complex. So what we see that averaging these models, that, that really only works when I work with models that already have a, a low bias to start with, but which have a high variance, because if I average over this, I essentially reduce the variance. And in this low bias example, or sorry, high bias example with low variance, if I average, uh, yeah, I get slightly better results. So I really reduce the variance to, to, to zero because I'm considering only one model but my bias remains high. So model averaging is a good thing uh, because it reduces uh, variance, but it cannot really increase, uh, sorry, reduce the bias as well. And that's going to be the main idea behind committees to work with uh, flexible models that have a low bias. And then we're going to use this idea of model averaging to really reduce uh, the variance. Okay, that's again some right over here, right? So when we average models trained on different data set, the contribution of the variance reduces. And so when we average a set of low bias models, so those are very complex methods, right? So they have low bias, but they have high variance. We actually obtain in the end very accurate predictions. So uh, the average of all these complex models results in a quite stable uh, prediction in the end. 
But then we're also back to the problem that we discussed before, that in practice we only have one single data set, right? So it's, it's weird to split your single data set into the small parts to come up with very poor models such that you can average them afterwards. It's still better to just use the entire data set. So what we can do, we can now apply a trick to artificially create new data set out of the data set I, uh, that I already have. And that is going to be done via the bootstrap method. So we're going to introduce variability between mil, uh, different models by uh, messing with my data set, essentially creating new data set. We're uh, bootstrapping the data set. And the idea is as follows. So, so I have this entire data set of observations. I have n of such uh, data points. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to create B new uh, data set. So capital B represents the number of new data sets that I'm going to generate. And each individual data set is going to be of the same size of my original data set. So each, so each XB is a new data set of size N. And these data sets are going to be generated by randomly sampling N points out of my original data set with replacements. And this means that some data points will occur multiple times in this particular data set XP. And it can also happen that some points will never be sampled. And then the reason for this uh, sampling with replacement is that, I mean, if I do not do this, then basically my new, new data set will be just a shuffled version of my original data set. So it does, it, in that sense, it isn't different from my original data set. Whereas I do sampling with replacement, then maybe some points uh, are sampled more often and some points do not occur in this particular data set, but they do uh, get included in, in, the, in one of the other data sets. So with this random uh, sampling with replacements, I really generate data sets that are different from one another. Obviously there will be overlap between uh, some of these distributions, but in general, they will be different. Okay, so this is a very uh, simple idea to generate new uh, data sets. So then we have all these uh, capital B number of, of data sets, and then we can train a model on each of these data sets. So the model trained on data set X uh, index B uh, is going to be denoted with Y index with uh, a small b. Okay, so now I have obtained a committee of predictive models YB. And then my final prediction can, for example, simply be done by taking the average over all my predictions. Now, this approach is what you call a bootstrap aggregation or bagging, where I must warn actually that this term bagging will also later be used in a different context, namely feature bagging. So when someone talks about I'm using a bagging to generate a new data sets, then really you should ask, okay, what do you mean? Do you mean uh, like bootstrap aggregation, like generating new data set, or do you mean feature bagging? And that's something that we're going to discuss uh, next actually. Okay, what we're going to do next, we're going to think about what this way of constructing committees does to our bias variance uh, decomposition. So I just said that we want to reduce the variance and now uh, we're going to think about if this actually happens, if, if I do this, this form of, of uh, model combination. So what we're going to do, we're going to suppose that we know uh, our ground truth uh, H of X. Then we can say that each of my models uh, makes a particular error, right? So, and the error is basically the difference between my model and my ground truth. So the main point to take into account here is that each model has its own uh, errors for each X. So then we can also think about what the overall error of my single model is going to be, right? If I average out over X, so if all these X's and uh, at each point X, I make a particular error. So let's take a look at uh, the mean of my squared error over my all X's. So that's given as follows, right? Then I have all these different models indexed with a small b, and I'm just going to compute the average error that, that all of these models make. So that's indicated with E subscript uh, AV. So the average error of my uh, individual models and that's going to be given by 1 over b times the sum over uh, the mean squared error. So now we're going to compare this average error of all these single models compared uh, to the, the error, the expected error that my committee is uh, supposed to make. And my committee was given by the error of these predictions. So uh, my committee model just spits out one number, right? And it's going to be a combination of all these individual predictions. And similarly for the committee, I can compute this uh, expected error by taking uh, the average over all my predictions uh, X, right? Because this is my uh, committee model, Y committee. 
And I can take my uh, ground root inside the sum, right? Via this uh, trivial relation, h of x simply given by 1 over b sum over uh, b h of x. So that allows me to put it in, in this form. So uh, the expected error of my committee is going to be given by uh, the square over the average error and then average over uh, my positions x. So that's different than, than here, right? So here I compute like my mean squared error and then I'm averaging it. And here in this particular case, I first compute uh, the mean of the error, then squared and then average it. Okay, now let's make this relation between the average error and the committee error a bit more explicit by doing the following. So what we can do, we can assume that the expected error uh, at each data point and of each model is going to be zero. And I think this is a reasonable assumption, right? So sometimes uh, my model is slightly above that ground root, sometimes below, but on average it's it has zero ever, error. Then I'm going to make a different assumption, namely I'm going to assume that the errors between models is uncorrelated. Now this is a somewhat um, debatable assumption, right? Because I can certainly assume that my models are going to be correlated uh, via this bootstrapping uh, method. But for now, let's just, uh, let's just assume that each model is independent from one another and therefore also their errors are uncorrelated. Then what we have that uh, since my covariance uh, between these models is zero and uh, the average of each of these errors is also going to be zero, then this implies that the expectation over the product of these errors is zero. Right, that follows from the definition of the covariance, right, which is given by the expectation of the product of these two random variables minus uh, the product of the expectation. So really these two together imply that also the, the expectation of the product of these two random errors is going to be uh, zero. Then if you write this out, you can show that my uh, committee error is going to be given by 1 over b uh, times my average error. So it seems it's really advantageous to work with multiple committees, b of them, because with every committee member I decrease my, my total error by quite a bit. And if you want to verify this, uh, maybe we can quickly do this. So I'm computing the expectation of uh, this thing squared, so that's the expectation of 1 over b squared, then well, 1 times this sum, so over b is 1 to b, the error b. So we're squaring this thing, right? So and now times the product of the sum. Now I have to use a different index, b prime, the error b prime at x. Okay, the expectation of this thing. Okay, so let's write this out. So linearity says that I can take the 1 over b squared out. I can take these sums out, b is 1 to b, b prime is 1 to b, and then the expectation of the product of this uh, b error times the product of the b prime error. And our assumption was that uh, these are uncorrelated errors, so that means that the expectation of b and b prime is going to be zero in general but only when b is exactly b prime, so when we're considering the same models, yeah, then we can uh, have some uh, non-zero uh, expectation. So I'm going to put this direct delta here, saying that uh, this is only one if b equals b prime, because if b is not equal to b prime, so if I consider different uh, models, then there's no correlation between these errors, and thus these components uh, evaluate to zero. So this tells me that I can get rid of one of these sums, right, because the only components that remain in the sum are the cases where b equals uh, b prime. So let's write that out. So then we see that we have 1 over b squared, the sum over all my models, and then the expectation of uh, my error for model b squared. And that's what we see over here, right? So we see that uh, this is the same as 1 over b times my average error. Okay, so this explains this uh, particular step. And it says that if I assume that my models are uncorrelated and hence I can assume that their errors are uncorrelated, then I can uh, gain a huge reduction in uh, these, these average errors by a factor 1 over b. And that's the key point here. If I have independent models, I really gain a lot uh, reduction in errors.
Okay, so that's again summarized over here. If I uh, assume independence uh, across my models, then my committee error is going to be redu reducing the average error by a factor one over B. So it's very advantageous to work in such a committee uh, method, but we obviously made this very strong assumption that the individual models are uncorrelated. And this in practice is of course definitely not the case. Especially when uh, we bootstrap the data set, right? Because um, some of the same points uh, recur in all the different data sets. So there is definitely going to be a correlation among my uh, bootstrap data sets. Okay, but the good thing is, and you can actually show this, and I'm not going to show this in this video, uh, but trust me on this. If you uh, take a look at the expected error of such a committee method, it will always be equal or smaller than uh, the errors, the average error of my individual models. So this really means it will never get worse. You'll never make it worse by uh, using such bootstrap method, uh, but it's just that maybe you require to do some more computations. Okay, but we just saw that if my errors are uncorrelated, so if I have uh, uncorrelated data sets, for example, then I have this really clear improvement. So the strategy would be what you want to aim for is to generate data sets which are uncorrelated. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the, in the next slide. But the general recipe is we are going to build B models which have a low bias. So that means we have complex models that are capable of overfitting. And then we're going to train a bunch of them and we average them. And this will eventually reduce, uh, reduce uh, this variance in my predictions. Okay, and then this works on the, the notion that uh, in this bootstrapping, my data sets will look uh, different every time, right? So I sample them uh, with replacement. So each of these individual data sets look different. So they're not fully correlated, but they are somewhat independent. So it will reduce uh, my variance in the end. And now let's go over a different way of uh, reducing uh, the dependency between data sets. And we we'll do this by sampling subsets of the features. So I'm not sampling different points in each data set, but I'm choosing to focus on only um, particular features in my uh, vectors that consist of my, uh, or that comprise my data set. And with that, I mean, I have this whole data set of samples. These vectors X each have their own feature values, right? So feature value one, feature value two, uh, et cetera. So all my feature vectors are vectors of uh, length d and what I'm going to do I'm now going to only use a couple of them let's say uh, I set r to 3 which means I'm only going to pick three of such uh, feature values and that is going to be forming the feature vector that I'm going to use in my model so with these three values uh, for each data point I'm going to train uh, model 1 for example uh, then maybe I'm in a second run, I'm only going to use these particular values, let's say the first three values, and that is going to be used to train a different model, let's say uh, model Y2. And then of course I can repeat this for several subsamplings of my feature vector. So maybe in another run, I'm only going to use X3, X4 and X5, and that is going to give me in the end my trained model uh, Y3. Okay, so instead of randomly sampling my data points, I'm going to randomly, randomly sample uh, the features that I'm going to use to train my model. So this is called uh, random, the random subspace method. And this works particularly well if my features are uncorrelated, right? Because we want to work with uncorrelated data sets, because then we can most effectively uh, reduce uh, the error that my committee is going to make. And you can imagine that uh, this causes the learners not to overfocus on features that are overly predictive for the training set, but that do not generalize well to new data set, right? Suppose this X1 feature is super uh, descriptive uh, for my training set for some reason, but then I have a test set where this doesn't play a role. Yeah, then I have a model that isn't working properly. So whereas in the training phase, my model learned to rely a lot on this particular fe feature. But then if I consider a different model, for example, Y3, then this feature isn't used and this model uh, learned to make predictions without this particular model. So uh, that sense, by randomly shuffling my input features and train different models, we, can, we gain more robustness against this, this particular type of overfitting. So, and yeah, and so feature backing also works particularly well if the number of features is much larger than the number of training points, because if this would be the case, then my model in itself using all these feature values could maybe re really memorize the training set in itself. 
And this is not going to happen if you just use a random subset of my uh, feature vectors. And then of course we can decide to combine bootstrapping with random subspace methods, right? To really reduce the dependency between the, uh, the data sets on which my models are trained. And if you use this combination of bootstrapping and random subspace methods with a very simple uh, classification method called decision trees, then what you obtain are random forests. And that's going to be explained in, in the, the last video of this uh, lecture. We just covered model combination via bootstrapping and feature bagging. And now in this video, we're going to consider an alternative approach uh, to combining models, namely via uh, boosting. So what we just did in the bootstrap aggregation and the random subspace method is uh, that we were essentially uh, obtaining a committee of models by training them on artificially created new data sets. And we relied on the idea of minimizing the variance in the expected error by averaging the resulting models. And now we take a different uh, approach to constructing a committee of models. We are now going to construct a committee of models in a sequential manner. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with the same data set, but we are just going to reweight the importance of data samples in such a way as to let each new model focus on the errors that the previous models were not able to solve. So we, we adapt a sequential optimization uh, approach. And by letting each new model focus on the errors of the previous model, uh, we eventually obtain a very strong committee of models which have complementary expertises. And this is really different uh, to the bootstrap and the, the, the begging approach, where the idea was uh, we have this very uh, complex, flexible model which have, has a low bias, and now we want to reduce the variance. But now in the boosting method, we can actually work with models which actually do have a high bias. So very simple models that tend to underfit. Um, but by letting each of these new simple models focus on the errors of the other models, we can actually uh, obtain a very strong model in the end, which has a low bias. So the essential difference is that with boosting, we can work with simple uh, models to create a complex model. And uh, with the bootstrapping and the backing methods, we already start off with complex models and we just make them better by reducing the variance among these uh, models. Okay, so let's talk about boosting. So the setting is that we're working with a committee uh, which consists of multiple base classifiers. So we call the individual uh, classifiers, we call them base classifiers. And then what we will see is that the performance of the committee as a whole can be significantly better than any of the base classifiers, right? So we can, again, a very simple base classifiers that in the end results to a committee of classifiers, uh, which perform significantly better than these simple models uh, alone. And now there are several methods for boosting that have these uh, kind of properties. And uh, the most popular and classic one is called ADA boost, adaptive boosting. It's, it's one of the, the simplest uh, models for, for boosting. And I think if you understand this concept of ADA boost, then you're ready also to dive into the more, more uh, complicated uh, method for boosting. But in this course, we just consider Ada Boost as one of the main examples for boosting. And really the strength of boosting is that it can give good results even if the base classifiers have a performance that is only slightly better than random. So that's really amazing. So if you have a very poor classifier that it's just slightly better than random, then you really can crank up the performance of such a classifier uh, via, by using Ada Boost, for example. And for that reason that we have this property of really boosting the performance, we can actually work with very simple base classifiers. Uh, and these simple models are often called weak learners. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to talk about Ada Boost in uh, the classification case, but this can also be uh, extended uh, to, re to regression. Okay, so again, want to stress this difference between uh, bootstrapping and begging. So uh, bootstrapping, right, creating new uh, data sets or bagging using different features every time in my data set. This really is aiming at decreasing the variance among my models, whereas boosting is really focusing on decreasing the bias. So basically getting more complicated, better suited models out of the simple uh, models. And with bootstrapping, I already start off with models that have a low bias but have large variance. And actually also in the boosting, because we take these average of predictions, we also see that we uh, sort of reduce the variance, um, sorry, and uh, variance. But the main 
idea behind boosting is to actually decrease the bias or actually increase the expressivity of these models combined. Okay, then the recipe is as follows. So we're going to uh, train the base classifiers uh, sequentially, right? And that, that's also a reason why we actually want to work with weak and simple uh, learners because they are typically fast to compute uh, because, well, the next model relies on training the previous one, whereas in uh, the bagging uh, or bootstrapping method, I can essentially train my models in parallel, right? I cannot do that in this case. So it's sequential and hence I want to work with fast and simple uh, classifiers. Now the idea in this boosting algorithm is that each model is trained with a weighted form of the training set. So each data point uh, gets assigned a weight that depends on the performance of the previous classifiers. So I have, I'm working with a loss, with a loss that uh, depends on, well, my uh, input vector, the corresponding target, and an important weight, an important weight of this, uh, of this data point. And basically this weight should re uh, reflect the, the, the difficulty in classifying this uh, particular data point Xn. So if my previous classifier had a problem with classifying this particular data point to the correct uh, target, then this uh, data point should have a large uh, weight. So that's essentially given in this line. Points that are misclassified by one of the base classifiers are given a greater weight when, using, uh, when used to train the next base classifier in, in the sequence. Okay, and I'll explain in a minute how to obtain these weights and how this exact procedure uh, looks like. Uh, but the idea is now we have a sequence of models trained on a data set with, uh, in which each of the data points are weighted in a particular way. So then we have the sequence of classifiers and then my final predictions are based via a weighted average of each of these uh, classifiers. And then each of my classifiers in this sequence uh, gets again assigned a particular weight. So this is a weight uh, on the model and this weight alpha reflects basically how good this model is performing. So in this entire sequential uh, training procedure, I'm going to test how good my model is performing and I have a good, if I have a good performing model, then I have a, a large uh, weight essentially, such that when I make my final predictions and recall that I'm considering classification. Uh, so these predictions, they are either minus one or one then we see that we have a sort of weighted majority vote going on here, right? So uh, in the end, my final prediction is just going to be based on uh, the sign of my uh, weighted uh, prediction. Okay, now let's get into uh, a little bit more detail. So we have a data set of input output pairs. Uh, we're considering binary classification. So my targets are either minus one or plus one. And then as said, each data point has an associated uh, weight parameter Wn. And initialize, initially, we're just going to initialize the weights uh, to a constant value. So basically each point gets assigned the same weight, uh, one over n, so, such that the sum of the total weights is just going to be, the, just going to be one. And okay, and then we, we're going to assume that we have some procedure to train a base classifier m, such that it produces a function y indexed by this particular m, uh, y of x. So we had y is just a model and we have a way of training this model given um, some weighted loss function. And this model can be anything, right? As long as it spits out a minus one or a plus one in the end, uh, and it can handle uh, weighted losses. Uh, so we can think of logistic regression, uh, decision trees, but even support vector machines can be used. But the main point is that we want to work with base classifiers, which are simple. Uh, so they're weak classifiers and they're fast uh, to optimize. Okay, and then uh, the recipe for add a boost is uh, simple. So at each stage, a new classifier is trained on this, this weighted data set. And then um, we check which points were misclassified. And for those points, we're going to crank up the weights such that next time, maybe the next model uh, is going to do a better job on these particular uh, data points. And then when all these classifiers are trained, a committee is formed via a weighted average of all these individual uh, models. Okay, so let's have a closer look at what this algorithm actually looked like. Uh, so let, let's go over these steps. So we initialize the weights uh, with, a, with one over n, so each uh, data point gets the same weight. Then uh, we're going to build our committee. So we start off with model one. Uh, so, okay, so we're going to train my classifier. And the objective of this training procedure is to minimize this uh, sum of errors. Uh, what you see over here, this is the indicator. 
function that returns uh, the value one whenever this criterion is satisfied and zero otherwise. So what does it say? Whenever my predicted output is unequal to the actual target, then this spits out the value one and otherwise zero. So conversely, if my uh, prediction was correct, then this thing is zero and basically my loss would be zero if, if this was the case for all data points. But if I make an error, then this sum adds um, with this weight uh, Wn. Okay, so we want to minimize this weighted sum of errors. Okay, and then we have a trained uh, classifier y of m, and then we're just going to verify um, how well it was performing on this uh, training set. So we're again going to evaluate uh, this weighted sum of errors, but we're going to normalize it uh, with the, the total uh, uh, number of weights, which basically gives me a weighted error rate, right? If I make zero errors, then this term is zero all of the time. And basically my, my error uh, fraction or my error rate is zero. And if I make uh, errors 50% of the time and my weights would be uh, constant, then uh, my uh, error rate would be 0.5. But now it could be that some errors are more important than others. Uh, so what you see over here is essentially a weighted uh, error rate. And now what we're going to do with this, with this errors rate, we're going to determine a sort of weight or a scoring term for how well this particular uh, model is performing. So if my error rate is small, then uh, if one minus something is small, so this is close to one divided by something which is small, it gives a very large value. And okay, so I take the logarithm of this thing. Maybe it will become clearer later on why we take this logarithm. But the thing is, we are able to assign some value alpha m that quantifies how well this model is performing. And this alpha m is going to be my uh, model weight. So it's large, my model weight is large whenever my errors, my error rate is small. And then based on this model weight, I'm going to update um, my data point weights. So these uh, WNs. And it reads as follows. So this is again the identity or the, the indicator function. So whenever I make an incorrect prediction, this thing is one, and I'm going to multiply my weights with some uh, value which is typically larger than one. So I'm really going to increase the weights for this particular data point. And if my correction was, uh, if my prediction was correct, then this thing evaluates to zero, and then I'm multiplying with one. So essentially, I do not do any update if my uh, prediction was correct, but I do update it proportional to, well, the quality of my model if I actually made an in incorrect uh, a prediction. So this basically means if I have a, a poor performing model, uh, then my alpha m takes on a relatively small value and my weights are updated a little bit. So the incorrectly classified points, they get a higher weight, but this increase in weight isn't as extreme as in the case when I have a very good performing model. If you have a very good performing model, then only a few data points uh, were misclassified. Uh, and hence, I have a very uh, large alpha M. And it's precisely these misclassified points that now also get a very strong increase in, in their, uh, their weights. Because apparently these points were very hard to classify, even with a classifier which was doing a very good job. Okay, and now we have updated the weight and, and we can proceed to the next model, which is now going to try to, to sort of do a better job at the points uh, where we failed last time. And so, yeah, you do this for M of such models and then you have a very strong committee of models which are uh, ideally complementary uh, to each other. So, and then your final predictions are made by just taking a weighted average of these predictions based on these alpha M's and these alpha M's we're scoring basically uh, the quality of, of each model. Okay, so I sort of can imagine that you maybe think that this algorithm sort of falls from the, the sky. It's like, why would you come up with this? Um, I will give an extra explanation in, in a couple of slides. So there, are, there is some strong motivations why this should work and, and it actually does work. So there's some empirical evidence that I show next. But there are also some clear theoretical motivations uh, for this. Okay, so let's go over the main components of uh, AdaBoost again. So we have our predictive models. So in the end, we have all we have a committee of, of models 
uh, ym each with a particular a scoring factor alpha m and my final prediction is a weighted average of these so the models that were performing well they have a large value for alpha m and therefore they contribute more to the final prediction and then these predictive weights alpha m were obtained by taking the logarithm of one minus my error rate divided by the error rate and that looks something like this so basically it says if i have a very low error rate then really this value uh, alpha m uh, shoots up so a low error rate means a high importance weight of this particular model. Uh, but then we also see um, that for an extremely large error rate, let's say close to one, it goes to uh, minus infinitely. Uh, but this obviously doesn't happen much, right? Because um, I think it's safe to assume that your model is at least better than uh, random guessing. And random guessing would mean an error rate of 0.5. And therefore it's safe to assume that uh, alpha m is generally uh, bigger than, than zero and therefore also this weight update term is going to be larger than one. So I'm also always going to increase my weights uh, wn but some uh, weights are uh, not updated because they were correctly classified and others they are indeed updated with this increase uh, in weight via this exponential. Okay, then let's take a look at an example. So here we use a very simple base classifier. So we're going to work with uh, decision stumps. So what a decision stump does, it's essentially a decision tree of, of depth one. So how it works, I have this two dimensional uh, feature space and I'm going to look for a decision boundary that best separates the two. So I'm just going to check if my feature value one, is it larger or smaller than some particular value? And if it's larger, then I assign it to the red class. And if it's smaller, then I assign it to the blue class. And initially, this is the best split I can take. I mean, I can also make splits along this direction, but apparently this split is the one that makes the best separation between uh, my data points. So that's what you see over here. This dashed line is my uh, model YM and the green line represents basically the sum alpha m y m so the sum of all these uh, models actually represents the sign right so i'm uh, considering the binary uh, classification problem okay so i now have a classifier that basically says this part belongs to the red class and this part becomes uh, belongs to the blue class Okay, so this is what we just did. So we fit our first very simple classifier to the data that minimizes uh, this error rate and that gave me this particular uh, decision boundary. So this represents my model essentially. And now what I'm going to do, I'm, con I'm going to compute the, the error rates. So obviously now I'm going to make errors and that's indicated with these points. So this one is red, it falls in the blue class. Uh, so this is error and these two blue points are errors. Okay, so I determined uh, the errors in my system and that also allows me to compute this alpha m, so this sort of model accuracy scoring uh, coefficient. And then I can update the weights, right? So every weight which was misclassified, so then this thing is one, uh, is updated based on this alpha m. And that's represented over here. So uh, the circles represent the size, of, the radius of the circles represents the weight of these data points. And now these data points were misclassified, so they get increased weights so they become larger right and uh, actually it seems that these uh, become smaller these weights but what you see over here is actually uh, the normalized uh, weights so actually these weights are the same as before it's just that uh, these uh, points get larger weights uh, but we rescale these images or these these radi radii as follows so we use a normalized weight for the m uh, iteration is each weight is divided by the sum by the sum over uh, all my weights okay and then in this next iteration now I'm going to uh, retrain my new classifier but now I weight the importance of these points uh, stronger right and that actually leads to a, uh, a decision boundary right over here because these red points it was very important that they belong to the red, to the red class so now this becomes my decision boundary but now I again I'm going to make errors right so uh, this point and this point and this point and this point and this point those are all errors that uh, actually lead to the fact that now if I compute this error rate I still uh, have a relatively large error so a relatively small model scoring coefficient so if I look at the current predictions in this case actually my previous model was doing a, a better job 
So if I compute the weighted average of my uh, predictions, so I evaluate my committee model, essentially it's, st it's still dominated by, uh, by this first model. So my uh, committee decision boundary is still at the same location. But now I have identified still these points which were misclassified and apparently are hard to, uh, to, to update. So they get again a higher weight. So that's what you see over here. Again, it's a rescaling. So these get larger, these points get larger. So you see that these points are larger than uh, these points because they have a larger weight now. Okay, and now with these updated weights, I'm going to retrain a model. So that gives me this optimal decision boundary. And I again recompute the weights and the importance factors, so these alpha m's. So I'm iterating that, and you see that I get more and more complex uh, decision boundaries. So these green ones, again, were the predictions of my uh, committee weighted with their uh, importance. And this allows me to come up with a classifier, which has very, which have very complicated uh, decision boundaries. And this final boosted classifier is really just a combination of super simple classifier, which alone don't work very well, but if you use them in this boosting setting, I actually obtain a classifier that does a very good job. Okay, so let's give an interpretation to Adaboost. What the algorithm is actually doing, it is sequentially update, updating the following error function. So it looks like this, where I take the exponential error of my classifier. So this FM is my committee classifier consisting of up to M of such uh, base classifiers and well, uh, the classifier itself is a weighted average of these uh, classifiers, right? That's what we saw before. So each FM consists of M uh, committee members. Okay, and then you see that this term quantifies uh, the total error, right? Because N uh, indexes my uh, data points and this particular term, so this particular term, so TN times FM of XN, that is uh, essentially larger than zero if correct and if it's incorrect then it's smaller than zero right uh, because this one is uh, the target is either one or minus one and also my prediction is either positive or uh, negative so this tells me that if my predictions are correct this term is positive and then times uh, minus one of this exponential so this total error will be small if i have a lot of correct predictions uh, but Whenever I make a lot of errors, uh, basically this error is large. Okay, so this is an error function that we want to minimize. So we want to minimize a error defined for my entire committee, right? So I have M of such committee members. Each of one uh, consists of a model that I want to optimize and a corresponding set of weights that I want to optimize, right? So that's the ultimate goal, to minimize the error with respect to both alpha L and, uh, well, the, the parameters within each uh, base classifier, YL. And that is of course super complicated to do. So there's so many parameters and so many dependent, uh, dependencies. So uh, what we're going to do or what Adaboost actually does, it does a form of sequential minimization, basically fixing all the parameters of the previously trained uh, classifiers, base classifiers and their corresponding weights. And then only focus on minimizing this error function with respect to the latest uh, committee member, YM alpha M. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to write out uh, this minimization step with respect to YM and alpha M. And then uh, in the end, we'll see that we have derived uh, adder boost. So this is our error function for my committee consisting of M members uh, so far. Okay, so this is just the definition of the error. And then in this step, we're just going to write out uh, this FM term, right? Because FM was given by by this particular expression, right? So it consists of the sum of all my uh, previous uh, committee members. And then, well, we can split the sum in the part up to m is minus one and then plus the remaining part. And that's what you see over here. So we have tn uh, times fm minus one. So that's the sum up to minus one. And then I still have to add this uh, term at the end times a half ym. So that's the, the, the mth term. And I said I'm going to now only focus on optimizing these alpha m's and y m's. So this particular term is going to be grouped. Um, so this particular term is going to be grouped in uh, this wn uh, parameter, right? It's just splitting of this exponential, and then I'm going uh, and then I'm going to call the exponential of this term. I'm going to call it uh, wn. So wn at iteration m is given by the exponential of minus tn f m minus one xn. Okay, and then what I'm going to do next, I'm going to write it in, in this form uh, that relies on this indicator uh, function, right? So um, that's the purpose of what I'm going to do next. So I'm identifying all the 
points that were correctly classified, I'm going to denote that with this uh, T of M. And those are all the points essentially for which Tn times Ym is one, right? So a positive uh, value uh, because then the labels coincide. So, and then the signs uh, go inside. Um, and I can also define the misclassified points or the set of misclassified points. Sorry, this should be then misclassified. So the set of misclassified points, those are all the points for which the product uh, Tn, Ym uh, equals uh, minus one. And once we've done that, we can split our error function, right? So I'm splitting the sum over my uh, positive part. So that's uh, step one, essentially. And uh, over this, uh, well, uh, misclassified points. And then I'm going to use the following identity that for the positively or the correctly classified point, this product Tn, Ym is equal to one. So Tn times one is one. And that gives me this very simple exponential, e to the power minus alpha m over two. And for the misclassified point, it, it gives me uh, the following expression, right? Okay, and then we can write this in, into the form of this indicator function, right? So if my predictions are correct, then this thing evaluates to zero. And what I'm left with is just only this particular term, right? So that's correct. So that's for my uh, positive data points. And if my predictions are incorrect, then this thing equals one. And then we have the same term over here. So this is e to the power minus uh, a half alpha m plus the same term over here. So these cancel out in the case of negative predictions and what I'm left is only this term, right? So I'm just rewriting my error function such that I can formulate it in terms of this uh, indicator function, which we saw in, in the adder boost algorithm. Okay, so this is just rewriting the error function, right? So now we obtain this particular error function and now it becomes clear that if you want to minimize with respect to ym, so we see uh, ym only pop up in this location, uh, this is just a constant with respect to ym. So if I want to minimize this error function, I should focus on minimizing this particular term. And that is precisely um, the objective in my adder boost algorithm. Right, so going back to the Adderboost algorithm, step one was fit a classifier that minimizes this particular objective, which has these weights in them. And these weights is, uh, so this particular form is what we just derived. So these weights were given via this um, exponential uh, grouping, right? Uh, I'll get back to, be to that in a minute. Okay, so when we minimize this exponential uh, error function with respect to my model parameters, it means I have to uh, minimize this particular objective for each of the uh, committee member models. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to minimize uh, with respect to uh, alpha m. I see these alpha m's over here, here, and here. And so if I want to optimize with respect to this thing, I compute the derivative, set it to zero. And this that gives me uh, the following expressions. So I'm not going to write out uh, these particular steps, but for convenience, we now introduce the, this uh, error term uh, epsilon m, which basically arises when we take this derivative, then these components all survive. And then I solve this equation, and in the end, I need to take a logarithm to uh, well to to get to my alpha m's, and that's essentially the recipe that you see here. You can verify it yourself if you want, uh, but the main point is when we uh, solve this equation, we get our expressions for alpha m, which we already saw in the adder boost algorithm, right? So let's go back to the the steps in the algorithm. So step one was fitting this classifier with this objective, and then step two was compute the the weighted error rates, right? So that's the thing that we just derived and it uh, corresponds to the optimal choice for alpha m given my exponential uh, error function that we're minimizing now uh, sequentially. Okay, so we just derived uh, the rules for step A, we just derived the rules for step B, and then of course we need to move to the next model, right? So now basically we're done with uh, defining my committee member ym and the corresponding uh, alpha m, so this model importance uh, parameter, and then we can add a new committee member. Uh, so let's see what we need to do to get there. So basically what you need to do is define the error function or the objective that we want to minimize for this new committee uh, with this newly added uh, committee member, uh, y ym plus one, sorry, ym plus one. So that's really just splitting this function fm plus one, right? This, this was my committee uh, model, so consisting of the sum of all these uh, weighted models. So I'm going to split it uh, as we've done before, where this part is essentially minus tn times my model up to uh, the empt committee member, and this is one, uh, the one that we just added, right? And then before we made this particular factorization where uh, this part was grouped into this uh, Wn, and this is the model that we uh, just derived. So that means if we then again write it in this form that we worked uh, with before, then it means we have to group these two terms and call it Wn 
um, at uh, the iteration n plus one, right? So we have all these n plus one indices over here, and this groups basically the contributions of all models uh, up to order m. So, uh, and you can derive this uh, sequentially based on what we had before. So this was fixed in the previous iterations, and now we're going to fix uh, this thing by just updating wn with the following uh, update rule. Okay, so let's get back to the algorithm slide. We already did step A, we already did step B, and now we just derived uh, the update rule for uh, my next uh, set of weights. Though actually in the Adabus algorithm, this update step was again formulated in terms of this uh, indicator function. So let's quickly do that as well. And to do this, we're going to make use of the following uh, property, right? So tn times yn, it takes on the value one whenever I have a correct prediction and it takes on the value minus one when I have an incorrect prediction. Uh, so I can do this that in terms of this indicator function, right? Because if I make an incorrect prediction, this thing is on. So I have one minus two, it gives me minus one. And when it's off, it gives me one. So I can just insert this in my expression for the update rule that we uh, just derived. And that gives me the following, where again, I can make this factorization, right? Because now I have the exponential of uh, one minus this thing uh, times alpha m. So uh, one times alpha m is, is this particular term. And since this particular exponential does not depend on my data points, right? So it does, it does not depend. It does not depend on n, which means that for every weight, I have this uh, same scaling factor there, which actually is canceled out if you take a look at the algorithm. Let's get back. So if you take a look at this algorithm, then uh, these wn's are normalized in this uh, weighted error rate, right? So that means that this particular uh, term is canceled out uh, anyway, so we can ignore it. And if you then ignore it, then we get precisely the update rule uh, that we saw in the, the algorithm just now. Okay, so this really gives me a recipe for obtaining this boosted committee of classifiers. And then if I want to make predictions with it, so just uh, write this out, like in the derivation that we just did, it turns out that we have this uh, term a half over here, but obviously this term a half uh, doesn't matter because we're looking at the sign and the sign doesn't change if I multiply this thing. So this was actually uh, the final uh, prediction in uh, step three. Okay, so we just really derived uh, the adder boost algorithm. So what we did, we started out with an exponential error function and we want to minimize this uh, sequentially. So that's essentially what we did and that resulted in uh, exactly the adder boost algorithm. So this is a very simple sequential uh, algorithm to train your committee of, of classifiers. Now there are some disadvantages uh, to this because we work with an exponential error function, which means that if uh, my errors for outliers uh, are very large, then uh, yeah, obviously this exponential takes on a very large value. And so my optimization algorithm will be dominated by these uh, outliers. So uh, the boosting algorithm at a boost is somewhat uh, sensitive to outliers. Uh, another possible disadvantage is that we cannot interpret this exponential error function in terms of probabilities. And that's what, what we like to do because that gives me a sense of uh, uncertainty in my models. And another disadvantage is that uh, this method doesn't generalize too easily to uh, multiple classes. Though uh, for the regression case, so for multiple regression targets, this is actually still doable, but in the classification setting, it's, it's somewhat complicated. Okay, so that's it for boosting. It's a very simple algorithm, which as it turns out, can be thought of as a sequentially training a committee that minimizes some exponential error function. In the last part of this lecture, we're going to look at decision trees. I already said that for boosting algorithms, you typically work with weak classifiers. And in the previous video, we used uh, this decision stumps as an example of such a weak classifier. Now the decision stump is an example of a very simple decision tree, namely it consists of just one decision. But uh, decision trees in general can be very flexible and they can be made as complicated as we want. They are therefore a very powerful tool in machine learning. When using decision trees as a base model in combination methods such as bootstrapping and feature bagging, we can obtain really incredibly powerful classifiers called random forest, uh, which as we will see are really obtained by just following a, a very simple recipe. Okay, so I'm going to talk about decision trees uh, now. And when I'm done with that, I'm going to show that if we combine decision trees in uh, committee methods such as uh, the bootstrap aggregation method or random subspace methods, uh, we, that we obtain very powerful classifiers uh, called random forests. But first, let's start uh, talking about decision trees. 
Now, um, because the Book of Bishop, which we have been following quite closely so far, uh, doesn't expand too much on uh, decision trees, I also want to include these extra references such that after this video, if you still want to read more about decision, decision trees and random forest, I recommend you to take a look at either this book, so an introduction to statistical learning, or um, this other book by uh, Hasey Tipshirani and uh, Friedman, The Elements of Statistical Learning where this book is, is really just a, a more advanced version of the book I just uh, showed. And actually, so the, the slides, I'm, I'm actually taking an example from a course given by, uh, by uh, the authors of this book, because I think it's such a nice example. Uh, but now let's just start talking about decision trees. So decision trees uh, can be applied in both a regression and classification context. And the idea behind decision trees is to stratify or segment my input space into rectangular regions. So the idea is that if I make this uh, stratification of my input space, uh, then I have rules like if my point falls within this region, then it has to adopt this particular output uh, value. Uh, I'm going to show this with an example. And now these input regions, uh, they are essentially defined by a set of splitting rules. So I have my entire input space and I'm going to split it step by step into these small pieces. And the rules that generate uh, this the, the splitting or the stratification of my input space can be nicely summarized in, in a decision tree. And this fact that these splitting rules are nicely summarized in a, in a decision tree uh, make these uh, decision trees a very insightful uh, data analysis tool. So that's really the biggest power of decision trees, that they're, it's, it's essentially a very uh, simple algorithm and it's very useful for interpretation. Uh, a downside of decision trees is that uh, this classification or regression method in itself isn't really competitive uh, with other state-of-the-art uh, algorithms. But when you combine them with, with bagging or boosting algorithms, they can become very powerful. So when you do that, you essentially obtain uh, what we call random forests, and these are like very competitive. Uh, it's a very powerful machine learning uh, algorithm. Okay, so let's go over an example. So the example that I'm going to take here is um, as follows. So we're dealing here with the data set of, of a salary of baseball players, uh, essentially. So uh, each dot represents one particular baseball player. And then uh, the salary of this uh, person is color coded. So red means really a high salary, um, blue greenish means uh, a relatively uh, so lo low salary. And the data that we have is uh, the number of years that this uh, player is uh, playing as a professional and the number of hits uh, that, that this player makes. And now the objective is to train a, a machine learning uh, algorithm that given a new baseball player predicts uh, uh, the salary. And now we're going to do this by uh, splitting my input space into regions. Uh, so the idea is I'm going to look at regions in which I can sort of make a homogeneous uh, prediction and uh, that then defines my uh, prediction for the new player. So if I look at this, I see, for example, a lot of low uh, salary players in this particular region and high salary over here, and then again a bit low over here. But if I want to split this data set into particular regions, then maybe this would be a nice uh, cutoff point because I see that all players on the left, they have somewhat equal salary. And if I take a look on the right, then here we still have some scattering going on. But basically this tells me, uh, just looking at years, I see that uh, players that already have been playing for many years, they have a higher salary. So the year is going to be a strong predictor. And if I make this cut, then this generates a new uh, region, right? So let's call this, for example, region one. And then what I could do if uh, a new player, uh, so his statistics fall into this uh, region one, basically meaning uh, the player has been playing for less than uh, five years, then I can come up with a decision rule saying, okay, then probably his or her salary is going to be given by, let's say, the average a salary of all uh, the players in my training set. That, that's a reasonable uh, prediction to make then. And that's the idea behind decision tree. So partitioning my data set such that I can make these uh, decisions uh, easily. Uh, but now if a, data, if, a, if a player falls into this uh, region, there's a lot of heterogeneity in my uh, salaries essentially. So maybe I want to make it a bit more accurate. So I'm going to include a new decision boundary. Let's say, uh, let's put it somewhere over here because I see that for all the players that have been playing uh, for quite a while, I see a large uh, deviation from low to high salary by just taking a look at the norm number of hits that, that this player makes. Right, we see high uh, salaries in this region and low salaries in this region. 
So basically, once you have determined that uh, you're dealing with a senior player, so it's on this side of this particular decision boundary, then I can further refine this by taking a look at the hits because we see that players that uh, have more hits, they have a higher salary. So then I obtain a new region, region two and a particular region three. A prediction would then be just made if a player falls in this region by, for example, taking a look at the average salary uh, in this uh, region. Okay, so what I then did, I, I generated these regions by just following a very simple recipe of sequential decisions. So I started off by looking at years. And so this is my first decision. I'm going to look at the number of years. And if the player has been playing for more than uh, four and a half years, then I'm going to say, okay, then you belong to this uh, particular uh, region. Or sorry, if it's more than four and a half years, it become, belongs to this particular region. So this particular decision, let's say less than four and a half years, means all the players that fall in this uh, particular region, right? And let's say the more senior people, so then I follow this right branch of this uh, decision tree, uh, they fall in this particular region. Now, if I want to refine my model, then it uh, there's most to gain by actually splitting this particular region, right? Because if I look at this region, all the points, all the players more or less have the same salary, so I do not gain much more accuracy by making a particular uh, split over here. But if I want to make my predictive model more accurate, then I have to probably make a split somewhere in this region, right? Uh, because I said that my predictions are going to base, be based on the average of my uh, player salary within this region. And because there's so much diversity in, in salaries in this region, um, on average, I'm going to be quite far off uh, in my predictions. So that's happening here. So and now I'm going to make a decision based on the number of hits saying that, well, if my senior player has a low number of hits, then I probably put the decision boundary somewhere over here. That means, well, you fall in this region and then your salary sort of coincide with all your fellow uh, players within this same um, um, identified region. Uh, but if you are a senior player with a lot of hits, yeah, then you fall in this region. And then I think your uh, salary is going to be comparable to uh, well, the players uh, within this region. Okay, so this is very simple, right? So we just have a decision tree of binary decisions. So first we decide on the number of years and that gives me this region one. Then I take a look at uh, the senior people and then again, make a split based on one of these variables, right? I could also make another cut uh, based on years, uh, but we see that actually most uh, can be gained by splitting along the number of hits, right? We see players with a lot of hits have higher salary. So it's best to make this cut. So that gives me this additional decision and that splits the region on the right into an, a region R2 and a region R3. Okay, and now this decision tree that you see over here is actually automatically obtained via criteria, which I've now been loosely defining. And we'll get back to that uh, in a second. Uh, but the main point is that with such decision tree, we have a very simple way of splitting my uh, data into these uh, regions, right? Uh, maybe a possible downside is that I'm going to split my regions just based on these binary decisions based on one feature value, right? So I always make these uh, cuts which are perpendicular to the axis. But looking at this from the positive side, we see that uh, these models are super interpretable, right? So let's take a closer look at that. So what we've seen so far is really that uh, the number of years is the most important factor in determining uh, the salary of the player. And if you look at this decision tree, it's way up top, right? So my first decision was based on years. And this tells me that this is actually an, a very important element in uh, my predictive system. And then we concluded that, well, for people that are playing for, for, more, for many years already, then uh, the next most discriminative thing to look at is uh, the number of hits that this player has. Okay, so just by building this tree, we gained insight in what kind of features or properties uh, of players are important when determining uh, their uh, salaries. Now this tree that we just went over was actually determined automatically by a very simple tree building uh, algorithm. And it works as follows. So the objective is to create these, these regions, so these splits, and I want to minimize, let's say the heterogeneity within a region, right? So I want to make a split of my data and then I'm going to look, so that defines a region, right? And then I have an average value within that region and I want all these points to lie close to this value. That's essentially what this particular uh, error term uh, characterizes over here. So if I make a split, I obtain multiple regions, multiple regions uh, J, and then I want to uh, make the splits in such a way that within each region, all points are close to the average uh, of that region. So the algorithm is as follows. So it's an iterative method. So we're just selecting one feature to start off with. So we're going to look at the number of years and then I can uh, draw maybe a decision boundary over here or over here. 
And I'm going to try all of them out and the same for the number of hits. So maybe I can make a split over here or I can make a split over here. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going to test this and look at my sum of squared errors. So the sum of squared errors. And I'm just picking the split that really minimizes the sum of squared errors. And then it turns out that if I make my split right over here, then I have a very homogeneous region over here. And still here we have some heterogeneity uh, going on. But over all the splits that I can make, this was the most optimal split that I could make. And then we proceed, right? So uh, then we have now two new regions which can again be split. So I'm going to draw a split somewhere in this region. Could be again like vertically or horizontally. And I can do the same uh, on the left hand side. I'm just going to try out everything, everything possible. And then it turns out that the largest degree in my uh, error that I'm going to minimize is obtained by putting a split somewhere over here. Okay, so this is a very simple algorithm. And this is what we just keep uh, iterating. Okay, and this can of course go on forever, right? Where I can make more and more splits, more and more splits. And with every split, I make tinier regions. So if I continue with this forever, then eventually I have like a rectangular region around each data point. So uh, these decision trees, they can actually overfit, right? If I make my uh, tree deep enough, uh, then I have a high chance of overfitting. But if I make my tree very shallow, then I have these very simple decision rules. Uh, so there's low risk of overfitting. But still, then you have to come up with a way of stopping this uh, splitting procedure, right? You can just say, I'm just going to go for five splits. Or you can say, I'm just continue splitting until my regions become too small. For example, I have a criterion that my re each region should c contain at least five data points. And, then, and if I then can no longer satisfy this constraint, then I'm done with my splitting. And uh, then I have my I build my decision tree. Okay, and then there's one other thing to be said about this type of uh, tree building, it's essentially a greedy process, right? So I make decisions locally based on my current status. I'm just going to look at, well, given this situation, what would be the best split given this uh, criterion? And I'm not going to think about if this would actually be a good decision on the long run, right? Um, so we call it a greedy algorithm because it makes decisions just based on the current status without thinking about uh, what consequence uh, this decision has in, in the long run. Uh, but the idea is then, okay, so, when we run this procedure, we obtain such regions, these rectangular uh, regions. And then as said before, I'm going to make my prediction based on the region in which uh, my new data point falls, right? And if I talk about regression, then the sensible thing to do is to let um, the prediction given by points falling in a particular region be given by the average in that region. So that, that's basically stated over here, right? So if a data point falls within region RJ, then the predicted value uh, t prime is given simply by the average over all my uh, target values uh, in my data set that fall in that region. So that's actually depicted over here, right? So that means for every region, I have a particular value. And that means I have this piecewise, piecewise constant landscape, right? If my data point falls uh, within this region, I have a particular value. If it falls in another region, I have a different value. So we have this uh, piecewise, uh, piecewise constant uh, landscape. Okay, so for regression, my predictions are based on the average of my uh, training samples within that region. And for classification, I'm going to take a look at the majority vote of my uh, samples in the training set that fall in that region. I'm actually going to take a second look at this uh, tree optimization framework in the classification setting uh, separately in one of the upcoming slides. But first, let's talk a bit about overfitting. Uh, we already saw that large trees, they might overfit to the training set. And this is mainly due to the idea that a small variation in the training data set can actually cause a very different splitting uh, splitting of my data space uh, higher up in, in, in the tree. And we also reason that smaller trees, they tend to underfit, right? So it makes a very coarse stratification of my uh, data space. So a strategy to prevent overfitting is really to stop the splitting whenever uh, I do not have a very clear de decrease in my sum of squared errors. So basically say at some point, um, the, the values within each region is, is homogeneous enough. Because if I do not have this constraint, I want to keep on splitting and splitting until uh, every point is very close to the, the, to the actual mean in that region, uh, which eventually leads to the situation where uh, I only have one point uh, within each, each region. Uh, but, but the idea with this is that maybe this is a somewhat uh, short-sighted solution, right? It, it, I mean, it could be that uh, maybe at the beginning, like higher up in my tree, I cannot make a right decision. Uh, it doesn't really decrease my sum of squared errors. 
but it allows me by making this decision, it, it allows me to do in the next step uh, a particular decision, which actually allows for a very clear um, decrease in the sum of squared errors. Okay, so that sort of exposes a problem with this uh, greedy uh, tree building approach, right? That a split, which actually only contributes to a very small decrease in my sum of squared errors, can in the long run actually lead to uh, larger decreases later on. So a solution to this uh, overfitting is not really to come up with a proper stopping criterion, but it's to just build very uh, strong uh, or, or, or large trees. So I grow a tree until some maximum depth, and then we're going to prune it to make it, to simplify it, to remove decisions from my tree. So that's actually a very common thing to do. So you start building a tree uh, based on all these uh, decisions and then one decision after the other. Uh, so I have this uh, particular decision tree. And then I'm going to take a look which of these decisions I can actually remove from my decision tree without too much, lo much loss of information, right? So for example, it could be that this particular leave node it can be removed without changing my sum of squared errors too much. So that's the idea. We, we built a very uh, deep tree, so here indicated in blue, and then we're going to prune it. So we're going to remove uh, leaf nodes. So leaf nodes are the final nodes that make my, like my final decision uh, steps in my tree. And every time when I remove such a node, I obtain a new uh, subtree, right? Which we're going to indicate with uh, T0. So this indicated in green over here, it could indicate one of such uh, subtrees obtained by pruning my original tree T. So then we have a definition of the number of terminal nodes. So in this particular example uh, of the full tree T, I have one, two, three, four, five uh, terminal nodes. So, uh, and now with this in place, so with these definitions in place, um, I'm going to minimize this for particular objective for, uh, for this pruning step. So for every subtree that I generate, so for every of these green newly obtained trees by pruning my original tree, I can evaluate some error criterion. And this error, error criterion is going to consist of this, uh, let's say, homogeneity term, so the sum of squared errors uh, within a region. But it's going to be balanced against the total number of leaf nodes in this uh, particular subtree. So we have this particular penalty that penalizes the total number of leaf nodes. The idea is that uh, we want to have small trees because smaller trees tend to uh, prevent overfitting. So we want to really reduce the number of leaf nodes. So if my subtree has a lot of leaf nodes and I have a large error, but obviously this error needs to be compensated for actually a proper model. So we also want to minimize uh, the sum of squared errors uh, within each of these uh, leaf nodes. All right, so it could be that these two regions can be merged and that would mean that they have actually one leaf node less. So I'm really reducing this particular uh, criterion over here without affecting too much my sum of squared errors. And that will mean that this QJ term uh, remains somewhat unchanged. So that actually means that, I'm, uh, that I can safely merge these two uh, regions uh, together. But then, yeah, we have this uh, alpha criterion over here, right? This, this is an additional parameter. And this is going to be sent, uh, set uh, via cross-validation. So in my entire training step, I'm going to keep a validation uh, set apart. And I'm going to optimize uh, this alpha via this uh, validation set. And when I have a proper uh, value for alpha, then I can find the optimal uh, pruned uh, tree in the end. Okay, so this pruning depends on this, let's say, heterogeneity error, right? So we want points to be similar in the same uh, region. And for regression, that, that's clear. We just work with the sum of squared errors uh, of each point relative to uh, the mean in that region. Uh, but for classification, it's maybe a bit less obvious because now my targets are, for example, binary labels, right? Or we have this, we have K classes, so we have K of such labels. So we cannot just uh, minimize the sum of square errors. Uh, so we're going to do something different. And the first thing you could think of is maybe work with the misclassification rate, right? So, so we could decide to uh, attach one label to each region, but that means that I'm going to make uh, errors, right? Because one point uh, originally had a different label. So that actually means that I'm going to make an error in my predictions. And I want to maybe minimize the total sum of errors within this region. Okay, so we can use this as a criterion that we want to minimize, but actually this is not recommended. It turns out this is a very somewhat unstable method for, for building trees in this sequential splitting manner. And I can show that as follows. So the main criterion was actually that we want to uh, maximize homogeneity within uh, my regions. And suppose I have this region and it's going to be split. So I consider two classes, for example, right? Now, 
Within each new region, I'm going to look at the ratio between a class, the number of points in class one and the number of points in class two. So let's call that a P. Then suppose I make a splitting as follows, which leads the, to the fact that maybe in this region, I have a P of 0 0.15, which means that 15% of my points in this region belong to class one, and but the majority belongs to class two. So this actually means that I'm making an error of a 0 0.15 in this region. And let's say in this region, I have a P of 0 0.85, which means 85% of the points in this uh, region belongs to class one. This means that for this region, I'm going to make also make an error of about uh, 15%. Uh, so if I sum the total number of errors, I actually have that 30% uh, of my points in within each of these regions uh, is misclassified. But now suppose I'm going to split my uh, region in a different way. Let's split it over here uh, because maybe then I can find a cut which actually reads, leads to a, very, to a pure uh, region of only points in class two. So that actually means my error rate in this region is going to be zero. But maybe uh, in this region I have uh, the fraction of points in class one is given by only 0 0.7, right? So 17% belongs to class one. So that means in this region, I actually have a larger error rate of about uh, of 30%. So in total, this still gives me a total error of uh, 0 0.3. And this is the situation that we actually want because we want to encourage purity because now if a point falls in this region, then I can make a very good uh, prediction. So this misclassification rate doesn't distinguish between these two cases. And actually it turns out that the best uh, trees are generated uh, with methods that sort of favor uh, purity within the regions. And this purity is really encouraged by the following uh, error function. So the negative cross entry loss and uh, the gene I index. And so the, these functions are plotted here in, in this figure. So they're actually quite similar and both have the property that they encourage purity, right? So either you want a full fraction of points that purely belong to one class or to the other class, because that really minimizes these uh, cross entropy and the, the Gini index. Okay, so we have defined a way of building uh, decision trees in a reliable way, uh, both for classifications and, and regression. Now, um, let's wrap this up. So we saw that decision trees are really easily interpretable and nice to visualize. So we have this nice decision diagram and uh, the, the splits, the decisions that made early on, they can be maybe considered as important uh, decisions uh, in this whole process of splitting my, uh, my data. I also said that performance of such models is usually suboptimal, so it's not the best algorithm in itself, but uh, we can solve this by really creating ensembles of trees. And that eventually leads to the notion of random forest, as we will see. Okay, so let's talk about random forests. So um, first of all, so we can talk about combining uh, decision trees, right? So we can do that via bootstrapping or via feature bagging. And the purpose of these uh, bootstrapping slash bagging approaches is to train new models which are uncorrelated, right? Because if my uh, models are uncorrelated, then I have most to gain of uh, with averaging them in order to reduce uh, the, the variance in my bias variance decomposition. Now the thing with decision trees is, and now let's consider this bootstrapping, right? So I'm just going to randomly shuffle my data with replacement. I can actually still obtain models that are very similar because if there are features in my data set which are very discriminative, then uh, well, the first decisions in my decision tree are going to be very much the same in all of these uh, trees that I'm building. So a solution to this is obtained as follows. So again, so we start off with building an assemble by bootstrapping the data set. So that's still what we're going to do. But then additionally, we do a form of feature bagging where for each tree, every time I have to make a split, I can only make a split based on a random selection of features. And this really makes sure that every tree that I'm going to build is going to look different because if one tree can only make a decision based on, let's say the first three features in the very first step, and the other tree can only make a decision based on, let's say, the last three features, then uh, yeah, the, obviously these trees will be different. Uh, so by doing this feature bagging on a stepwise level, I get completely different trees every time I, I build this uh, tree. So I'm building a committee of uh, trees which are uncorrelated. Okay, so that's all there is to it. So I just follow my regular tree building procedure, but whenever I am going to make a new split, I can only do this based on a subset of the features which I randomly sample. And uh, the number of features that you randomly sample or randomly consider is typically said to be a square root over D, where D is the total number of uh, features.
in my uh, feature vectors. Okay, so that's all there is to it. So let's have a final look at some example where we see the benefit of such a random forest approach. So what we're considering here is this gene expression data set, which I talked about in the very introduction of this course. And you can find it also in the books that I recommended at the start of this video. So uh, we want to classify the type of cancer based on uh, these gene uh, expressions. And if we try to do that with a single tree, we get uh, like very poor performance actually. And that's sort of what we discussed before that maybe a single tree can be considered as a uh, weak classifier. But if I combine all these weak classifiers in this random forest approach, uh, then I see like a significant decrease uh, in, in error rate where I can consider still several options for this a random subsampling of my features, right? So the square root over P that was the, uh, the recommended thing that you see is indeed the best performing method. And if I said M equal to P, so the number of features in, in my data points, you see that what I'm doing really is just bootstrapping based on the data, right? So there's no um, random subspace method involved in, in this particular case. And that, that's the orange line, what you see over here. So these ones are close uh, to just bootstrapping. And in this one, we really decrease the correlation between models uh, with extra uh, feature backing. Where this is important, feature backing is just not just done at the start when I build my data set, but it's done really in each step of my decision tree, right? because that is the most efficient way uh, to reduce the correlation between my models. And again, I want to stress this, these committee models, they work best if the individual uh, models are uh, uncorrelated because then uh, my variance in the bias variance decomposition is most effectively reduced.